everyone. Mike Me back with KTV Fox 2 in the San Francisco Bay Area. We're talking coronavirus and real estate, and uh, we're lucky enough to have Vanessa Bergmark, CEO of Red Oak Realty, uh, join us for the conversation. Vanessa's uh, in Oakland, California right now. Um, what are we experiencing right now, Vanessa? I'll just kind of throw it wide open. Um, people are moving out of the big cities, not just in the Bay Area, uh, but across the country, I guess, and, and looking for land, space out there in the suburbs. Yep. Well, thanks so much for having me, first of all. Sure. Um, so yeah, what we are seeing is basically um, uh, a confluence of events come together. It's like the trifecta. Um, and, and frankly, the fires right now are, are adding a whole other level to, to what's going on with real estate. But what we had was incredibly high prices, a huge demand at the beginning of the year. And that's after years of incredibly expensive, high cost of living in the Bay Area. Couple that with this pandemic where we were you know, sheltered in place in counties across the Bay Area that took a very hard stance and were some of the you know, earliest in the nation to shut down. Sure. And then uh, you have the reopening of that. And still, I think a lot of um, you know, county mandates that change sort of the way that we are living right now. Uh, bars, restaurants, nightclubs, events, all the things that drive city living, urban living, have been stripped away practically overnight. And they're not making a resurgence just yet. So couple that with what will the fall look like? How long will this pandemic continue? Um, and you're starting to see what, what has been whispered about and now it's starting to come to fruition, which is a push out of the urban areas and uh, into you know, suburbs and, and really truly rural areas as yeah. well. Yeah, let's talk about inventory, because if you told me back in January that the city of San Francisco was gonna have a 96% a increase uh, in inventory, housing inventory, that according to Zillow, mm -hmm. um, I wouldn't have believed you. Uh, as someone who grew up in the, in the Bay Area, but um, that's a big number, Vanessa. Would you agree or no? There? It's, a, it's a really big number. And, um, and I think what it is, is part of that number right now is people having the time to say, wait a second, if I really don't have to work in the city and commute, because part of the, you know, we've got these prices, but we've also got traffic. You've got like Google's and Facebook saying, hey, you don't have to come back for a year, right? And, and, then, and then they're setting a precedence that other companies are saying, well, is it a liability if I don't fall in line? So right. you're starting to see what is becoming sort of like, there's an imitation factor going on of like, well, if they're going to do it, then I'm going to do it. Then. So then you have an entire opportunity that never existed before. You have for the first time in the history of working that you don't have to live where you work. So if that's the case, all bets are off. You could go home to family, you could go back somewhere, you could try the mountains, you could try anything. Because if your company is allowing you to keep your job, keep your employment, mm -hmm. and do use technology and go somewhere else, everyone's having a different conversation with their, you know, yeah. significant other and or their families or their children of what would we do now and what could we try. Yeah. Um, so that's what, changing. What about inventory are you seeing? And I know you're in Oakland. I mean, you have San Jose, San Francisco, Oakland, big cities there in the Bay Area. Um, what are you seeing in regards to inventory um, beyond you, like through the Caldecott Tunnel, Walnut Creek? I mean, I know it's huge in the big cities. The Everyone seems to be pushing, like it's like one step forward for everyone. So if you're in Palo Alto, there's people. So first of all, what we are seeing is that um, inventory was started the year down 30%. Then it was moving up slowly it plummeted 53% in May in, in, in the Oakland East Bay market, 53%. Yeah. Now it shot up, it's 5% up year over year. And we're starting to see more and more inventory come on. That could be a lot of things. It's, it's the work from home becoming a real true reality. It's the election, it's the fires. There's a lot of things now. It's like one thing on top of the other that's pushing people forward to make decisions. Yeah. So what we're seeing is everyone seems to be going, you know, maybe it's like one county out or one city. Right now, we are getting a lot of people leaving San Francisco that are coming to the East Bay. You know, just for the mere fact of yards, better weather, um, less commute, right? The ability to go somewhere else, but not wanting to totally leave the Bay Area. So yeah, a lot of movement, a lot of movement to Napa, Sonoma counties. Uh, there's a push from the East Bay to those counties. Even Lake so, Tahoe, right? I mean, I saw uh, Tahoe's huge. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I saw an article in the Chronicle. I don't know if it was over the weekend or maybe it was this week, but that someone from San Francisco knocked on the door of someone in Truckee up in Lake Tahoe and said, I want to buy your house. And the person's like, no, they're like $2 million. And that person's like, no. But I mean, it's gotten to that point where yeah. you have these people who have, you know, uh, a lot of money in their homes in San Francisco um, that, that can do that, I guess. They can just walk up to someone and, and say, hey, I want your house right now. Well, and let's look at this. We've got historically low interest rates and they are going yeah. to stay low. When you're looking at 2.75 to 3.25% on a million and a half 
or two million dollar loan. That's when are you going to be able to? See? I mean, if people really look at what's going on right now, there's an opportunity that is quite golden. Um, in the midst of fires, pandemics, right? In the midst of all this chaos, there are some really good opportunities. And I don't think that the San Francisco Bay Area, you know, area is gonna cease to exist after this. I just think there's an opening. There was a pressure. There's a lot of moving forces. And again, it's the, it's the companies that will make a decision that will really change the face of the area for a while, which is, mm. will they demand that they come back come or back. will they continue with this trend and let them work from anywhere? What do you think? I think they're probably gonna continue with the trend. And I think it will, I think it's a good thing for our nation. I think it's a good thing for people to move and repopulate and go into other cities. I also think maybe a, you know, summer in Austin and a winter in Montana might have people running back to the Bay Area. You know, so right, we, sure. we've, we've got to get through a whole season of things before we can really say, is this permanent? Is there, risk, is permanent. there risk though? I mean, is there risk when it comes to someone who, let's say lives in the suburbs and, um, you know, they would make a lot of money on the sale of their house and maybe they still want to stay in the Bay Area and they want to buy a new house, but obviously the, the, the prices are higher. Um, are you finding people who are in that kind of like, God, I could sell and make a lot of money and I can buy a house, but then my property tax will go up and they're yeah. in that debate? Yeah, no, no, that, 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 that definitely is happening. It depends on your market. There are some markets where um, the, the starter price is going to be incredibly, there's a huge amount of demand for that. But the next level up houses are diminishing in, 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 in uh, competition. So for those people that have a starter price home and could make a lot of money, but move into a house that isn't increasing as much, that is actually trading at a lower rate, that's a, that, those people are in for a really good, they're getting more house with a very low interest rate loan. They may pay more with property taxes, but um, there's an advantage for those folks. The ones breaking into the market, you know, if it's whatever your price point may be, in, in Palo Alto on the South Bay, it's two and a half million for a starter home. In the East Bay, it's getting closer to about nine to one million. San Francisco is one three to one five. So you can take, if you're a San Francisco person that wanted to buy, and now you're looking at, you know, those interest rates in the East Bay, that's what we're seeing is, let's come on over and do that. We don't maybe have to commute for the next two years. Let's try this new opportunity. And we'll see uh, well, it's probably people in Tucson, Arizona are going, what are those numbers again? Or, uh, <laughs> I, know, I know, I know. When I talk about these numbers, it just sounds like what? But yeah. that's part of the reason we're doing this right now, right? right. Is those right. numbers have been on a steady incline since 2011. So I remember 12 years ago, the, the commercial real estate business in San Francisco just tanked, right? And people were not making money. And then all of a sudden over the past decade, it's just exploded, right. uh, at least in that particular city there. Um, what, what's the state of just like agents, right? Is it a good time to be a real estate agent? Um, they're in the Bay Area, or is it just really cutthroat? I mean, it always kind of is a cutthroat business, but is it, uh, or is it a tough time? Uh, I, I think it's, a, I think it's a good time. I think if you, um, especially if you know how to service and, uh, and, and, and figure out what your clients' needs are. One thing that we are seeing in our roles right now is we're not just making a decision based on, hey, what do you think the value of my house is? I'm thinking of moving somewhere within, you know, the city. We are really now consulting on what is your, what's your your long-term plans, like what is the opportunities that you have right now? No one had this opportunity to what feels like retire from this area. I mean, think about this. It's the first time that you could actually go to some other place while, while not retiring, while still keeping your job. That has changed the conversation. So um, we're having to evolve with that conversation and look at what are the opportunities. I will say we are part of a, um, a referral company called Leading Real Estate Companies of the World, and it's a global referral exchange. And they have seen year over year um, something about, I think it's increased year over year, 53% with referrals going out throughout the company. And it's not just happening in California. It's happening in DC. Wow. It's happening in New York. It's happening in, in Europe. We are sending people to Europe for the first time. Yeah. So that says a lot. This is saying that this is a global movement. Yeah. Uh, my brother's an agent and he's in, uh, out in Florida and I thought it'd be tough over the last five months. He says he's just, he's been busy as ever, you know, with people coming in from out of state, moving to Florida. And, um, I don't know if you can touch on this, but what about the rental market? Um, is that? I don't follow it as much, but from, from anecdotally and from the people I've touched in on, and if you check on Zillow, what we are seeing, I think San Francisco and numbers are considerably down, Palo Alto, anyone yeah. that did not own already and have this new opportunity is like, why am I here? Yeah. Why am I saying? And especially, you got to realize, especially at the same time when nothing's really open right. in the Bay Area, nothing. Uh, it goes down. You pay four or five grand a month. You don't have to go to work. 
you could do it from your living room. All the, you know, urban amenities are shut down. Like why, why not just say, I'm, I can come back, I'm a renter. They don't have to put their house on the market, go through that whole thing and pull out of the Bay Area. They can just go and they can come back. Yeah. Especially as the rents keep falling, they may be able to upgrade in a year. So yeah, I think that the, in the urban cities, the rentals, even in Oakland, it's starting to come down. Condos, we're kind of, mm-hmm. we're starting to see a little bit of a, a, you know, a depression in the condo mm-hmm. market. A lot of inventory uh, drop in prices. So, um, but the rentals will be the first ones that go, and that's what we're seeing for sure. I mean, at Red Oak Realty, are you guys? Uh, I mean, when you look out at the future, how do you plan to 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 make more money uh, during a pandemic? I mean, everyone who has a business wants revenue, right? You want to make money. Um, has your business plan at all changed? Or, I mean, or is you just doing what you do? Well, first, I would say I'm I'm extraordinarily grateful, and I'm one of the lucky. Um, industries that saw a V recovery and became essential. I, I really, I look out at, because in real estate, you're not just serving, you're not just selling houses, you're really representing communities. Mm-hmm. And when I look out and I see restaurants closing and bars closing and, um, you know, small business owners losing their shirts over this, mm-hmm. um, I say, it's not so much about making money, it's about being able to be an essential service right now. And it's heartbreaking to look at these communities where we have we have represented clients. We are bringing people into them. And these services that make those communities so ru- robust are compromised because yeah. of the pandemic. So I would say, um, look, I'm a business owner and the goal is to bring in revenue and profit. But the first and foremost, it's just, I am super grateful that we were not where we were in the great recession where real estate was, you know, yeah. the redheaded stepchild. And it was the last thing. What I think we've seen is a value shift in what home and what community really does mean. And we're sort of at the forefront of that. So that's kind of been, um, that's been an interesting experience. I'd say it's a much harder transaction. It might be robust right now, yeah. but it's 5X the work to get people into houses. There's legal documents that have to be signed. There's medical requirements. My office turned into what used to be a uh, you know, harmonious area where everyone came together. It looks like the CDC now. You've got to get your, you know, your temperature taken and a tracing doc, and we keep very little staff in there. So, you know, things have changed and we've adjusted, but um, it's not. Although it's a robust industry right now, it's um, it's not easy to transact in. I don't see those open house signs on Sundays They're at gone. the corner down the street that I saw before. I mean, because right now I would, but you don't even have open homes. No, we do virtual open homes now. So you yeah. can find us. We do Instagram lives. We brought everything in. We do a lot of video. We've hired in-house. So my business has changed where I'm bringing videography inside. I'm making sure all my platforms of ease of uh, transaction signing and disclosures is all done virtually. Um, our appointments are all done just like this. I mean, it's just pivoted online. But the great part is it happened overnight. And we are adapting, and there is still commerce. It did. And as you said, I mean, millions of Americans don't even have jobs right now, and yet here we are talking right. about this. Right. Very grateful to be working myself and, and, and having this conversation here. So, uh, Vanessa Bergmark with uh, Red Oak Realty, uh, the CEO. Um, appreciate your time. Very interesting Thank conversation, you. and uh, have a great weekend here. Thanks so much. News now from Fox. It's tear gas. Experience breaking news as it occurs. I have the driver now heading. Uh, a nonstop stream of compelling content and live events from around the nation and the world. Subdivision has been flooded. A front row seat to news happening right now. Several thousand strong. Watch news now from Fox right here. I'm the Fox Medical Team's Beth Galvin in Atlanta. And the Labor Day weekend is typically a huge travel weekend for Americans. But traveling right now can be tricky when we're right in the middle of a pandemic. So we're going to hear from Dr. Henry Wu. He's the director of the Travel Well program at Emory University in Atlanta and a physician on some tips about how to travel safely right now. First, I should emphasize that because the risk of COVID is still fairly high throughout the world, the risk cannot be totally mitigated. So I do think that the threshold to travel should still be a bit higher than it is during normal times. This is particularly true if you're elderly, have medical problems, or are visiting or have family members that have those risk factors for more severe illness. However, if you do need to travel, you can be proactive and take steps to protect yourself, your loved ones, and your community. First, if you're feeling sick or have been in close contact with somebody with confirmed COVID-19 illness, please do stay home. Thankfully, many times this illness can be mild, even asymptomatic. However, we do know that 
those cases can still spread the infection to others. So please stay home and do your best to protect others if you might be sick. I strongly encourage all travelers and the general community when you're out and about in public among others to wear a face covering. I firmly believe that face coverings protect the wearer. We use these every day in our clinics. I do believe they do protect you against COVID-19 and protect others in case you happen to be sick. Of course, they have to be worn correctly. Make sure your hands are clean when you're putting on the mask, cover your nose and your mouth. And if you do have to adjust your mask or remove it, do your best to sanitize or clean your hands. Maintain your distance from others when in public. Of course, we all know about the social distancing rules, the six feet apart rules. And this applies not only when you're standing in lines, but really when you're out and about in general. I encourage travelers and the general public to really internalize uh, this distancing. Redefine what you consider what is your personal space when you're out and about. This way you can inherently keep yourself protected as you're moving through more crowded areas. Keep your hands clean, of course. Although we do believe most of the spread is through the air, through large respiratory droplets, there's still a possibility you may touch a contaminated surface and then subsequently infect yourself. So carry hand sanitizer with you at all times. You may not always be close to a, a sink. Uh, this is particularly important when you're interacting with others or may touch uh, common surfaces like doorknobs, elevator buttons, ATM machines, and the like. On planes, of course, you don't always have control of where you're sitting, who you're sitting next to. To the extent of possible, please try your best to sit away from others. If that's not possible, remember that masks are now a requirement on most airlines and I strongly encourage folks to wear them regardless. This will help protect you just in case somebody immediately around you might be sick. Only remove it if you have to take a drink or eat, otherwise keep it on. The good news is that, that the air circulation and filtration systems on aircraft are very good. So really my main concern is those that are immediately around you. Whenever going out, consider that any congregate setting, whether it's a restaurant or a party or a club, any place with a large number of people, particularly indoors, particularly when you're close together can be risky. So think carefully before you go out and where you go. If you're eating, consider taking out, or if you have to dine in, consider trying to eat outdoors or choose an establishment with patio seating and the like. Whenever I go out, if I see staff not wearing masks with masks down their chin, I turn around and look for somewhere else to go. On road trips, plan carefully, plan your stops, try to minimize them. Pack your food if you can as much as possible so you don't have to make those extra stops for food and water. When you do make your stops for gas or things, Please wear your mask, carry your hand sanitizer with you. This will help protect you on your stops. Note that travel in general has become much more complicated if you're crossing state or international borders. Many jurisdictions, even within the US, now has requirements for testing and potentially quarantine requirements. You may be subject to temperature checks upon arrival. Some of these can come up unexpectedly. So it, your best bet is to do your research far in advance. Check with the country's embassy. Check with the CDC and the State Department. The International Air Transport Association also has a database of regulations. Your airlines may also be a source of information. Doing as much research as possible can help make your travel go much more smoothly. Finally, there's never been a better time to get a flu shot during travel. Even in normal times, we've always encouraged the flu shot as a travel vaccine. The flu has always been one of the most common infections you can get when you're traveling. This year, there's another reason to get the flu shot. The flu can present with symptoms that are identical to COVID-19. So preventing the flu can save you a lot of trouble if you are traveling. Imagine what would happen if you landed in a foreign country with a high fever, a cough, that is really the flu. Um, you, you could end up re getting isolated, having mandatory testing, and you certainly you would cause yourself, your family, the people you're visiting a lot of worries. So get a flu shot for every reason. With that, I'd be happy to take questions uh, from you all. Great. Thank you very much, Dr. Wu. We're going to go ahead and take the first question. 
We saw spikes in COVID-19 cases after Memorial Day and 4th of July. Is there something unique about the timing of Labor Day weekend and where it falls in the pandemic that makes it a potential turning point, neither worsening or getting a better handle on controlling the spread of COVID-19? Good question. Um, this is the way I look at it. The COVID epidemic to me is like a wildfire. If the conditions are right, it can flare up even when you thought you had it con under control. So any situation we have a large number of people traveling, getting into congregate settings, and that would certainly include a, a popular travel weekend like Labor Day, that could lead to the factors that would result in a spike. So yes, we are concerned that this could happen. Next question. There are large parties scheduled this weekend and in the Atlanta metro area, some indoors. Is there any way to do this safely or would you advise not going to these events at all? You know, I, I think every situation can be different, but I think as a general rule, I, I, I really think it's not the best time to getting into indoor areas with large numbers of people. Great, next question. And if you're traveling either by, oh, sorry, do you think people can safely use a public restroom at a gas station or fast food restaurant? If so, how? I think you can really minimize the risk to the point that I, I myself have used public facilities and gone to restaurants when I need to. I would encourage, again, covering your mask, covering your face with a mask, use carrying your hand sanitizer. That way you can sanitize after using the credit card machine. Getting your food or after using the bathroom, just you just leave the facility. I think as long as you maintain that distance, avoid those situations where you're crowded together, this will help minimize the chances of getting anything. And if you're traveling either by car 10 hours or by plane one hour, which one do you think is more safe for COVID or is not one or the other, but other considerations like mask wearing, et cetera? I think, I think there's not a simple answer, but I do think uh, travelers can make informed decisions about which route of travel is best for them. Certainly the challenge of air travel is that there's so much out of your control, uh, whether it's crowded air airports, layovers, and sitting on a plane for a potentially a prolonged period uh, with folks close to you. On the other hand, driving, as we always known, has some its own inherent risks. So I think a lot of it depends on the traveler, your comfort zone and traveling long distances and your ability to plan. I think either way, taking the proper precautions uh, can help minimize that risk. Any concern about going to other states, hotspots people should know about or avoid? Well, I think in general, traveling to an area that's having a significant problem with COVID-19 is not a good idea. Um, certainly there's risk to you and certainly there's risk of you getting infected and bringing that infection back to your, your family and your own community that may be just getting over the problem. Um, I also think it's difficult from the data to necessarily know where the hotspots are. As you know, there's a delay in these numbers too. So just because one area may look, may look like it's not having a problem, it's, it, it, it potentially could have one too. So I think in general, uh, travelers should just keep that threshold a little higher. If they do need to travel, take the precautions. And a few basics to remember if you're hitting the road this weekend or getting together with others. Try to avoid large crowds and large gatherings if you can. And you're safer to get together outdoors with others rather than indoors. Also remember to wear your mask, wash your hands, and try to stay at least six feet away from strangers when you're out in public places. For your Fox Medical Team, I'm Beth Galvin. My name is Gassia Mikaelian, and I'm coming to you through KTVU Fox 2 News in the San Francisco Bay Area. Here on the West Coast, we've been wearing masks for months, and I know you might have questions about how it's impacting the health of your skin. I'm happy to welcome to this conversation Dr. Elizabeth Mullins, a board-certified dermatologist based there in Houston, Texas, but with good advice for us all. Thanks for being with me, doctor. Thank you for having me. Of course. Now let's talk about some changes that we're noticing. And I'll be honest, my skin's terrible. I don't know if it's the stress from the pandemic, the mask I've been wearing, or the bad air quality we have due to wildfires. 
Are you seeing a lot of people with similar concerns? Yes, I'm seeing a lot more patients uh, in my clinic with, ask me, with acne from their masks called maskne. And there are uh, some things that we can do to mitigate that, uh, to mitigate that risk as well as medicate. Well, let's start with the mitigate before we get to the medicine okay. part. Um, I, I don't know what the requirements are where you are there in Houston, but here in California, there's a statewide mask mandate that means anytime you're outside of the house and among the general public, you have to wear a mask. That can be a lot of hours in a day. Um, what are the requirements where you are and how is that directly affecting people's skin? Certainly here in Houston, I know that uh, anytime you're going into an establishment, you have to have a mask on. And of course, then if you're in the, if you're pretty close to other people, even outside, it's a good idea to wear a mask. Right. And, and how, how does mask me differ from, you know, what I had starting at 13 years old and still have now in my mid forties, just regular old acne? Well, so in mask me, what happens is the fabric of the mask, it's trapping dead skin cells, oils, saliva, dirt. It traps these uh, agents on the skin, which then clog the pores and then result in pimples. And is this something that I might try to fix with increased face washing, you know, more, you know, I forget what we, you know, Oxy-10 or whatever those, those things are that we used to put on when right. we were teenagers? Well, first of all, it's a good idea to keep your skin regimen simple. Um, ideally, you're washing your face daily with a gentle cleanser, such as a CeraVe or a Cetaphil cleanser. And if you need a moisturizer, you want to make sure that it's non-comedogenic as well as hypoallergenic. Neutrogena makes a good hyaluronic acid moisturizer called uh, HydroBoost. It's better if you don't wear makeup, but if you must, you'd like to wear a light foundation, one that also says that it's non-comedogenic, which means it won't clog pores. It's interesting because I see people on Instagram, you know, the influencers saying, I do my regular makeup, I do a setting spray, and then I put my mask on. And I say, oh gosh, that must feel like, you know, taking a bath inside a Ziploc bag. It just layer upon right. layer. Layers. So, so you're saying just keep it simple. Yes. The more layers, the, the, more, the layers. more layers you have on the skin, the more you're going to risk clogging your pores and then causing the pimples. So I'm one of those people who, for whatever reason, just loves a good face washing. And, and I'll admit, I do have those fancy brushes and tools that like, mm -hmm. you know, basically it's like the car wash on your face. Right. Uh, um, I, I've, I've heard that that can be a little harsh though, especially when you are seeing mask me. Absolutely. Certainly those uh, harsher products and devices can irritate the skin. They can damage the skin's protective barrier, which increases the risk of irritation, but then also of getting more pimples. Are you seeing clients you've worked with over the years, pre-pandemic, who had issues they were dealing with and now they're saying, gosh, it seems worse. And is that typical? Uh, yes, it's certainly typical in these uh, times of the COVID virus and us having to wear the masks. It's even happened to me. Yeah. So how does stress affect our skin? I think I know the answer, but I'd like to get it from you. Well, sure. I mean, certainly if people are under a lot of stress, which patients have actually mentioned to me that, the str that uh, when their faces have been clear prior to COVID, now because of the stress, they are breaking out. I see. So if, if people do want to take the next step and get in touch mm -hmm. with a dermatologist, um, what, what kind of medical help can, can you uh, and, and your peers give? Well, sure. Well, the first thing is if somebody is just getting a few pimples, you could always go to the pharmacy and get an over-the-counter product that you could use to spot treat pimples, something like a 2.5% benzoyl peroxide or a salicylic acid gel. But yet, if, that, if you're doing that and you're treating these uh, pimples spot treatment, and if, it's, if they're not clearing up, it's a good idea to uh, call and make an appointment with your dermatologist because we have a number of different uh, topical and oral medicines that we can use. How are you, I mean, essentially you are a doctor's office. How, how are your day-to-day -day operations uh, impacted by COVID? Well, we are, we're probably at 80% of capacity. We keep our clinic doors locked. And before a patient gains admittance to our office, we take their temperature. Everybody must wear a mask at all times. Now, certainly sometimes the patients do have to lower the mask so I can examine the face. And then, of course, we've always had good uh, hygienic practices in our office. So it, things are pretty much the same, although we're not seeing quite as many patients in the clinic because we don't want more than one person in the waiting room at a time. Right. Can I ask you, when you're out and about there in Houston, what sort of mask do you wear? 
Oh, I, I wear a mask that has several layers of cotton and the cotton masks are good because the cotton will help absorb the extra saliva, the, uh, the sweat and then the skin's oils so that they're not just sitting right there on the face. Right. I've seen, you know, here on the West Coast in California, we were wearing N95 masks starting a few years ago because we had intense wildfires, which, by the way, we have right now. Um, I, I think those must have some sort of a polyester element to them because they're very, not suffocating, but they don't breathe that well. So I've started, this is my, one of my bandanas that I have in regular, you know, I fold it into a triangle and then I fold, oops, I fold the top part over again. So we have, I think, at least four layers right up right. at the top. And then I do this. So I look like I'm a bank robber. Um, are there better masks or, or things to use when it comes to preventing mask knee? Um, of course, with safety always being top of mind. Correct. I mean, certainly you'd like a mask that has several layers for safety, but yet uh, the other, the inner material should be cotton that, that uh, the layer right next to your skin. So really cotton is best. I mean, it's almost like when you put on a cotton t-shirt, you feel better than if you're wearing, let's say, a polyester sweatshirt. Yes. Is there anything else you'd like to tell us about mask knee or any preventative tips for, for, for keeping us from entering your office, uh, you know, so it doesn't get quite that bad? Right. Again, it's just important to keep your uh, skin routine simple, use non-comedogenic products. And if you do that, everything should be fine. But if your acne isn't clearing up, call and make an appointment with a dermatologist, and we have a number of things we can do to treat the mask knee. And for people who are watching this and might live in the Houston area, um, how would they find you online? Oh, uh, we're at UptownDermatologyHouston.com. Okay, well, I appreciate your time. Thank you again to Dr. Elizabeth Mullins, board-certified dermatologist in the Houston area, helping us keep our mask knee to a minimum. Thank you again. Thank you very much. News now from Fox. Experience breaking news as it occurs. A front row seat to news happening right now. News now from Fox. I'd be pissed. If, I was, if I'm just Joe Voter, I would be pissed. I'm, I mean, to me, this is just incompetence. William Hartman is a member of the Wayne County Board of Canvassers. Here's what they do after every election. We do a, a canvas, and the canvas has got, it's like an audit of your checkbook. The problem with this last election, the August primary, the board certified the election, but had to note that in more than 70% of absentee voting precincts in Detroit, there were discrepancies between the number of absentee ballots cast versus the number recorded by election workers. When we started to balance the AV counting boards in Detroit, they were so messed up that there was really no way that we could balance them the way they were. Now, what are the biggest things that we could ask in the gen for the general election is that people come and sign up and register to be precinct workers or as they call election inspectors. The board is also asking Secretary of State Jocelyn Benson for an investigation into what went wrong, not only with the election process of counting absentee ballots in the city of Detroit, but also with the training for a task with long hours. I've got to tip my hat to all the workers that were there because I was there 22 hours and so were they. Bob Cushman was one of the ones sounding the alarm that there might be a problem in the location he was working at as an election challenger. After 2 a.m., all of the ballots that were processed, to the best of my knowledge, were never checked for the name and the other lesser checks that uh, are supposed to take place. The city of Detroit said they're reaching out to the Secretary of State and City Clerk to make sure this gets fixed immediately, adding, quote, we cannot have a recurrence of these problems in November. Secretary of State Jocelyn Benson's office also told Fox 2 in a statement, the Bureau of Elections will work with the city of Detroit to identify any errors that may have occurred in the processing of absent voter ballots and to implement any needed improvements to training procedures in advance of November. All of this happening in the backdrop of a U.S. Senate committee hearing in which the U.S. Postmaster General vehemently defended changes being made to the Postal Service. U.S. Senator Gary Peters from Michigan had this to say. Uh, and we've got to get to the bottom of it because we, we have to make sure that when uh, votes are cast, they're counted uh, accurately and can be verified. That's the very essence of a, of a fair election. Detroit's clerk Janice Winfrey has yet to respond to Fox 2 about the Board of Canvassers request or about what went wrong with absentee ballot tracking. The Secretary of State's office explained that what they're doing is not an investigation yet, but that's not ruled out. Hillary Golston, Fox 2 News. Less than 24 hours after postal workers picketed in front of the main post office in Detroit, 
U.S. Representatives Debbie Dingell and Brenda Lawrence from Michigan and U.S. Representative Robin Kelly from Illinois hosted a Zoom call for the media about Postmaster General Louis DeJoy's attempt to make sweeping changes to the United States Postal Service. After he made the announcement on Tuesday, the Postal Service in Grand Rapids moved the sorting machines out of the post office and destroyed them, destroyed them. So even when we passed legislation on Friday, Saturday that says you cannot do this, the machines that are being pulled out of these distribution centers are being destroyed. After a public outcry and accusations that the newly appointed Postmaster General was trying to undermine the Postal Service's ability to deliver mail just months before the presidential election, Louis DeJoy released a lengthy statement saying in part that he would halt changes until after the election and denied any wrongdoing, saying, quote, I came to the Postal Service to make changes to secure the success of this organization and its long-term sustainability. I believe significant reforms are essential to that objective and work towards those reforms will commence after the election. But in a year where a record number of Americans will be voting through the mail, a lot of people aren't buying DeJoy's explanation. My district, the second district, urban, suburban and rural, all three types of communities that make up our country. And I've heard from every single one of these different communities, they are frustrated and angry with the games that are being played by the Postmaster General and this administration. Congress has passed legislation that would prohibit the Postal Service from making any operational changes during the COVID-19 pandemic, while providing $25 billion in critical funding to support the Postal Service. During this pandemic, we can talk all we want about how important this election is. If we do not have a functioning Postal Service, it is going to be a direct impact on our ability to protect our democracy. Prior to becoming a lawmaker, Brenda Lawrence worked for the U.S. Postal Service for 30 years. Did you deliberately want to create chaos? Are you deliberately trying to slow us down? Um, so those are questions that we don't understand because there's usually a plan and the thought behind these type of actions. Americans deserve to have a postal system that they can count on every day. Camille Mary, Fox 2 News. Representative Alyssa Slotkin joins us now to talk about that postal funding and obviously a lot of concern right now about the scaling back uh, of the funding. Uh, what are you hearing from constituents? I'm getting a ton of calls into our offices um, and while obviously people are worried about their absentee voting and, and making sure they can exercise their right to vote, the phone calls that I'm getting that are the most urgent where people, you can hear the desperation, is folks who get their prescriptions um, and medical equipment through the mail. What are they telling you and what's happening with them right now? So uh, we hear a range of things. Um, we heard from a woman in Brighton, a couple in Brighton, where the, the man went for a procedure at, at the hospital in Ann Arbor, and only when he returned home did he get the letter in his mailbox 10 days late um, that said, here's how you need to prepare for your surgery, here's what you need to do, don't eat this, don't drink that. Um, you're hearing from people who, especially our veterans, who get their prescription drugs through the mail, especially our diabetics who are already overburdened with the price of insulin. So they, they go and try and find a, a cheaper price, often mailed to them. And if they can't count on a package coming, you know, and it's going to be potentially two weeks late, you can imagine the fear in people's voices when they don't know that they're going to have their life-saving drugs, right? Yeah, the president and many Republicans have made it clear that they're weary of mail-in ballots and and the accuracy of the election. But in the meantime, pressure has been mounting to restore funding and some of that public outcry has actually worked. So that's why I think it's really good that public pressure got the Postmaster General to reverse course. Um, a lot of these changes, pulling out of equipment, canceling of overtime is now being suspended. We need to know a little bit more about when it will, um, you know, are we returning that equipment? Can people now take their overtime? What? What's actually happening? And that's why these hearings are important. Let, let him say in front of everybody, the whole country, what he's doing and why he's doing it. Because it's taxpayer dollars, so he should have to account for that. When exactly is this happening? Yeah, the great news is he's agreed to appear in front of the Senate, um, including the ranking member, uh, Senator Gary Peters, on Friday. He's going to appear in the House on, I believe it's Monday of next week. And then in between, members of Congress, uh, uh, the House side, have been called back. I'm flying back to Washington on Friday. 
we're having a pretty unusual Saturday vote on um, making the post office whole financially. All right, we'll be keeping very close tabs on what's happening. Congresswoman Alyssa Slotkin, thanks for your time today. What's the problem with the mail? I don't know. And that's not the first time someone has complained about the mail coming late or not coming at all. Late and, and, and have a day we don't get none. See, and word of late mail or no mail is reaching high places. I've been hearing uh, folks all across uh, Michigan have uh, been contacting my office, uh, concerned that uh, mail is uh, taking a whole lot longer to, to get to them. But why? Now, Senator Gary Peters is launching a congressional investigation into post office delays, in part because, well, he wasn't getting any answers. Even though I'm the ranking member on the committee that oversees the Postal Service, they have not answered the, the questions we've been asking. Senator Peters says right. that the Postmaster General, Louis DeJoy, has failed to provide answers when pressed for details on delays following recent changes directed by the Postal Service leadership that could undermine delivery service during a pandemic or ahead of the general election. The changes that they're seeing, they've never seen before in their career. We look at our bills and stuff, they, they come late. Senator Peters says that his investigation is not designed to shut down the post office. No, I, I believe in the Postal Service. The Post uh, Service has been providing superior service uh, for over 240 years. The investigation could get partisan. Some Democrats accuse President Trump of trying to dismantle the post office in order to prevent voting by mail in the general election. I don't know if it's politics or what, you know, it's got to be something. If you have a story about poor mail service, Senator Peters wants to know. In Oak Park, Charlie Langton, Fox 2 News. I'm encouraging people to vote. Janice Winfrey is the clerk of Detroit, and she's given us an inside look at how Detroit is getting ready for this primary. So, how many people will vote absentee? Oh, uh, we'll probably count 50%. The clerk said about 110,000 Detroiters have already requested applications to vote. That's a record. And about 90,000 ballots have already been sent out. That's a record, too. Are you a ballot stuffer? I am. Now those ballots have to be put into envelopes and sent out by hand. And then they're returned and sorted by new high-speed machines. Right. Are you opening the envelope too in this thing? No, I wish. Our law doesn't allow us to do that. Those ballots will be opened and counted when the polls open 7 o'clock on August 4th. Do you have enough workers to count all the absentees? We hope so, Charlie. Now the clerk won't give us an estimate as to when absentee votes will be counted, but voters can still go to the polls. People want to know, mm -hmm. is it safe to vote at the election? Absolutely. These are for our sanitation stations, for the precincts. So they have wipes, they have thermometers, they have gloves, and they have masks. So everyone voting is going to have to have the temperature check, yeah. gloves, and sanitizers. That is correct. And, and masks, that. too. But some of the churches where voting was to take place were afraid to host the election. We're even doing drive-through voting where they don't, the voter really doesn't have to get out their car other than to just put that ballot in the tabulator. So if you're unsure about going to a polling place or you're unsure about the mail, because there could be some issues there. Use one of our drop boxes or drop it off at the vote center or drop it off here. Now, if this sign doesn't remind you to vote on August 4th, maybe this will. Don't forget to vote! Yay! In Detroit, Charlie Langton, Fox 2 News. News now from Fox. It's tear gas. Experience breaking news as it occurs. I have the driver now heading. A nonstop stream of compelling content and live events from around the nation and the world. Subdivision has been flooded. A front row seat to news happening right now. Several thousand strong. Watch news now from Fox right here. Marielle, I want to start with you. you. We're less than two months to November. Why are you still undecided at this point? I'm still undecided because as a woman, minority, small business owner, um, I'm looking for a candidate that can provide adequate relief for small businesses like mine um, that were disproportionately impacted by the crisis and a candidate that can put safe systems in place for travel domestically and internationally will win my vote. What is it that you need to see from President Trump and from candidate Joe Biden that could potentially sway your vote? I need to hear a sound economic plan. 70% of travel advisors are going to be out of business if in the next six months, if relief is not 
give in to these businesses. Small businesses like Marielle's travel agency in Maryland and so many others forced to shut down for months due to COVID-19 have been hit hard and now it's a matter of survival. Virginia undecided voter Joseph Cotarucci is a husband and father of three and owns a small health care business where he provides at home coronavirus testing for the most vulnerable. You come from a Republican household, but you told me that you voted Democrat recently. Why is that and why are you conflicted this time around? At that time, uh, you know, I was younger as well. I had different outlook on what was important to me. I haven't myself heard a sound plan for what is coming uh, for COVID and uh, not just social distancing, but getting the economy, economy uh, back on track. Um, I have not heard that from uh, Joe Biden or uh, President Trump. When it comes to coronavirus, some panelists say they don't know what to believe, and the false information on social media isn't helping. There's so much conflicting information. I, I just feel that there's this culture of fear that's propagated and that both sides use to push their you know, opinions. Mm -hmm. It's hard to know what the real facts are even for COVID-19 in terms of the statistics and how many people really get it. Is the incubation process two weeks? Is it one month now? And how can we keep our family safe? For the 97th night in a row, there was unrest on the streets of Portland. Demonstrations in the name of criminal justice reform and an end to systemic racism have turned violent and even deadly as Black Lives Matter protesters are clashing with police and Trump supporters. Portland is a beautiful city and I certainly haven't felt safe taking my uh, family down there for a while. Is that unrest? that you're seeing in Portland factoring in on why you're undecided. So I think everybody is looking at someone to be fair, but also strict. Uh, protesting is one thing, but destroying people's property, people's livelihood and businesses, that's, that's another thing. And so whomever would win my vote would need to make at least me feel safe, that they would be able to uh, help handle situations like that better better than they have been. While Portland is not a swing state and will comfortably go to Joe Biden, how these protests and violence are dealt with will be critical to voters come November. But the panelists say coronavirus and its impact is still top of mind, especially for undecided voters in the purple state of Virginia. What do you need to see specifically from these candidates to give you confidence to, to make the right decision come November? Well, I'd love to see some partisan action take place. You know, there's there should have been a second stimulus by now, but they're arguing about it and they are not getting anything done. And it's been weeks. And for Hirsch Sundu, who was leaning towards reelecting President Trump, a Kamala Harris choice for running mate is making him think twice about Joe Biden. It definitely moved it a little bit in his favor. Uh, before I would have had a zero chance uh, of voting for him. Uh, but it was either vote for Trump or don't vote. But now I'm taking a different, a more closer look uh, because I do feel that she might be, you know, a very strong candidate for vice president and potentially president of the future. News now from Fox. Oh, tear gas. Experience breaking news as it occurs. I have the driver now heading. A nonstop stream of compelling content and live events from around the nation and the world. Subdivision has been flooded. A front row seat to news happening right now. Several thousand strong. Watch news now from Fox right here. Well, Eric Trump is the executive vice president of the Trump Organization. Of course, he is the president's son as well. Eric, good to see you this morning. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks a lot for having me on, Ryan. So let's start with the conventions. You spoke at the RNC. Some polls have shown a bump for the president after the conventions. When you look back at those four days, what do you think influenced voters? Well, it was a beautiful four days. Obviously, it's a great honor of, you know, a lifetime to speak at one. I spoke at one in 2016. I think the difference, Ryan, is, you know, in 2016, you're speaking in front of a crowd of 30,000 people, and people are going crazy, and they've got the signs. And, you know, in 2020, you're really speaking to people in their living room. And so, you know, my tone was very different. And, um, and it was just a beautiful convention and, it, you know, a lot of red, white and blue. And, you know, you compare that to the, the DNC. I mean, they dropped under God in the Pledge of Allegiance at the beginning of the you know, Democratic National Convention. And, you know, you had a lot of career politicians up there. You had Chuck Schumer and Nancy Pelosi. And we had very few of those people. Uh, in fact, we had pretty much all of the, the other, which is, you know, real hardworking Americans from different industries who's talking about their experience under Trump and how he saved various industries. We had 
you know, lobster fishermen. We had loggers. I mean, I literally crossed the gamut. These are real Americans who bleed red, white, and blue, love this country, not, you know, political hacks who have been in the beltway for, uh, you know, their entire careers. Eric, as you know, political topics can change really quickly, and law and order is one of those, a huge campaign topic just over the last week or so. Could this issue ultimately maybe decide this election? I think so, because, listen, you know, people in this country love law enforcement. We certainly do as a family. But, you know, when you have Kamala Harris, who's calling, you know, law enforcement officers KKK and Gestapo, and when you have Biden, and, you know, a couple of days ago he came out, no, I didn't mean it, I didn't mean it. But when you have Biden saying he wants to take all the money from law enforcement, re reappropriate it to other programs, other social programs, and Kamala Harris has called for defunding police, and not once have they gone and stood behind, you know, police officers and said, listen, thank you for what you do. Thank you for keeping our community safe. In fact, they turn their backs on law enforcement officers every single day, and it's why you see the problems that we have in Portland, Seattle, and Minneapolis, and Chicago, and, and now in New York. It's all, you know, the left-wing mob, and it's, uh, they haven't been behind law enforcement. It's why my father's gotten endorsed by literally every law enforcement um, agency in the country, which, you know, they typically don't endorse. They're pretty much neutral. Um, but the way they've turned their backs on law enforcement, the names they've called law enforcement, um, even here, Ryan, in my own city of New York, you, you saw under Bill de Blasio, you know, NYPD officers were having bleach thrown in their face. They were having water thrown in their face. Um, no one ever stood up for them. And my father stands up for law enforcement. And he will never defund them. And um, America is behind the men and women in blue. He has talked a lot about law enforcement. What more can he do maybe to help what is a distrust in the black community? Can he can he be a bridge in that aspect? Well, I, listen, I think my father has been a bridge and, um, you know, uh, he's, he's been incredible, actually. You know, lowest African-American unemployment ever, lowest Hispanic unemployment. Um, you know, in fact, I, the minority communities in this country and um, I can't tell you how many, you know, we've 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 spoken to and how many have spoken out about this fact. Um, you know, I've all come out and said, listen, we want policing more than anybody. Uh, we want more police. We don't want less. Um, you know, policing keeps us safe. It keeps our community safe. But, you know, if you, between the lowest unemployment ever, criminal justice reform, Biden never did that. Biden talked about racial jungles. I mean, just go back and pull the clips for your audience. He talked about, you know, the racial jungles and, you know, um, you know not wanting to segregate schools and, um, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And, I mean, um, he has a horrible, horrible, horrible track record um, on racial issues. In fact, his running mate, Kamala Harris, talked about busing and how he opposed, you know, busing and he was a racist for doing it. And all of a sudden she'll stand by his side as soon as he, um, you know, he gives her the nod to be the uh, potential VP. But, um, you know, he's got a long checkered history and my father's done more for that community than anybody. Let's talk about COVID-19. You've certainly heard the critics. They blame the administration for its response. What's your response when you hear those claims? You know, I think we should all be really proud of America. I mean, if you just... Just look at other countries around the world. Look at the UK. The UK's economy was down 60%. It's actually 59.8% to be exact. You know, look at where America was. Right? America fell at its, actual, at its biggest trough. It was, you know, just under 30% of the US economy fell. Look where it is now, right? We've had 10 million jobs come back over the last 90 days. The S&P 500 is at all-time highs. The NASDAQ is at all-time highs. The Dow Jones is, you know, 1,000 points off of record highs. You know, I implore anybody, look at your 401ks. Open up your 401ks if you have one or your pension you know, plans if you have one. Open them up and see how well you're doing. And that's because of Trump. I mean, my father reduced taxes. Biden wants to increase taxes. Biden wants to raise your taxes by $4 trillion. You know what that's going to do for the U.S. economy? It's going to tank it. And, um, you know, we should be very, very proud. I mean, there's no question that, that you know, COVID punched the whole world in, in the face. And uh, I really believe my father will hold China fully, fully accountable. Um, but we've done a phenomenal job relative to any country in the world, what we did with protective equipment, what we did with ventilators. My father shut off travel to China earlier than anybody, and Biden came out and called him, you know, xenophobic for doing that. My father's done a phenomenal, phenomenal job with COVID, and uh, the world is bouncing back, and it's bouncing back than anybody could have ever imagined it would, any economist could have ever imagined it would. And we should be very proud as Americans that we had the backbone that this country had to, to weather the storm because no one's done as well as the United States. Eric, let's try and talk about Florida trying to bounce back. Now, the I-4 corridor, as you know, it is critical. And six months ago, Central Florida's economy was setting records, as was the U.S. economy. We're now, we're now we're struggling after the shutdown and the impact on tours. But I know the president and Governor DeSantis, they talk often about this. When do you think we'll see travel return, which is so critical for our area? Well, listen, we certainly want it, right? I mean, I'm in, I'm in the hospitality business. It's, it's certainly what, what everybody in the world wants. And um, everybody wants America to come roaring back to life. And you know what the good news is, is, is it is. I mean, I drove into New York City this morning and 
there were cars back on the road and there's people coming back into the offices and you know there's a renewed confidence in this country and it's it's phenomenal phenomenal to see and i was just in orlando two days ago i took the big trump bus through uh, all of orlando and you wouldn't believe ryan the enthusiasm that we had everywhere i was going people were honking people were giving us you know thumbs up they were waving there were signs everywhere and uh, there's tremendous enthusiasm for this for this president and my father as you know is going to be voting absentee in florida and i um, mean you know, he's a resident of florida and um, we're very proud of that but um we're going to win florida we're very proud of, of the area you're in right now we know orlando incredibly incredibly well and um florida as you just said florida has done phenomenally well i mean you guys are probably leading the economy of this country right now and the state should be very very proud of that and uh, that's going to continue. There are two quick questions I want to get to. There was a recent CDC report, I know you're familiar with it, 6% of American deaths listed COVID-19 as the only cause of death, 94% saying at least there was other one, if not two, contributing factors. So, so here's my question. We hear trust the science. We had two different doctors on this week. One declares COVID is deadly. The other says it's not fatal to healthy Americans. So your reaction to this is Americans try and kind of cut through the science and decide which doctor to believe. Well, listen, the CDC report was uh, pretty telling, right? 94% of people had a serious underlying condition uh, that passed away from COVID. And listen, make no mistake about it, COVID was incredibly deadly and it was unfamiliar and we knew nothing about it. And it hit the whole world like a, like a ton of bricks. There's, there's no question about it. I think the government handled it you know, incredibly well. At the same time, we're Americans. We have to get back to work. We have to get our kids back in school. Our kids have to get the education that they deserve. I mean, you look at Wuhan, China right now where COVID came out of and you know, they're getting together in massive crowds. They're all in school. They're all back to work. China's laughing at us. I mean, when, when you hear these governors of certain liberal states, including mine, saying, you know what, you might not want to send your kids back to school. You might want to do this. We might keep schools closed. I mean, they're totally forgetting what, what, what happens to the career of that mom or what happens to the career of that father who now can't go to work because they have to take care of their kids. What happens to our kids who can't, you know, socialize with other children? I mean, how far do they fa fall behind? And, you know, it goes on the list, but um, you have to get the economy back going, and my father is, and faster than anybody could have expected. You have to get our kids back to school. People want to start living their lives again, and uh, and they are. And we should be um, we should be really happy that uh, the world's coming back as strongly as it is. And so, listen, people need to make their, up their own minds on the habits that they have and what they do. Um, but it's really nice to see America coming back as strong as uh, as we are. It's interesting. We have a Chinese student living with us, and her family left her here through this because they wanted her education to be most important. I want to finish with politics here and family for you. Uh, politics are divisive. I don't need to tell you that. The comments are brutal. So how does the Trump family and the president get away from that when you're together and kind of leave this all behind? Yeah. I think, well, Ryan, it's hard to. It's hard to get yeah. away from it, right? I mean, we're attacked pretty viciously every day, and you see it. And listen, I'm a big boy. I stood on that stage, and I pray for my father every night. You know, when you stand up on the stage in the convention, um, you're, you're going to get hit, and, and frankly, you're fair game. I think what bothers me is when they go after Barron, a 14-year-old boy, when they go after my kids. And I have a daughter who's one years old. I have a son that's three years old. I mean, you post a picture of them, and they attack them savagely. And, um, you know, these people are disgusting. You know, so many of the people, it, it's just, it's, it's gross. And uh, that affects you more than anything. And, you know, we have shields. We have iron shields. You have to become, you know, um, emotionless, you know, meaning to the political process. And, and we certainly have been as a family and we understand it, you know, as a game as it is that it is. But, you know, there are savages out there on, you know, on the radical left that hey, you saw what they were doing to people as they were coming out of the, the convention the other night. They were attacking people. They were spitting in their face. Republicans don't do that. They don't. And you see them attack children on social media and other things. And it's disgusting. But, you know, we're tough and we're strong and we fight every single day. And we're going to we're going to win again because America has very little tolerance for that nonsense. Eric, that's, we're out of time. Really appreciate your time today, and thanks for talking about the issues with us. Yeah, thank you very much, Ryan. News now from Fox. Experience breaking news as it occurs. A front row seat to news happening right now. News now from Fox. Hi, everyone. I'm Frank Malikud. I'm an anchor reporter for KTVU Fox 2 here in the San Francisco Bay Area. My guest is the CEO of True Public. It's a Chicago-based mobile opinion platform, and they've done a number of surveys uh, while the pandemic has hit, including distance learning and a love survey for some of the younger folks out there. And uh, we're going to meet their CEO right now. That's uh, Kevin Clausen. How are you? Doing great, Frank. Thanks for having me. Good to have you. Well, let's jump into True Public. Tell our viewers what that's all about. 
Yeah, True Public is an immobile opinion platform where people all across America are sharing their opinions on politics, on culture, on their dating and love lives. And really, coronavirus has taken over the conversation on True Public, just like everywhere else, as people are weighing in, as they're all isolated on what's really going on in your life today. I know, just about every story we do, it's got a COVID edge. How can it not? Because sure. Affecting us all. Well, you did a survey not too long ago on distance learning, how parents are coping uh, with having their kids learn from home and how the students uh, are learning from home as well. And apparently, uh, neither parents or students are too uh, fired up about this. Tell us, uh, give us just a little outline. Yeah, I think, the, I think the headline is a lot of parents out there are going to have to brush up on their algebra really quick, Frank. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah. It's become, a, it's become a real challenge, I think, with e-learning. What we're seeing is 40% of young Americans today, these are high schoolers and college-age students that are now living at home with their families. They're saying their parents are able to offer zero help. Only 12% of young Americans say that their parents are a big help on their schoolwork. So one of the challenges as we've looked at this e-learning thing, this new normal of being at home when you're learning is who's there to help you without tutors, and without teachers there, we're noticing a lot of students having challenges. I think the other big number for you, the big headline is 70%, seven in 10 young Americans are saying, I'm learning worse now at home than I was uh, before when I was actually able to go to school. Well, that can't be good. I know parents are busy working from home themselves. Yep. And my co-anchors got three kids, one in junior high, one in high school, and, uh, and one in elementary school. And how do you do your job and keep track of them at the same time? It's got to be tough. It, and one of the biggest things about learning at home is there was no preparation for this, right? If we go back to when COVID first started, if you would have told me or I would have told you that we'd be canceling school in the fall, I think, I think that would have shocked a lot of people. So what we're having is, and we see these comments on True Public from not just students, but also parents as well. They were unprepared for the type of learning environment they need. So I do caveat that, that seven in 10 who are learning worse maybe that number gets better as a routine sets in and they start to realize, okay, here's how we're going to run our days. Here's when mom and dad can help. Here's when we can't. Cause you're right. Everyone's, these parents are, this is one of the most challenging times ever. They've got kids at home, they've got jobs, they've got other responsibilities, but the, what are the biggest distractions at home? There's two major ones. One is the environment itself is not conducive to learning. We see a lot of young Americans saying, look, Home is where I play video games. It's where I hang out with my friends. It's where I watch my favorite Netflix show. It's not where I'm typically learning all day. So it's really hard to have that temptation right there. And then also we talk about technology temptation. And I'm sure you and I and every person who's in, biz uh, in business in this country has done it. When you're on a Zoom call, sometimes it's tempting to go look at the news oh. or check Twitter, <laughs> yeah. right? And go check out something else. And what we're seeing is a lot of young Americans are saying, uh, yeah, I'm really distracted by these other options I have. And with no teacher there to hold you accountable, it's really easy to click over to another tab on your computer. Well, my niece is a kindergarten teacher in Northern California. She's got 25 new kindergartners, five-year-olds. I mean, how do you keep them lined up with Zoom going, okay, do that, all right, you know? They're gonna walk off and do whatever they want. It's incredibly challenging and what, what we've noticed though is interesting because with these learning outcomes being so bad so far, you think, okay, let's get kids back into school. And that is a, that is a prevalent uh, and increasingly prevalent opinion out there, right? We've seen a 15% shift actually over the last month and a half of people actually wanting to get kids back into school. That's a nationwide number. Now, much like, like much else in life today, Frank, there's a political divide. In states that are more conservative, they are much more likely to want to get kids back to school than states that are more traditionally liberal. But the common theme we're noticing is the health crisis has kind of gone above the uh, education crisis, if you will. But there's another one that's really interesting here, and that's the, the, the mental health and the happiness of young people. Uh, we've been really surprised about how hard COVID has been on the anxiety levels of young Americans. We've seen a 30% increase, 30% which we, statistically, we see that as a huge number at True Public of people saying, I'm more anxious today than I was pre-COVID. I'm dealing with anxiety on a weekly basis when I wasn't before. And a lot of that is around the disconnection they're having, especially college students. Mm -hmm. College students are at this amazing time in life. 
they're getting ready for a big career, they've got huge plans, and a lot of them feel like those plans are on hold, and a lot of them feel like they're being robbed of an incredible social season that they had, and it, it's all made worse by the fact that your tuition might be $40,000 a semester. And I hate to break it to them, but they're right. I mean, <laughs> going to school is, you know, meeting people, learning how to cope yep. with the situations and uh, learning those social skills that'll uh, propel you after you learn your academics uh, onto the other side. Um, one thing I, I think you guys found out as well, that kids are worried about their academics too, especially probably junior seniors in high school, like, well, is this going to get me into my college of choice? And that kind of thing. Yep. Yeah, I think it's now 57% who think that COVID's actually threatening their academic progress. So as, although they're saying they're learning worse, a lot of students still say, okay, well, I'll, I'll be fine. But it is now over half. So over half of young Americans are saying they're worried that COVID is actually challenging their progress to college or their progress to their next job. And I think that's meaningful and that's extremely stressful uh, in, in this season. And one of the things we're, we're noticing also is when it comes to these e-learning platforms, one of the biggest gaps here is these school systems, you know, they really haven't been prepared for this at scale. And, and a lot of those strains are starting to show. They haven't had best practices yet. So I think what we'll find is if COVID was to continue into further semesters and further months of in-person classes, um, there's going to have to be some technological solutions. Now, another interesting thing, Frank, about this is we ask people, what's your ideal schooling situation right now? You could do 100% e-learning. You could do 100% in school. Actually, the favorited solution by parents and students alike across the country is a hybrid approach. So you do a lot of e-learning, but then you have kids go into school on a off and on basis. And what that, what that does is it kind of splits the difference. It's, a, it's still safer for COVID. You'll have less spread potentially, but you'll still be able to give them some of what they're missing. And frankly, it's funny, when you actually look at the survey data, what are students missing the most? Lunch with friends. It's the simple things in life that are actually the things they're missing the most today is just going to lunch with some of your friends and having that experience. And that for many, that's been taken away. Yeah. Well, hopefully it's going to change. But uh, I think a lot of parents in the spring said, all right, we'll get through this. Summer's coming. We'll figure it out. And then lo and behold, August and September are here. And they're like, Oh, geez, I guess we're in this for the long haul. And I think yeah. school districts, too, were kind of thinking the same thing. We'll figure this out, but, you know. And it's causing conflict. 30%, three in 10 are saying, I'm fighting more with my parents around my schooling and around being home so much. So, uh, although we can always flip these numbers around and you could say, well, Kevin, 70% of kids are getting along with their parents just fine. I think that's actually kind of a positive story. I certainly... You know, in some ways, okay, only three in 10 are actually having more conflict. Well, that's not too bad because you can imagine there's, there's, there might be financial stress on the parents. There, someone could be sick in the home. There's so much going on in the world. And there's, a, there's, a, there's an election coming up. And one of the other interesting things we find out at True Public is parents and their young kids who might be students don't always agree politically. And that's another area of potential discord right now. All right. Well, let's shelve that for now. Let's jump into the love survey that you did sure. uh, with Gen Zers, I guess, and millennials, over uh, 12,500 people uh, took part in the survey. These are what, 16 to 35 year olds. And yep. are, we, uh, are we making connections or, or are people uh, wigged out about the pandemic? Well, well, love is totally changing. And really, how, how do you find someone in a romantic setting? Before, it was always bars, events, parties, concerts. Those are all out right now. So the big winner, frankly, has been the dating apps. The dating apps have exploded in growth. Dating apps have always been seen, Frank, as a very niche thing. They've always had a bad stigma as a place to meet low-quality people, maybe a place to hook up and have a casual relationship, but not a place to meet your future partner, your future husband, your future wife. Right. Now, what's happened is millions of young Americans have been forced to use dating apps for the first time to try to find someone. And what we're noticing in the data is they, this, there's been some businesses, so many businesses have been harmed by COVID. There's a few, though, that we've noticed at True Public that are going to be dramatically helped. One of them is those dating app companies, companies like Tinder, Hinge, Bumble. What they're finding is once people have been forced to go online, they're actually finding 
love there and finding, okay, it's not maybe ideal, but it's, it works. All right. So the apps are probably applauding this. Yeah. The apps are liking it. Yeah. Um, and or, and or the video call, the video call thing has been interesting because imagine like, what's the typical first date? Dinner, movies, maybe coffee, drinks. Um, today, a lot of first dates are video calls. 16% of people have already taken a first date over a video call and actually FaceTime someone uh, before they potentially could meet them. And that seems a little awkward potentially. And I think a lot of young Americans are not gonna go for that, but we're now seeing almost half are saying, if it came to that and COVID continues, I'm willing to do a first date over FaceTime or over Zoom. Imagine that. Well, what else are you gonna do? I can't, you can't yeah. go to a bar, you might as well give it a shot. And, yeah. uh, and that, you know, and a lot goes in to getting prepped for something like this, but if you're gonna meet someone potentially uh, for a relationship or, or a date or two. I mean, you're probably getting all nervous and just, is my background okay? Do I have the right clothes on? And all that yeah. kind of stuff as well. Yeah, yeah. Dating used to just be about what you're wearing, but now it's right. like, what's behind, what's behind your camera? You better get that tight too. So well, that, that's, been a, that's been fascinating to watch that unfold. I know a lot of people were, I'm obviously reporting from home, and I watch other reporters here in the Bay Area and I go, Oh, I went to the University of Colorado. I got a picture of my dad's uh, 64 Olds Cutlass back there. And uh, it's been up for a while. And uh, oh, I've beautiful. had, I don't know, probably a dozen people either uh, send me a tweet or an email like, hey, what kind of car is that, Frank? You know? So uh, it is yeah. a brave, brave new world, that's for sure. And they're always, they're always asking me which books am I reading. So I try to keep those. <laughs> Can you name those books behind you? Um, I, I've read them. I have read them. I can't okay. name them off the top of my head, but. <laughs> well, let's talk about sex if we can. Our, our... And we continue to always bring you the very latest here on news. Now we're going to go out to Polk County, Florida, right here, getting an update uh, from a shooting that happened. Unfortunately, it was fatal. Together. We learned at about 4 a.m. this morning from his friends that he dropped some acid, and that's their terminology. They used acid, and he just freaked out and left. He was wearing a pair of shorts, no shirt, and only had socks on. So he ends up in this this apartment complex and he's in the breezeway of a, an apartment complex when just prior to 6 a.m. this morning there's a there's a man walking his dog as he walks past he hears a guy going pow 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 and he looks and there's this 19 year old who is about five foot five and 125 pounds, according to the information on his driver's license, as if he's got a gun and he's making this noise, pow, 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 but he doesn't have a gun. So he speeds up. He, he walks faster. The guy comes out of the stairwell and grabs him on the shoulder. He turns around and shoves him down. And then he runs and goes up to his third apartment floor. He has a roommate up there and he tells them, hey, this guy just attacked me down here. And his roommate and he come out and they start looking for him. And our witness one, as we're calling him, who has the dog is dialing 911 to say there's a guy out here that's acting really crazy, really bizarre. And as they're looking for him, there is another couple that came out of their apartment on the second floor, and as they said, they went down to smoke. And they learned of this event that took place. So at that time, who is now our suspects, Brian Mideros, M-E-D-E-I-R-O-S, a white male, 
who's 25, goes down to his gun, car and gets his handgun, a Taurus, and he puts it in his waistband and covers it with his shirt. They finish smoking. He goes back up to the second floor, which is where their apartment is. And he tells his girlfriend or fiance to go inside. He hears noise on the third floor. And he goes up to the third floor and as he's on the landing, there's a landing on each side of the apartment complex. He sees the guy laying, our victim, Divine, laying flat on his back on the other landing. And someone's trying to talk to him. And it turns out that it is not the person with the dog, but his roommate. So the guy gets up and he goes on up to the third floor, our victim, Divine. Our shooter goes up, sees him there. He turned, the, the victim turns around and starts down the other stairwell. Well, our shooter comes down his stairwell, and then we see where our victim, Divine, is walking directly toward our shooter. And Un, even though he told his girlfriend to go inside, she's standing at the door, but now they see he's got his pants down. So if you can imagine this, our victim has his pants down to mid-thighs. It's clearly indicated he doesn't have a firearm. And he's walking directly toward our shooter, Brian Mitteros. Brian Mitteros then does something that's interesting. He pulls his gun and he shoots him. And when he shoots him, he says it has no effect and the guy's really close to him. So he said, I walk around him and I start past him and he turns around to follow me and I turn around and shoot him some more. And he's caught up with me, and then I walk past him again. And as I'm going down the staircase to the first floor, he follows me and he tumbles down behind me. And that's where he dies. Ladies and gentlemen, we have done an exhaustive investigation all day, and the investigation's not over. We have this law in Florida called Stand Your Ground. So the issue is, was Brian Miros standing his ground? At this initial point in the investigation, it clearly appears to us that Brian used too much force. The law talks about protecting yourself from imminent, yourself or others, from imminent death, serious bodily harm. The guy's five foot five. He's 125 pounds. He's bizarre and out of his mind and rambling. He's laying on his back part of the time, talking incoherently. But is he a danger? And to what level is he a danger? Well, the fear is in the mind of the shooter. The second issue we have problems with, in addition to using too much force based upon being able to see everything, he doesn't have a weapon, he doesn't have a knife, he doesn't have a gun, he doesn't have a stick, he's acting bizarre, he doesn't have a right to be there. But then instead of going into his apartment, he's not standing your, his ground, he follows and goes up to the third floor where he hears sounds. So he engages the guy when they both come back down the stairwell to the second floor. 
But had he simply gone into his residence, there would not have been a problem. So there was a lot of discussion about the stand your ground issue. At this point in the investigation, we can't articulate that he was in valid fear based upon the initial information we see. It's clear he didn't have a gun. It's clear he was out of his mind. It's clear that the shooter, had he initially came in contact with this guy, might have been able to articulate that more clearly. But at this point in the investigation, he walks past his, his residence and up the flight of stairs, or halfway up, he goes up to the landing where he can see onto the third floor, only to see our person on the third floor. And the person on the third floor, it's not like he's up there protecting someone else because there is no conflict or fight or confrontation of violence at that moment in time. So he's being arrested. He's going to jail tonight. I've said over and over and over, and I've said it to the news media over the years, I've said it at civic club meetings, people who do not under this, understand the stand your ground law will end up arrested because they misjudged what it means. And what it means is simply this, if you've got a right to be where you are and someone uses force or puts you in fear of that, then you're good to go. But he actually pursued the guy up a flight of stairs. So he wasn't standing his ground. He was following him up. It's a very difficult case for the state attorney's office, but certainly we believe there's significant probable cause that given the art, the the discussion on when you stand your ground, and we're, we're, we're saying, stating at this point in the investigation, he followed him up the stairs. He's not standing his ground. He's following him. He's looking for him to engage him. And number two, when the dude's got his pants down to his mid-thighs, it's evident he doesn't have a weapon at all. What the shooter didn't know that the man walking the dog knew, when the guy came on him and grabbed him by the shoulder, the man with the dog simply shoved him down. And if the guy had been that big a threat when he got to his apartment, why did he and his buddy come back out looking for him while he's trying to make a 911 call? He had bad reception in his apartment, but he and his buddy came out looking for him. This is a very difficult case, but here's what we know. We got a 19 year old kid with a criminal record. He was first arrested when he was 14 years old. He's got 10 felony charges. One a robbery at 14, some burglaries, some misdemeanors. So he's no angel. But we also have the shooter who has no criminal history but we can see at least two events where he's been involved in an altercation involving a firearm. In fact, he alleged that his brother was choking him and he shot his brother. Our shooter has shot another person. All of those charges ended up getting dropped, I guess, because family deal, maybe brother didn't want to prosecute. But then on another occasion, 
He and his brother were involved in an altercation with a repo guy, record driver, where there was a gun there. So we know that the shooter today has shot someone before and was not criminally charged. We know that there's a report that we've been able to find today that the shooter had another conflict involving a firearm with his brother. Don't know which one was holding the gun. We're suggesting that he didn't know what the law said. We're suggesting that he was outside the bounds of stand your ground. Any questions? What charges are you facing? We are still investigating the homicide charge that's appropriate to bring. It'll be someplace between manslaughter or second degree murder and they are discussing those charges at this time, but there will be a homicide charge brought against him today. And then we're investigating to see whether or not any other charges are appropriate. Is this the first case you have brought against somebody who accused them of misusing the Castle Bat doctrine or standard grounds? I don't know. I can't answer that. But I can tell you that we will work with the state attorney's office to complete this investigation but the evidence is obvious to me at this early stage of the investigation that there was too much force used and that instead of standing your ground, he was actually seeking the guy out. And at the end of the day, criminal record or no criminal record, he's a 19-year-old kid who was messed up on drugs and acid, according to his friends, and was acting horribly bizarre. And the end result was he died. He died of multiple gunshots. Do you know how many gunshots? Don't know yet. It was multiple gunshots. He was shot more than once. Has the suspect spoken with your investigator at this point? Yes. The suspect has cooperated and given us his statement as well as the witnesses. Did he bring up I'm not sure what he told them. That's the obvious issue here today. Is it stand your ground? Is it manslaughter? Is it stand your ground? Is it second degree murder? Our suggestion is at this point in the investigation, we have to look at the totality of the circumstances. And the totality of the circumstances are simply these. We got a 19 year old kid that shot multiple times and is dead. He was on drugs. He shouldn't have been in this apartment complex. But we don't see a level of violence that's articulated to my satisfaction that warrants the use of a firearm. And when the firearm was used, he had gone up pursuing or looking for the, the victim, the victim, and when he saw the victim come down to the second floor, he came back down to the other stel stairwell on the second floor, and as he's walking in, that's when the victim starts toward him, going pow, pow, pow with his fingers. But he has no gun. He's just out of his mind on drugs. But had he gone into the house, into his apartment, with his girlfriend like he directed her to go, even though she didn't, she stood outside the door, because curiosity. And then she went in and closed the door when she saw the guy coming down the gangway or the uh, breezeway with his pants down. I don't know if he understood the law or not, but I understand that this early phase of the investigation, it's clear to me. He used too much force, and he wasn't standing his ground. He was pursuing the guy. He was looking for him. I'm sorry, two questions. Um, I'm confused. Um, the victim or the suspect was the one with the background to shoot his brother? The, the shooter has the background of shooting his brother in a domestic event. Okay, and, the and the shooter also with 
that brother or another brother had an armed conflict with a repo agent. The victim, who was 19, had a robbery charge when he was 14 as a juvenile and some burglaries and some resisting and some misdemeanors. And today, he would have been trespassing on this property once we got there. But had everybody just waited for us to go there and arrive because no one was in imminent danger according to the initial information of our investigation. No one was in imminent danger. The one guy who could articulate that he was shoved the guy down and went up to his third floor apartment. And then he came back out with his buddy. So if the guy posed that much of a threat, I don't think he would have come back out. So the deputies were already en route to this complex while the shooting took place there? We were on our way there before the shooting took place because the guy who was walking his canine called us. And we were getting other calls when the gunshots rang out. Any surveillance cameras on the property to help uh, document your view? Do you feel you have reliable witnesses who saw this uh, or recognize the video? We have. We are looking for any surveillance cameras. There are none on the grounds of the, of the apartment complex, and we've not been able to find any to this point. If someone's got some, we'll take a look at it. Yes, sir? Just to clarify, the gentleman walking the dog is who saw um, Divine do the pow-pow battle? Both. When, when supposedly, according to our shooter, when he was coming down, he had his fingers out the second time. Supposedly. But that's after he saw him laying flat on his back being crazy on the landing. That's after our shooter walks past the door of his apartment, tells his girlfriend or his fiance to go inside and pursues and goes up to the landing and can see up on the third floor where our victim has now gotten up and gone to the third floor. There were people that were trying to talk to him. What's your name? What's going on? And he was babbling. We see no reason for him to, be, have, to have been shot to death at this early stage of the investigation. He's from Orlando. And all of his friends were from the Orlando area. And are they cooperating with the investigation as well? They have cooperated with the investigation. And we've also served a search warrant on their motel rooms. And we have arrested one for a violation of a curfew on a probation. We've seized some marijuana that needs to go to the lab, but they were very cooperative as well. Could you just repeat the, the, the suspect's full name for us one time, please? The suspect's full name is, I don't know if it's his full name, is Brian Mideros, M-E-D-E-I-R-O-S. 25, you said, sir. 25. Brian with an I or a Y? Why? Thank you. Oh, good question. <laughs> and how old is he? I'm sorry. Brian is 25. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, it, when, this is one of those events where, I'll, where I'll, the shooter will articulate that he's right. The investigative information that we determined early in this investigation. We don't see that. And Sheriff, I should say that this is one of the criticisms about the capital doctrine and the standard ground doctrine, but that it would be broadly misapplied, and anyone could shoot anybody at any time and claim self-defense. Does this case confirm some of those fears? No, no this, this case confirms just the opposite of that. I don't know what he was thinking, whether he was thinking stand your ground, but it shows you can get arrested when you think you're standing your ground and you're not. And that's what, that's what we're saying. 
not only do we believe he's not standing his ground, but he pursued the guy initially, but he used too much force because clearly the guy has no firearm, he has no gun, he has no knife, he's five foot five, he's a little bitty dude. So it's not like he had his hand in his pants, he made some overt statement, he said, I got a gun, I'm going to shoot. We're having a trouble seeing how he articulates that level of force at this stage of the investigation. There's a lot of work to do on this case, but I think the message is clear tonight. You can get arrested when you go shooting people. When in fact, my, su my suggestion is to stand your ground in my understanding means you're where you have a right to be and someone comes upon you with this force or threat of force in your mind at that moment in time. Not for you to seek out and go to a problem. You see, and that's my argument. He wasn't standing his ground. You can't run into a problem and then say, oh, I'm just standing my ground. No, no, you have a right to be there, but you ran to the issue. No, he's going to be arrested tonight. We, we, he's in our custody. He'll have first appearance tomorrow, and then he'll have the opportunity to make bond, and he'll either make bond or he'll sit in jail until the criminal justice system moves forward. Given these other shooting incidents, would you advise that this gentleman be held without bond up until the Wisconsin? That's not my. That's not my decision. I don't get to make that. There is a bond schedule but he will be detained until he goes before a judge where the court can determine, and he has a right to a bond, by the way. And his hearing will be tomorrow on Labor Day? He, he should have a first, uh, first appearance hearing if we get him booked in tonight before the cutoff time. Otherwise, it'll be Tuesday morning. Okay. How many felony charges you say um, the victim had? Ten? The victim had 10 felony charges and some misdemeanors, no convictions. All while were juvenile? I don't know if they were all juvenile, but the serious ones were juvenile. He was 14, he was five years ago on a robbery and some burglaries. I don't know if he had any serious ones as an adult, but he has no convictions. So the victim has no convictions. The suspect, the shooter has no arrest, but he's shot his brother in an event, and he and his brother's been involved in another event with a repo driver where a gun was displayed as well. And today it got him arrested. Not those events, this event. This will be an interesting case to follow through the criminal justice system because certainly you know what his lawyers are going to say. And what we are saying, and understand, let me underscore once again, this is the initial phase of the investigation. And we look at the entire circumstances before us at this moment in time and see no reason that he killed that 19-year-old kid. Okay? This morning. Oh, this morning. This morning, just before 6 a.m. Were there any drugs found in the room where they were staying? Because you said this guy was not. Yes. They, they, found, they found some suspected marijuana. It's got to go to the lab. And they didn't find any acid. But his friend said he used acid and then he just freaked out. I mean, he took off just with his socks and his shorts and no shirt. Sure, 
the charges will be homicide charges. And they are probably manslaughter or second degree murder. They are going through those through the statutes and comparing the initial information that they have at this moment in time. Understand, folks, that as is my custom with my transparency, we're giving you a lot of detailed information about an event that just happened a few hours ago. And we've been trying to sort this out all day long. And this is the best we know at this moment in time. Okay? Thank you very much. I just need the correct spelling of the dude's name again. The, the, the guy, the shooter. Uh, his. Congressman Hakeem Jeffries is the chair of the House Democratic Caucus. Well, I thank the senior senator from New York, Senator Schumer the next majority leader of the United States Senate for his tremendous leadership and once again bringing us together as a delegation uh, to stand strong on behalf of the state that we love and represent. I thank all of my colleagues uh, in the delegation for their continued fight as we all proceed with the fierce urgency of now to address the coronavirus pandemic. Each and every year, New York State sends tens of billions of dollars more to the federal government than we get back in return. All we are asking for at this moment of need is our fair share. Yes, we continue to subsidize other parts of the country, but we are a generous people here in New York. Yet in this hour of need, Funds should be distributed equitably to each and every state in the union. The Republican skinny coronavirus bill fails that basic test. It is like a heat-seeking missile aimed directly at the heart and soul of New York, and we will not let it stand. On May 15th, the House passed the HEROES Act, a three plus trillion dollar intervention to deal with the coronavirus pandemic in a way that meets the moment. The coronavirus pandemic is an extraordinary crisis. It requires an extraordinary intervention. That is what Chuck Schumer, the Senate Democrats and House Democrats would like to see for our nation. It's pretty simple. Given all of the pain, suffering, and death being experienced by the American people, almost 200,000 Americans dead, more than 100,000 small businesses permanently closed, over 6 million Americans infected by the coronavirus, over 50 million Americans at some point during this pandemic unemployed, pain, suffering and death experienced by the American people and Senate Republicans do nothing. And now they want to nickel and dime the American people. No money for state and local stabilization. No money for assistance to tenants struggling to pay rent or homeowners struggling to pay their mortgages. No funds to support our heroes who have been on the front lines. No money for the MTA where the House bill provides approximately $4 billion. I hesitate to call the Senate Republican coronavirus legislation skeletal because that would be an insult to skeletons. It's a complete and total abdication of the Senate Republican responsibility to help the American people. It is dead on arrival in the House, and thanks to Chuck Schumer's leadership, will be dead on arrival in the Senate. Let's come together to do the right thing, not just for New York, but for the American people to defeat the coronavirus pandemic. Stop hiding from your responsibilities 
Mitch McConnell, come to the negotiating table. The White House needs to come to the negotiating table. Let's get this done for the people. Thank you, Congressman Jeffries. And last but not least, representing Manhattan and the Bronx, Congressman Espiat. Thank you, Senator Schumer, for your fight, for your struggle for New Yorkers. And thank you to my colleagues uh, that are here in a fight for the soul of our country and pretty much the existence of our state and city. A hundred billion dollars for rental assistance and mortgage assistance. Now, we may have a moratorium, but at the end of the day, when that moratorium is done, the landlord's gonna be waiting for that check. People stop me every day. I represent the district that has perhaps the highest concentration of rent-stabilized apartment and a great number of NYCHA units, as does Lydia Velasquez district as well. And they stop me every day, and they tell me I'm backed up three, four, five, six months worth of rent. That's a half a year. I think anybody that's backed up two months worth of rent is in trouble to begin with. And so even though we may have a moratorium, we're looking at people that are back. They, some, some have stopped me in the street and tell me they can't sleep because they don't know where they're going to get the money to pay the rent because the rent is too damn high to begin with. And so this is critical for renters and also for mortgage assistance. A hundred billion dollars in the HEROES Act to help tenants and owners because at the end of the day they're going to have a problem meeting their obligations with the bank as well especially the small owners that's one nothing nada from the senate food stamps i see the food lines growing and growing to Going around the block, I was, I was with Senator Gillibrand, Senator Schumer the other day, and the line went around the block with moms and grandmas with their kids. Now, Congresswoman Meg and myself have, have, have been pushing for the ability to buy hot food with that, with food stamps. They don't even give us that. You can't even get a hot meal. Food stamps, the very basic food on your table. Nothing. Nada from the Senate. Small businesses. There's still monies in the PPP program. Our bill extends until December. What do we get from the Senate? Nothing. Nada. If a small business failed to get some money from the PPP program and they want to do it now, they can't do it. Last, the first week of August, it got shut down. Nothing. Nada. So we see uh, these basic uh, programs that are so critical to the well-being of Americans. I saw a program today on TV that said that, that by the time we're done with the pandemic, there may be as many as 500,000 deaths in the country. We're already approaching 200,000. Certainly before November, unfortunately, we'll have 200,000 Americans dead and millions positive from the COVID-19. And so the country needs help. A hundred billion dollars for rental assistance. We must do more for our small businesses. Food stamps, come on, food on the table. At least you'll be able to go to a restaurant and buy a hot plate of rice and beans. Estamos aquí. You know how we feel about rice and beans, Congresswoman, right? <laughs> We like him too. You like him too. He goes up to my district and has a lot of rice and beans. <laughs> and so, estamos aquí para apoyar el plan de la Cámara de Representantes que propone 100 mil millones de dólares para la renta, propone más dinero para los cupones de alimento y propone seguir ayudando a los pequeños comerciantes. Gracias. Again, the Senate plan, nothing, nada. Thank you. Well, thank you, all of my colleagues, for so articulating why the Senate bill is such a disaster for New York and for the country. Again, let me say, Mitch McConnell, take one of these red pencils, they're nice and sharp, add in money 
for state and local. Add in money for mass transit. Add in money for all of others New York's needs, food and housing and business, small business. And then maybe add in money for those things that New York needs and then maybe we can get together on a bill. But a bill like this, which is just done to check the box and not really get anything done, to take 12 Republican senators who are running for re-election and are in trouble and their constituents are crying out for help, isn't going to do the job, isn't going to pass, is a sham, is a fake, and the American people aren't going to stand for it, New York's not going to stand for it, and we are not going to stand for it. Questions, we're only going to take them on this subject because we had a long yes, Dave. The rest of the country, though, instead of talking about this right now in the last couple of days, last week or so, is talking more about law and order and rioting in cities all over the country. People want unity. People want us to come together. They know Donald Trump is dividing us. They know Joe Biden is unifying us. That's what we believe. Senator, what if you receive pushback on all of your comments today uh, from President Trump? What will be your reaction to Trump? Well, President Trump, one of the reasons he's in such trouble is he hasn't met the COVID crisis. Our bill meets the crisis. This is the greatest economic crisis in 75 years since the Great Depression. It's the greatest health crisis in 100 years since the Spanish flu. We need it. Their bill doesn't. President Trump doesn't. And that's probably the number one reason he is so far down in the polls. The American people want real help. When the Senate goes through the process of considering the GOP bill, it takes time. So it just feels like the back and forth has taken time. Well, no, no. That is not true. What took time is McConnell. The Senate passed the bill. The House passed the bill. In May. McConnell said, we're on, first he said, we'll see if there's a need for the bill. What planet was he on? What planet was he on? His people were dying, people were hospitalized, people were losing their jobs, people were losing their businesses, people were losing their money and getting kicked out of their apartments and not feeding their kids. What planet was he on? Then he said, let's go on pause. And he only came to, and he didn't even sit at the table when Speaker Pelosi, Mnuchin, Meadows, and myself started there. So for, for, for him to say that he's been here and where have we been is totally ridiculous, and everyone knows it. You've got to talk a little hot, louder. When you talk about cuts to food stamps, where does that leave us? Like, is there less money as opposed to last year when there used to be more? No, there's just greater need and no more money. Okay, thank you, everybody. Thank you, my friends. Good. Great job. Very good. Send a message to you. Keep it up, Chuck. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Take care. All right, good to see you. Senator Schumer. Yeah, can we get a picture of Kushner uh, to talk to you about the history that was made here at the White House today, and then they'll take a few of your questions. <clears throat> Thank you, Kaylee. Uh, uh, again, it was a, uh, a great morning uh, in the Oval Office uh, with uh, President Trump, President Vucic, and Prime Minister Hoti. Uh, we brought together, uh, through the hard work of, uh, of great diplomats, primarily led by uh, uh, Rick Rennell, acting at the President's direction, uh, Serbia and Kosovo, uh, and they've normalized their economic relations. This is a — the Serbia-Kosovo conflict has gone on for decades. Uh, they've been stuck, uh, unable to move forward for many, many years, and the President uh, uh, some time ago decided that we, try, we needed to try something creative, try something new, break the deadlock, and bring uh, — try to, to, to move forward with the peace process with Serbia and Kosovo. Uh, to, to have the Prime Minister of Kosovo and the President of Serbia uh, together in the Oval Office was something uh, — given the history of those two countries and given the history of the United States with respect to Serbia uh, and, and the conflict in the Balkans, is something that is, is quite remarkable. Uh, and to have this happen uh, just in the, uh, the shadow, uh, a few days after uh, Jared and I were on a, the, the flight from 
uh, Ben Gurion Airport to Abu Dhabi International Airport, uh, the first commercial flight between Israel and a Gulf Arab state. Uh, it, it shows the sort of momentum that's coming. One of the side benefits of the normalization of economic ties between Serbia and Kosovo was a, 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 uh, the establishment of diplomatic relations between Kosovo, a, a majority Muslim state, and the state of Israel. Uh, this is now uh, the second time in, in less than a month uh, that Israel has uh, made peace with and has normalized its ties uh, with a majority Muslim country. It's, uh, again, it's another uh, really uh, signal accomplishment uh, of President Trump. Uh, the, the fact that uh, this has happened uh, on the heels of uh, a, a peace agreement uh, with the Taliban in Afghanistan, uh, that it's happened uh, in response uh, uh, you know, on the heels of, of last year negotiating a peace, uh, uh, a ceasefire between the Kurds and the Turks. Uh, you're seeing a pattern here uh, of the president uh, being a, a true peacemaker, uh, and, and there's been plenty of criticism of the administration. But what's been interesting to me is as the president has undertaken these historic uh, initiatives uh, and, and brought together a team to perform. And, and deliver these accomplishments. Uh, others have, uh, have even tried to take credit. I was just watching uh, uh, the Vice President, without making a political comment, the Vice President was welcoming uh, these moves today. But the, the, these things could only happen under a Trump administration and, and under the President's uh, leadership, a peace through strength foreign policy and national security policy. He put the pieces in place, uh, and, and now we're reaping the, uh, uh, the peace dividend. And it's, it's happened to the Balkans, it's happened to the Middle East. Uh, and, and we have more to come. I'll, I'll leave some of that to, to uh, Senior Advisor Kushner to address in a moment. So uh, with those opening comments, I want to turn the, uh, uh, the time over to uh, uh, the Special Envoy for Serbia and Kosovo, the Presidential Envoy for Serbia and Kosovo, Ambassador Rick Grinnell. Uh, he'll have a few comments, and then we'll make ourselves available for some questions after uh, uh, Rick and Jared address you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Robert. Um, I know there's a lot of reporters who have worked a long time uh, in your industry. And for any reporter that has been working for more than 10 years, you will know this story. There was a terrible war. And this story has been lingering for decades. And so I really want to appeal to you all as journalists to dig deep on this story. This is one of those good news stories that I'm not asking you to do anything but look at the facts and look at really what's been happening here. We've been working very hard on this agreement for a long time. We had three agreements last year that went largely unnoticed by Washington reporters. And I just really have to say I think it's a shame when we, when we talk a lot about symbolism and we don't dig deep on these stories that last 21 years. What we've been able to accomplish here by pushing the two parties together is truly historic. The, the way that this came about is that the politics were stuck. Everybody knows that. We've been fighting and talking about the same thing for decades. They have been fighting about the same symbolism, words, verbs, adjectives. It's been a nightmare. And what President Trump said to me was, they're fighting politically about everything. Why don't we give it a try to do something different and creative? Why not try to do economics first and let the politics fall, follow the economics? That proved to actually be a formula that they were eager for. No one had been talking to them about this. We have an establishment foreign policy team in Washington, D.C. that literally keeps pounding the same meetings and issues over and over. I'm telling you that an, the only way that this agreement could have happened is from an outsider. All of the insiders in Washington said, you're not talking about recognition. You're not talking about this symbolic word. And what we tried to do is ignore that. And from an outsider perspective, go in and dig deep. I, I ask you to look at this agreement and see all of the details 
that have been hard fought negotiated that will move both economies and the entire region forward. This is economic normalization. It's a first step. I think the Europeans are going to be very happy. We've been on the phone a couple of times with the national security advisor in Germany, the national security advisor in France, to be to brief them. We briefed them on the strategy, and we are briefing them again today on the details of, of this agreement. This is something that I feel very strongly about. It will make Americans safer. It will make American companies more prosperous. This is a region that's been largely shut out because of a perceived conflict. Whether or not there's been a conflict, there has been a perceived conflict. European businesses and American businesses largely have refused to go in and grow in, the, in these areas. Now we will be able to open this up, whether it's in energy, water, construction of roads, railways, mines. These are all industries that are going to be opened up to European and hopefully American businesses to go in and help the people create an industry, which means creating jobs in the, in the region, but also U.S. jobs, jobs for Americans and American companies. The last thing I'll say before we turn it over to Jared, the people of Serbia and the people of Kosovo are ecstatic about this agreement and are very thankful that there was an outside administration to look at this situation and not do the typical political thing. If we would have done the typical political thing and listened to all of the really smart people at NGOs and think tanks here in Washington, D.C., we would not have this agreement. Take just a quick look at the criticism in the lead up to this of what we should have been talking about and what we weren't talking about. It's all been squarely in the same old political dialogue that was stuck. And I'm really thankful that President Trump challenged us to say, think differently. Think from an outsider's perspective. And that was the key to the whole thing. So I really urge you to look at the details and see and talk to the, the leaders in Kosovo and Serbia. Ask them how this came about. Ask them how the process went. And I think you'll see that this outsider perspective of doing things differently is what worked. Thank you, Ambassador Grinnell. An incredible job working through this historic agreement and Ambassador O'Brien. Um, this is just another uh, chapter that this administration has been able to write towards making the world a safer and more peaceful place. President Trump, when he ran for politics, was not a politician. He sees things uh, in a, through a prism that not a lot of politicians uh, look through, which is how can I truly do things that will make people's lives better, make people uh, find common interests and opportunities, and figure out ways to resolve conflicts that, quite frankly, uh, politicians have allowed to go on for far too long. Uh, today's breakthrough really is historic, and we have had so many historic things this week that uh, we shouldn't be uh, minimizing the significance of all the different things that happened. Uh, I started the week uh, with Ambassador O'Brien uh, in uh, Jerusalem, where we met with the Prime Minister and then took the first ever flight, commercial flight, from Israel to uh, United Arab Emirates. Uh, we broke uh, that barrier, which brought a lot of hope to the Middle East. And for the last years, I've been uh, listening to a lot of people tell uh, us and the administration all of the things we were doing wrong while we were looking at this the wrong way. And what the president's done is he's reversed now 20 years of bad foreign policy in the Middle East, where we've uh, allowed our country to get trapped in uh, in a lot of these wars that, quite frankly, uh, uh, you know, don't do much for our country. We have to make sure that we're keeping our country safe, and we need to figure out how we can get people in the Middle East. Uh, and in Europe to get along so that uh, we can spend our resources and our treasure uh, on building up our countries and building up our cities and helping our citizens. And uh, what you've seen through President Trump's first three and a half years is he's uh, ended, he's trying to end a lot of these endless wars, he's making peace agreements, he's bringing people together, and he's bringing our troops back home to America while figuring out how to get along with different countries and reducing the foreign threats that we have. Uh, second, this week, uh, obviously, we were in Saudi Arabia, and then Saudi Arabia announced uh, the historic opening of their airspace, which, again, brings people in the Middle East closer together. Uh, and then yesterday, Bahrain announced the same thing, that they'll be opening up their airspace 
uh, which again will allow flights and, and better commerce and interaction between peoples to happen in the Middle East in a much quicker way. Uh, today we announced another normalization with Israel, which quite frankly, a lot of the divide between uh, the, the anti-Semitism that we have in the world, the terrorism we have in the world, comes from the notion that people are divided and, uh, and leaders will exploit divisions and, and religious differences to try and keep people divided, to cause conflict, often to maintain power for themselves that they mask in an ideological way. Uh, this breakthrough, again, brings people closer and shows people in the world that anything is possible if we push for it. And again, fundamentally, President Trump believes that no matter who you are, no matter where you're from, no matter what country you're in, uh, all people want the same thing, which is they want the opportunity to live freely, live better lives, have economic opportunity, and live in peace. And uh, today, again, is another historic step forward that politicians have spoken about for, for decades but haven't been able to deliver on. And it's another uh, victory for this administration and really for the world. And so I want to uh, give my congratulations to the people of Serbia and the people of Kosovo. And, uh, and to the people of Europe and also to the people of Israel who will you know, reap tremendous benefits from this agreement. So thank you. Ambassador O'Brien, um, the U.S. government determined that Russians are seeking to, quote, undermine faith in the electoral process by spreading disinformation about the accuracy of voter data for expanded vote by mail. And President Trump has also said that states' voter data is not accurate. And he's telling people to not trust that their mail-in ballots are counted. So is the president helping Russia spread disinformation? Well, I think what we have with when it comes to elections and, and what the intelligence community has made very clear is that first you have China, which has the, the most massive program to influence the, the United States politically. You have Iran and you have Russia. <clears throat> These are all three adversary countries uh, that are seeking to disrupt our elections. Some of them prefer Biden. Uh, some people say some of them prefer, prefer the president. Uh, my position is it doesn't matter what these countries want, that any country that attempts to, to interfere with free and fair elections in the United States has to be stopped. Uh, we've taken unprecedented action. The president has taken unprecedented action uh, in funding uh, the, uh, the hardening of our election infrastructure, whether it's cyber uh, or otherwise. Uh, obviously, there are tremendous concerns about mail-in ballots. Uh, in the news every night, there seems to be another picture of uh, some apartment building in some city with thousands of ballots stacked up in the foyer of the apartment building or that sort of thing. Uh, so I think there are concerns about mail-in ballots. Uh, I think that, that, that those concerns are very different than being concerned about foreign adversaries trying to influence our elections. And we've made it a red line. We've made it very clear to the, to the Chinese, to the Russians, to the Iranians, and others that, that, uh, uh, that haven't been publicly disclosed. Uh, that anyone who tries to attempt to, uh, anyone that attempts to interfere with uh, American elections uh, will face uh, extraordinary consequences. But Russia said, but it, Russia said, I'm sorry. Uh, Ambassador O'Brien, a uh, question on Serbia and Kosovo, then I just have a follow up on that. Um, in terms of the, the two parties agreeing to freeze the recognition and de recognition campaigns, how long will that last and how important is it to the administration? News now from Fox. Experience breaking news as it occurs. A front row seat to news happening right now. News now from Fox. I shouldn't say aloud that Kosovo did make the decision uh, as a Muslim majority country to normalize its relations with Israel, uh, to recognize Israel, and to, to establish an embassy in Jerusalem, uh, in the capital of, uh, of Israel. And, uh, and uh, we, we appreciate the fact that the uh, uh, the the, Ser the Serbs not taking a position on that. So although we have de we're, we're going to have a suspension of the de-recognition campaign and the recognition campaign, it's two sides of the same coin, for the next year, uh, we were able to achieve, uh, uh, with the courage and bravery of the of the leaders of uh, President Vucic and Prime Minister Houthi and and Prime Minister Netanyahu, we were able to achieve this you know re very remarkable breakthrough. Again, the second time in in now a month, it took I think 40 years to have two. Muslim majority countries recognize Israel. Now we've had two Muslim majority countries recognize Israel uh, in uh, in less than a month. Uh, so it's a remarkable uh, achievement in the context of this this overall freeze that will give the parties space to negotiate a deal. Just to follow up on what Ben was asking you, Attorney General Barr said earlier this week that he feels China is being more aggressive in meddling in the election than Russia is. Do you agree with that assessment? Yeah, I, I agree with him 100 percent. And then I, I just want to follow up on that, and then I've also got a question about Israel. Um, can you just characterize at this point uh, the extent and the level to which both China, Russia, and other foreign countries are right now trying to spread disinformation about the 2020 campaign? 
Yeah. Look, it, it, it's it's hard to know, uh, you know, what impact they can have or how they're spreading things. I think some of our tech companies are doing a good job in, in trying to police, uh, uh, whether it's Facebook or Twitter or others, are trying to police things in a way that they didn't before. Uh, our intelligence community is doing a good job in trying to track these things. Uh, DHS, uh, Department of Homeland Security, uh, with, with increased funding from this administration, uh, is doing a good job in hardening our infrastructure to make sure that, uh, whether it's cyber infrastructure or or physical infrastructure to make sure that we're not susceptible to having our uh, the, the the choice that the American people make on election day changed by some foreign party. Uh, there's always going to be propaganda. There's always going to be efforts to to influence us. And again, we know that the Chinese have taken the, the most active role, but uh, but the Russians and the Iranians and and other countries are involved in well as well. So we're going to keep monitoring it, and we're going to do everything we can to protect uh, the sanctity of our election. That's the foundation of our democracy. That what's that's what makes us America, and we're just not going to tolerate. Uh, you know, these other countries trying to get involved in our elections. And the Oval Office, uh, an Israel question? Okay. Can I? Uh, sure, quick follow-up on Israel. Yeah, just, I want to um, make sure everyone gets a chance. The President had said uh, in the Oval Office earlier that there are other Arab countries that are also interested in following in the UAE's footsteps. Can you talk about where we're at on that process, what countries are, are interested you know, I'll in? I'm going to turn that over to Senior Vice President Jared, uh, who's just returned from the region and, uh, and may be able to give you some, some background there. Thank you. I'm not going to give as much background, but uh, bottom line is this. When we did the uh, Israel-United Arab Emirates deal, that caught a lot of people by surprise because of the diplomacy that we were able to do was to keep things private. Uh, obviously, we had some great discussions in the region, uh, and, uh, and we are hopeful that more people will want to move forward. I think a lot of the countries are uh, quite envious of the opportunities that will now be available to the, to the United Arab Emirates uh, in terms of mutual investments, mutual tourism, uh, uh, investing in technology, uh, security partnerships. So uh, we're seeing that uh, that peace agreement actually starting to really pick up a lot of momentum. And the delegations that uh, traveled with Ambassador O'Brien and myself had uh, very, very fruitful um, discussions. I think both sides were surprised to see the eagerness of the other side to move forward. And the level of, uh, of getting uh, agreements uh, adjudicated and completed is, is happening much quicker than people thought. Um, other countries, again, see uh, the benefits of having a, a Middle East and uh, that's that's united. And if you look at what President Trump uh, did on his first foreign trip, he went to Saudi Arabia and he outlined very clearly what his strategy was going to be, what he saw as the challenges. And uh, again, if you just go from that snapshot to now, three and a half years later, you have the Middle East where ISIS is defeated, Iran has been significantly rolled back, uh, the proxies that they've been funding that have been spreading terror and instability throughout the region uh, are, are, are much shorter on cash than they were before. Uh, he's brought uh, the different sides together. And, you know, one story that I think doesn't get enough attention is the fact that uh, in the last election, a lot that, of what we were talking about was the uh, the spread of, of extremism through the Internet and then also the funding of terror groups. And President Trump on that first trip set up two different uh, organizations in Saudi Arabia. One was the counter-terror finance organization that unified uh, a lot of the Middle Eastern systems with our Treasury Department, and we got more transparency than we've ever had. That significantly reduced the amount of funding that's gone to terror groups over the last three and a half years. Uh, the next thing we set up was the Counter uh, Extremism Center, which has been fighting the ideological battle uh, online and has been making really uh, a tremendous amount of progress towards uh, towards reducing uh, the misinformation that's been used to pervert a lot of the youth. So we're seeing a lot of progress in the Middle East, and I think a lot of countries at this point see it as, see it as an inevitability that they're going to have normal relations with Israel and that in order for people to live better lives, it's not dissimilar to Serbia and Kosovo, where you know, their leaders are coming together to realize that while there are differences, uh, you know, human beings want to get together, they want to have better lives and opportunity, and the more that the leaders in the Middle East, you know, put old differences behind, they're creating a new opportunity for a new Middle East and a bright future where people can live securely, uh, practice whatever religion they, they choose, uh, respect each other, and have economic opportunity, which is uh, critical towards people, you know, seeing a pathway to a better life. Thank you. This is actually for Jared. With two questions, I'll just combine them to make this easier. With the election coming up in two months, I'm curious as to how you feel about what you've accomplished so far, but whether or not you feel pressure to get more done before November. And secondly, because I know you would have been part of these conversations at the time, I do want to ask you about that Atlantic report that we saw today and how in a 2018 planning meeting for a military parade, the president reportedly said he didn't want amputees there. He said nobody wants to see that. Have any of you, but particularly you, ever heard the president talk like that? 
The answer is no. Look, it, what I find in Washington is, is strange is sometimes you'll have a couple unnamed sources and then the media treats that as a panacea and then you'll have, you know, 10 people on the record saying it didn't happen and you give no credence to that. Uh, that does not represent the way that I've seen the president uh, conduct himself. He has tremendous respect for the military, for our veterans. He's, uh, you know, again, the media tries to ascribe a different way, but you have to look at his actions and I think his actions have been incredible towards supporting the military, strengthening the military and strengthening uh, our veterans. But with regards to uh, your question on timing, uh, look, deals uh, deals happen when deals are ready. And, and I do think that, you know, you can't just come in, wave a magic wand and make impossible deals happen, right? People, you know, describe peace in the Middle East as something that's so, it's, it's less a deal than more of a saying for what is impossible. And it's taken a lot of building blocks that had to be moved, a lot of uh, untraditional moves. When the president moved the embassy to Jerusalem, uh, when he recognized the Golan Heights, when he got out of the Iran deal, when we did our economic conference in Bahrain, um, it's probably 50 decisions that the president's made that allowed him to uh, create a different course. And each one along the way, you've had people like the magazine you mentioned before criticizing his foreign policy, saying it wasn't strategic, it didn't have a plan. <clears throat> But again, you know, he's not a traditional Washington person, and the traditional Washington people have a track record of creating those wars that we have sent our soldiers to that have, you know, led to a lot of them getting, you know, killed or, or, or hurt. Um, and President Trump's been ending those wars and, and bringing his soldiers back home. And so uh, I would say deals happen when deals are ready, and the deal that you saw last week had nothing to do with the election. It had everything to do with the fact that you know, it's, 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 it's time for the president to start harvesting some of the accomplishments that he spent years building the foundation in order to achieve. And what I would say, too, is that if you look at, you know, the world, foreign policy is, is a big chess game, and you have a lot of pieces all over the board in different places, and the president's been masterful with the way that he's built different relationships, taken some pieces off the board, created different uh, issues in other places. And I think that he set the board up very, very well now to have uh, continued successes in the years ahead. So obviously the voters will decide uh, whether they give President Trump four more years, but if they do uh, give him four more years, I think you'll see that uh, Iran is in a, a much weaker position than they were four years ago. Uh, North Korea, we've, we've had obviously a much better situation they had four years ago. Uh, Venezuela is in a different situation. The Middle East went from a place that, you know, again, when President Trump got in, Libya was a mess, Syria was a mess, Yemen was a mess, uh, all of our allies felt alienated, Iraq was a mess, and you see a much different Middle East today than we had three and a half years ago. And that's not an accident. That's because President Trump has had uh, a good strategy and he's worked very hard uh, to, to, to manifest that. So now we're starting to see some of the fruits from his labor, uh, but I do believe that we'll see even more and more of that uh, as time goes on. So we're set up for more successes, hopefully in the weeks ahead, the months ahead, uh, but definitely in the years ahead to take Amer uh, President Trump's America First foreign policy, where he's making trade deals for the first time that are endorsed by our, our workers and our labor unions that are bringing jobs back home. Uh, he's representing our farmers, he's representing our ranchers, he's representing our manufacturers. Um, and he's also ending these endless wars and figuring out how to bring our soldiers home and, and fighting the threats from overseas so that Americans can prosper here at home. Let me just weigh in for one second on, on your uh, last question about the Atlantic article, uh, which I, I thought was really a, a, a sad article for, for any magazine uh, to have published. And while I wasn't in the meeting uh, that's, that's described there, I've worked for this president for two and a half years, first as a hostage envoy and for the last years as national security advisor. In both those jobs, I've had to, uh, uh, to meet extensively with the president on, uh, on military issues, whether it's a hostage rescue mission or uh, how we're going to deploy our troops uh, around the world. Uh, and, and I, look, I've had, I, in my current job, I have the sad duty of having to call him sometimes in the middle of the night if we lose a soldier, sailor, airman, or marine uh, in, a, in combat, which, which hasn't, fortunately has. All right, folks, we are waiting for President Trump news conference about 30 minutes away. Let's go out to Pennsylvania. Though we, we do have Joe Biden doing roundtable discussion out here. And represent our working employees. And as our commander in chief, I would hope that you would rescind those. Well, I will. Look, uh, first of all, thank you all for your service. I don't mean just... Uh, your service for labor, but your service to the country. How, what made you uh, decide you wanted to join the service? Um, it's pretty much, I, I, growing up, I, you know, I was born and raised in New York. It was very hard to find jobs. And that was, I, that was like one of my reasons too. But at the same time, I saw myself 
being a soldier at the same time. So I had, I already had the plan to do that. I wanted to serve. So I wanted to do three years. I liked the military service and I wanted to keep continuing my service. That's one of the reasons why I also stayed in. <laughs> but you were in Afghanistan as well as Iraq, yes, correct? I went to Iraq and Afghanistan. How long were you in Afghanistan? You were in oh, Afghanistan for a whole year, 365 days. Iraq also. What do what, what do your fellow soldiers talk about out there? Um, talk about back at home. Talk about families. Uh, you know, one of the things that they they talk about is how are they going to get out and start a fresh career? You know, doing something else. They run their own business. Uh, go to school, have a degree plan. And sometimes when they do that, when they go to college, some of those jobs are outdated. They can't get those jobs. And now they're sitting on a fence somewhere trying to find a different job or go back to school and have to depend on government loans to cover those costs. You, uh, do you think most of those guys are, and women are suckers? <laughs> no. I mean, it's, uh, is there any reaction to that? Have you, among, because you're in the National Guard now, right? Yes. Okay. Well, look, let me ask you a couple practical questions, okay? How did you find the Pipe Fitter Apprenticeship Program? Um, I was getting out. They, they had uh, transition programs for vets. It was a new program that started in Fort Hood, Texas. And I, that was the trade I wanted to uh, go into as a welder. And how do civilian employees... Uh, what don't they get about uh, the enormous talent veterans offer? I mean, is there a is there a concern that vet getting out doesn't know what he's doing or she's doing, or is there a, an appreciation of it? Um, it's a little bit of both because you gotta once you start a new career, you have to reset your mind and, and learn new ways because military and the civilian sector doesn't really always work, but some jobs they do always work, but construction. It's a whole different ball game. You have to, you know, take what you're learning from the guys that are experienced in those in those construction jobs. Uh, go through the whole training process, start a new beginning. And uh, tell me, the the AFG. Do you think you should be able to unionize? Right. Absolutely, sir. Well, so do I. Uh, you know, uh, how'd you find a way to? Uh, uh, get into the AFG, I mean, after you get out of the military? Well, I was union all my life as well. My father was a lifetime member of a National Steel Workers 1940 in Lewistown, Pennsylvania at a steel plant. Um, and so it was a natural evolution for me. As soon as I got into a civilian job where I was eligible to be in a union, I sought that out and joined the union, and that was 35 years ago. And what has been the impact of his executive orders? Well, um, it, there are a lot of impacts to it. Uh, we have to pay for any uh, office space that we use on a military installation to have a union office where bargaining unit members can come to. We have to get prior approval to use official time to meet with someone who has a problem that they need to discuss. And that official time has been truncated to the point that it's almost impractical to try to use it. And we're forbidden from using our official time to try to prepare someone for certain grievances and certain processes. We would have to use our personal time, off, off the clock time, and some locals, our local is fortunate in that we still have an office on the installation. Some locals, for instance, the one in, in, uh, at the Army Depot over in New Cumberland, um, they were forced to leave the installation altogether and rent someplace, someplace to have a union office. And so it varies by command how, the, how it has personally affected the locals. But overall, it has gutted our ability to properly represent our bargaining unit employees. You've been doing this a while. Long time, sir. 
74 years old. Well, I tell you what, you know, uh, you iron workers are all nuts anyway. Anybody who climbs up 13 stories and walks a 12-inch beam, you know, and, and then sits on the beam and has lunch, you know, you got to be crazy. But then again, you, it, you're prepared. it helps. It helps. All kidding aside, don't, tell me what you hear from your old colleagues that's most bothering them right now. Well, you know, I, I don't get to talk to too many of them anymore. But just getting out there and doing a day's work for a day's pay, this is drummed into us a long time ago, and today it's still like that. They're out there. They want to do a good day's work for a good day's pay. And uh, I, I just want to let you know, I am a coal cracker from Shemokin, PA. Shemokin, all right. <laughs> almost heaven, almost Scranton. <laughs> yeah, almost. <laughs> yes, sir, almost. Yeah, well. Um, Mr. Vice President? Yeah. Um, I, I also wanted to uh, earlier thank you for your help with helmets to hard hats with the national building trades, uh, which helps transitioning um, military into our apprenticeship programs. And as journeymen, uh, I, uh, I know you worked on that with us through the years. And to, to be blunt, I would say we have over 50,000 to 100,000 uh, ex-military in the building trades nationally. And, uh, you know, when someone's coming out out of uh, the military, they may have never applied for a job before. So, uh, you know, they don't know where to go or where to look. And programs like Veterans in the Pipe Trades or Helmets to Hard, hard Hats helps them transition. And uh, your help through the years of uh, your career has benefited uh, thousands of military uh, getting those good paying jobs where they get health care, they get a pension, and they retire with dignity. Uh, don't ask for anything extra. We just, you know, we pay for our own health care. We pay for our own um, pensions. And, you know, I'm concerned now with the pensions, uh, with the economy the way it is. And, and the number, of, we had 8,500 people laid off at the cracker plant in Beaver County uh, in one day. 8,500 people uh, because there was no uh, preparation for the pandemic. Uh, we're gearing back up a little bit at a time uh, with, with different kinds of standards and, and protocols than we had before. But just think, that was just one job in Pennsylvania where all those people had to go home in one day. 85. the first president in American history to uh, uh, end up, when he leaves office, having fewer jobs than when he took office. Not history, in the, in the last 90 years. Uh, and... Uh, you know, you got uh, um, you know, six more than six million people uh, infected with COVID. You're heading toward uh, the 200,000 above 200,000 range of people have died from COVID, and uh, he still has no plan. I mean, there's virtually no plan as to how to deal with it. And uh, you see what's happening uh, across the country. We're uh, you know we have more. We're averaging about 1,000 deaths a day. If you take the seven largest European countries and combine them, they have a population bigger than ours. And as of a week ago, they were averaging total 57 deaths a day versus 1,000 and with a population larger than ours. And so uh, he has just sort of waved the white flag on, on dealing with COVID. And he, all he wants to do is just, just reopen. But... The way he's reopening is causing us to, uh, you know, shut down. Look what's happening with schools right now. If you have kids trying to get them back in school right now, it's pretty tough. The, um, you know, uh, I, uh, it seems to me that there is uh, things can and should change because for the first time, unions are respected more for the first time than they have been any time in the last 50 years. Over 65% of the American people support union movement, support union growth. And so, you know, the only thing standing in the way of us getting for people to be in a position where they actually have the ability to make a decent wage is a uh, prevailing wage is, is, uh, is to make sure that we uh, remove the guy who's there right now. The fact is that, uh, you know, we're in a position where we can fundamentally grow this country just by 
no other reason, just investing in infrastructure, roads, bridges, canals, all the things we have to do, airports, that in fact could create thousands and thousands of good paying jobs at prevailing wage. And uh, he keeps saying he wants a, a uh, you know, an infrastructure plan. He said he wanted one in, you know, in 2016, 17, 18, 19. Now, he hadn't introduced a thing. What are we waiting for? Well, I, I, I don't think that you know, he, I don't think he has any interest in it whatsoever at this point. At least he hasn't shown any. One of the things that, uh, um, uh, Frank, is that uh, have, uh, how, how, how have unions helped people get through this pandemic? Um, you know, you, you know, what would be a big investment in infrastructure that, I mean, how, how much would it mean to your members if we were able to create what's estimated to be tens of thousands or actually several million jobs uh, that are needed now? I mean, we need to improve our bridges, our roads. We rank so, we're so low in our, in the safety. We're, in a position where, you know, there's no reason why, as President of the United States, you have control of a significant budget of taxpayers' money, taxpayers' dollars, where you're spending federal money hiring contractors to do things. Under my administration, it will be all made in America. Not a joke. If it's going to be used, taxpayers' dollars are going to be used to hire corporations to do things from you know, building roads to building bridges to whatever it is, it's going to have to have been made in America. Any product, steel, aluminum, anything used has to be made in America. And also the supply chain. You know, we, we now have under this president the, uh, you know, the, the largest trade deficit we've had uh, uh, in a long time. The trade deficit with Mexico is higher than it's ever been in, in history. And the uh, product trade deficit with the rest of the world is the highest it's ever been in American history. And that's because he's tried all these loopholes in the law to allow companies to get a tax break going abroad and hiring people doing things abroad. That'll, that'll end. And it will not be a violation of international trade agreements. That'll end in my administration. I mean, for real. It all will have to be made in America if it's a taxpayer dollar is being spent. But uh, tell me about the, uh, uh, the attempt on the part of corporations to prov provide their, quote, own apprentice programs. There was an effort to shut down you all, and uh, they're deciding they can provide the apprentice programs. Well, as it stands right now, there's, there's guidelines to make sure the people that enter an apprenticeship program actually get the training and end up graduating to a decent paying job uh, at the completion of their apprenticeship program. And the plan was to eliminate that, take, take all the rules, and let the corporation decide all the, all the angles on how they were gonna run their apprenticeship program. As it is now, there are requirements under federal law and state laws to make sure that people do actually get the training and it's not just a venue for low wages. Uh, we see a lot in corporate America where they want to have an apprenticeship program, and, and especially in the construction industry, to have people at 50% of the, the wage rate so they can have an advantage on bid day or cut their cost uh, in production. And this is problematic. And one, one of the big ones is uh, warehousing. Uh, you know, it's only a $15, $15 an hour job to start with, and then they want to have an apprenticeship program where they bring people in for seven fifty an hour, and then they just churn those people. They keep them until they get to be too expensive, and then they get rid of them. And, you know, it, it ends up that we have people just going through a cycle, and uh, the unemployment system gets drained as it is now, which has never been drained as far as it has in Pennsylvania due to uh, the lack of response of the president on the COVID issue. Uh, we have more, more debt than we're ever going to have uh, in my lifetime. And uh, that, that apprenticeship scheme that was being portrayed by the uh, Department of Labor out of D.C. was terrible. I think we had the most calls uh, and comments to uh, L&I on the regulations on that, that have, in the history of <laughs> calls on regulations. So 
You're absolutely right. Well, the reason that. why you guys get hired, you have the best training programs in the world. You're the best at what you do. I mean, in fact, you're the best at what you do. And uh, everything they've done uh, has been designed. Uh, you know, uh, the fact is that, uh, um, you know, Wall Street investors didn't build this country. Ordinary folks, middle class built it, and, the, and unions built the middle class. That's how we got to where we are and continue to try to hollow out the union movement, hollow out the middle class is, uh, is, is, is what's going on, been going on for uh, some time now. And uh, I promise you, if I'm elected, it stops. It stops. You're going to have the best friend Labor's ever had in the White House because you know, my dad used to have an expression and uh, when he had to leave Scranton because there was no work and moved away to Delaware to find work was that uh, he said, Joey, a job's about a lot more than a paycheck. It's about your dignity. It's about respect. It's about your place in the community. It's about being able to look your kid in the eye and say, honey, it's going to be okay. Well, the fact is that uh, there's an awful lot of people who don't think their kids are ever going to be able to reach the standard of living they had because of what's going on. And the House has passed legislation that the so-called HEROES Act that provides for significant help to allow people, first responders, whether they are docs or whether they're firefighters, police officers, whether they are whoever they are, the, the folks keeping the sewers functioning, uh, the, the, the people who make the system work and, uh, and provided the money to, for states to be able to pay them. You all know that states have to have a balanced budget. There's a reason why the federal government was designed not to have to have one, to be able to be a ballast for when things got really bad. We inherited one of the worst economies that existed when uh, the so-called financial collapse, it was the worst uh, recession, short of a depression in American history when Brock and I got elected. And he put me in charge of a program called the Recovery Act, and it provided for over $800 billion in stimulus. But what it did, I was able to spend $144 billion making up for states' deficits so teachers didn't get fired, so that firefighters didn't get fired, so police officers didn't get fired, so essential workers didn't get fired. All those folks out there that are busting their neck, keeping the groceries stacked on a shelf so everybody else can be okay. All those nurses and doctors taking their shots and, and uh, I mean, risking their lives to keep us going. Those firefighters that show up and don't ask, by the way, do you have COVID? They just take care of the problem. And uh, and so and he has uh, been spending too much time in his golf courses and his sand traps instead of uh, going out. I mean, for real, think about this. I've been around a while. I can't think of any president in the middle of a crisis like this. And there's been other crises, both foreign and domestic, that has not called in the leadership of the Republican and Democratic parties to the White House, to the White House, to the Oval Office to sit and work out an agreement. But there's no desire to work out an agreement here. It's just the ability to make sure that you he's able to do the minimum things that are necessary to make it look like he's trying. But he's not even had a meeting with him. And so a lot of people are hurting. A whole lot of people are hurting right now because and things we could be avoiding right now. And, uh, and I, I just, uh, I was going to say I don't get it, but I'm beginning to get it because I don't think he... It's not what he's about. He talks about this K-shaped recovery, meaning the, on the letter K, one part goes up. Okay? You know, when you're doing the K, you know, boom. Okay? The K is up. That's the stock market. As long as the stock market's doing great, everything's okay as far as him. But everybody else is getting clobbered. Everybody else is hurting. And, uh, and so I, I just think that... Uh, you know, the other expression my dad used to talk about, he said, you know, the only way to deal with power, the abuse of power, is with power. And the only power out there to counter the abuse or the extreme abuse of corporate power is unions, labor, the only ones who have the wherewithal to take it on. And that's why I think everyone, including public employees, should have the right to organize and make their case for what they are entitled to have, and what they're able to work, what they should be being paid, how they should be treated. And it's all about just, you know, basic fundamental decency. But I think we've got an enormous opportunity because the public is 
changed. You know, I'll say one last thing here, and then and you don't ask me any questions. You know, uh, um, all of a sudden, the last, uh, not all of a sudden, the last eight, ten years, things have changed in the following way. People, uh, hourly workers who thought unions were the problem, remember how unions were the issue? That's why we weren't. Well, you know, all of a sudden they found out you had, you had thousands of employees making an hourly wage having to sign non-compete agreements. So if you worked at Burger King, you have to sign a non-compete agreement. You would not go across town to McDonald's to try to get five more cents in your hourly wage. All designed to do nothing, just to keep wages down. You could not go. It's not like you had a secret uh, that was uh, consequential and you couldn't give away that secret because it's a high-tech industry to another industry you go to work for. These are people making an hourly wage, just doing just their, just their job. And they were told they couldn't even bargain for themselves, let alone have a union do it. And uh, I remember going up to when, uh, well, I won't go into it, but the point is all of a sudden they figured it out. And then all of a sudden they figured out, too, the reason they got overtime pay is because of unions. Because look at all the overtime was being cut from people who weren't union members. They reclassify you as management. That if you worked in a grocery store and you control the man or woman who brought out the cart that had all the all, all the spaghetti sauce on it, you were management. You you control that cart. I mean, literally. And that's what people realize that this abuse has caught up with them. And uh, and this economic crisis caused by his failure to deal rationally. With COVID, not even acknowledging it, I mean, look, it's going to, you know, warm weather is going to make it go away. It's going to be like a miracle. It's going to be passed. I'm going to have a vaccine for you quickly that everyone's going to be fine. You know, it's just, uh, it, it's, it's all about refusing to deal with the problems that affect ordinary, hardworking people. And uh, I think one of the ways back is to considerably strengthen the union movement. But you guys have any questions for me about anything at all? I would just like to thank you. I'd like to thank you for all you've done for unions in general through your career. And Pennsylvania, um, I mean, if you, and you know Pennsylvania, if you go to Erie now, there's no new jobs in Erie. There's no new jobs in Scranton. There's no new jobs anywhere except for maybe some warehousing jobs or a few uh, delivery jobs now because people can't go to restaurants. But if you take all the people that are on unemployment and then out all the people that ran out of unemployment and then take all the people that can't get either or just, you know, going day to day, that number is a lot greater than what they're showing on, on TV. Especially those who've had to move to part time and have their wages cut. They're not considered unemployed. They're just considered they're employed. But guess what? When you get your wage cut in half, it's awful hard to pay for the new tires when you have four ball tires on your wife's car or your husband's car. When you, in fact, uh, have your wage cut in half, it's always awful hard to figure out how you put all the meals on the table. It's going to be all right. Or, I mean, how many people have discussions in suburban neighborhoods where they're sitting down saying, who's going to tell her she can't go back to the junior college? We can't afford it. Who's going to tell him that he can't do the following? We can't do such and such. I mean, these are the discussions that took place in my living room, my kitchen growing up. And now they have to be there. And there's an answer to it. The money's been appropriated. The money's been appropriated. But the, but the Senate, you know, uh, Mitch McConnell, that Republican leader, said, let the states go bankrupt. Well, that's really cool, right? Let the states go bankrupt. But the point is, I think that the American public is beyond it. I think the American public knows the dereliction has taken place and knows that, uh, you know, we, uh, um, we have a president who doesn't seem to understand the notion of service. Uh, you know, I, I just, uh, I, I just, I don't know, the idea that you guys have served and my son who spent a year in Iraq and before that six months in Kosovo and
All right, and that is a wild now video that we are showing you right there, but that is Joe Biden wrapping up there in uh, Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Live look at the White House here, everyone, where we are expecting in uh, just about eight minutes, President Trump doing a White House news briefing. Of course, we will bring that to you in its entirety when it happens. Also, let's go out now to Wisconsin. We do have Vice President Mike Pence speaking at that battleground state. Beyond that, the lowest unemployment rate ever recorded for African Americans and Hispanic Americans. At the end of our first three years, more Americans were working than ever before. And let me just say with with him present here today. None of that would have been possible without the strong and principled support of Senator Ron Johnson. Wisconsin, would you join me? Get on your feet and show how much you appreciate a man that's been fighting for Wisconsin values and fighting for Wisconsin jobs. Thank you, Senator Johnson. Our strong allies in the Congress, like your son, we created the greatest economy in the world in three short years. We made America great again. And then the coronavirus struck from China. The people of Wisconsin deserve to know that before the first case of coronavirus spread from person to person, within the United States. President Trump took the unprecedented step of suspending all travel from China before the month of January was out. And I can tell you, having led the White House Coronavirus Task Force, that action alone saved untold American lives. And it bought us invaluable time to stand up the greatest national mobilization since World War II. At the President's direction, we marshaled the full resources of the federal government and the American economy. We partnered with private industry to reinvent testing. When I took over the task force in late February, we'd done no more than 8,000 tests total nationwide for the coronavirus. Today, with American ingenuity and high relief, we perform more than 800,000 coronavirus tests a day. We work with private industry to arrange for the production and the delivery of billions of supplies of personal protective equipment to our great doctors and nurses and hospitals all across America. We saw to the delivery of those supplies at the point of the need in one city after another where the impact was the greatest, where the challenge was the greatest. And I will tell you here in Wisconsin all across America, Every American should be grateful for our doctors, our nurses, and our health care workers and our first responders who have risen to the challenge in this hour of our time. Now, our hearts go out to all the families who've lost loved ones during the course of this pandemic, including more than a 1,000 families here in Wisconsin. I want to say to each and every one of them, You've always been in our hearts, and you'll remain in our prayers. But we're going to continue to move forward, continue to develop medicines each and every day that are saving lives across the country. More therapeutics are becoming available each and every day. And I promise you, we're not going to rest. We're not going to rest until we have a safe and effective coronavirus vaccine for the American people, and we put this virus in the past. It's amazing to think with Operation Warp Speed, the President initiated a project where, believe it or not, we have several vaccines that are already in the final stages of clinical trials. But we're not waiting until they're approved to produce the vaccines. At the President's direction, we're actually manufacturing vaccines even as we speak, so that the moment that the FDA says that we have a safe and effective coronavirus vaccine, we'll have tens of millions of doses available for the American people. I have to tell you, Joe Biden said not long ago that 
no miracle is coming. But here in America, we're in the miracle business. And we're going to have a safe and effective vaccine for the coronavirus before the end of this year. So we're slowing the spread. We're protecting the vulnerable. And we're saving lives. Each of us has a role to play. But in the midst of this pandemic, our president also worked with leaders in both parties in Congress and with Senator Johnson in particular to secure support for American families and for American businesses. It's amazing to think we were able to secure nearly $4 trillion in support to American families and enterprises. And the Paycheck Protection Program alone is estimated to have saved some 50 million American jobs. But I promise you, Wisconsin, we're going to continue to put the health of America first. But because of the strong foundation that President Trump poured in those first three years, and because of the unprecedented aid that we secured for families and businesses, after losing 22 million jobs at the height of this pandemic, we've already seen more than 10.6 Americans go back to work already. The American comeback has begun. In the last four months alone, we've literally, literally seen half of the Americans that lost their jobs go back to work. And that, that includes 200,000 Americans right here in the state of Wisconsin. So we're opening up America again. And we're opening up America's schools. Just last week, we spoke to educators around the country, leaders of uh, colleges and universities around America, to make sure they had the support and the guidance to be able to safely reopen their schools. People all across the country are working to safely reopen our K-12 schools. I'm proud to report to you that school teacher I've been married to for 35 years is already back in the classroom teaching art at her elementary school. And I want to say thank you. I want to say thank you particularly to the Dairyland employees who leaned into this effort to get our schools back open. On the plane on the way here, I learned that a lot of you volunteered at, at an area school to build plexiglass barriers. You removed furniture to make our classrooms safe for our kids. Thank you for being there for our kids and our teachers and our schools. Great job. Great job. Larry. So we've gone through a time of testing, but we're coming through it together. Hardworking people of Wisconsin deserve to know. As we go through this time of testing, we're soon coming to a time for choosing. And the choice has never been more clear. It's amazing to think that in the middle of a global pandemic, Joe Biden wants to raise taxes by $4 trillion. And President Trump, for our part, not only cut taxes for working families and businesses large and small, but as we speak, we're letting the American people keep more of what they earn. And I promise you, we're going to keep fighting for tax relief for working Americans every day. Where President Trump signed more laws cutting federal red tape than any president in American history, Joe Biden wants to bury the American economy under an avalanche of red tape, like his own version of the Green New Deal. And here at Dairyland Power, you deserve to know that Joe Biden and the radical left want to crush American energy and American energy jobs. They want to pass a, their climate change agenda and cap and trade that would cost, that would raise the cost of electricity for nearly every household and business in Wisconsin. President Trump, for his part, unleashed American energy, an all of the above energy strategy. As we stand here today, the United States is now a net exporter of energy for the first time in 70 years. We're energy independent. When it comes to free and fair trade here in the heartland, we all remember NAFTA. Over in the Hoosier State, after NAFTA was signed into law back in 1995, 
We saw entire communities shuttered. And literally in the years since, 60,000 factories closed across the United States, and many of those jobs moved south of the border and overseas. But I saw this president work to keep the promises he'd made to the people of Wisconsin. He said we could do better than that. We could fight for the kind of free and fair trade that put American jobs and American workers first. He drove a hard bargain. And I'm here to tell you, the USMCA is a win for Wisconsin workers and a win for Wisconsin farmers. <laughs> Under the U.S.-Mexico-Canada agreement, now Canada is also ending its unfair treatment of our dairy farmers. So important here in Wisconsin. The USMCA is actually expected to increase our dairy exports by more than $300 million in the next year. That's a win for Wisconsin. The experts also tell us the USMCA overall will create about 600,000 new jobs just right out of the gate, including 50,000 manufacturing jobs. You know, I heard that Joe Biden's running mate is in Milwaukee today. The dairy farmers in Wisconsin deserve to know that Senator Kamala Harris is one of only 10 senators to vote against the USMCA. She said it didn't go far enough on climate change. And here at Dairyland Power, you deserve to know, Senator Harris put their radical environmental agenda ahead of Wisconsin dairy and ahead of Wisconsin power. But under President Donald Trump, we will always put Wisconsin farmers, Wisconsin businesses, and Wisconsin families first. President Trump's leadership at NAFTA is yesterday, and the USMCA is here to stay. Beyond trade with our neighbors, this president also stood strong. Stood strong with regard to China from day one. President Trump made it clear that the era of economic surrender is over. When we took office, literally half of our international trade deficit was with China. And president Trump acted. We imposed strong tariffs on China. We took action to end steel dumping. It was hollowing out our steel industry and manufacturing in this country. And every single day, we continue to stand firm, demanding that China, demanding that China open up their markets, respect American private property, and play by the international rules. Joe Biden, he's been a cheerleader for communist China. He actually wants to repeal all the tariffs that are leveling the playing field for American workers. And recently, he actually criticized President Trump for suspending all travel to China at the outset of the pandemic. So I'll make you a promise. Whatever the other side wants to say or do, President Donald Trump and I are going to keep standing strong for American workers and American jobs until China comes to the table, lowers trade barriers, respects American properties, and levels the playing field. Because when the playing field is level, American workers can compete and win against any workers anywhere in the world. Finally, on this Labor Day, as we think about labor, think about the cost of labor. It's one of the reasons why President Trump has made record investments in border security. As we stand here today, this President is already overseeing the construction of more than 300 miles of a border wall on our southern border. And we've been enforcing our immigration laws all across America. I mean, the truth is that illegal immigration drives wages down. People know that. One of the reasons people of Wisconsin ought to be concerned, Joe Biden, is for open borders, sanctuary cities, free health care for illegal immigrants that will continue to bring low-cost labor into our cities and our towns, undermining the wages of American workers. And in addition to enforcing our immigration laws and standing firm, 
with the conviction that a nation without borders is not a nation. President Trump has also launched what we call the Pledge to America's Workers. We're encouraging businesses in every field to expand training opportunities for American workers, and it's already led to 16 million training and apprentice opportunities for American workers all across the country. That's why we call that future ready. So we stood strong. We stood strong for a safer, more prosperous America. We stood firm to make sure that those that are meeting the needs, the families that are challenged in the midst of this pandemic have the support and the resources, have the care that every one of us would want their family member to have. We stood up for our values, and stood up for American families. And on this Labor Day, American workers can be confident you have a champion in President Donald Trump. President Donald Trump, I can tell you firsthand, having served with him every day over the last three and a half years. He's the real deal. The man who says what he means, means what he says. Never backs down. And I can tell you, he's never stopped fighting for the working people of Wisconsin. But for all that we accomplished in those first three years, for all we've done to see our nation through this time as America's begun to stand up again, go back to work and back to school. That's just what President Trump calls a good start. And I promise you, I promise you that we're never going to stop fighting for working people all across Wisconsin and all across America until we bring this state and this nation back bigger and better than ever before. So thank you for the warm reception today. And I'm very thankful it's not that warm today. It's a beautiful day in Wisconsin. Good to be with all of you. More importantly, thank you for thank you for what all of the hardworking families gathered here and those that might be looking on do for this country every day. And President Trump and I believe that all honest work is honorable that it's really been the people who make things, who grow things, who work with their hands, with the sweat of their brow, in the factory, in the field, that have made this country what it is today. I mean, it's been the hard work and the strength of working Americans, men and women like all of you here, people who believe in faith and family and patriotism and hard work, people who believe in the American dream, that have always and will always be the backbone of this country. So on this Labor Day 2020, I encourage you to keep pressing on. Keep showing the strength and the faith and the resilience that working people have always shown in the life of this nation. Keep standing with us. And I promise you, we'll keep standing with you. And finally, have faith. Have faith in the strength and resilience of the American people. The ability of hardworking Americans to see our nation through this challenging time and come all the way back and then some. And have faith that even in these challenging times, those ancient words that Americans have clung to throughout the generations are still true today. They're above the mantle in our home. There they've been for more than 20 years. From the book of Jeremiah, chapter 29, verse 11. Have faith, as he said, I know the plans I have for you. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. The future belongs to America and to hard-working Americans. And our hope is in him, in this one nation, under God, with liberty and justice for all. So with faith in all of you and faith in him, I leave here today with renewed confidence 
We're going to make Wisconsin and America stronger and more prosperous than ever before. With President Donald Trump in the White House, with great leaders like Senator Ron Johnson serving Wisconsin, and maybe future leaders like Derek Van Orden finding his way into public life. With your continued support and with God's help, on this Labor Day, I just know we're going to make America great again. Again. Thank you all very much. God bless you. God bless Wisconsin. And God bless America. Happy Labor Day. And that was Vice President Mike Pence there in Wisconsin, battleground state there. Live look right now, right outside of the White House, where we are expecting President Trump at any moment to do a news conference. And, of course, we will have that for you uninterrupted and in its entirety. We do appreciate you joining us here today on this Labor Day. I'm your host, Mike Page. Always great to be here with you. So we saw Vice President Mike Pence. While we do wait for President Trump, let's take out to Pennsylvania, where uh, Joe Biden just wrapped up a community meeting with some union members. You would rescind those. Well, I will. Look, uh, first of all, thank you all for your service. I don't mean just uh, your service for labor, but your service to the country. How, what made you uh, decide you wanted to join the service? Um, it's pretty much, I, I, growing up, I, you know, I was born and raised in New York. It was very hard to find jobs. And that was, I, that was like one of my reasons too. But at the same time, I saw myself being a soldier at the same time. So I had, I already had the plan to do that. I wanted to serve. So I wanted to do three years. I liked the military service and I wanted to keep continuing my service. That's one of the reasons why I also stayed in. <laughs> but you were in Afghanistan as well as Iraq, yes, correct? I went to Iraq and Afghanistan. How long were you in Afghanistan? You were in Afghanistan for a whole year, 365 days. Iraq also. What do what, what do your fellow soldiers talk about out there? Um, talk about back at home. Talk about families. Uh, you know, one of the things that they they talk about is how are they going to get out and start a fresh career? You know, doing something else. They run their own business. Uh, go to school. Have a degree plan. And sometimes when they do that, when they go to college, some of those jobs are outdated. They can't get those jobs. And now they're sitting on a fence somewhere trying to find a different job or go back to school and have to depend on government loans to cover those costs. You, uh, do you think most of those guys are, and women are suckers? <laughs> no. I mean, it's, uh, is there any reaction to that? Have you, among, because you're in the National Guard now, right? Yes. Okay. Well, look, let me ask you a couple practical questions, okay? How did you find the pipe fitter apprenticeship program? Um, I was getting out. They, they had uh, transition programs for vets. It was a new program that started in Fort Hood, Texas. And I, that was the trade I wanted to uh, go into as a welder. And how do civilian employees... Uh, what don't they get about uh, the enormous talent veterans offer? I mean, is there a is there a concern that vet getting out doesn't know what he's doing or she's doing, or is there a, an appreciation of it? Um, it's a little bit of both because you gotta once you start a new career, you have to reset your mind and, and learn new ways because military and the civilian sector doesn't really always work, but some jobs they do always work, but construction. It's a whole different ball game. You have to, you know, take what you're learning from the guys that are experienced in those in those construction jobs. Uh, go through the whole training process, start a new beginning. And uh, tell me, the the AFG, do you think you should be able to unionize? Right? Absolutely, sir. Well, so do I. Uh, you know, uh, how'd you find a way to? Uh, uh, get into the AFG, I mean, after you get out of the military? Well, I was union all my life as well. 
My father was a lifetime member of a National Steel Workers 1940 in Lewistown, Pennsylvania at a steel plant. Um, and so it was a natural evolution for me. As soon as I got into a civilian job where I was eligible to be in a union, I sought that out and joined the union, and that was 35 years ago. And what has been the impact of his executive orders? Well, um, it, there are a lot of impacts to it. Uh, we have to pay for any uh, office space that we use on a military installation to have a union office where bargaining unit members can come to. We have to get prior approval to use official time to meet with someone who has a problem that they need to discuss. And that official time has been truncated to the point that it's almost impractical to try to use it. And we're forbidden from using our official time to try to prepare someone for certain grievances and certain processes. We would have to use our personal time, off, off the clock time, and some locals, our local is fortunate and that we still have an office on the installation. Some locals, for instance, the one in, in, uh, at the Army Depot over in New Cumberland, um, they were forced to leave the installation all together and rent some place, some place to have a union office. And so it varies by command how, the, how it has personally affected the locals, but overall it has gutted our ability to properly represent our bargaining unit employees. You've been doing this a while. Long time, sir. 74 years old. Well, I tell you what, you know, uh, you iron workers are all nuts anyway. Anybody who climbs up 13 stories and walks a 12-inch beam, you know, and, and then sits on the beam and has lunch, you know, you got to be crazy. But then again, you, it, helps. it helps. It helps. All kidding aside, don't, tell me what you hear from your old colleagues that's most bothering them right now. Well, you know, I, I don't get to talk to too many of them anymore. But just getting out there and doing a day's work for a day's pay, this is drummed into us a long time ago, and today it's still like that. They're out there. They want to do a good day's work for a good day's pay. And uh, I just want to let you know, I am a coal cracker from Shemokin, PA. Shemokin, all right. <laughs> almost heaven, almost Scranton. Yeah, almost. <laughs> yes, sir, almost. Yeah, well. Um, Mr. Vice President? Yeah. Um, I, I also wanted to uh, earlier thank you for your help with helmets to hard hats with the National Building Trades, uh, which helps transitioning um, military into our apprenticeship programs. And as journeymen, uh, I, uh, I know you worked on that with us through the years. And to, to be blunt, I would say we have over 50,000 to 100,000 uh, ex-military in the building trades nationally. And, uh, you know, when someone's coming out out of uh, the military, they may have never applied for a job before. So, uh, you know, they don't know where to go or where to look. And programs like Veterans in the Pipe Trades or Helmets to Hard, hard Hats helps them transition. And uh, your help through the years of uh, your career has benefited uh, thousands of military uh, getting those good paying jobs where they get health care, they get a pension, and they retire with dignity. Uh, don't ask for anything extra. We just, you know, we pay for our own health care, we pay for our own um, pensions. And, you know, I'm concerned now with the pensions, uh, with the economy the way it is, and, and the number of, we had 8,500 people laid off at the cracker plant in Beaver County uh, in one day. 8,500 people. Uh, because there was no uh, preparation for the pandemic. Uh, we're gearing back up a little bit at a time uh, with, with different kinds of standards and, and protocols than we had before. But just think, that was just one job in Pennsylvania where all those people had to go home in one day. 85. Be the first president in American history to uh, uh, end up, when he leaves office, having 
fewer jobs than when he took office. Not history in the, in the last 90 years. Uh, and, uh, you know, you got, uh, um, you know, six more than six million people uh, infected with COVID. You're heading toward uh, the 200,000, above 200,000 range of people who have died from COVID. And uh, he still has no plan. I mean, there's virtually no plan as to how to deal with it. And uh, you see what's happening uh, across the country. We're, uh, you know, we have more, we're averaging about 1,000 deaths a day. If you take the seven largest European countries and combine them, they have a population bigger than ours. And as of a week ago, they were averaging total 57 deaths a day versus 1,000 and with a population larger than ours. And so uh, he has just sort of waved the white flag on, on dealing with COVID. And he, all he wants to do is just, just reopen. But the way he's reopening is causing us to, uh, you know, shut down. Look what's happening with schools right now. If you have kids trying to get them back in school right now, it's pretty tough. The, um, you know, uh, I, it uh, seems to me that there is uh, things can and should change because for the first time, unions are respected more for the first time than they have been any time in the last 50 years. Over 65% of the American people support union movement, support union growth. And so, you know, the only thing standing in the way of us getting for people to be in a position where they actually have the ability to make a decent wage is a uh, prevailing wage is, is, uh, is to make sure that we uh, remove the guy who's there right now. The fact is that, uh, you know, we're in a position where we can fundamentally grow this country just by no other reason, just investing in infrastructure, roads, bridges, canals, all the things we have to do, airports, that in fact could create thousands and thousands of good paying jobs at prevailing wage. And uh, he keeps saying he wants a, a uh, you know, an infrastructure plan. He said he wanted one in you know, in 2016, 17, 18, 19. Now, he hadn't introduced a thing. What are we waiting for? Well, I, 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 don't, think that, you know, he, I don't think he has any interest in it whatsoever at this point. At least he hasn't shown any. One of the things that, uh, um, uh, Frank, is that uh, have, uh, how, how, how have unions helped people get through this pandemic? Um, you know, you, you know, what would be a big investment in infrastructure uh, that, I mean, how, how much would it mean to your members if we were able to create what's estimated to be tens of thousands or actually several million jobs uh, that are needed now? I mean, we need to improve our bridges, our roads. We rank so we're so low in, our, in the safety. We're in a position where, you know, there's no reason why. As President of the United States, you have control of a significant budget of taxpayers' money, taxpayers' dollars, where you're spending federal money hiring contractors to do things. Under my administration, it will be all made in America. Not a joke. If it's going to be used, taxpayers' dollars are going to be used to hire corporations to do things from, you know, building roads to building bridges to whatever it is. It's going to have to have been made in America. Any product, steel, aluminum, anything used has to be made in America. And also the supply chain. You know, we, we now have under this president the, uh, you know, the, the largest trade deficit we've had uh, uh, in a long time. The trade deficit of Mexico is higher than it's ever been in, in history. And the uh, product trade deficit with the rest of the world is the highest it's ever been. In American history. And that's because he's provided all these loopholes in the law to allow companies to get a tax break going abroad and hiring people doing things abroad. Uh really a very special time I had speaking to some of the uh, labor union heads and other people. They're very happy with the way things are going. As you probably see, the numbers are terrific. So we uh, called some people, wished them a very happy Labor Day, and they told us how they're doing. And we really celebrate the American worker. We are in the midst of the fastest economic recovery in U.S. history. 
So we have a lot to be thankful for, including this really beautiful day. So I thought we'd do this outside as opposed to in your more normal place. The United States experienced the smallest contraction of any major Western nation. You probably know that. Uh, you look around and see how we're doing compared to every other nation. And uh, our rise is spectacular. And we're rebounding much more quickly from the pandemic. The U.S. economy added 1.4 million jobs last month. We've added a record-setting 10.6 million jobs since May. 10.6 million jobs since May. That's a record that is not even close. Uh, second place is a long ways away. In July, the Congressional Budget Office was projecting unemployment over 10.5 percent through the end of 2020. So they thought 2020, and maybe it would be a lot longer than that. Some projections where you'd go through the entire year, and uh, that includes uh, a lot of months in the following year, 2021. And instead, the unemployment rate plunged, really to the surprise of many, all the way down to 8.4 percent 8 in August. And that's the second largest single month decline on record. And we have the first. We have both of them. So we have the uh, two number one declines. Decline meaning positive, not negative. We're currently witnessing the fastest labor market recovery from an economic crisis in history, world history. By contrast, Biden presided over the worst, the weakest, and the slowest economic recovery since the Great Depression. It was a, it was a long, slow slog, and it was a very small — very small on growth and very small on every other factor that you need. It was the weakest recovery. Under my leadership, next year will be the greatest economic year in the history of our country, I project. And uh, some people are starting to agree. We have a V shape. It's probably a super V. And you see what's going on with the stock market, where it's, uh, in certain cases, already setting records. The NASDAQ has set 17 records already. And this is as we're hopefully rounding the final turn in the pandemic. Uh, first, we'll end the pandemic under Operation Warp Speed. We've pioneered groundbreaking therapies, reducing the fatality rate 85 percent since April. Uh, you don't hear that from the press very often. Uh, they don't like to talk about that. So the fatality rate, 85 percent. Think of that since April. The United States has experienced among the lowest case fatality rates of any major country in the world. And uh, we are uh, an absolute leader in every way. Under my leadership, we'll produce a vaccine in record time. Uh, Biden and his very liberal running mate, the most liberal person in Congress, by the way, is not a competent person, in my opinion, would destroy this country and would destroy this economy. Should immediately apologize for the reckless anti-vaccine rhetoric that they are talking right now, talking about endangering lives, and it undermines science. And what's happening is uh, all of a sudden you'll have this incredible vaccine, and because of that, fake rhetoric. It's a political rhetoric. That's all it is, just for politics, because now they see we've done an incredible job. And in speed, like nobody's ever seen before, this could have taken two or three years. And instead, it's going to be <laughs> it's going to be done in a very short period of time. Could even have it during the month of October. So contrary to all of the lies, the vaccine, that they're, they're politicalized. They're, they're, they'll say anything. And it's so dangerous for our country, what they say. But the vaccine will be very safe and very effective, and it'll be delivered very soon. You could, you could have a very big surprise coming up. I'm sure you'll be very happy, but the, the people will be happy. The people of the world will be happy. Next, we'll return to unprecedented prosperity through our pro-American policies. We'll pass new tax cuts to boost Take home pay. We're going to be cutting taxes very substantially. We get it back through growth. We had tremendous growth until we got hit with the China virus. We'll continue our historic regulatory reduction campaign. We've, as you know, in three and a half years, we've cut more regulations than any other administration, no matter how long, no matter what period of time you're talking about. We'll enact fair trade deals. 
And we're working on seven major fair trade deals right now. And when I say fair, fair to our country, because our country is ripped off by every nation. Friend, foe, didn't matter. Every nation was ripping us off at a level that it's just unbelievable, to be honest. We're going to be expanding opportunity zones, and uh, we will uh, keep that going. It's been a tremendous, a tremendous program. I want to thank Senator Scott, South Carolina, for coming up with that whole concept, because he came up and I liked it right away. And it was — it's really turned out to be a tremendous thing, especially for African Americans, Hispanic Americans. We'll continue to unleash American energy. We're number one in the world. And we're totally energy independent right now. And in 2021, we'll create 10 million jobs at least in the first 10 months. Joe Biden, the radical socialist Democrats, would immediately collapse the economy. If they got in, they would collapse it. You'll have a crash the likes of which you've never seen before. Your stocks, your 401ks. Remember, it's the people that own these massive listed companies. A lot of people, rich people and not-so-rich people and middle-income people, and those stocks will crash like you've never seen before. The Biden plan begins with a $4 trillion tax hike, and that will end everything, including growth. There won't be growth. There'll be total contraction. Biden's also pledged to demolish the U.S. energy industry and implement the same policies causing blackouts in California. He wants to have things lit up with wind. Now, he'll have to talk to China, Russia, uh, India, and lots of other countries, because they're not doing that. And if they're not doing it, uh, it puts us at a tremendous economic disadvantage, and it doesn't work. You take a look at the blackouts in California. It's really rather amazing what's going on there. They've tried to go, and that's just with a small portion going that route. That doesn't work, and it can't fire up our big plants. If we're going to have this great industry that we've created. can't fire up our big plants. Biden's plan for the China virus is to shut down the entire U.S. economy. He's going to totally rely on somebody to walk up. Yes, sir, it's time to shut it down. He'd be laying off tens of millions of workers and causing countless deaths from suicide, substance abuse, depression, heart disease, and other very serious illnesses. Because when you do a shutdown, there's a problem on the other side. It's not just from the virus. You have a big problem with suicides, with losing your jobs, with all sorts of things that uh, you just take a look. Depression is a massive problem, and uh, what happens is you — they turn to substance abuse, alcohol, drugs. So we can't do that. And then we'd have to give up all the gains that I've been talking about over the last three months. We've — what we have done is incredible. We're setting records all over the world, no matter where you go. Nobody has done what we've been able to do. So we're setting records in jobs. We're setting records in numbers. And you're going to see some very big numbers. Third quarter numbers are coming out right before a very special day, November 3rd. So you have the numbers coming out. And they're, uh, I think, going to be fantastic. You know, I think they're going to be fantastic. The best numbers of all, if somebody doesn't come along and raise taxes, double, triple, quadruple your taxes, will be the numbers from next year. But you're going to have a good third quarter number coming out. And uh, I think it's going to be hard for even the media to disparage that number. Biden wants to surrender our country to the virus. He wants to surrender our families to the violent left-wing mob. And he wants to surrender our jobs to China, our jobs and our economic well-being. I've taken in billions and billions of dollars from China. No other president's done what I've done. I've given much of it to the farmers. I've given it to farmers and manufacturers. But I've given most of it to the U.S. Treasury. Nobody's done that. We haven't taken in 10 cents from China ever. They targeted our farmers, and I targeted them. And I gave $28 billion to our farmers. Our farmers wouldn't be existent right now. Right now, they're very happy. In fact, they're setting records on purchases. China is purchasing more corn than they've ever done. Record purchase of corn and soybeans, beef, because they know I'm not happy with them. They know I'm not happy at all. And frankly, uh, I don't want to set the world necessarily to thinking too much about it right now. But there's been no country anywhere at any time that's ripped us off like China has. We lose billions and billions of dollars for years and years, decades. We've lost 
billions and billions and billions of dollars by dealing with China. We get nothing from China. They get nothing other than loss, other than giving our money, and they take that money and they build their military, and you see they're building up a powerful military. And it's very lucky that I've been building ours up, because otherwise we'd be dwarfed right now by China. It would be a terrible thing, a terrible thing. We're way ahead on the nuclear front. We've upgraded our nuclear hope to God we never have to use it. But we would be in a position that we are not in right now. But China is spending the money we give them to build up their military. So when you mention the word decouple, it's, uh, it's an interesting word. Uh, so we lose billions of dollars. And if we didn't do business with them, we wouldn't lose billions of dollars. It's called decoupling, so you'll start thinking about it. You'll start thinking. They take our money and they spend it on building airplanes and building ships and building rockets and missiles. And Biden has been just a pawn for them. He's been so easy, they dream about Biden. There was a report today that they hope that uh, Joe Biden becomes president. If Joe Biden becomes president, China will own the United States, and every other country will be smiling also. They'll be smiling. When reports come out that certain countries don't really like me too much, that's not because of my personality, although it could be that also, frankly. It's because of the fact that I've been very tough on countries that have been ripping us off for so many years. If you look at NATO, with the exception of eight countries, we're one of them. Every country is way behind their delinquent, especially Germany, in paying their NATO bills. That means we end up paying it, and we're not doing it. I told them, we're not doing it. And they've increased their spending now, 130 billion, going up to $400 billion a year. It's all because of me. Then you hear the country doesn't like me. I mean, I can understand that, because President Obama and other presidents, in all fairness, would go in there and they'd make a speech and they'd leave. I went in there, I looked, and I said, this is unfair. We're paying for NATO. We're paying for NATO, almost all of it. So they rip us off on the military, and then they rip us off with the European Union on trade. And Biden doesn't have a clue. He, you know he doesn't have a clue. Everybody knows he doesn't have a clue. In prime time, he wasn't good. And now, it's not prime time. He spent 47 years sending American jobs to China, to Mexico, and to other countries while collecting millions of dollars in campaign and super PAC contributions from global corporations that got rich by making American workers poor. His son, where's Hunter? Where's Hunter? I call him Where's Hunter. Uh, walked away with one and a half billion dollars to manage, even though he never did that before. He walked away with a fortune from Ukraine, from China, and from other countries between his son and his brother. He ought to read the statements, and the press doesn't pick that up. If I ever did that, it would be, uh, it would be hell even worse than it's been, okay? Even worse than it's been. What he's done is so incredible. I won't give them the billion dollars, he says. I won't give them unless they get rid of that prosecutor. And then, voila, they got rid of the prosecutor. And the press doesn't even want to talk about it. You talk about quid pro quo. With me, there was none. With him, he's right on tape, and you don't want to cover it. You should be ashamed of yourselves. The press should be ashamed of themselves. But Biden shipped away our jobs, threw open our borders, and sent our youth to fight in these crazy, endless wars. And it's one of the reasons the military, I'm not saying the military is in love with me, the soldiers are. The top people in the Pentagon probably aren't because they want to do nothing but fight wars so that all of those wonderful companies that make the bombs and make the planes and make everything else stay happy. But uh, we're getting out of the endless wars. You know how we're doing. We defeated 100% of the ISIS caliphate. 100%. When I was in, when I came in, it was a mess. It was all over. They have it in a certain color, all ISIS. A year later, I said, where is it? It's all gone, sir. Because of you, it's all gone. Because of my philosophy, but be all gone. I said, that's good. Let's bring our soldiers back home. Some people don't like to come home. Some people like to continue to spend money. One cold-hearted globalist, betrayal after another, and that's what it was. Biden supported NAFTA. He supported China's entry into the World Trade Organization. Two 
disasters, the most disastrous trade deals in history, both of them. I, I can't tell you which was worse. They were both terrible. And as you know, I ended it, and uh, I ended NAFTA. And we're looking at the World Trade Organization. They've become much better, I will say that. Uh, we, uh, World Health, I got out of because we're spending $500 million. China was spending $38 million, and China controlled it. But World Trade, we're looking at it. They've been very nice to us lately, I will say that, amazingly. We never used to win anything at the World Trade. We'd lose every case. Now, all of a sudden, we're winning a lot of cases. We just won $7 billion as a case. And uh, they're talking to us much differently than they used to. Because if they don't shape up, we're going to ship out. That's all. We're not treated fairly. China is treated as a developing nation. Developing nation. We're treated as a nation that's fully developed. We're not fully developed, as far as I'm concerned. When you look around at Portland and you see what these Democrats are doing to our cities, take a look at what's happening in New York and Chicago. We have Democrat-run cities and mayors that are running and governors that are running states so badly and mayors running cities so badly. It's very sad to look at it. It's Democrat-run. Every one of them that I see. I guess we could probably find one or two that aren't, but I don't — so far, I haven't been able to. Uh, if you look at uh, Biden, he supported TPP, Trans-Pacific Partnership, which would have been a disaster, would have destroyed our automobile business. By the way, Many plants are being built right now, auto plants in Michigan, just like I said. They're being built in Ohio. They're being built in South Carolina, North Carolina. They're being built all over and expanded at a level that we've never seen before. Because I said to Japan and Germany and others, sorry, you got to come here and build plants. Otherwise, we're going to have to make it very tough on you with tariffs. And we got out of the horrible Paris Climate Accord that he'll go back into because, you know, it sounds wonderful. It's a disaster for this country. They've basically taken away your wealth, the Paris Climate Accord. And the other countries don't have to adhere to it. China doesn't kick in until 2030. They don't have to do anything until 2030. We had very high standards. We would have had to close under some scenarios. 25 percent of our business is in order to qualify under this ridiculous Paris Climate Accord. It sounds good. It was very bad, very expensive. The New York Times has just published an entire story on Biden's China sellouts, which is amazing for The New York Times. I appreciate that. In 2001, Biden said the United States welcomes the emergence of a prosperous, integrated China on the global stage because we expect this is going to be a China that plays by the rules. They didn't play by the rules. They didn't play by the rules. The World Trade Organization, one of the reasons it's so bad is that China didn't play by the rules. We did. We did. But their rules were easier because they're considered a developing nation. So they had a much lower standard. But even that, they didn't play by the rules. That's when they became a rocket ship. They were flatlined for years and years and years. Then they joined the World Trade Organization. And frankly, they cheated. Okay? They cheated. I'll say it. What difference does it make? I feel much differently. I feel I made a great trade deal with China. Great. They're, and they're buying. You know why they're buying? Because they know I'm not happy. That's why they're buying. And I talk about it because today is Labor Day. And it's a good time to talk about when we're being ripped off by countries. But nobody's even close to China. Biden cheered China's rise as a great power because great powers adhere to international norms in the areas of nonproliferation, human rights, and trade. Well, they didn't. They took advantage of stupid people. Stupid people. And Biden's a stupid person. You know that. You're not going to write it. But you know that. The cost of Biden's economic treachery was 60,000 shuttered American factories. And I hear this morning the real number is probably 70,000. 70,000 shuttered American factories. And he's talking about how wonderful it is with China. No, China's been very bad. On top of which, we had the China plague sent to us and other viruses. Nothing near this area, but the swine. We had other viruses sent in over the years that came from China. I wonder why. If Biden wins, China wins, because China will own this country. If Biden wins, China will own this country. And hopefully, you're not going to be able to find that out. It's the most important election in our history right now. Most important election in our history. Under my administration, we will 
make America into the manufacturing superpower of the world and we'll end our reliance on China once and for all. Whether it's decoupling or putting in massive tariffs like I've been doing already, we're going to end our reliance on China because we can't rely on China. And I don't want them building a military like they're building right now. And they're using our money to build it. We'll manufacture our critical medical supplies in the United States. We'll create Made in America tax credits and bring our jobs back from China to the United States. And we'll impose tariffs on companies that desert America to create jobs in China and other countries. If they can't do it here, then let them pay a big tax to build it someplace else and send it into our country. We'll prohibit federal contracts from companies that outsource to China. And we'll hold China accountable for allowing the virus to spread around the world. Now you can understand why China would much rather see Sleepy Joe than Donald Trump. But as long as I'm president, we will never waver in our undying loyalty to the American worker and to our country as a whole. So happy Labor Day, everybody. Yeah, go ahead. You're going to have to take that off, please. Just, you can take oh, it off. You're, you're how, how many feet are you away? I'll speak a lot louder. Well, if you don't take it off, you're very muffled. So if you would take it off, it would be a lot easier. I'll, I'll just speak a lot louder. Is that better? It's better, yeah. Mr. It's Mr. better. Mr. President, some people are having a hard time believing your denials of the Atlantic story because of what you said about John McCain in the past. Do you understand that? And have you asked John? No, I don't understand. And have that. you asked John Kelly to refute that story? Yeah, no, I don't understand it at all. No, because I've always been on the opposite side of John McCain. John McCain liked wars. I will be a better warrior than anybody. But when we fight a war, we're going to win them. And frankly, I was never a fan of John McCain. You know that. It's been very obvious. I was, but I had to approve his entire funeral. I wanted him to get. He deserved a first class. You know, it all was approved by me. We sent Air Force One to pick up the casket, a lot of things. But no, I was not a fan of John McCain because he wanted the endless wars. And I didn't. I thought that the way the vets were taken care of, our great vets, was not good, not appropriate. And of course, he took the fake dirty dossier and gave it over to the FBI. So this is not somebody I'm not supposed to say, what a wonderful guy. So you know what? I lived with him. He lived with me, but we had different philosophies. I think my philosophy is right. I think it's turned out to be right. But I wasn't a fan. But I respect people, and I respect a lot of people. That doesn't mean I necessarily uh, have to agree with them. And I didn't agree with him on a lot of things. Uh, the story is a hoax written by a guy who's got a tremendously bad history. The magazine itself, which I don't read, but I hear it's just totally anti-Trump. He's a big Obama person. He's a big Clinton person. And he made up the story. It's a totally made-up story. In fact, I was very happy to see Zach Fuentes came out and said, now he's, that's, I think that's number 15. And these are people that were there. That's the 15th person, General Kellogg. Uh, everybody that was there uh, knew what happened. And so I was happy to see that Zach came out and said it's not true. He just came out. And uh, it's a disgrace. Who would say a thing like that? Only an animal would say a thing like that. There is nobody that has more respect for not only our military, but for people that gave their lives in the military. There is nobody. And I think John Kelly knows that. I think he would know that. I think he knows that from me. But Zach Fuentes says, you know, work for John. And I think they both know that. But Zach came out, as you know, today or yesterday, last night, and said very strongly that uh, he didn't hear anything like that. Even John Bolton came out and said that was untrue. Now, what was true is that we had the worst weather. I think it was as bad a rain as I've just about ever seen. And it was a fog. You, you literally couldn't see. I walked out. I didn't, have, I didn't need somebody to tell me. I walked out. I said, there's no way we can take helicopters in this. I understand helicopters very well. And they said, no, sir, that's been canceled. They would have had to go Secret Service. I have the whole list. They would have had to go through a very, very busy section during the day of Paris. They would have had to go through the city. The Paris police were asking us, please don't do it, because they're not ready. When you do that, you need a lot of 
time. They, they take days and days and days to prepare for that. I wanted to do it very badly. I was willing to sit in a car for two hours, three hours, four hours. I didn't care. It didn't matter. And I had nothing else to do. I went there for that. I had nothing else to do. It was ended because of the terrible weather, and nobody was prepared to go through in terms of Paris, the police, the military, and the Secret Service. And they came out very strongly and said, sir, we can't allow you to make this trip. If I wanted to, sir, we can't allow you from a safety standpoint. It was a phony story, just like the dirty dossier, the fake dirty dossier, just like the Russia collusion, just like all of the other phony stories. And there'll be more phony stories. But I do appreciate Zach coming out. But Zach now is the 15th person that's denied it. Zach now, I think, also talked about the weather aspect of it. And he's probably the 14th or 15th person that blamed it on weather. So that's enough of that. Yes, please. Thank you, sir. Christina Bob, One American News, thank you for holding the briefing. Thank you. We're seeing judges, most recently in Detroit, limit police ability to use non-lethal force. Uh, my first question would be, should the police be allowed to use non-lethal force to call the violence in their city? We're talking about where non-lethal force? Right. So in the riot, most recently. The riots. Yes. Well, I think what's happened is the, uh, the toughness. These are Democrat-run cities all. And there's no, um, there's no retribution. There's no, you, they stand there. They throw things at the people that are supposed to be protecting something, and nothing happens. They throw rocks. They throw cans of soup. They throw lots of hard objects. And rarely does anything happen. But I've told, when we have the federal in there, as you know, I told the US Marshals to go get the man who killed a, another man, and they know who it was, and you have to arrest him. You have to arrest him. After two and a half days, they didn't arrest him. The U.S. Marshals went in, and it ended up being a gunfight, and the man was killed. But this is a man that had a bad record, and there's a man that killed a man in the street. I mean, I witnessed it. Most people witnessed it. And the U.S. Marshals went in. They weren't playing games. They can't play games. If somebody is breaking the law, there's got to be a form of retribution. I watch so often when I watch some of the, uh, the areas that we're talking about. Now we have Rochester. That's, again, Democrat governor, Democrat mayor, all Democrats, every one of them. And it always will be. I was with the governor in Texas. He looked at me and said, I can't imagine how they allow this to happen. And, you know, it's different. It's different. I could talk about other governors saying the same thing. Yeah, please, go ahead. I could follow up on that. Uh, we're also hearing reports of groups like Antifa and Black Lives Matter traveling around the country, leaving their home cities to go um, riot and protest in other cities where they're yeah. causing damage. Do we expect to see um, prosecutions or charges yeah. in the Department of Justice for those traveling for that purpose? So we have now over 1,000 people, federal, uh, in jail. We're prosecuting many people. A big thing was when I signed the law putting people in jail if you knock down monuments. That was three months ago. There hasn't been a federal monument knocked down in three months or even thought about it. I don't think they've even thought about it. So that's had a very big impact, very big impact. But yeah, we're uh, going around. And the nice part is you people take, see those people up there, they take nice pictures of everybody. So we don't even have to bother. We can use the news photos. We had a photo right over there of Andrew Jackson, uh, the monument. He was getting ready. and. This guy was a big, brave guy, and he was up like this, and he was showing off to all his friends, and he got arrested. So did a lot of other people get arrested. And I would say we have the ultimate proof. Now, in that case, we got there before they ripped down the statue of Andrew Jackson, which is so beautiful, which is right over there. But they never got it. But right after that, I signed a, an order saying you go to prison for 10 years. And as soon as I signed that order, that was the end of the statues coming down. But they have other ideas. They've, they've got plenty of ideas. They're not at want for ideas. Please, go ahead. Mr. Spunt, David Spunt from Fox News. Uh, Mr. Trump, Mr. President, thank you for taking my question. Um, sir, you talked a lot about the economy and touted the economy. Three weeks ago in Bedminster, I asked you specifically why you have not called Democratic leadership to the White House to meet with them. If they don't want to meet, it's on them. Uh, a lot of people are criticizing you. I cover you on the weekends and stuff. You're doing I don't a think lot they of golfing. Are, no, Why have you not met with them in yeah. person? I mean, we're in September. There's no deal. There's no hope of a deal. Uh, we're two months out from the election. What don't say, say there's no hope. Why do you say there's what no hope? What do you know? 
Well, what can you say? It what do you seem, know? It doesn't seem like And, and let me just her. tell you, I know my customers. That's what I do. Uh, I know Pelosi. I know Schumer very well. They don't want to make a deal because they think it's good for politics if they don't make a deal. This has nothing to do with anything other than you have to know who you're dealing with. I do. Uh, these are people that uh, I don't have a lot of respect. Uh, I don't think they have a lot of respect for the American people. And I know who I'm dealing with. And I don't need to meet with them to be turned down. They don't want to make a deal because they know that's good for the economy. And if they make a deal that's good for the economy and, therefore, it's good for me for the election in November or November 3rd, and, therefore, they're not going to make a deal. Now, uh, if we gave the store away, if we bailed out all of their Democrat-run cities where we give them a trillion dollars, which is the kind of money they want, they want a trillion dollars to bail out badly-run Democrat cities and states, uh, whether it's New York or Illinois or others, uh, they want to bail them out. And we're saying, well, we're not going to pay that kind of a price in order to bail the city. We'll do something to help cities, but that's going to have to rest on its own. And why didn't you do this at the beginning? Because they could have done it at the beginning. So I know who I'm dealing with. And I'm on the phone with uh, Mnuchin and with Meadows and with all of these people constantly, you know, while they're there. But I also know when it's time to meet with people. I've done very well with deals, okay? That's what I do. And I know when it's time to meet. But I don't have to meet them in order to be turned down and in order for them to walk out to the sticks, which is the microphones, and give you people a false report of what just took place in the Oval Office. So um, they don't want to make a deal because they think that if the country does as badly as possible, even though a lot of people are being hurt, that's good for the Democrats. But, David, that's a bad thing. Yeah, please, but go as ahead. President, shouldn't you take the high road, sir? I, I am taking the high road. I'm taking the high road by not seeing them. That's the high road. Yeah. And, you, thank you. President David and if Jackson. I thought it made a difference or would make a difference, I'd do it in a minute. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. David Jackson, USA Today. My question is about the Durham report, which you have talked about recently. You said, let's see what happens. Now, you've accused people of committing crimes against you during the Russian investigation. Including yeah, President sure, Obama, sure. They spied on my campaign. That's right. My question they spied on my campaign. And if they were Democrats, they would have been in jail two years ago. They would have been in jail. Literally, if this side were the Democrat side, they would have been in jail two years ago for 50-year terms for treason and other things. Excuse me. My question is, do you want the Justice Department to indict people over this? I'm not going to say that. I have to see the report. I haven't seen it. I purposely — I don't know if that was a good thing, smart thing. I don't know. But nobody can complain about it. I have every right to have been very much involved. And maybe someday I'll get involved in it. They spied on my campaign, and that includes Biden and Obama. They spied on my campaign trying to defeat me. They wrote up a fake dossier that has proven to be totally fake, written by Christopher Steele, paid for by Hillary Clinton and the Democrats. And they used that illegally in the FISA courts. If we did what they did, you would have many people in jail all right, all right now. And you have, other than the one agent that admitted his guilt, that he forged documents, we don't have that yet, but the report hasn't been issued yet. Let's see what happens. But like let, me just, let me just say something. President Obama and Biden, Sleepy Joe, he knew everything that was happening. They were spying on my campaign, and they got caught. Now let's see what happens. But if this were the opposite way, people would have been jailed. They would have been in jail already for a period of at least — it would have started two years ago, and it would have been for 50 years for treason. Because you can't do that. That's never — and nothing like that's ever happened before. Then they created, at tremendous expense — the money they paid is tremendous. I'm sure you know the money that was paid — millions of dollars. They created a fake dossier, a fake dossier, proven to be now fake. Everyone — and they used it in the FISA courts. That's a crime. So far, I haven't seen anybody have a problem. But the report hasn't been issued yet. Let's see what happens with the Durham report. But this started at Obama. And some people would say, and some people would, well, but he was the president. Like, let's leave him alone. If it were me, they wouldn't be leaving me alone. I can tell you, it's a totally double standard, and it's a, it's a disgrace. And if I were a Republican senator, and if I were a Republican congressman, and we have some great ones, but we have a lot of them that don't fight the way that the other side fights. We have much better policy. We have much better things going for us, like borders and walls and immigration and no sanctuary cities, and a lot — they have a lot of bad stuff going. But they're dirty fighters. And the dirtiest fight of all is the issuance of 80 million 
ballots, unrequested. They're not requested. They're just sending 80 million ballots all over the country. 80 million ballots, non-requested. I call them unsolicited ballots. That's going to be the dirtiest fight of all. People are going to get ballots. They're going to say, what am I doing? And then they're going to harvest. They're going to do all the things. And if you look at the last period of six months, take a look at the races where they've sent ballots out. Take a look at Carolyn Maloney, whose race should be redone because she won that race totally unfairly to her opponent. Her opponent did very well against her. That race should be rerun. But they declared her the winner because they heard I found out about it. But take a look at what's happened in New Jersey and in Virginia and different places. It's a disgrace. That'll be a beauty. Yeah, please. Thank you, Mr. President. If proven true, are you okay with Postmaster General DeJoy and the fact that he asked former employees at his private company to make donations to the GOP and then reimburse them? Are you okay yeah, with that? I don't know too much about it. I read something this morning, but I don't. Other than that, I'd have to see it. Uh, he's a very respected man. He was approved. Uh, very much uh, by both parties, I guess. It was sort of a, an approval that took place by both parties. I don't know exactly what the story is. I'll certainly know within a short period of time. I just read it for the first time. I read it this morning, just like you did. Would you support an investigation, sir? Sure, sure. And in I think let the investigations go, but, but uh, he's a very respected man. Again, it was a uh, bipartisan commission. Postmaster General is appointed by a bipartisan commission, and we'll see how that goes. But no, I, I think he's a very honest guy, but we'll see. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President. Go ahead, please. Follow up, please, if you don't mind. If it's proven to be a campaign finance scheme, do you think he should lose his job? Yeah, if something could be proven that he did something wrong, always. You know? Thank you. Always. They've been looking at me for four years. They found nothing. Four years, think of it, for four years. From the day I came down the escalator, I've been under investigation by Sleaze, and they found nothing. They found nothing. A friend of mine said, you have to be the most innocent, honorable man ever to hold the office of president. Think of it. They spent just Mueller alone. He spent, I guess the real number turned out to be $48 million, but whatever it was, many, many millions of dollars. They had 18 angry Democrats looking. They had FBI agents all over the place. They had every — and they have no collusion. Friends of mine have said, sophisticated friends have said, you've got to be the most innocent guy ever to hold this office. And there's a lot of truth to that. Yeah, please. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, after Navalny poisoning, Chancellor Angela Merkel of Germany is under pressure to cancel Nord Stream 2 pipeline from Russia to Germany. Would you support such a move. Do you sure. think the, the project should be canceled? Sure. Well, I've been, I've been supportive of that. I was the first one that brought it up. You never heard of Nord Stream 2 until Trump came along. When I came along, I said, wait a minute. We're protecting Germany from Russia, right? NATO. We're protecting Germany from Russia. Germany's paying Russia billions and billions of dollars to get their energy. And the real number is probably 60 to 70 percent, ultimately, of their energy is going to come from Russia. And I said this for years, that nobody talks about it. One of the many things between sanctions and all of the what we've done for Ukraine relative to what the past had. They used to send pillows, and we sent tank busters. But I brought that up a long time ago. Russia's unhappy that I brought it up. But you never heard of Nord Stream 2. Nobody did until I got elected. And I said, why is Germany making a deal to give billions of dollars to Russia, and then we're protecting Germany from Russia? How does that work? And then on top of it, Germany is delinquent because they're only paying a little more than 1 percent, and they're supposed to be paying 2 percent, and even the 2 percent is low. But just remember, Trump, me, I got the countries of NATO to spend 1.130 billion, going to 400 billion dollars a year. Think of it, 400 billion dollars a year more for NATO. And the purpose of NATO primarily is Europe protection against Russia. Now they can use it for other, I guess, and they have a little bit in the Middle East, et cetera, et cetera. But I'm the one that did that. So. But nobody talks about that. Nobody talks about Nord Stream 2. The answer is, absolutely, if they feel that something happens. But I don't know that Germany's in a position right now.
because Germany is in a very weakened position energy-wise. They're closing all their plants. They're closing their nuclear. They're closing their coal. They're closing a lot of plants. And they are — they have put themselves in a very bad position, frankly. Very, very bad position. Yeah, please. Mr. President, uh, can I follow up on Jeff Mason's question? Uh, have you asked John Kelly to publicly refute the Atlantic? And then can I ask him No. I have nothing against John. I have no nothing against anybody. No. I was very heartened to see that a friend of his — because I know Zach is a friend of his and worked for him — I was very heartened to see that Zach Fuentes came out with the statement that he did, I guess, late last night, that uh, it was not true. Can I ask another question? Mr. President. Mr. President. Mr. President. Mr. President, what exactly is un-American about federal government training programs that are aimed at improving inclusivity? Well, we're going to do a report. Yeah. I, I fired those people. They're all gone. And uh, it was a disgrace, frankly. And we're going to give you a big report that's going to make you very happy. All right. Yeah, please. Thank you. Darlene Superville, AP. You said a moment ago they'll say anything. You were talking about Joe Biden and Kamala Harris and their comments about the vaccine. You have a No, they say worse. They say negative. They say negative. They're going to make the vaccine into a negative so that when we have it — and I spoke to the head of Pfizer. I spoke to the head of Johnson & Johnson. I spoke to the head of the greatest uh, medical companies in the world. We're doing great. We're going to have it soon. Wait a minute. So now what they're saying is, oh, wow, this is bad news. President Trump is getting this vaccine in record time. By the way, if this were the Obama administration, you wouldn't have that vaccine for three years, and you probably wouldn't have it at all. So we're going to have a, a vaccine very soon, maybe even before a very special date. You know what date I'm talking about. But let me just tell you, wait. And what they're doing because they think it is going fast. And if you talk to a lot of your sources, if you have sources, if you talk to your sources in the FDA, you'll see it's going very, very well. The, the numbers are looking unbelievably strong, unbelievably good. So now they're saying, wow, Trump's pulled this off. OK, let's disparage the vaccine. That's so bad for this country. That's so bad for the world to even say that. And that's what they're saying. It. But I watch Kamala's poll numbers drop from 15 to almost zero, and then drop out even before she ran in Iowa, because people didn't like her. And I understand why. She will never be president, although I have to be careful, because Obama used to say that about me, so I have to be a little bit careful. Right, but, but you have to look at her a little bit more closely, because obviously Joe's not doing too well. So you're going to have to look at her a little bit too closely. But she's talking about disparaging a vaccine so that people don't think the achievement was a great achievement. I don't want the achievement for myself. I want something that's going to make people better, that people aren't going to get sick with. That includes therapeutics, where we're doing equally as well. Therapeutics. Go ahead. Your, your point is that what they're saying is that they're saying it for political purposes. Yes. You have asserted repeatedly that a vaccine will be on the market by before the election. No, I didn't say, I didn't say they will. I said by the end of the year. No, but you're not quoting me accurately. I said that vaccines will be on the market before the end of the year. But they may even be on the market. They may even be developed and fully developed, tested, everything else. You know, we have 30,000 people in just one vaccine right now under test in very, very highly infected areas. So we're going to be able to get a good result one way or the other very soon. So I didn't say what you said. What I said is by the end of the year. But I think it could even be sooner than that. It could be during the month of October, actually could be before November. And are you also saying that for political reasons? No, I'm saying that because we want to save a lot of lives. The fast — with me, it's the faster, the better. With somebody else, maybe they would say it politically. But I'm saying it in, in terms of this is what we need. We have to have — if we get the vaccine early, that's a great thing, whether it's politics or not. Now, do benefits inure if you're able to get something years ahead of schedule? I, I guess maybe they do. But the most important thing to me is saving lives. It's the most important thing. Yeah, go ahead in the back. Hi. Um, just based on some of your recent tweets, sir, do you um, — You sound so clear, <laughs> as opposed to everybody else, where they refuse. Your, your tweets about the 1619 projects. Yeah. Uh, why do you object to that being taught in schools? And, and do you object to slavery itself being taught sir, in schools? Yeah, so, no, I want everybody to know everything they can about our history. I'm not a believer in cancel culture, the good or the bad. If you don't study the bad, you could happen again. So I do want that subject studied very, very carefully and very accurately. 
Um, but uh, we grew up with a certain history, and now they're trying to change our history, revisionist history. That's why they want to take down our monuments. That's why they want to take down our statues. I saw something the other day which was absolutely horrendous, a Washington Monument. They want to rename it the D.C. Committee, but the D.C. Committee is all Democrats. Abraham Lincoln, Thomas Jefferson. I mean, we're talking about this is the big stuff now. This is the big stuff. And they want to rename it. They want to redesignate it. They want to take some down. No, we don't do that. Never going to happen with me, I guarantee you that. Well, I want to thank you all, and I just want to wish you a very happy Labor Day. And we're having tremendous success, whether it's on the vaccines, whether it's on the pandemic, the, the plague that came in from China that China should have never let happen, because I will never feel the same about China. And I just want to, again, wish you a happy Labor Day. Thank you very much, everybody. There you go, President Trump wrapping up a, a long news conference there, Labor Day news conference at the White House. We continue to bring you always the very latest air on News Now from Fox. I do want to show you in its entirety right now, Vice President Mike Pence in Wisconsin just moments ago. And Senator Ron Johnson. To Derek Van Orden, to all of our fellow Americans from near and far, all across the Badger State, it is great to be with you here in La Crosse. And I can't think of a better place to be on an American holiday where we celebrate America's tradition of hard work and the American dream. For 79 years, you've been keeping the lights on here in Wisconsin. So to all the hardworking men and women of Dairyland Power, and to every American worker across Wisconsin, happy Labor Day. And you can grab a seat if you've got one. You know, before I go any further, allow me to bring greetings from another friend of mine who loves the Badger State, who I think is the best friend American workers have ever had sitting in the Oval Office at the White House. When I told him this morning that I was headed to La Crosse, I, I think he sounded just a little bit jealous. <laughs> so allow me to bring greetings. From a friend of this state and a friend of American workers, I bring greetings from the 45th President of the United States of America, <laughs> President Donald Trump. You know, I'm here because I stand with President Donald Trump. When this president stands up for faith and family and the American flag, I stand with President Donald Trump. When this president stands up to the radical left and their socialist agenda, I stand with President Donald Trump. And when this president stands up every day and fights for American workers and jobs, jobs, jobs. We stand with President Donald Trump. You know, four years ago, a movement was born, a movement of everyday Americans from every walk of life. And look how far we've come. Four years ago, we inherited a military hollowed out by devastating budget cuts an economy struggling to break out of the slowest recovery since the Great Depression. Terrorism was on the rise around the world, and we witnessed a steady assault on our most cherished values, the freedom of religion and the right to life. But in our first three years, what a difference the decision that Wisconsin made made. We rebuilt our military. We restored the arsenal of democracy, and we are once again giving our soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines, and Coast Guard, and our veterans the resources and the support that they deserve every single day. We revived our economy by cutting taxes across the board, rolling back federal red tape, unleashing American energy, and fighting for free and fair trade. We appointed judges to uphold all of our God-given liberties, including the Second Amendment right to keep and bear arms. Yeah. 
I couldn't be more proud to be vice president to a president who has stood without apology for the sanctity of human life and for the freedom of religion of every American of every faith. And beyond all of that, throughout all of the last three and a half years, this president and this administration have stood with the men and women of law enforcement, and we will stand with them every day. You know, President Trump and I know that the men and women who serve in law enforcement are the best of us. They put their lives on the line every single day. They literally count our lives as more important than their own. And they deserve the respect of every American. Now, to be clear, any incident involving the police use of force will always be thoroughly investigated. But there is no excuse for the rioting and looting that we have seen in Kenosha and in cities across the country. And this violence against civilians, against property, and against law enforcement must stop, and it must stop now. Now, President Trump and I will always support the right of Americans to peaceful protest. But rioting and looting is not peaceful protest. Burning businesses is not free speech. And those who do so will be prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law. That's why President Trump took action just a few days ago. We sent 200 federal law enforcement officers into Kenosha. Working with the National Guard and local law enforcement, we quelled the violence. Under this president, I promise you, we will have law and order in every city in this country for every American of every race and creed and color. So help us God. Now for months, all Joe Biden talked about was peaceful protesters as the American people watched businesses and communities in our major cities burn. Last week, Joe Biden, after three months of silence, spoke out against violence in every form it takes. But right after he said that, he criticized law enforcement. And Joe Biden never condemned Antifa. He never called out his campaign staff or his running mate for raising money to bail out violent criminals. And he never called on Democrat mayors to get their cities under control. And I think the people here in Wisconsin know Joe Biden would double down on the policies that have literally led to violence in our major American cities. I mean, Joe Biden says America is systemically racist and that law enforcement has an implicit bias against minorities. When asked whether he'd support cutting funding to law enforcement, Joe Biden replied, yes, absolutely. But under President Donald Trump, I promise you, we will always stand with those who serve on the thin blue line of law enforcement. We're not going to defund the police, not now, not ever. Now, President Trump and I know what you all in Wisconsin know. We don't have to choose between supporting law enforcement and standing with our African-American neighbors and families to improve the quality of their lives, to improve public safety, create more jobs and better schools. I mean, for the first day of this administration, we've done both. And I promise you, we're going to keep supporting law enforcement and keep supporting our African-American neighbors and all the minorities in every community in this city every day from here to come. So in three short years, with the support of the people of Wisconsin, we rebuilt our military, we revived our economy, we stood for our liberties and for law and order. The result? I can tell you, having traveled to more than 30 countries as your Vice President, America is respected in the world again.
At home, our God-given liberties are more secure today. And in our first three years, there's only three ways you can describe those years. It was jobs, 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 right here in Wisconsin and all across America. It's true. I mean, with less taxes, less regulation, more American energy and better trade deals, businesses large and small across this country created more than 7 million good-paying jobs in just three years. And on this Labor Day, it's, it's great to remember that, that wages were rising in those first three years. Wages were rising at their fastest pace in the last decade, and we couldn't be more proud that in those first three years, wages rose most rapidly for hard-working, blue-collar Americans. The forgotten men and women of America are forgotten no more. And under this president's policies, manufacturing has come roaring back. You know, when Joe Biden was vice president, America lost 200,000 manufacturing jobs. And the last president actually said that those jobs were never coming back. You remember? It was the summer, four years ago, 2016. The president back then wondered aloud how you could ever bring manufacturing back to the heartland. He said, quote, what magic wand do you have? Well, we didn't need a magic wand. We just needed President Donald Trump in the White House. 500,000 manufacturing jobs in just three years. Beyond that, the lowest unemployment rate ever recorded for African Americans and Hispanic Americans. At the end of our first three years, more Americans were working than ever before. And let me just say, with with him present here today. None of that would have been possible without the strong and principled support of Senator Ron Johnson. Wisconsin, would you join me? Get on your feet and show how much you appreciate a man that's been fighting for Wisconsin values and fighting for Wisconsin values. Thank you, Senator Johnson. our strong allies in the Congress like your son, we created the greatest economy in the world in three short years. We made America great again. And then the coronavirus struck from China. The people of Wisconsin deserve to know that before the first case of coronavirus spread from person to person, within the United States. President Trump took the unprecedented step of suspending all travel from China before the month of January was out. And I can tell you, having led the White House Coronavirus Task Force, that action alone saved untold American lives. And it bought us invaluable time to stand up the greatest national mobilization since World War II. President's direction, we marshal the full resources of the federal government and the American economy. We partnered with private industry to reinvent testing. When I took over the task force in late February, we'd done no more than 8,000 tests total nationwide for the coronavirus. Today, with American ingenuity and high relief, we perform more than 800,000 coronavirus tests a day. We work with private industry to arrange for the production and the delivery of billions of supplies of personal protective equipment to our great doctors and nurses and hospitals all across America. We saw the delivery of those supplies at the point of the need in one city after another where the impact was the greatest, where the challenge was the greatest. And I will tell you here in Wisconsin all across America, Every American should be grateful for our doctors, our nurses, and our health care workers and our first responders who have risen to the challenge in this hour of our time. Now, our hearts go out to all the families who've lost loved ones during the course of this pandemic. 
including more than a thousand families here in Wisconsin. I want to say to each and every one of them, you've always been in our hearts, and you'll remain in our prayers. But we're going to continue to move forward, continue to develop medicines each and every day that are saving lives across the country. More therapeutics are becoming available each and every day. And I promise you, we're not going to rest. We're not going to rest until we have a safe and effective coronavirus vaccine for the American people, and we put this virus in the past. It's amazing to think with Operation Warp Speed, the President initiated a project where, believe it or not, we have several vaccines that are already in the final stages of clinical trials. But we're not waiting until they're approved to produce the vaccines. At the President's direction, we're actually manufacturing vaccines even as we speak, so that the moment that the FDA says that we have a safe and effective coronavirus vaccine, we'll have tens of millions of doses available for the American people. I have to tell you, Joe Biden said not long ago that no miracle is coming. But here in America, we're in the miracle business. And we're going to have a safe and effective vaccine for the coronavirus before the end of this year. So we're slowing the spread. We're protecting the vulnerable. And we're saving lives. Each of us has a role to play. But in the midst of this pandemic, our president also worked with leaders in both parties in Congress and with Senator Johnson in particular to secure support for American families and for American businesses. It's amazing to think we were able to secure nearly $4 trillion in support to American families and enterprises. And the Paycheck Protection Program alone is estimated to have saved some 50 million American jobs. But I promise you, Wisconsin, we're going to continue to put the health of America first. But because of the strong foundation that President Trump poured in those first three years, and because of the unprecedented aid that we secured for families and businesses, after losing 22 million jobs at the height of this pandemic, we've already seen more than 10.6 Americans go back to work already. The American comeback has begun. In the last four months alone, we've literally, literally seen half of the Americans that lost their jobs go back to work. And that, that includes 200,000 Americans right here in the state of Wisconsin. So we're opening up America again. And we're opening up America's schools. Just last week, we spoke to educators around the country, leaders of uh, colleges and universities around America, to make sure they had the support and the guidance to be able to safely reopen their schools. People all across the country are working to safely reopen our K-12 schools. I'm proud to report to you that school teacher I've been married to for 35 years is already back in the classroom teaching art at her elementary school. I want to say thank you. I want to say thank you particularly to the Dairyland employees who leaned into this effort to get our schools back open. On the plane on the way here, I learned that a lot of you volunteered at, at an area school to build plexiglass barriers. You removed furniture to make our classrooms safe for our kids. Thank you for being there for our kids and our teachers and our schools. Great job. Great job. Dairyland. So we've gone through a time of testing, but we're coming through it together. Hardworking people of Wisconsin deserve to know. As we go through this time of testing, we're soon coming to a time for choosing. And the choice has never been more clear. And it's amazing to think that in the middle of a global pandemic, Joe Biden wants to raise taxes by $4 trillion. And President Trump, for our part, not only cut taxes for working families and businesses large and small, but as we speak, 
We're lower letting the American people keep more of what they earn, and I promise you we're going to keep fighting for tax relief for working Americans every day. Where President Trump signed more laws cutting federal red tape than any president in American history, Joe Biden wants to bury the American economy under an avalanche of red tape, like his own version of the Green New Deal. And here at Dairyland Power, you deserve to know that Joe Biden and the radical left want to crush American energy and American energy jobs. They want to pass uh, their climate change agenda and cap and trade that would cost that would raise the cost of electricity for nearly every household and business in Wisconsin. President Trump, for his part, unleashed American energy and all of the above energy strategy. As we stand here today, the United States is now a net exporter of energy for the first time in 70 years. We're energy independent. And when it comes to free and fair trade here in the heartland, we all remember NAFTA. Over in the Hoosier State, after NAFTA was signed into law back in 1995, we saw entire communities shuttered. And literally in the years since, 60,000 factories closed across the United States. And many of those jobs moved south of the border and overseas. But I saw this president work to keep the promises he'd made to the people of Wisconsin. He said we could do better than NAFTA. We could fight for the kind of free and fair trade that put American jobs and American workers first. He drove a hard bargain. And I'm here to tell you, the USMCA is a win for Wisconsin workers and a win for Wisconsin farmers. <laughs> Under the US-Mexico-Canada agreement, now Canada is also ending its unfair treatment of our dairy farmers. So important here in Wisconsin. The USMCA is actually expected to increase our dairy exports by more than $300 million in the next year. That's a win for Wisconsin. <laughs> the experts also tell us the USMCA overall will create about 600,000 new jobs just right out of the gate, including 50,000 manufacturing jobs. You know, I heard that Joe Biden's running mate is in Milwaukee today. But dairy farmers in Wisconsin deserve to know that Senator Kamala Harris is one of only 10 senators to vote against the USMCA. She said it didn't go far enough on climate change. And here at Dairyland Power, you deserve to know, Senator Harris put their radical environmental agenda ahead of Wisconsin dairy and ahead of Wisconsin power. But under President Donald Trump, we will always put Wisconsin farmers, Wisconsin businesses, and Wisconsin families first. <laughs> Thanks to President Trump's leadership, NAFTA is yesterday and the USMCA is here to stay. Beyond trade with our neighbors, this president also stood strong stood strong with regard to China from day one. President Trump made it clear that the era of economic surrender is over. When we took office, literally half of our international trade deficit was with China. And President Trump acted. We imposed strong tariffs on China. We took action to end steel dumping. It was hollowing out our steel industry and manufacturing in this country. And every single day, we continue to stand firm demanding that China, demanding that China open up their markets, respect American private property, and play by the international rules. Joe Biden, he's been a cheerleader for communist China. He actually wants to repeal all the tariffs that are leveling the playing field for American workers. And recently, he actually criticized President Trump for suspending all travel to China at the outset of the pandemic. So I'll make you a promise, whatever the other side wants to say or do, President Donald Trump and I are going to keep standing strong for American workers and American jobs until China 
comes to the table, lowers trade barriers, respects American properties, and levels the playing field. Because when the playing field is level, American workers can compete and win against any workers anywhere in the world. And finally, on this Labor Day, as we think about labor, think about the cost of labor. It's one of the reasons why President Trump has made record investments in border security. As we stand here today, this president is already overseeing the construction of more than 300 miles of a border wall on our southern border. And we've been enforcing our immigration laws all across America. I mean, the truth is that illegal immigration drives wages down. People know that. One of the reasons people of Wisconsin ought to be concerned, Joe Biden is for open borders, sanctuary cities free health care for illegal immigrants that will continue to bring low-cost labor into our cities and our towns, undermining the wages of American workers. And in addition to enforcing our immigration laws and standing firm for the conviction that a nation without borders is not a nation, President Trump has also launched what we call the Pledge to America's Workers. We're encouraging businesses in every field to expand training opportunities for American workers, and it's already led to 16 million training and apprentice opportunities for American workers all across the country. That's why we call that future ready. So we stood strong. We stood strong for a safer, more prosperous America. We stood firm to make sure that those that are meeting the needs, families that are challenged in the midst of this pandemic have the support and the resources, have the care that every one of us would want their family member to have. We stood up for our values, we stood up for American families. And on this Labor Day, American workers can be confident. You have a champion in President Donald Trump. President Donald Trump, I can tell you firsthand, having served with him every day over the last three and a half years. He's the real deal. The man who says what he means, means what he says. Never backs down. And I can tell you, he's never stopped fighting for the working people of Wisconsin. But for all that we accomplished in those first three years, for all we've done to see our nation through this time as America's begun to stand up again, go back to work and back to school, that's just what President Trump calls a good start. And I promise you, I promise you that we're never going to stop fighting for working people all across Wisconsin and all across America until we bring this state and this nation back bigger and better than ever before. So thank you for the warm reception today. And I'm very thankful it's not that warm today. It's a beautiful day in Wisconsin. Good to be with all of you. More importantly, thank you for thank you for what all of the hardworking families gathered here and those that might be looking on do for this country every day. And President Trump and I believe that all honest work is honorable that it's really been the people who make things, who grow things, who work with their hands, with the sweat of their brow, in the factory, in the field, that have made this country what it is today. I mean, it's been the hard work and the strength of working Americans, men and women like all of you here, people who believe in faith, in family, in patriotism, and hard work, people who believe in the American dream, that have always and will always be the backbone of this country. So on this Labor Day 2020, I encourage you to keep pressing on. Keep showing the strength and the faith and the resilience that working people have always shown in the life of this nation. Keep standing with us. 
and I promise you, we'll keep standing with you. Finally, finally, have faith. Have faith in the strength and resilience of the American people, and the ability of hardworking Americans to see our nation through this challenging time and come all the way back, and then some. And have faith that even in these challenging times, those ancient words that Americans have clung to throughout the generations are still true today. They're above the mantle in our home. And there they've been for more than 20 years. From the book of Jeremiah, chapter 29, verse 11. Have faith, as he said, I know the plans I have for you. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. The future belongs to America and to hard-working Americans. And our hope is in Him, in this one nation, under God, with liberty and justice for all. So with faith in all of you and faith in Him, I leave here today with renewed confidence. We're going to make Wisconsin and America stronger and more prosperous than ever before. With President Donald Trump in the White House, with great leaders like Senator Ron Johnson serving Wisconsin, and maybe future leaders like Derek Van Orden finding his way into public life. With your continued support and with God's help, on this Labor Day, I just know we're going to make America great again. Again. Thank you all very much. God bless you. God bless Wisconsin. And God bless America. Happy Labor Day. It's too loud in here. I don't think I'll ever go to sleep. Then we go out to Chicago for a Labor Day event. I guess in about five minutes. Right, Joe? Riding in a Pullman car. Well known for its quality and innovation. Right here. Started right here. But if it were just if it were just about that car and that production, it would have been lost in history. Bob Ryder has touched the story that brings us together today. It was on May 11th, 1894, that 4,000 workers here who drew wages from Pullman, lived in Pullman's housing, bought their food at Pullman's store, had their wages cut, their jobs slashed. They called a wildcat strike. It was one of the first organized strikes in the nation. And it led to a national rail shutdown when all of the other railroad employees joined them in this strike. There was a panic. George Pullman called President Grover Cleveland and said, you've got to do something. So Grover Cleveland went into the federal court mayor and got an injunction to stop the strike, first time that it ever happened in American history. But still the workers wouldn't go back. So President Grover Cleveland sent in the federal troops. Twenty-nine people were killed. Twenty-nine people were killed. And eventually, on July 20th, the workers were forced back into the factory to go to work. That was the beginning, as Bob told you, of President Grover Cleveland trying to win back the workers of America by creating this national holiday, National Day Off, called Labor Day. And that's why we're here today at Pullman on Labor Day. When you think about it, with the men and women who were working then, and I saw Bob had his T-shirt on, show him what it says, established 1896, two years later, Chicago Federation of Labor. What they basically were saying is there room on that railroad track in America for economic justice? That was a question they asked then, Bob, and still asked today. But that wasn't the end of the story, and Bob alluded to it, because there was that labor union, the first all-African-American labor union in the United States, the Sleeping Car Porters Union. And that union waited for its day, and its day came. In the 1950s, the son of a Pullman porter named Thurgood Marshall 
took a case to the Supreme Court, Brown v. Board of Education, and ended segregation in America's public schools. And it was just a few years later that a woman in Montgomery, Alabama, named Rosa Parks said, I'm not going to sit on that back seat for the segregated black seats. I'm sitting in the front of the bus. And for that, she was arrested and put in jail. And there was a man named E.D. Nixon. E.D. Nixon stepped up and said, I'll post the bail for Rosa Parks, and we're going to start the Montgomery bus boycott. E.D. Nixon gathered the preachers, went over and met with Dr. Martin Luther King and said, we need you to support us. We're going to start this bus boycott. And you know he did. And that was the beginning of the civil rights movement, starting with the sleeping car porters. And their motivation and inspiration led to that question that was raised. A question across America. Is that railroad track in the United States big enough for racial justice, economic justice, and racial justice? Those were the questions then. They're the same questions today. We're asking the same questions today. And we have to ask ourselves whether or not the sacrifice that has been made by so many generations before us, which bring us to this place in time, is still worth the effort. We know that it is. And if there's ever a moment in history, and if there's ever a place to do it, it's right here today on Labor Day 2020 that we know that that railroad track is big enough in America for economic justice and rail justice. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Senator. Senator, I was not going to give up the secret on why we're getting all the federal resources here in the Ninth War, but you let it out the bag that you, you and your entire family work for the railroad, so everybody knows now why the money's coming to the Ninth War. <laughs> all righty. Our next speaker is, again, no stranger to us. It's a partner in Washington bringing resources back to us, and we couldn't do it without having partners in Springfield and in Washington. So let's give it up for our Congresswoman, Robin Kelly. Thank you, Alderman Be Beal, Senator, Mayor, and my colleagues in Springfield and all the honored guests here. You all know by now the remarkable story of Pullman, a uniquely hardworking, problem-solving, innovative, inspirational, transformational treasure of Americana. As you've heard more than a century and a quarter ago, Pullman workers refused to waver in the struggle for civil rights. They stood strong in the face of deadly riots and ultimately forced Congress and the President to recognize the monumental contributions that working men and women were making every day. Today, their struggle for basic fairness, their fight for a fair day's wage, for a fair day's work, still continues in America. Pay disparity is still a reality in 2020. Voting rights have come under new attack, and the wealth held by the poorest half of Americans are being depleted by recession after crisis. But like the Pullman brothers and sisters who came before us, we will not fall, we will not falter, and we will not waver. A few decades back, when many felt Pullman had outlived its usefulness, they proposed bulldozing the town. But like the Pullman leaders, local residents united and saved their community. And there are so many fantastic residents in the Pullman community. More recently, an accidental fire nearly destroyed much of the iconic clock tower building. Again, the community reunited to rebuild the tower. Finally, a few years ago, as you've all heard by now, Pullman got the recognition that it long deserved. President Obama proclaimed Pullman to be a national monument, the same status given to the Statue of Liberty. Like Lady Liberty, who welcomes waves and waves of new Americans, Pullman stands as another testament to the same American dream. In Congress, I, along with my partner, Senator Durbin, have legislation to make this location into a national park, an even higher distinction that will also increase access to federal resources. But we're depending on all of you uh, so we can see some changes in January so we can make sure uh, that legislation goes through. <laughs> Today, as with every Labor Day holiday, we gather to recognize Pullman, the confluence of so many uniquely American stories from presidents to Pullman laborers. Throughout its long and glorious history, there's been a common thread to life in Pullman, unity in the face of all odds. This community's commitment, perseverance, innovation, 
humanity, and overriding sense of place dating back five to six generations forever shaped America. The story of that unity, that passion, and that progress will forever be told in the new visitor center, which opens next year. So congratulations, Pullman, and to all the residents that have made this happen. This is your holiday. Thank you so much. All righty. Thank you, Congresswoman Robin Kelly. All right. Our next speaker uh, is no stranger to anyone here. Uh, we want to welcome our mayor to the Ninth Ward. And we, not only bef before I bring her up, I just want to remind the mayor, we got a lot going on out here. And we want to keep it going. We want to keep it going by having a partnership as we move forward with creating jobs and opportunity here in the Ninth Ward. Let's give it up for the Ninth Ward round of applause for our mayor, Mayor Lightfoot. Uh, thank you, Alderman, and thank you all for, so much for being here. Um, this is a great day. A lot of enthusiasm <clears throat> because of the hard work of so many. You heard the list that uh, the Alderman gave at the start of his remarks. There are incredible, important things that are going on here in the Ninth Ward, and I'm happy to be a part of today's celebration. Let me also acknowledge uh, my friends, Senator Dick Durbin, Congresswoman Kelly. Um, you're going to hear, I believe, from uh, Lisa Stark of the Union Pacific Railroad and National Park Foundation, uh, Chicago Federation of Labor uh, leader Bob Ryder, my friend and partner in crime. Thank you, Bob, for, I think, an important uh, a lesson in the history of this site. National Pullman Monument uh, Superintendent Terry Gage, welcome to Chicago. The Illinois Department of Natural Resources, Colleen Callahan, uh, we've looked forward to your continued partner, partnership. GMA Construction President and CEO Cornelius Griggs, wasn't he remarkable? I mean, wasn't he remarkable? I also want to acknowledge uh, our friends in the state legislature who you've uh, heard about already today, but bears repeating Representative Marcus Evans, Representative Nick Smith, um, Senator L.G. Sims. Uh, I got to give a shout out to my birthday buddy, uh, Reverend Meeks, who heals hearts and minds all over the city, but particularly uh, in this community. Let me also acknowledge the generosity of the Richard Driehaus Foundation, the Chicago Community Trust, um, and the Alphawood Foundation. Uh, we are grateful uh, for these foundations for helping set the vision uh, for the preservation of this historic site. Um, I also have to acknowledge my friend Aziz Scott, the president of Chicago State. Great things are happening in Chicago State. David Doig of CNI, um, and I'd be remiss if I didn't also acknowledge my wife, the First Lady of the city, uh, Amy Eshelman, who's also with us today. Today, we're not just breaking ground on a historic site. We're also laying the foundation for preserving our country's storied history of labor and civil rights activism, where Chicago played a central role. 140 years ago, the Pullman neighborhood became our nation's first industrial plan community, helping put Chicago and Illinois on the map in an industrial age um, and made us a powerhouse. On its surface, Pullman seemed perfect, with homes and public spaces so scenic that the community was named the ideal city of the world. But for the Pullman car company workers that live there, things were far from perfect. After an economic recession, um, the company cut their wages and their jobs, but didn't reduce the rent that those workers had to pay on those company homes that they needed to keep food on the table. So as you heard, from May 11th to June, July 20th, 1894, those same workers staged a historic strike that would reignite the labor and civil rights movements across the country by rallying people against exploitation, discrimination, mistreatment, both in and outside of the workplace. And we know that as a consolation prize, as Senator Durbin said, led to uh, Grover Cleveland announcing that the first Monday in September would become a federal holiday called Labor Day. Given that rich history, uh, we owe it to the Pullman community and our entire country to preserve this history and uplift this neighborhood to its rightful place in our city's cultural and economic life. 
And when we talk about the struggles of the Pullman workers, of course, we also have to, um, to reflect on the life and legacy of A. Philip Randolph, who organized the Pullman porters into the brotherhood of sleeping car porters. This union earned collective bargaining rights for African-American porters and maids the first time ever in this country's history. And now, over 120 years after the Pullman strike, we're doing just that with the renovation of this Pullman National Historic Site, and we support the efforts of our senators and our congresswomen to make this a national park, not just a national memorial. And we selected uh, Pullman as one of our important Invest Southwest corridors because of the work that was already being done by so many important stakeholders to recognize and drive investment here and rejuvenate the fortunes of this community. Where this site is fully um, opening will create, when, when this site is fully open, it will create um, no less than 1,500 jobs and attracting hundreds of thousands of visitors from both far and near. That is what the vision is for this site, and we fully support it, and we'll do our part to make that a reality. Rejuvenating the local economy and giving residents the resources they need to escape the cycles of poverty that have left too many of them vulnerable to crises like the one that we're grappling with right now. This renovation comes at a time where we're facing some of the very same challenges as society did 126 years ago. A historic economic crisis, outrageous levels of income and inequality, transition to a new economic age, and attempts by the federal government to stifle legitimate, righteous protests against systems of injustice. And answering to the demands of our working communities, one of which we just renewed the fight for. I want to remind people that in August, we launched the Your Home is Someone's Workplace campaign to support over 56,000 care workers who are a majority women and people of color and are members of our immigrant community. Care workers have been fighting for the same dignity, respect, and safe, sustainable conditions other workers take for granted and that we all deserve. This campaign is personal to me because my mother was also a care worker and never receive the kind of benefits and wages that she deserved, taking care of others' households and others' elders and loved ones. This campaign will ensure that these workers have access to a fair living wage, paid time off, clear and written expectation, and safe workplaces. For more information and resources, please look to shy.gov forward slash care. The path forward to ending poverty and creating a more equitable Chicago has always started with listening and addressing the needs of our workers, who are the backbone of our city. Whether it's rail workers of the Pullman community over a century ago or workers across our city today, making sure that we do everything we can to support workers in their aspirations for fair wages, wages good and safe working conditions, is the vital to the future of our city. I am proud of the work that we have done already in my administration for workers in partnership with many, including our friends at the Chicago Federation of Labor. When I think about Labor Day, first and foremost, I think about my dad, one of the hardest working people I have ever met. Labor Day was one of the few days that he actually didn't work and got to relax and spend time with our family. I also think about uh, other workers that I knew growing up, the steel workers in my town, the men and women who labored in factories without union protections, but who worked hard every day and took pride in their life's work on assembly lines and on factory floors. We remember and salute them today and every day because their hard work and sacrifice is what put food on the table shelter over our head, and gave me and people like me the opportunities in life that those workers could only dream about for their children. These workers built our cities, they built our towns, and continue to build America. To all of them, past and present, we salute them and we wish them Happy Labor Day. You fit my paper? As the Alderman said, there's much work to do, 
not only here in the Ninth Ward, but all over our city. And I look forward to being a part of that work, shoulder to shoulder with working men and women who deserve to have a decent life for them and for their children. We know that doing this work transforms communities, creates a sense of purpose and ownership in the ground under their feet. And that's what we, we must be about. That's why I'm glad to be here today. Thank you, Alderman. Thank you all who are here and have made this moment possible. More work to be done, but onward together in the struggle for making sure that our city lives up to the promise and the obligation to be good to our people, to build lives worth living, and to make sure that everyone has the opportunity to live their lives in peace. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. The only thing I didn't hear, Mayor, is that we're going to rename Invest Southwest to Invest South Side, <laughs> Far South Side. <laughs> Thank you so much for those remarks, Mayor. We appreciate you being here today, joining us in this historic moment. Thank you. All right, our next person is the Assistant VP of Public Affairs for Union Pacific Railroad. Let's give it up for Lisa Starks. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here today on behalf of Union Pacific Railroad and as a National Park Foundation donor. When you think about railroad in our history, Union Pacific's history with the national parks started with preserving the iconic western parks, the great parks of our nation, including Zion, Yellowstone, Grand Canyon, and Death Valley. And what you may not realize is that the railroad, way back when those parks opened up to the public, provided access to those pristine landscapes that were otherwise virtually impossible to visit. Our rail network allowed travelers to experience the wonderment of the new national parks, working hand in hand with the Park Service to develop the infrastructure that park visitors still treasure. In fact, Union Pacific helped build many of the iconic lodges that you may see today when you visit a national park. Today, Union Pacific remains enthusiastic about sharing the wonders of our nation with the next generation of park goers through our partnership with the National Park Foundation. We're extremely proud to support the Pullman National Monument. We think this is an absolute fitting tribute to George Pullman and all that he contributed to not only railroad history, but to planned development, as well as the labor movement. For 150 years, Mr. Pullman's accomplishments have touched the lives of so many employees, not only at Union Pacific Railroad, but throughout the railroad industry. Mr. Pullman is a part of our history at Union Pacific Railroad, and it's something that we're extremely proud of and we recognize today. We're very honored to partner with the, the City of Chicago. Mayor, thank you for being here today with the State of Illinois, with all of the federal partners um, and leaders who have had a hand in bringing Pullman to life, and of course, the state and community leaders that have made this a priority. I congratulate and thank each and every one of you that are here today for what has been accomplished so far, and I look forward to our partnership in the future. In closing, I want to just remind everybody that, you know, really throughout history, the railroads have played a really significant role in community development. Where the railroads ran, communities grew and spurred around them and provided opportunity for economic development. And that's something that we are still absolutely supportive today. So as I close, I, I would be remiss if I didn't uh, talk, uh, just uh, mention a little briefly the National Parks uh, Find Your Park initiative. And so with that, I encourage everybody to find your park, or put another way, Encuentra tu parque. And I suggest, why not start right here in Chicago's own backyard with a visit to Pullman? Thank you. All right, our next guest here in the Ninth Ward is no stranger. She has been with us every step of the way. And you know, as much as I would love to give our state reps and state senators and even our governor credit for the appropriation of $21 million coming to our community, is you know, we all get credit for different things, but we know there's people behind the scenes making things happen. And let me just say, we have a true soldier and a partner here in the Ninth Ward with us today who works for the governor. Let's give it up for the Director of Illinois Department of Natural Resources, Colleen Callahan.
Thank you, Alderman. The, I have some prepared remarks, as most of us did, but the thought occurred to me as I was listening to everyone speak today, acknowledging the partnerships, whether it's local or state or federal or community, that every one of us that is here today, whether we're sitting in these chairs or those chairs, we're all here because we stand on the shoulders of those who came before us. No matter what our role is uh, in the Pullman Project, everyone that is here today feels a stake in this. And that's why it's important for all of us to take the time out to be here today. There are a lot of other places that many of us could have been, but we made this our priority for a reason because it means so much to every one of us for different reasons. Senator Durbin talked about his personal relationship and, and what he remembers about traveling from Southern Illinois to Los Angeles. The mayor talked about what it means to her as she reflects on her family. And so that's why it's important. It's, in, it's, it's part of our history. And so as we think about the 126 years later when the Pullman workers walked off the job, they did so, in, in my words, not theirs, because they knew it, it wasn't fair. It didn't feel right. And so it's important that when we acknowledge that life isn't fair, that it doesn't exempt us from trying to make it that way. And that's what they were doing. And here we are today. As speakers have said, we're not there yet. We're not where we need to be yet, but we're closer. And we'll get closer because of all of the partnerships that are represented here today to reflect this history and to showcase it. And so to not repeat what so many have said, I, I will also share a quick reference to why this is important to the state of Illinois and to me personally as the director of the Department of Natural Resources. I too feel that this is the right place for me to be today. And I wouldn't have thought that several years ago, but this is my second consecutive Labor Day at Pullman. And I think I want to be here next year and the year after that, because it feels like that's where I should be. The reason being that my Grandpa Callahan was the president of the Illinois Farmers Union. Now, when you think of unions, you probably don't think of farmers, but I grew up on a farm and my grandpa was the president of the Farmers Union, and he felt that there was a need for that. And my other grandpa, my grandpa Thompson, fixed hot boxes on the Illinois Central Railroad in Springfield. And I remember him coming home dirty and greasy, and, and it was hard work. But he literally kept the trains running on time. That was his job. And as I was thinking about what to say today to represent the state, I, I found this because it was, I keep it right next to some of the work that I do from home now, um, and it was this fan that says, look for this label, when you shop for women's and children's apparel, the International Ladies Garment Workers Union, the symbol of decency, fair labor standards, and the American way of life. Let your conscience be your guide. Those words ring true today. And why it's important for me to be here today is because I know now that I didn't know then what my Grandpa Thompson did. He knew that when those Pullman workers went on strike, they were doing it for the future of what his industry was doing. And I know that now, but I didn't know it then because he would always point out to me on those bib overalls that he wore, that union label. And he would say, it's important to wear union clothes because he was a union man. And it all started right here. And so to represent the state of Illinois and the Illinois Department of Natural Resources, it seems appropriate that we continue to do the work that those started for us to complete. <laughs> you know? So when we think about the partnerships, and we think about state, federal, and local, community certainly, it is those partnerships that have brought us to this point where we are ready now finally for this groundbreaking ceremony. From the Hotel Florence, which is across the street, and to the entire 12 acres, this is the beginning. 
of the state of Illinois being able to showcase not only the significance for what we do as it relates to labor and civil rights and what it meant to the history of our nation, but the role the state of Illinois played in that significant event and what it means to us today. So for John Rogner, who is our assistant director who is here, Ryan Pren, who is uh, our director of, of parks and our historic sites, to Levi, who's the site superintendent, and to Martin, who's over at the, the, uh, the Florence Hotel as the site specialist, this is an important and significant day for the state of Illinois and for all of us as we commemorate Labor Day. That's why we're here. It started here. And I would thank all of you for taking time to be here and say that we look forward to all convening again after this groundbreaking to see you here soon for the ribbon cutting. Thank you again. All right. Thank you so much. And once again, uh, Ms. Callahan, every time you come to the Ninth Ward, you bring lots of money. So stay close to those guys over there and keep the money flowing. So thank you so much. All right. We're going to deviate just a bit. We're going to ask everyone to step back so we can break ground. And then after that, we'll come back for q All right, folks, now we are going to take you to Austin, where a little bit ago a march happened in downtown Austin, Texas, to demand a congressional investigation into the case of murdered Fort Hood specialist Vanessa Guillen.
está pasando. Es una vergüenza para el gobierno de otros gobiernos. ¡Ay, coche! ¡Ay, coche! ¡Es una vergüenza!
dijo, mami, yo cuando salga yo voy a hablar de lo que está pasando en Fort Hood. Voy a hablar. Y esos perros la mataron. ¿Por qué no han matado a las que han violado o han hasta acosado? Ahí está la muchacha. ¿Por qué puro hombre? Porque saben y los matan. No es que se cuide, los matan. Pero a mi hija, lo peor es que me duele, es que me la mataron cruelmente. Esos perros miserables que van a Troy. Y ahora que sé por dónde la mataron, con más ganas voy a hundir esos malditos. Los voy a hundir. Los voy a ver hasta atrás de las rejas y ahí se van a pudrir. Sea quien sea, ahí se pudren esos malditos. Se van a pudrir. Como dije, es que todo se maneja nada más es una soldada. Es una hija, una hermana, una prima, una amiga, una novia. All right, everybody, that was a Vanessa Guillen march in Austin, Texas. Happy Labor Day, everybody. Happy Monday, Pilar Arias, one of your News Now hosts, been on Mission Control. That's what I like to call the News Now set for about the last 20 minutes or so. I'm going to actually say hello here in just a few seconds. You know me, though, always got to fix the hair, right? <laughs> hello. I hope you all are enjoying a day off with loved ones, family, friends, staying as safe as possible, socially distancing, wearing those masks. You know, lots of people are super 
we're worried about crowds gathering, events where a lot of people are attending due to the fact that we're still in a pandemic. So yes, it's a holiday. Yes, a lot of people have been sheltering, staying at home, working from home and the like, but so many people are just concerned and they wanna make sure that everybody stays healthy and happy. So again, you are watching News Now from Fox. My name is Pilar Arias. Thank you all so much for being here. If any news breaks across the country, if anything happens live, you know that we are certainly going to have you covered right here from the set. Again, which I refer to as Mission Control. So super happy to be here with you all. I want to show you all the different uh, live pictures that we have right now, all the different vantage points across the country. This is, of course, the White House in our nation's capital, Washington, D.C. And then we also have two different vantage points from New York City that I want to show you as well. Right here is Times Square. Take a look at that on the holiday. Quite a few people out and about. Looks like we've got some outdoor dining going on as well. And then we also have a live picture outside of the Fox News headquarters right there across from Radio City Music Hall. So um, I actually kind of want to look up what the New York City weather is like right now. Temperature, I'm looking it up. It is 78 degrees out there. It says the humidity is 59% though, so it feels a little bit warmer than 78 degrees. But for New York City, I mean, that's pretty nice, right? Feel free to let me know where you are watching from. If you are watching on the platform where there is a chat and there's actually 1,684 of you watching. So again, I hope you all are having a great day. Three day weekend for a lot of people. But uh, again, I appreciate you being here. Appreciate you watching regardless of where you are watching from. Hey, we're going to head out to Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and that's because we just got a few minutes of video of Kamala Harris out there. She is the Democratic vice president candidate. Again, she's in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. So let's take a listen as best we can. Wonderful. I mean, they're an incredible family and what they've endured and they just do it with such dignity and grace and, you know, they're carrying the weight of a lot of voices on their shoulders. And what was the message that you shared with him? Thank you. Let's not let it happen to her. Just to, one, to express concern for their, you know, well-being and, of course, for their brother and their son's well-being um, and to let them know that they have support. Senator Tom Kennedy, Hi. another one of our instructors here. Tom, Kamala, nice to meet How you. Are you doing? Um, I'm uh, the lead instructor. I've been here full time for 11 years. Okay. Um, I'd like to welcome you to our telecommunications training lab. Yes. Um, this has been a lot of hard work and, and, and partnership with the IBW and everybody to, to get this put together. Um, what we simulate here is, you know, the Internet of Things requires so much infrastructure cabling that this yeah. room we can take uh, an apprentice and continuing education journeyman. You all are not imagining things. They started this video, then they rewinded it a bit, and now it's starting over again. You are not imagining things. This is the second time you've seen this. We're continuing to listen to Kamala Harris in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. No handshake in there, as you can see. Wear your mask. Okay. I'd like to welcome you to our telecommunications training lab. Yes. All right, so maybe it was actually only like a minute of actual footage because they just keep replaying the same thing over and over and over again from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And I just looked at it. It appears it's only like two actual minutes of footage. I just wanted to make sure before I continued on to other news of the day, everyone. That's a okay. We've always got tons of stuff to show you here on News Now from Fox. All right, so next I'm going to take you out to... I'm staying in uh, the Midwest area. I'm going to Illinois, and that's because Chicago Mayor Lori Lightfoot joined elected officials, including Senator Dick Durbin, uh, U.S. Representative Robin Kelly, and uh, others for the groundbreaking of a Pullman National Monument renovation project in honor of Labor Day. So let's listen in. I came back, and I got up in there, and I said to my dad, I said, 
it's too loud in here. I don't think I'll ever go to sleep. Well, I hit that soft mattress, and I heard that clickety-clack, and I lasted about five minutes. Right, Joe? Riding in a Pullman car, well known for its quality and innovation, right here, started right here. But if it were just, if it were just about that car and that production, it would have been lost in history. Bob Ryder has touched the story that brings us together today. It was on May 11th, 1894, that 4,000 workers here who drew wages from Pullman, lived in Pullman's housing, bought their food at Pullman store, had their wages cut, their jobs slashed. They called a wildcat strike. It was one of the first organized strikes in the nation. And it led to a national rail shutdown when all of the other railroad employees joined them in this strike. There was a panic. George Pullman called President Grover Cleveland and said, you've got to do something. So Grover Cleveland went into the federal court mayor and got an injunction to stop the strike, first time that it ever happened in American history. But still the workers wouldn't go back. So President Grover Cleveland sent in the federal troops. 29 people were killed. 29 people were killed. And eventually, on July 20th, the workers were forced back into the factory to go to work. That was the beginning, as Bob told you, of President Grover Cleveland trying to win back the workers of America by creating this national holiday. National Day Off, called Labor Day. And that's why we're here today at Pullman on Labor Day. When you think about it, with the men and women who were working then, and I saw Bob had his T-shirt on, show him what it says, established 1896, two years later, Chicago Federation of Labor. What they basically were saying is there room on that railroad track in America for economic justice? That was a question they asked then, Bob, and still ask today. But that wasn't the end of the story, and Bob alluded to it, because there was that labor union, the first all-African-American labor union in the United States, the Sleeping Car Porters Union. And that union waited for its day, and its day came. In the 1950s, the son of a Pullman porter named Thurgood Marshall took a case to the Supreme Court, Brown versus Board of Education, and ended segregation in America's public schools. And it was just a few years later that a woman in Montgomery, Alabama, named Rosa Parks, said, I'm not going to sit on that back seat for the segregated black seats. I'm sitting in the front of the bus. And for that, she was arrested and put in jail. And there was a man named E.D. Nixon. E.D. Nixon stepped up and said, I'll post the bail for Rosa Parks, and we're going to start the Montgomery bus boycott. E.D. Nixon gathered the preachers, went over and met with Dr. Martin Luther King, and said, we need you to support us. We're going to start this bus boycott. You know he did. And that was the beginning of the civil rights movement, starting with the sleeping car porters. And their motivation and inspiration led to that question that was raised. A question across America. Is that railroad track in the United States big enough for racial justice, economic justice, and racial justice? Those were the questions then. They're the same questions today. We're asking the same questions today. And we have to ask ourselves whether or not the sacrifice that has been made by so many generations before us, which bring us to this place in time, is still worth the effort. We know that it is. And if there's ever a moment in history, and if there's ever a place to do it, it's right here today on Labor Day 2020 that we know that that railroad track is big enough in America for economic justice and rail justice. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Senator, I was not going to give up the secret on why we're getting all the federal resources here in the Ninth War, but you let it out the bag that you, you and your entire family work for the railroad, so everybody knows now why the money's coming to the Ninth War. <laughs> all righty. Our next speaker is, again, no stranger to us. It's a partner in Washington bringing resources back to us, and we couldn't do it without having partners in Springfield and in Washington. So let's give it up for our Congresswoman, Robin Kelly. Thank you, Alderman Beal, Senator, Mayor, and my colleagues in Springfield and all the honored guests here. You all know by now the remarkable story of Pullman, 
a uniquely hardworking, problem-solving, innovative, inspirational, transformational treasure of Americana. As you've heard more than a century and a quarter ago, Pullman workers refused to waver in the struggle for civil rights. They stood strong in the face of deadly riots and ultimately forced Congress and the President to recognize the monumental contributions that working men and women were making every day. Today, their struggle for basic fairness, their fight for a fair day's wage, for a fair day's work, still continues in America. Pay disparity is still a reality in 2020. Voting rights have come under new attack, and the wealth held by the poorest half of Americans are being depleted by recession after crisis. But like the Pullman brothers and sisters who came before us, we will not fall, we will not falter, and we will not waver. A few decades back, when many felt Pullman had outlived its usefulness, they proposed bulldozing the town. But like the Pullman leaders, local residents united and saved their community. And there are so many fantastic residents in the Pullman community. More recently, an accidental fire nearly destroyed much of the iconic clock tower building. Again, the community reunited to rebuild the tower. Finally, a few years ago, as you've all heard by now, Pullman got the recognition that it long deserved. President Obama proclaimed Pullman to be a national monument, the same status given to the Statue of Liberty. Like Lady Liberty, who welcomes waves and waves of new Americans, Pullman stands as another testament to the same American dream. In Congress, I, along with my partner, Senator Durbin, have legislation to make this location into a national park, an even higher distinction that will also increase access to federal resources. But we're depending on all of you uh, so we can see some changes in January so we can make sure uh, that legislation goes through. <laughs> Today, as with every Labor Day holiday, we gathered to recognize Pullman, the confluence of so many uniquely American stories from presidents to Pullman laborers. Throughout its long and glorious history, there's been a common thread to life in Pullman, unity in the face of all odds. This community's commitment, perseverance, innovation, humanity, and overriding sense of place dating back five to six generations forever shaped America. The story of that unity, that passion, and that progress will forever be told in the new Visitor Center, which opens next year. So congratulations, Pullman, and to all the residents that have made this happen. This is your holiday. Thank you so much. All righty. Thank you, Congresswoman Robin Kelly. All right. Our next speaker uh, is no stranger to anyone here. Uh, we want to welcome our mayor to the Ninth Ward, and we, not only bef before I bring her up, I just want to remind the mayor, we got a lot going on out here, and we want to keep it going. We want to keep it going by having a partnership as we move forward with creating jobs and opportunity here in the Ninth Ward. Let's give it up for the Ninth Ward round of applause for our mayor, Mayor Lightfoot. Uh, thank you, Alderman, and thank you all for, so much for being here. Um, this is a great day. A lot of enthusiasm <clears throat> because of the hard work of so many. You heard the list that uh, the Alderman gave at the start of his remarks. There are incredible, important things that are going on here in the Ninth Ward, and I'm happy to be a part of today's celebration. Let me also acknowledge uh, my friends, Senator Dick Durbin, Congresswoman Kelly. Um, you're going to hear, I believe, from uh, Lisa Stark of the Union Pacific Railroad and National Park Foundation, uh, Chicago Federation of Labor uh, leader Bob Ryder, my friend and partner in crime. Thank you, Bob, for, I think, an important uh, lesson in the history of this site. National Pullman Monument uh, Superintendent Terry Gage, welcome to Chicago. The Illinois Department of Natural Resources, Colin Callahan, uh, we look forward to your continued partner partnership. GMA Construction President and CEO Cornelius Griggs. Wasn't he remarkable? I mean, wasn't he remarkable? I also want to acknowledge uh, our friends in the state legislature who you've uh, heard about already today, but bears repeating Representative Marcus Evans, Representative Nick Smith, um, Senator L.G. Sims. Uh, I got to give a shout out to my birthday buddy, uh, Reverend Meeks, who heals hearts and minds all over the city, but particularly uh, in this community. 
Let me also acknowledge the generosity of the Richard Driehaus Foundation, the Chicago Community Trust, um, and the Alpha Wood Foundation. Uh, we are grateful uh, for these foundations for helping set the vision uh, for the preservation of this historic site. Um, I also have to acknowledge my friend Aziz Scott, the president of Chicago State. Great things are happening in Chicago State. David Doig of CNI. Um, and I'd be remiss if I didn't also acknowledge my wife, the first lady of the city, uh, Amy Eshelman, who's also with us today. Today, we're not just breaking ground on a historic site. We're also laying the foundation for preserving our country's storied history of labor and civil rights activism, where Chicago played a central role. 140 years ago, the Pullman neighborhood became our nation's first industrial plan community, helping put Chicago and Illinois on the map in an industrial age um, and made us a powerhouse. On its surface, Pullman seemed perfect with homes and public spaces so scenic that the community was named the ideal city of the world. But for the Pullman car company workers that live there, things were far from perfect. After an economic recession, um, the company cut their wages and their jobs, but didn't reduce the rent that those workers had to pay on those company homes that they needed to keep food on the table. So as you heard, from May 11th to June, July 20th, 1894, those same workers staged a historic strike that would reignite the labor and civil rights movements across the country by rallying people against exploitation, discrimination, mistreatment, both in and outside of the workplace. And we know that as a consolation prize, as Senator Durbin said, led to uh, Grover Cleveland announcing that the first Monday in September would become a federal holiday called Labor Day. Given that rich history, uh, we owe it to the Pullman community and our entire country to preserve this history and uplift this neighborhood to its rightful place in our city's cultural and economic life. And when we talk about the struggles of the Pullman workers, of course, we also have to um, reflect on the life and legacy of A. Philip Randolph, who organized the Pullman Porters into the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters. This union earned collective bargaining rights for African-American porters and maids the first time ever in this country's history. And now, over 120 years after the Pullman strike, we're doing just that with the renovation of this Pullman National Historic Site, and we support the efforts of our senators and our congresswomen to make this a national park, not just a national memorial. And we selected uh, Pullman as one of our important Invest Southwest corridors because of the work that was already being done by so many important stakeholders to recognize and drive investment here and rejuvenate the fortunes of this community. Where this site is fully um, opening will create, when, when this site is fully open, it will create um, no less than 1,500 jobs and attracting hundreds of thousands of visitors from both far and near. That is what the vision is for this site, and we fully support it, and we'll do our part to make that a reality. Rejuvenating the local economy and giving residents the resources they need to escape the cycles of poverty that have left too many of them vulnerable to crises like the one that we're grappling with right now. This renovation comes at a time where we're facing some of the very same challenges as society did 126 years ago. A historic economic crisis, outrageous levels of income and inequality, transition to a new economic age, and attempts by the federal government to stifle legitimate, righteous protests against systems of injustice and answering to the demands of our working communities, one of which we just renewed the fight for. I want to remind people that in August, we launched the Your Home is Someone's Workplace campaign to support over 56,000 care workers who are a majority women and people of color and are members of our immigrant community. Care workers have been fighting for the same dignity, respect, and safe, sustainable conditions other workers take for granted and that we all deserve. This campaign is personal to me because my mother was also a care worker and never received the kind of benefits and wages that she deserved 
taking care of others' households and others' elders and loved ones. This campaign will ensure that these workers have access to a fair living wage, paid time off, clear and written expectation, and safe workplaces. For more information and resources, please uh, look to shy.gov forward slash care. The path forward to ending poverty and creating a more equitable Chicago has always started with listening and addressing the needs of our workers who are the backbone of our city. Whether it's rail workers of the Pullman community over a century ago or workers across our city today, making sure that we do everything we can to support workers in their aspirations for fair wages, wages, good and safe working conditions is the vital to the future of our city. I am proud of the work that we have done already in my administration for workers in partnership with many, including our friends at the Chicago Federation of Labor. When I think about Labor Day, first and foremost, I think about my dad, one of the hardest working people I have ever met. Labor Day was one of the few days that he actually didn't work and got to relax and spend time with our family. I also think about uh, other workers that I knew growing up, the steel workers in my town, the men and women who labored in factories without union protections, but who worked hard every day and took pride in their life's work on assembly lines and on factory floors. We remember and salute them today and every day because their hard work and sacrifice is what put food on the table, shelter over our head, and gave me and people like me the opportunities in life that those workers could only dream about for their children. These workers built our cities, they built our towns, and continue to build America. To all of them, past and present, we salute them and we wish them Happy Labor Day. You fit my paper. As the alderman said, there's much work to do, not only here in the Ninth Ward, but all over our city. And I look forward to being a part of that work, shoulder to shoulder with working men and women who deserve to have a decent life for them and for their children. We know that doing this work transforms communities, creates a sense of purpose and ownership in the ground under their feet. And that's what we, we must be about. That's why I'm glad to be here today. Thank you, Alderman. Thank you all who are here and have made this moment possible. More work to be done, but onward together in the struggle for making sure that our city lives up to the promise and the obligation to be good to our people, to build lives worth living, and to make sure that everyone has the opportunity to live their lives in peace. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. The only thing I didn't hear, Mayor, is that we're going to rename Invest Southwest to Invest South Side, <laughs> far South Side. <laughs> Thank you so much for those remarks, Mayor. We appreciate you being here today, joining us in this historic moment. Thank you. All right, our next person is the Assistant VP of Public Affairs for Union Pacific Railroad. Let's give it up for Lisa Starks. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here today on behalf of Union Pacific Railroad and as a National Park Foundation donor. When you think about railroad in our history, Union Pacific's history with the national parks started with preserving the iconic western parks, the great parks of our nation, including Zion, Yellowstone, Grand Canyon, and Death Valley. And what you may not realize is that the railroad, way back when those parks opened up to the public, provided access to those pristine landscapes that were otherwise virtually impossible to visit. Our rail network allowed travelers to experience the wonderment of the new national parks, working hand in hand with the Park Service to develop the infrastructure that park visitors still treasure. In fact, Union Pacific helped build many of the iconic lodges that you may see today when you visit a national park. Today, Union Pacific remains enthusiastic about sharing the wonders of our nation with the next generation of park goers through our partnership with the National Park Foundation. We're extremely proud to support the Pullman National Monument, 
We think this is an absolute fitting tribute to George Pullman and all that he contributed to not only railroad history, but to plans development, as well as the labor movement. For 150 years, Mr. Pullman's accomplishments have touched the lives of so many employees, not only at Union Pacific Railroad, but throughout the railroad industry. Mr. Pullman is a part of our history at Union Pacific Railroad, and it's something that we're extremely proud of and we recognize today. We're very honored to partner with the, the City of Chicago Mayor, thank you for being here today, with the State of Illinois, with all of the federal partners um, and leaders who have had a hand in bringing Pullman to life, and of course, the state and community leaders that have made this a priority. I congratulate and thank each and every one of you that are here today for what has been accomplished so far, and I look forward to our partnership in the future. In closing, I want to just remind everybody that, you know, really throughout history, the railroads have played a really significant role in community development. Where the railroads ran, communities grew and spurred around them and provided opportunity for economic development. And that's something that we are still absolutely supportive today. So as I close, I, I would be remiss if I didn't uh, talk, uh, just uh, mention briefly the National Parks uh, Find Your Park initiative. And so with that, I encourage everybody to find your park or put another way, encuentra tu parque. And I suggest why not start right here in Chicago's own backyard with a visit to Pullman. Thank you. All right. Our next guest here in the Ninth Ward is no stranger. She has been with us every step of the way. And you know, as much as I would love to give our state reps and state senators and even our governor credit for the appropriation of $21 million coming to our community, is, you know, we all get credit for different things, but we know there's people behind the scenes making things happen. And let me just say, we have a true soldier and a partner here in the Ninth Ward with us today who works for the governor. Let's give it up for the director of Illinois Department of Natural Resources, Colleen Callahan. Thank you, Alderman. The, I have some prepared remarks, as most of us did, but the thought occurred to me as I was listening to everyone speak today, acknowledging the partnerships, whether it's local or state or federal or community, that every one of us that is here today, whether we're sitting in these chairs or those chairs, we're all here because we stand on the shoulders of those who came before us. No matter what our role is uh, in the Pullman Project, Everyone that is here today feels a stake in this, and that's why it's important for all of us to take the time out to be here today. There are a lot of other places that many of us could have been, but we made this our priority for a reason, because it means so much to every one of us for different reasons. Senator Durbin talked about his personal relationship and, and what he remembers about traveling from Southern Illinois to Los Angeles. The mayor talked about what it means to her as she reflects on her family. And so that's why it's important. It's, in, it's, it's part of our history. And so as we think about the 126 years later when the Pullman workers walked off the job, they did so in, in my words, not theirs, because they knew it, it wasn't fair. It didn't feel right. And so it's important that when we acknowledge that life isn't fair, that it doesn't exempt us from trying to make it that way. And that's what they were doing. And here we are today. As speakers have said, we're not there yet. We're not where we need to be yet, but we're closer. And we'll get closer because of all of the partnerships that are represented here today to reflect this history and to showcase it. And so to not repeat what so many have said I, I will also share a quick reference to why this is important to the state of Illinois and to me personally as the director of the Department of Natural Resources. I too feel that this is the right place for me to be today. And I wouldn't have thought that several years ago, but this is my second consecutive Labor Day at Pullman. And I think I want to be here next year and the year after that because it feels like that's where I should be. The reason being that my grandpa Callahan was the president of the Illinois 
farmers union. Now, when you think of unions, you probably don't think of farmers, but I grew up on a farm and my grandpa was the president of the farmers union and he felt that there was a need for that. And my other grandpa, my grandpa Thompson, fixed hot boxes on the Illinois Central Railroad in Springfield. And I remember him coming home dirty and greasy and, and it was hard work. But he literally kept the trains running on time. That was his job. And as I was thinking about what to say today to represent the state, I, I found this because it was, I keep it right next to some of the work that I do from home now. Um, and it was this fan that says, look for this label, when you shop for women's and children's apparel, the International Ladies Garment Workers Union, the symbol of decency, fair labor standards, and the American way of life. Let your conscience be your guide. Those words ring true today. And why it's important for me to be here today is because I know now that I didn't know then what my grandpa Thompson did. He knew that when those Pullman workers went on strike, they were doing it for the future of what his industry was doing. And I know that now, but I didn't know it then, because he would always point out to me on those bib overalls that he wore, that union label. And he would say, it's important to wear union clothes, because he was a union man. And it all started right here. And so to represent the state of Illinois and the Illinois Department of Natural Resources, it seems appropriate that we continue to do the work that those started for us to complete. <laughs> so when we think about the partnerships, and we think about state, federal, and local, community certainly, it is those partnerships that have brought us to this point where we are ready now finally for this groundbreaking ceremony. From the Hotel Florence, which is across the street, and to the entire 12 acres, this is the beginning of the state of Illinois being able to showcase not only the significance for what we do as it relates to labor and civil rights and what it meant to the history of our nation, but the role the state of Illinois played in that significant event and what it means to us today. So for John Rogner, who is our assistant director who is here, Ryan Prenn, who is uh, our director of, of parks and our historic sites, to Levi, who's the site superintendent, and to Martin, who's over at the the, uh, the Florence Hotel is the site specialist. This is an important and significant day for the state of Illinois and for all of us as we commemorate Labor Day. That's why we're here. It started here. And I would thank all of you for taking time to be here and say that we look forward to all convening again after this groundbreaking to see you here soon for the ribbon cutting. Thank you again. All right, thank you so much. And once again, uh, Ms. Callahan, every time you come to the Ninth Ward, you bring lots of money. So stay close to those guys over there and keep the money flowing. So thank you so much. All right, we're going to deviate just a bit. We're going to ask everyone to step back so we can break ground. And then after that, we'll come back for q All right, everybody, very exciting time out there for the Pullman National Monument in Illinois. You are watching News Now from Fox. Pilar Arias here with you. Happy Labor Day. Hopefully you are doing some relaxing, spending some safe and quality and uh, time with family and friends, just like all these people right here in Times Square in New York City. This is actually probably uh, one of the higher larger crowds that is um, that we've seen lately out there in New York City. New York City hit extremely hard with the coronavirus outbreak, but things are starting to get back to what a lot of people are referring to as the new normal, likely tourists and locals alike out there. Feel free to let me know if you're watching news now on the platform where there is a chat feature. If you are traveling, are you comfortable? And if so, are you doing road trips? Because we featured a uh, a lot of road trip ideas on AZAM this morning and talked about the travel trends. A lot of people are renting RVs. Or are you taking to the skies again? Are you comfortable with flying? 
feel free to let me know. All right, everyone, coming up next, I'm going to take you out to Rochester, New York, where they actually had an update, uh, the latest about the protests, the unrest that are going on out there and the like. We're going to hear from the mayor, Lovely Warren. Stick, listen. Good afternoon. Over the last few nights, we have seen righteous anger and heartfelt protest from many residents of our community. I know the vast majority of the people that have taken to our streets do so with pure hearts, good intentions to ensure tragedy, tragedies like the death of Mr. Prude never happen again. Their message that we must do better and that we have to address how we police our city has been heard. These calls are not new, and the chief and I have worked diligently to do the necessary work. It is my solemn duty as the mayor of the city to honor Mr. Prude, to not let his death be in vain, and to do everything possible to transform how we police our city, to truly protect and serve our residents. That is why today, as a child who was raised on Jefferson Avenue and educated at Wilson Magnet High School, and as a mother who raises my daughter in our city, I am recommitting myself to doing that work. And we have already begun. We are doubling the availability of mental health professionals. At the suggestion of Council Vice President Lightfoot, we will take our Family Crisis Intervention Team, or FACET, out of the police department and move it and its funding to the Department of Youth and Recreation Services, where our Pathways to Peace program already resides to better and more humanely serve our residents. We will fully engage with the Race Commission and our Real Rapid Response Team to further improve our response to mental health crises and re-envision our police department. However, this work won't be done in a week or in a weekend. Today, and to do this right, we will need to continue to deliver consistent progress over the coming weeks, months, and years. But I am committed to addressing these challenges and ensuring that change truly comes. But we need to also address the immediate issues in front of us. I am glad that the Attorney General informed us yesterday that she will impanel a grand jury to complete the investigation of Mr. Prude's death. And I have to also address the response to the protests by our police department. I have spoken with Chief Singletary, and we have discussed at length how our police department has responded to the protesters. The deployment of pepper balls, tear gas, the fireworks, and agitators have escalated these situations. That is the reason why I'm asking you, the citizens of Rochester, to help us. In the city of Rochester, we take care of our own. I am proud to stand here with Reverend Myra Brown, pastor of Spiritus Christi Church. Today, she and I met and have worked together to come up with a plan that will allow our protesters to exercise their First Amendment right to assemble free from distress while our officers protect the public safety building. Pastor Brown and I are calling on the elders of this city in our community to meet at her church located at 121 North Fixture Street at 6.30 p.m. today. RTS has agreed to bus in our elders. They will stand as the buffer between our protesters and our police department. I appreciate her and others for their willingness to step up and help us through these trying times. No one of us can do anything alone. It takes people reaching across, working together to ensure that we have a brighter future. You will hear from Reverend Brown in a moment, but I also need this community to understand the importance of the public safety building not only does our police department reside within the PSB, 
but our fire department's leadership and the nucleus of our city's operations reside in that building. Our ability to serve the residents of our city on a daily basis depends on the services that are held within that building. We have to protect it. There is credible information that outside agitators want to destroy the PSB. That said, what truly matters is creating a city that is dedicated to serving, protecting, and lifting up the least among us. What will always pain me about the death of Mr. Daniel Prude is our failure to do that. We had a human being in need of help, in need of compassion. In that moment, we had an opportunity to protect him, to keep him warm, to bring him to safety, to begin the process of healing him and lifting him up. We have to own the fact that in that moment, we did not do that. Unfortunately, we will not have the opportunity to save Mr. Prue. I can't bring him back. None of us can. But what I do have the opportunity to ensure is that his memory creates everlasting change. To ensure that he did not die in vain, that the next man or woman that needs our help gets the very best that this community has to offer. So let me say this to this community. I wholeheartedly believe that Chief Leron Singletary is the right person to lead us through these difficult times. He was born and raised in this city, educated in this city, worked his way up to lead the department he loves. I do not believe there's another person more dedicated to changing the culture of policing than Leron. I know that he and I are committed to being better, working harder to restore the trust and faith of our community. Please welcome our police chief. First and foremost, uh, I extend my condolences to the Prue family, and we want to make sure that uh, Mr. Prue's death changes how we do policing in this city. Moving forward, we are dedicated to taking the necessary actions to prevent this from ever happening again. And I understand that there are certain calls that law enforcement shouldn't handle alone, and we are looking at ways to reimagine policing surrounding uh, mental health and have been for the last several months. And as the mayor stated, we have already started working with city council to uh, remove the family crisis intervention team, is known as FACET, from the RPD, and all of its resources to drive, and we are prepared to do more. RPD is working with our county's forensic intervention team and clinicians out of the Office of Mental Health to effectively assist residents with mental health needs who have repeated contact with law enforcement with the goal to connect said individuals to outpatient services and to decrease the use of emergency and crisis responses. And police reform is actively moving forward with the Race Commission charged with developing policies and procedures and legislation that will address uh, racial inequities. As well as the things that we've already instituted, such as body-worn cameras and the implementation of the Community Affairs Bureau that I did in 2018. And as I share the mayor's sentiment, there is more work to be done, and I'm dedicated to doing what I was charged to do, which is to serve our citizens so that together we can collectively cre create change uh, in our community. And tonight, I'm dedicated to work with uh, community leaders such as Reverend Myra Brown, someone who I've been uh, accustomed to know uh, throughout in this community, and our city elders to ensure that tonight we protect the people's First Amendment rights to protest peacefully. Thank you. Now that I welcome Reverend Myra Brown. Hi, I'm Reverend Myra Brown, and I'm the pastor of Spiritus Christi Church uh, in Rochester. On last night, protesters were trapped in front of my church, and we took them in. The church was um, smattered with um, pepper bullets and whatever was used on those protesters. 
And I've been marching with protesters in these last few days because um, it's important for us to get our systems right. And so as a pastor, it is my job to make sure that people are safe. Mr. Prude's death re-triggered pain, trauma in this community. And so it's important when a community is grieving that they be given the space to grieve. They be given the space to be angry, to be given the space to make the demands that we need to make in order to change these systems. We know that our policing systems in this country were created around the 17th century. And many of them were created to answer a question after emancipation, which was, what do we do with the blacks? And so these, the systems across America were created from a slave patrol blueprint. Uh, we need to change that blueprint. We need to make these changes. We need to do the structural racism work on all of our systems, but in particular, our policing systems. And I'm, I'm, I'm happy to hear that that work is going to begin in Rochester. And I'm looking forward to and expecting us to finish that work. I don't want my children 57 years later uh, having to march and having to call for equity and equality. So the mayor and I have agreed to make sure that those who are protesting in the city are safe, that they get to have the space to grieve, that they will not be converged upon, um, and that we can have protests and be able to give people the space to make the demands and to do their civic duty of calling on our systems to do better, to do more, to transform itself. And so that is my position, and I'm looking forward to that work. I'm looking forward to the transformation of policing systems in Rochester and across the country as I um, send my deepest, deepest condolences to the Prude family. May we not have to stand here or any other city again talking about a black or brown body dying at the hands of police. Thank you, Reverend Brown, and I appreciate you for stepping up and helping us today. We will take some questions. Yes, sir. What credible proof do you have, what credible proof do you have that there are outside agitators coming to the city? Uh, we do have intelligence that uh, we've been receiving that there has been outside agitators that have uh, come to Rochester. As you know, we do monitor social uh, media and, and things of that nature. Um, so we do have credible information that uh, one of the areas that they want to target uh, is symbolic features. Chief, has anyone been arrested from outside of the city? I mean, what yes. credible proof? Yes. Chief, we, 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 we have arrested uh, people who provided addresses from Alaska, Massachusetts, and other parts of the country. Did you say it's true that, that you misled the mayor between March and August? As uh, w what I did was I provided you know, factual information based on the uh, incidents uh, that I had at the time. Mayor, could we follow up on that um, regarding the transparency? Because that is an issue for these protesters. They don't feel like they knew the whole story, and the community was not aware of what was happening regarding Mr. Prude. There was an autopsy in April showing that Mr. Prude died by homicide. Were you aware of that autopsy? No, I was not aware of that autopsy in April. What I was aware of, um, as I said, the chief called me at 7 o'clock in the morning, um, I believe on April 20, uh, March 23rd, and he told me what he knew at the time. Um, and then he did whatever he needed to do from that point forward, and I think that he has the document to show that he exercised and, and did what he needed to do as chief from that point forward. Uh, remember, we were in the middle of COVID. We had a lot going on in this city and across this, this country at that time in dealing with the pandemic that was before us. It wasn't until um, August 4th that I was uh, made aware of the video and saw the video, and that was by Corporation Council. I think that the chief did do all those things. So he he handled it the way that he needed to handle it internally. 
So when he made the call to me, it was the information that he had at that time. And then he did what he needed to do on the back end. And then on August 4th, when the Corporation Council made me aware of just the video and, and the extent of what the video was, that was the conversation that we had, an extensive conversation with the Corporation Council, the chief, as well as the deputy mayor at that time. So the law department, and, and again, city council is going to be reviewing this. And so you will see as they go through their review that all the steps that were taken were in proper order. So the chief notified me that, that we had an incident. He reviewed that incident, made a call, um, and then started his internal process. And those things happened. Again, we were in the middle of a pandemic. We were dealing with those issues in-house where we're trying to make sure that the city is still operating and functioning. It wasn't until April, uh, until August 4th, that I was able to see the video and notify by our corporation council about that. But there will be an extensive review for this, and you will get all that information during that investigation and during that review. And you will all see that this was done by the book and the chief did everything possible on his end to ensure that the Proof family got the justice that they needed and the law department acted in accordance with what they believed the law to be. Chief, at any point in the last couple of days, Chief, uh, have you offered to resign? Did you resign? No, I know there was a rumor that I offered to resign. I, I did not. I'm still the Chief. chief today. Have chief. you been asked to resign, Chief? At any, at any point, were you asked to step down? No. no. Chief, knowing that the relate. Uh, you say you hope Daniel proved that leads you to change the way you do policing. Do you believe the officer involved in his death acted improperly? That would be uh, inappropriate for me to comment at this time. There's still an ongoing criminal investigation. There's an internal investigation. So that would be highly inappropriate for me to comment with respect to uh, the outcome of that investigation prior to its conclusion. Can you specify how you want your policing to Well, I think, I think we're at a time and climate that we're looking at the, the uh, temperature around the country. We're looking at what the narrative is. And I think people do want change. People do want reforms. And I think, you know, even prior to uh, whether it's Mr. Prude's death or Mr. Floyd's death, there have been calls for change. And I think that's what we have been continuously doing. That's what we will always do. What about your officer's response to the protest? Do you think that's been appropriate and proportionate? I think what we do is we look at how we respond. We plan. You know, we, we, we take a measured approach. Um, and I think we have been consistent in that. Uh, what? Let me be clear. What has occurred is that there are people who come to these protests who want to protest peacefully, who want to express their First Amendment right. Um, as police chief, that is my charge to do that. That's what I have done as police chief, okay? The, um, there are agitators within the crowd, whether they're from here or elsewhere, who do want to uh, provoke um, and, and want some kind of confrontation. There have been frozen water bottles that have been thrown at police officers. There have been other type of debris, glass bottles, rocks that have been thrown at police officers. Now, our stance has been measured. Uh, we have shown restraint. I know that there's people who may have a different of opinion. Um, but, you know, as of yesterday, I had a conversation with uh, some other police departments across the country with regard to how they respond to protests. You know, just for information sharing purposes, to see you know if there's anything that we are missing here in Rochester, uh, we were right on par. Chief and Mayor, this is a question for you both. The first, the last time we saw the two of you together, the officers in question were still on duty. 24 hours later, the mayor alone comes out and announces their suspension. What changed in those 24 hours that caused you to suspend those officers when, in fact, you knew in August that this video existed and this was on tape? So I think that we have reviewed this extensively, right? So our understanding from our law department was that the Attorney General's office was in the middle of their investigation, and therefore we could not get in the middle of that investigation. We since learned on that day that we could proceed. The Attorney General came out and said that we could proceed, and so it was my belief that we needed to suspend the officers and that we needed the Attorney General's office to finish their independent review 
and I am thankful that the AG has come forward and said that she is impaneling a grand jury, and that process will be moved forward. So we have the situation with Mr. Prude's death, and now we also have a situation where we have to make sure that our citizens, our police department, our community is able to do the work and move forward together. And moving forward together looks like working together to ensure and reimagine what policing looks like. It also looks like uh, readjusting how we manage and budget our, our police department. It looks like making sure that we are understanding what our officers are responding to and being held responsible for and looking to mental health and mental health professionals to help us with that. I know that that is something that our city council has definitely been pushing us towards and we're committed to making sure that we do everything possible here in the city of Rochester to build up our community and not tear it down. What is your response to protesters who have called for your resignation and the chiefs? For everything that we have seen this year, it is clear to me that there is more work to be done. And I am committed to doing what's necessary. And I know that the chief is committed to doing what's necessary to better, the, better serve our citizens and our community. That was the job that I was elected to do. That was the job that he took an oath to serve. And understand something, the chief and I, we love our city. We were born and raised here. We were educated here. We are committed to making the necessary changes to ensure that this community moves forward. We recognize the hurt. We understand that there will be a process, an extensive process and a look at, but when you go through and you look at step by step by step, you will understand that throughout this whole thing, we have been responsive to those people that were investigating this and listening to our legal department as we went forward. For everything that we have seen this year, it is clear to me that there is more work that needs to be done, and I am committed to doing that work. When you go through and look at, when I go through and I look at extensively what the chief did, right? So notifying me on a day that the incident happened, what he knew, he, he, he knew that this, uh, that Mr. Prude had, uh, was on drugs or had, a, had an overdose and, and that was what he believed. He then went to review the video. After he reviewed the video, he immediately started an internal criminal and internal investigation. When he learned of Mr. Prude's death, he immediately referred that over to the DA's office. He immediately, after being contacted by the AG's office, gave them the information that they needed and went through that process. Again, we were in the middle of a pandemic. And so when he's going through and doing his job as chief, and you look at the documentation of everything that he did on, that back, on the back end, and then when the law department is working through the process, and they're working with the AG's office as well as their family's attorney, and then our corporation counsel is able to see the video and then notify me before releasing it and, and making sure that I saw it. I think that is very, very important to understand the timeline. The documentation will support that. And we welcome the city council going through and looking at each of those steps. Mary, you talked about the timeline of the investigation just, just now. And you just gave a very clear expression of your confidence in Chief Singletary. But last week, it sounded almost as if you're accusing other holding information, not telling you the whole story at the time on some important issues. It sounded like you didn't have confidence in him then. I, I, I clearly, expressly at that, that press conference stated that I believe that Chief Laron Singletary was the person to lead this department. If that was what you interpreted, then I am sorry. I clearly unequivocally said, I believe that Chief Laron Singletary is the person to lead this department. And when you look through the timeline, you can go through and step by step by step. He gave me the information that he knew when he had it. Knowing so, um, 
Chief, did you, were you told the same exact information as her originally, that it was just an OD? Or were you told the full thing? I, I provided the, maid, the mayor factual information uh, the morning of the 23rd and uh, March 30th is the follow when Mr. Fruit passed away. But if you, you, you told her that a, a person OD while being arrested, did you know that he was being held down and all the other stuff? Yes. Would it be protocol to tell the mayor when someone's um, death is ruled a homicide in police custody? I'm sorry? Would it be protocol to tell the mayor when someone died in police custody? As, as yes, and I did. I did. In April, as, the mayor knew? As, I mean, after the autopsy came out, did the mayor on the, know? On the morning of the 23rd, I made factual information to provide to the mayor. And on the morning of March 30th, when Mr. Proof passed away, as well. Well, what about the autopsy? Was she informed of the autopsy report that showed it was a homicide? The mayor, the mayor just said she was not. Would that be protocol? Office says that your officers aren't, aren't cooperating with the investigation. Do you know why that is? Well, th this is a criminal investigation, and as part of the criminal investigation, the officers do have a right to an attorney. So um, I have no control as police chief, no control of as to whether they go provide a statement to the attorney general's office. You mentioned last week there was two investigations, the internal one and the criminal one, that were both put on hold. Are, are those both back happening now, and if so, what's the timeline for them to, to come out public? Correct. So the, uh, both are active. The internal investigation, as I ordered them the next day, um, the same day, I should say morning, uh, March 23rd, the internal investigation and the criminal investigation. So the Attorney General's office, as you know, to go over the investigation on April 16th. And the, um, the internal investigation is, is being done by the, uh, by the professional standards section, and that investigation is still ongoing. Do you have any sense when that might come out? Um, I'm, I'm not sure. It's Regarding that timeline, Chief. I have a question back to your point about the they're doubling down, saying that they did not prevent uh, your office from making the information public. Do you have a response to that? So I can only tell you what our law department's understanding was. I was not on that call. And I believe that our corporation counsel and the attorney that spoke with the assistant AG was on that call. I believe that it was sometime either in April or June. But I can tell you that when I saw the video on August 4th from our corporation counsel, um, the, the understanding that he gave to me was that there was an investigation going on, a criminal investigation going on by the assistant attorney general's office, and that we could not impede that investigation and we needed to wait until they were done with that criminal investigation before coming forward. But I can assure this community that once I saw that video on August, uh, August 4th, I informed the chief that whenever there is a death in our community or a use of force, force that I needed to be informed within 24 hours. And he has been, and he understands that. And we have changed our policy around that. And so when we, as we move forward, it's about how do we ensure that the things that happened here never happen again. Mayor, how and so, are you going to allow these protests to continue at night? At what point, Chief, will you do something different so this doesn't go on for be 100 days like Portland? So today, again, Mayor uh, Reverend Brown is working with us, right? So we have the elders in our community that's coming together with our protesters and our police department to help us ensure that everyone is able to exercise their First Amendment rights, they're able to walk, and they're able to protest and do it peacefully. But we also recognize, and as the Chief has already indicated, there are some agitators that are from outside of this community that we also have to be aware of. Reverend Brown is aware of that, and she is committed to helping us work with the protesters to ensure that everyone is able to exercise their First Amendment right peacefully and without loss to property or harm to anyone. Do you feel like you can guarantee the safety of these elders? Do you think that that's a safe arrangement to have elders from the community? I mean, we've seen this volatile situation with what you're describing as agitators, your officers firing pepper bullets. Is it a safe thing to put in the middle of that mix 
senior citizens in the community. And I'm really interested in having the police chief comment as well, if, if he thinks that that's a public safety decision that makes sense. So if I could just um, respond to that and then he can say what he wants. Um, having the elders uh, be the buffer between police and protesters was my proposal because it's important for this community to be able to protest safely. I don't know how long we'll be protesting on the streets together, um, but we're, we're asking for justice and until justice is served, you need to make sure that our young people are safe, right? That our college students are safe that children who are marching are safe. And so we elders have volunteered to put our bodies on the line to make sure that that happens because this community needs to unrestrictedly be able to walk these streets, be able to make the demands that they want to make, and to be able to go home without pepper spray and pepper balls in their eyes and feel safe in this community. And I feel as an elder and as a pastor that that is one of my responsibilities to do everything that I can to make sure that that happens. And so I am actually, um, I'm glad that the mayor has accepted this proposal and is working with us to make sure that our elders can step up and partner to make sure that this community is safe when they come out and hit those streets to protest a system uh, that needs to be transformed. Question for Chief Singletary about last night. Uh, we've seen that lots of back and forth about who got physical first, throwing something, firing the pepper bullets. But the very first thing that happened was the police announcement that it was an unlawful gathering. Can you explain how that decision was arrived at and what the protocols are? Why was it unlawful? And, and take us through that process, starting not when the, when the object was being thrown, but back when the decision was made that the gathering was unlawful. Yeah, so if, 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 if individuals just standing there peacefully protesting, um, it is not unlawful at that particular point in time. It is not. Um, so whenever we do any type of you know, situation, we always go back to the table and do, uh, see what we can do better. Um, and that was one of the things that did come up. But how's, how, what, what criteria makes the gathering of people anywhere yep. unlawful? So when people start to throw debris and things um, at the police or start destroying property or throwing incendiary devices, um, frozen water bottles at police, that's when it becomes an unlawful assembly. Um, you know, what we want people to do is show up at um, these situations and protest peacefully. You know, we don't want people to throw frozen water bottles or debris or glass um, at police officers, right? Because we don't want no one to get hurt, to include police officers, peaceful protesters, anybody. We don't want no one to get hurt. The police were literally all the way across the broad street from the protesters and vice versa, and the announcement was already being made that the gathering was unlawful. How did that determination right. Again, those are things that we review um, throughout the process. Chief, so how can you guarantee the safety of elders when lawmakers, last night that were walking the streets peacefully were hit by pepper balls and complained of injury. So as Mayor Brown said, you know, this is a plan that, you know, she brought to us. This is a plan that whatever we do have a plan, we make our concern is known. Do you have concerns about this, Chief? Has anybody died in police custody? No. Do you have concerns about tonight's idea? We, whenever there's a plan, I always express concerns, and we try to, you know, overcome those concerns as best as possible. So, I'll meet the, the elders at the church uh, tonight at, at 6.30. I believe that um, Reverend Brown has a special relationship with the people in our community. And um, the fact that she has come forward and she has said, Mayor, let me try this. We can't continue to go down the same road that we've been down. We can't continue to have the, these protests end this way. You know, it breaks my heart. Remember, this is our community. This is a city that we love, that we care about. And we know that the protesters care about this city as well. And we want to work collectively together as partners to ensure that everyone is able to exercise their rights and do so safely and do so peacefully without harm, without danger. And so what 
Reverend Brown saw last night, what I saw, the cause that I got, the things that I was seeing over the last two days. And I know that this hurts the chief as well as the officers and everyone in our community alike. We want to try something different. We want to be able to work together. We want to be able to, to move forward in a way to make sure that Mr. Prue's death wasn't in vain and make the changes that are necessary in order to do so. And those are changes that the Pruitt family has brought forward, especially as it pertains to mental health, to reimagining how we do policing, to making sure that we have a proper and adequate response to those people that are in our community that are in need, to make sure that we are trying to change whether it's facet or fit or all the other things that we know that we need to do. If we're committed to change, then we're committed to doing the work. And that commitment, I know, is something that we have never shied away from. We're asking for an opportunity to work with our community partners to get it done for our city and to be a model for the nation. I appreciate Reverend Brown and her leadership and her commitment. I also appreciate our police department understanding that this is an idea that has come forth from the community, wanting to help and allowing them the opportunity to do so. How long will the elders be serving as Someone calls 911 tonight with the same scenario with Daniel Pruitt. Someone calls 911 Well, I think we, we follow the steps that we have been followed, same way in Mr. Cruz investigation, you know, order criminal internal investigation. No, okay, let me read this. Let's say, for instance, somebody calls 911, says they're concerned about their loved one who has left, and they're clearly uh, uh, they're hallucinating and they're agitated, and they threaten to harm themselves, which is what Joe Cruz said, Daniel Cruz. your officers get dispatched to that call? And if so, what do they do? Yes, the officers get dispatched to the call. The officers try to deal with the situation as best as possible. Would it be different, than what, we saw, different than what we saw on March 23rd? As best as possible. How would it be different? Well, I mean, each situation is different. I, I mean, we really can't be specific with that. What we're trying to do is move forward and see what we can, how we can do it better when officers respond to certain instances so we don't have another situation. Chief Singleton, at, at any time between, say, April 1st and August 3rd, did you talk to the mayor about this case at any time in any conference? The, I mean, I'm, I'm not going to get into conversation with regards to what me and the mayor talked about with regards to that. Um, I'm not going to publicly disclose conversations between me and the mayor. Well, she's implying that the answer is no. So is the answer no or is it something else? I mean, I don't want to speak for the mayor. I'm not going to speak for the mayor. Mayor Warren, can you, can you answer that? Did you hear from Chief Singletary or anybody else about this at any time from April? On, on August 4th, the Corporation Council came to me and asked me about the video. So no and so on April, so March 23rd, the chief contacted me. On March 30th, when Mr. Prue passed away, he contacted me. And then on August 4th, the Corporation Council talked to me about this. And so recognizing we were in the middle of a pandemic, we were dealing with a lot of situations here in the city of Rochester as it pertains to the coronavirus and COVID and all of that. The lawyers were going back and forth. It wasn't until the Corporation Council came forward that and said, did you see this video? And talked to the Deputy Mayor and I, and then the Chief and I had a, a conversation. Then again, this will all be, there's documentation to show what happened, when it happened, how it happened, and that is all information that will be available when City Council does their review. So you're saying you didn't hear the words Daniel approved at any time between April 1st and August 3rd? I do not recall hearing those words at all. You, when you talked about making changes from now on, knowing about someone's death in police custody, would it be protocol for you to be made aware of an autopsy? Uh, yes, yes, yes. So, so, uh, so uh, so again, going forward on August 4th, uh, you know, I sent a letter and note to the chief about different things that I want done um, because of what transpired here. 
And so I can assure you that we can't undo the past, right? You can only do what you can to ensure that what happened before doesn't happen again. Recognizing the times that we were in, recognizing that on, when I look at the, the dates and the times of everything that our corporation counsel, that our police chief and his team did, and all those steps, when you look at the documentation, you can see that this case was moving forward and moving through a process. It wasn't just sitting there. It was going through a complete process. And now we understand that there are some touch points. And again, even with city council, informing them as soon as I know and making sure that everyone is made aware. But all of that documentation and reports will come forward and you'll be able to see that as city council does their investigation. I'm sorry? I, I have not heard about that. How long um, will the elders be with these protesters and be the buffer? How long will they be there? I'm asking elders to be there from the beginning of the protest to the end of the protest is what I'm asking because we need to be able to move freely. We need to be able to move in spaces where it is not declared that is an unlawful gathering. And that is why I'm proposing this. We need to clear the streets so that people can protest without the fear of feeling like they're violating something that is unlawful. How many elders do you anticipate getting to I'm calling for at least 50 elders. 50? Yes. Are you worried that they will get injured? I am not worried about that. And they better not get injured. <laughs> Well, I mean, I, I mean I, again, you know, when plans are proposed, as police chief, my obligation is to uh, look at the plans that are proposed and express my concerns. And we try to look and see how we can execute the plan. But the fact that they seem to need to have people between the protesters and your police. The elders are in front of them? I'm sorry? Are the police being told not to use any pepper spray or pepper balls as long as the elders are in front of them? I'm not going to get into tactics, but we're going to, we're still in the uh, planning process for that. Very good. Thank you, everyone. Appreciate your time. Good afternoon. Over the last few nights. Thank you very much. Thank you. Happy Labor's, Labor Day. That was uh, really a very special time I had speaking to some of the uh, labor union heads and other people. They're very happy with the way things are going. As you probably see, the numbers are terrific. So we uh, called some people, wished them a very happy Labor Day, and they told us how they're doing. And we really celebrate the American worker. We are in the midst of the fastest economic recovery in U.S. history. So we have a lot to be thankful for, including this really beautiful day. So I thought we'd do this outside as opposed to in your more normal place. The United States experienced the smallest contraction of any major Western nation. You probably know that. Uh, you look around and see how we're doing compared to every other nation. And uh, our rise is spectacular. And we're rebounding much more quickly from the pandemic. The U.S. economy added 1.4 million jobs last month. We've added a record-setting 10.6 million jobs since May. 10.6 million jobs since May. That's a record that is not even close. Is, uh, second place is a long ways away. In July, the Congressional Budget Office was projecting unemployment over 10.5 percent through the end of 2020. So they thought 2020 and maybe it would be a lot longer than that. Some projections where you'd go through the entire year, and uh, that includes uh, a lot of months in the following year, 2021, and 
Instead, the unemployment rate plunged, really to the surprise of many, all the way down to 8.4 percent in August. And that's the second largest single month decline on record. And we have the first. We have both of them. So we have the uh, two number one declines. Decline meaning positive, not negative. We're currently witnessing the fastest labor market recovery from an economic crisis in history, world history. By contrast, Biden presided over the worst, the weakest, and the slowest economic recovery since the Great Depression. It was a, it was a long, slow slog, and it was a very small, very small on growth and very small on every other factor that you need. It was the weakest recovery. Under my leadership, next year will be the greatest economic year in the history of our country. I project, and uh, some people are starting to agree. We have a V shape. It's probably a super V. And you see what's going on with the stock market, where it's. Uh, in certain cases, already setting records. The Nasdaq has set 17 records already, and this is as we're hopefully rounding the final turn in the pandemic. Uh, first, we'll end the pandemic under Operation Warp Speed. We've pioneered groundbreaking therapies, reducing the fatality rate 85 percent since April. Uh, you don't hear that from the press very often. Uh, they don't like to talk about that. So the fatality rate, 85 percent. Think of that since April. The United States has experienced among the lowest case fatality rates of any major country in the world. And uh, we are uh, an absolute leader in every way. Under my leadership, we'll produce a vaccine in record time. Uh, Biden and his very liberal running mate, the most liberal person in Congress, by the way, is not a competent person, in my opinion, would destroy this country and would destroy this economy, should immediately apologize for the reckless anti-vaccine rhetoric that they are talking right now, talking about endangering lives, and it undermines science. And what's happening is uh, all of a sudden you'll have this incredible vaccine, and because of that fake rhetoric. It's a political rhetoric. That's all it is, just for politics, because now they see we've done an incredible job. And in speed, like nobody's ever seen before, this could have taken two or three years. And instead, it's going to be <laughs> it's going to be done in a very short period of time. Could even have it during the month of October. So contrary to all of the lies, the vaccine, that they're, they're politicalized. They're, they're, they'll say anything. And it's so dangerous for our country, what they say. But the vaccine will be very safe and very effective, and it'll be delivered very soon. You could, you could have a very big surprise coming up. I'm sure you'll be very happy, but the, the people will be happy. The people of the world will be happy. Next, we'll return to unprecedented prosperity through our pro-American policies. We'll pass new tax cuts to boost take-home pay. We're going to be cutting taxes very substantially. We get it back through growth. We had tremendous growth until we got hit with the China virus. We'll continue our historic regulatory reduction campaign. We've, as you know, in three and a half years, we've cut more regulations than any other administration, no matter how long, no matter what period of time you're talking about. We'll enact fair trade deals, and we're working on seven major fair trade deals right now. And when I say fair, fair to our country, because our country was ripped off by every nation. Friend, foe, didn't matter. Every nation was ripping us off at a level that it's just unbelievable, to be honest. We're going to be expanding our opportunity zones, and uh, we will uh, keep that going. It's been a tremendous, a tremendous program. I want to thank Senator Scott, South Carolina, for coming up with that whole concept, because he came up and I liked it right away. And it was it's really turned out to be a tremendous thing, especially for African-Americans, Hispanic-Americans. We'll continue to unleash American energy. We're number one in the world, and we're totally energy independent right now. And in 2021, we'll create 10 million jobs at least in the first 10 months. Joe Biden, the radical socialist Democrats, would immediately collapse the economy. If they got in, they would collapse it. You'll have a crash, the likes of which you've never seen before. Your stocks, your 401ks. Remember, 
it's the people that own these massive listed companies. A lot of people, rich people, and not so rich people, and middle income people, and those stocks will crash like you've never seen before. The Biden plan begins with a four trillion dollar tax hike. And that will end everything, including growth. There won't be growth. There'll be total contraction. Biden's also pledged to demolish the U.S. energy industry and implement the same policies causing blackouts in California. He wants to have things lit up with wind. Uh, he'll have to talk to China, Russia, uh, India, and lots of other countries, because they're not doing that. And if they're not doing it, uh, it puts us at a tremendous economic disadvantage, and it doesn't work. You take a look at the blackouts in California. It's really rather amazing what's going on there. They've tried to go, and that's just with a small portion going that route. That doesn't work, and it can't fire up our big plants. We're going to have this great industry that we've created. can't fire up our big plants. Biden's plan for the China virus is to shut down the entire U.S. economy. He's going to totally rely on somebody to walk up. Yes, sir, it's time to shut it down. He'd be laying off tens of millions of workers and causing countless deaths from suicide, substance abuse, depression, heart disease, and other very serious illnesses. Because when you do a shutdown, there's a problem on the other side. It's not just from the virus. You have a big problem with suicides, with losing your jobs, with all sorts of things. That, uh, you just take a look. Depression is a massive problem. And uh, what happens is you, they turn to substance abuse alcohol, drugs. So we can't do that. And then we'd have to give up all the gains that I've been talking about over the last three months. We've — what we have done is incredible. We're setting records all over the world, no matter where you go. Nobody has done what we've been able to do. So we're setting records in jobs. We're setting records in numbers. And you're going to see some very big numbers. Third quarter numbers are coming out right before a very special day, November 3rd. So you have the numbers coming out. And they're, uh, I think, going to be fantastic. You know, I think they're going to be fantastic. The best numbers of all, if somebody doesn't come along and raise taxes, double, triple, quadruple your taxes, will be the numbers from next year. But you're going to have a good third quarter number coming out. And uh, I think it's going to be hard for even the media to disparage that number. Biden wants to surrender our country to the virus. He wants to surrender our families to the violent left-wing mob. And he wants to surrender our jobs to China, our jobs and our economic well-being. I've taken in billions and billions of dollars from China. No other president's done what I've done. I've given much of it to the farmers. I've given it to farmers, manufacturers, but I've given most of it to the U.S. Treasury. Nobody's done that. We haven't taken in 10 cents from China ever. They targeted our farmers, and I targeted them. And I gave $28 billion to our farmers. Our farmers wouldn't be existent right now. Right now, they're very happy. In fact, they're setting records on purchases. China is purchasing more corn than they've ever done. Record purchase of corn and soybeans, beef, because they know I'm not happy with them. They know I'm not happy at all. And frankly, uh, I don't want to set the world necessarily to thinking too much about it right now, but there's been no country anywhere, at any time, that's ripped us off like China has. We lose billions and billions of dollars for years and years, decades. We've lost billions and billions and billions of dollars by dealing with China. We get nothing from China. They get nothing other than loss, other than giving our money. And they take that money and they build their military. And you see they're building up a powerful military. And it's very lucky that I've been building ours up, because otherwise we'd be dwarfed right now by China. It would be a terrible thing, a terrible thing. We're way ahead on the nuclear front. We've upgraded our nuclear hope to God. We never have to use it. But we would be in a position that we are not in right now. But China is spending the money we give them to build up their military. So when you mention the word decouple, it's, uh, it's an interesting word. So we lose billions of dollars, and if we didn't do business with them, we wouldn't lose billions of dollars. It's called decoupling, so you'll start thinking about it. You'll start thinking. They take our money and they spend it on building airplanes and building ships and building rockets and missiles. And Biden has been just a pawn for them. He's been so easy. They dream about Biden. There was a report today that 
they hope that uh, Joe Biden becomes president. If Joe Biden becomes president, China will own the United States, and every other country will be smiling also. They'll be smiling. When reports come out that certain countries don't really like me too much, that's not because of my personality, although it could be that also, frankly. It's because of the fact that I've been very tough on countries that have been ripping us off for so many years. If you look at NATO, with the exception of eight countries, we're one of them. Every country is way behind their delinquent, especially Germany, in paying their NATO bills. That means we end up paying it, and we're not doing it. I told them, we're not doing it. And they've increased their spending now, $130 billion, going up to $400 billion a year. It's all because of me. Then you hear the country doesn't like me. I mean, I can understand that, because President Obama and other presidents, in all fairness, would go in there and they'd make a speech and they'd leave. I went in there, I looked, and I said, this is unfair. We're paying for NATO. We're paying for NATO, almost all of it. So they rip us off in the military, and then they rip us off with the European Union on trade. And Biden doesn't have a clue. He, you know he doesn't have a clue. Everybody knows he doesn't have a clue. In prime time, he wasn't good. And now, it's not prime time. He spent 47 years sending American jobs to China, to Mexico, and to other countries while collecting millions of dollars in campaign and super PAC contributions from global corporations that got rich by making American workers poor. His son, where's Hunter? Where's Hunter? I call him Where's Hunter. Uh, walked away with one and a half billion dollars to manage, even though he never did that before. He walked away with a fortune from Ukraine, from China, and from other countries between his son and his brother. You ought to read the statements. And the press doesn't pick that up. If I ever did that, it would be, uh, it would be hell even worse than it's been, okay? Even worse than it's been. What he's done is so incredible. I won't give them the billion dollars, he says. I won't give them unless they get rid of that prosecutor. And then, voila, they got rid of the prosecutor. And the press doesn't even want to talk about it. You talk about quid pro quo. With me, there was none. With him, he's right on tape, and you don't want to cover it. You should be ashamed of yourselves. The press should be ashamed of themselves. With Biden, shipped away our jobs, threw open our borders, and sent our youth to fight in these crazy, endless wars. And it's one of the reasons the military — I'm not saying the military is in love with me. The soldiers are. The top people in the Pentagon probably aren't, because they want to do nothing but fight wars so that all of those wonderful companies that make the bombs and make the planes and make everything else stay happy. But uh, we're getting out of the endless wars. You know how we're doing. We defeated 100 percent of the ISIS caliphate. 100 percent. When I was in, when I came in, it was a mess. It was all over. They have it in a certain color, all ISIS. A year later, I said, where is it? It's all gone, sir. Because of you, it's all gone. Because of my philosophy, but be all gone. And I said, that's good. Let's bring our soldiers back home. Some people don't like to come home. Some people like to continue to spend money. One cold-hearted globalist betrayal after another, and that's what it was. Biden supported NAFTA. He supported China's entry into the World Trade Organization. Two disasters, the most disastrous trade deals in history, both of them. I, I can't tell you which was worse. They were both terrible. And as you know, I ended it, and uh, I ended NAFTA. And we're looking at the World Trade Organization. They've become much better, I will say that. Uh, we uh, — World Health, I got out of, because we're spending $500 million. China was spending $38 million, and China controlled it. But World Trade — we're looking at it. They've been very nice to us lately, I will say that, amazingly. We never used to win anything at the World Trade. We'd lose every case. Now, all of a sudden, we're winning a lot of cases. We just won $7 billion as a case. And uh, they're talking to us much differently than they used to. Because if they don't shape up, we're going to ship out. That's all. We're not treated fairly. China is treated as a developing nation. Developing nation. We're treated as a nation that's fully developed. We're not fully developed, as far as I'm concerned. When you look around at Portland and you see what these Democrats are doing to our cities, take a look at what's happening in New York and Chicago. We have Democrat-run cities, 
mayors that are running and governors that are running states so badly and mayors running cities so badly. It's very sad to look at it. It's Democrat run. Every one of them that I see. I guess we could probably find one or two that aren't, but I don't. So far, I haven't been able to. Uh, if you look at uh, Biden, he supported TPP, Trans-Pacific Partnership, which would have been a disaster, would have destroyed our automobile business. By the way, many plants are being built right now, auto plants in Michigan, just like I said. They're being built in Ohio. They're being built in South Carolina, North Carolina. They're being built all over and expanded at a level that we've never seen before. Because I said to Japan and Germany and others, sorry, you got to come here and build plants. Otherwise, we're going to have to make it very tough on you with tariffs. And we got out of the horrible Paris Climate Accord that he'll go back into because, you know, it sounds wonderful. It's a disaster for this country. They've basically taken away your wealth, the Paris Climate Accord. And the other countries don't have to adhere to it. China doesn't kick in until 2030. They don't have to do anything until 2030. We had very high standards. We would have had to close under some scenarios. 25 percent of our businesses in order to qualify under this ridiculous Paris Climate Accord. Sounds good. It was very bad and very expensive. The New York Times has just published an entire story on Biden's China sellouts, which is amazing for The New York Times. I appreciate that. In 2001, Biden said the United States welcomes the emergence of a prosperous, integrated China on the global stage because we expect this is going to be a China that plays by the rules. They didn't play by the rules. They didn't play by the rules. The World Trade Organization, one of the reasons it's so bad is that China didn't play by the rules. We did. We did. But their rules were easier because they're considered a developing nation. So they had a much lower standard. But even that, they didn't play by the rules. That's when they became a rocket ship. They were flatlined for years and years and years. Then they joined the World Trade Organization. And frankly, they cheated, okay? They cheated. I'll say it. What difference does it make? I feel much differently. I feel I've made a great trade deal with China. Great. And they're buying. You know why they're buying? Because they know I'm not happy. That's why they're buying. And I talk about it because today is Labor Day. And it's a good time to talk about when we're being ripped off by countries, but nobody's even close to China. Biden cheered China's rise as a great power because great powers adhere to international norms in the areas of nonproliferation, human rights, and trade. Well, they didn't. They took advantage of stupid people. Stupid people. And Biden's a stupid person. You know that. You're not going to write it, but you know that. The cost of Biden's economic treachery was 60,000 shuttered American factories. And I hear this morning the real number is probably 70,000. 70,000 shuttered American factories. And he's talking about how wonderful it is with China. No, China's been very bad. On top of which, we had the China plague sent to us and other viruses. Nothing near this serious, but the swine. We had other viruses sent in over the years that came from China. I wonder why. If Biden wins, China wins, because China will own this country. If Biden wins, China will own this country. And hopefully, you're not going to be able to find that out. It's the most important election in our history right now. Most important election in our history. Under my administration, we will make America into the manufacturing superpower of the world, and we'll end our reliance on China once and for all whether it's decoupling or putting in massive tariffs like I've been doing already. We're going to end our reliance on China because we can't rely on China. And I don't want them building a military like they're building right now. They're using our money to build it. We'll manufacture our critical medical supplies in the United States. We'll create Made in America tax credits and bring our jobs back from China to the United States. And we'll impose tariffs on companies that desert America to create jobs in China and other countries. If they can't do it here, then let them pay a big tax to build it someplace else and send it into our country. We'll prohibit federal contracts from companies that outsource to China, and we'll hold China accountable for allowing the virus to spread around the world. Now you can understand why China would much rather see Sleepy Joe than Donald Trump. But as long as I'm president, we will never waver in our undying loyalty to the American worker and to our country as a whole. So 
Happy Labor Day, everybody. Yeah. Go ahead. You're going to have to take that off, Liz. Just, you can take oh, it off. You're, you're, how, how many feet are you away? I'll speak a lot louder. Well, if you don't take it off, you're very muffled. So if you would take it off, it would be a lot easier. I'll, I'll just speak a lot louder. Is that better? It's better, yeah. Mr. It's Mr. better. Mr. President, some people are having a hard time believing your denials of the Atlantic story because of what you said about John McCain in the past. Do you understand that? And have you asked John no, I don't understand. And have you asked John Kelly to refute that story? No, I don't understand it at all, no, because I've always been on the opposite side of John McCain. John McCain liked wars. I will be a better warrior than anybody, but when we fight a war, we're going to win them. And frankly, I was never a fan of John McCain. You know that. It's been very obvious. I was — but I had to approve his entire funeral. I wanted him to get he deserved a first class. You know, it all was approved by me. We sent Air Force One to pick up the casket, a lot of things. But, no, I was not a fan of John McCain because he wanted the endless wars, and I didn't. I thought that the way the vets were taken care of, our great vets, was not good, not appropriate. And, of course, he took the fake, dirty dossier and gave it over to the FBI. So this is not somebody I'm supposed to say, what a wonderful guy. So, you know what? I lived with him. He lived with me, but we had different philosophies. I think my philosophy is right. I think it's turned out to be right. But I wasn't a fan. But I respect people, and I respect a lot of people. That doesn't mean I necessarily uh, have to agree with them. And I didn't agree with him on a lot of things. Uh, the story is a hoax written by a guy who's got a tremendously bad history. The magazine itself, which I don't read, but I hear it's just totally anti-Trump. He's a big Obama person. He's a big Clinton person. And he made up the story. It's a totally made-up story. In fact, I was very happy to see Zach Fuentes came out and said, now he's — I think that's number 15. And these are people that were there. That's the 15th person, General Kellogg. Uh, everybody that was there uh, knew what happened. And so I was happy to see that Zach came out and said it's not true. He just came out. And uh, it's a disgrace. Who would say a thing like that? Only an animal would say a thing like that. There is nobody that has more respect for not only our military, but for people that gave their lives in the military. There is nobody — and I think John Kelly knows that. I think he would know that. I think he knows that from me. But Zach Fuentes says, you know, work for John. And I think they both know that. But Zach came out, as you know, today or yesterday, last night, and said very strongly that uh, he didn't hear anything like that. Even John Bolton came out and said that was untrue. Now, what was true is that we had the worst weather. I think it was as bad a rain as I've just about ever seen. And it was a fog. You, you literally couldn't see. I walked out. I didn't have — I didn't need somebody to tell me. I walked out. I said, there's no way we can take helicopters in this. I understand helicopters very well. And they said, no, sir, that's been canceled. They would have had to go Secret Service. I have the whole list. They would have had to go through a very, very busy section during the day of Paris. They would have had to go through the city. The Paris police were asking us, please don't do it, because they're not ready. When you do that, you need a lot of time. They, they take days and days and days to prepare for that. I wanted to do it very badly. I was willing to sit in a car for two hours, three hours, four hours. I didn't care. It didn't matter. And I had nothing else to do. I went there for that. I had nothing else to do. It was ended because of the terrible weather, and nobody was prepared to go through in terms of Paris, the police, the military, and the Secret Service. And they came out very strongly and said, sir, we can't allow you to make this trip. If I wanted to, sir, we can't allow you from a safety standpoint. It was a phony story, just like the dirty dossier, the fake dirty dossier, just like the Russia collusion, just like all of the other phony stories. And there'll be more phony stories. But I do appreciate Zach coming out. But Zach now is the 15th person that's denied it. Zach now, I think, also talked about the weather aspect of it. And he's probably the 14th or 15th person that blamed it on weather. So that's enough of that. Yes, please. Thank you, sir. About one American. Thank you for holding the briefing. Thank you. We 
We're talking about where and non-lethal force? Right. So in the riots, most recently. The riots. Yes. Well, I think what's happened is the, uh, the toughness. These are Democrat-run cities all. And there's no, um, there's no retribution. There's no — they stand there. They throw things at the people that are supposed to be protecting something, and nothing happens. They throw rocks. They throw cans of soup. They throw lots of hard objects, and rarely does anything happen. But I've told, when we have the Federal in there, as you know, I told the U.S. Marshals to go get the man who killed a, another man, and they know who it was, and you have to arrest him. You have to arrest him. After two and a half days, they didn't arrest him. The U.S. Marshals went in, and it ended up being a gunfight, and the man was killed. But this is a man that had a bad record, and there's a man that killed a man in the street. I mean, I witnessed it. Most people witnessed it. And the U.S. Marshals went in. They weren't playing games. They can't play games. If somebody is breaking the law, there's got to be a form of retribution. I watch so often when I watch some of the, uh, the areas that we're talking about. Now we have Rochester. That's, again, Democrat governor, Democrat mayor, all Democrats, every one of them. And it always will be. I was with the governor of Texas. He looked at me and said, I can't imagine how they allow this to happen. And, you know, it's different. It's different. I could talk about other governors saying the same thing. Yeah, please, go ahead. I could follow up on that. Uh, we're also hearing reports of groups like Antifa and Black Lives Matter traveling around the country, leaving their home cities to go um, riot and protest in other cities where they're yeah. causing damage. Do we expect to see um, prosecutions or charges yeah. in the Department of Justice for those traveling for that purpose? So we have now over 1,000 people, federal, uh, in jail. We're prosecuting many people. A big thing was when I signed the law putting people in jail if you knock down monuments. That was three months ago. There hasn't been a federal monument knocked down in three months or even thought about it. I don't think they've even thought about it. So that's had a very big impact. Very big impact. But, yeah, we're uh, going around, and the nice part is you people take — see those people up there? They take nice pictures of everybody, so we don't even have to bother. We can use the news photos. We had a photo right over there of Andrew Jackson, uh, the monument. He was getting ready, and this guy was a big, brave guy. And he was up like this, and he was showing off to all his friends. And he got arrested. So did a lot of other people get arrested. And I would say we have the ultimate proof. Now, in that case, we got there before they ripped down the statue of Andrew Jackson, which is so beautiful, which is right over there. But they never got it. But right after that, I signed a — an order saying you go to prison for 10 years. And as soon as I signed that order, that was the end of the statues coming down. But they have other ideas. They, they've got plenty of ideas. They're not at want for ideas. Please, go ahead. Mr. Spunt, David Spunt from Fox News. Uh, Mr. Trump, Mr. President, thank you for taking my question. Um, sir, you talked a lot about the economy and touted the economy. Three weeks ago in Bedminster, I asked you specifically why you have not called Democratic leadership to the White House to meet with them. If they don't want to meet, it's on them. Uh, a lot of people are criticizing you. I cover you on the weekends and stuff. You're I don't think they are. No, Why have you not met with them in yeah. person? I mean, we're in September. There's no deal. There's no hope of a deal. Uh, we're two months out from the election. What don't say, say there's no you? hope. Why do you say there's but no what hope? Can you say what do you know? Well, what can you say? It what do you know? It doesn't seem like and, and let me just person. tell you, I know my customers. That's what I do. Uh, I know Pelosi. I know Schumer very well. They don't want to make a deal because they think it's good for politics if they don't make a deal. This has nothing to do with anything other than you have to know who you're dealing with. I do. Uh, these are people that uh, I don't have a lot of respect. Uh, I don't think they have a lot of respect for the American people. And I know who I'm dealing with. And I don't need to meet with them to be turned down. They don't want to make a deal because they know that's good for the economy. And if they make a deal that's good for the economy, and therefore it's good for me for the election in November or November 3rd, and therefore they're not going to make a deal. Now, uh, if we gave the store away, if we bailed out all of their Democrat-run cities where we give them a trillion dollars, which is the kind of money they want, they want a trillion dollars to bail out badly-run Democrat cities and states, uh, whether it's New York or Illinois or others, uh, they want to bail them out. And we're saying, well, we're not going to pay that kind of a price in order to bail the city. We'll do something to help cities, but that's going to have to rest on its own. And why didn't you do this at the beginning? Because they could have done it at the beginning. So I know who I'm dealing with. And I'm on the phone with uh, 
Mnuchin and with Meadows and with all of these people constantly, you know, while they're there. But I also know when it's time to meet with people. I've done very well with deals, okay? That's what I do. And I know when it's time to meet. But I don't have to meet them in order to be turned down and in order for them to walk out to the sticks, which is the microphones, and give you people a false report of what just took place in the Oval Office. So um, they don't want to make a deal because they think that if the country does as badly as possible, even though a lot of people are being hurt, that's good for the Democrats. But, David, that's a bad thing. Yeah, please, but go as ahead. President, shouldn't you take the high road, sir? I, I am taking the high road. I'm taking the high road by not seeing them. That's the high road. Yeah. And, you, that's President David and if Jackson. I thought it made a difference or would make a difference, I'd do it in a minute. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. David Jackson, USA Today. My question is about the Durham report, which you have talked about recently. You said, let's see what happens. Now, you've accused people of committing crimes against you during the Russian investigation. Including yeah, President sure, Obama, sure. They spied on my campaign. That's right. My question they spied on my campaign. And if they were Democrats, they would have been in jail two years ago. They would have been in jail, literally, if this side were the Democrats said they would have been in jail two years ago for 50-year terms for treason and other things. Me, my question is, do you want the Justice Department to indict people over this? I'm not going to say that. I have to see the report. I haven't seen it. I purposely — I don't know if that was a good thing, smart thing. I don't know. But nobody can complain about it. I have every right to have been very much involved. And maybe someday I'll get involved in it. They spied on my campaign, and that includes Biden and Obama. They spied on my campaign trying to defeat me. They wrote up a fake dossier that has proven to be totally fake, written by Christopher Steele, paid for by Hillary Clinton and the Democrats, and they used that illegally in the FISA courts. If we did what they did, you would have many people in jail all right, all right now, and you have, other than the one agent that admitted his guilt that he forged documents, we don't have that yet. But the report hasn't been issued yet. Let's see what happens. But let me, just, let me just say something. President Obama and Biden, Sleepy Joe, he knew everything that was happening. They were spying on my campaign and they got caught. Now let's see what happens. But if this were the opposite way, people would have been jailed. They would have been in jail already for a period of at least — it would have started two years ago, and it would have been for 50 years for treason, because you can't do that. That's never — and nothing like that's ever happened before. Then they created a tremendous expense. The money they paid is tremendous. I'm sure you know the money that was paid. Millions of dollars. They created a fake dossier. A fake dossier, proven to be now fake. Everyone — and they used it in the FISA courts. That's a crime. So far, I haven't seen anybody have a problem. But the report hasn't been issued yet. Let's see what happens with the Durham report. But this started at Obama. And some people would say, and some people would, well, but he was the president. Like, let's leave him alone. If it were me, they wouldn't be leaving me alone, I can tell you. It's a totally double standard, and it's a, it's a disgrace. And if I were a Republican senator, and if I were a Republican congressman, and we have some great ones, but we have a lot of them that don't fight the way that the other side fights. We have much better policy. We have much better things going for us, like borders and walls and immigration and no sanctuary cities, and a lot — they have a lot of bad stuff going. But they're dirty fighters. And the dirtiest fight of all is the issuance of 80 million ballots, unrequested. They're not requested. They're just sending 80 million ballots all over the country, 80 million ballots, non-requested. I call them unsolicited ballots. That's going to be the dirtiest fight of all. People are going to get ballots. They're going to say, what am I doing? And then they're going to harvest. They're going to do all the things. And if you look at the last period of six months, take a look at the races where they've sent ballots out. Take a look at Carolyn Maloney, whose race should be redone because she won that race totally unfairly to her opponent. Her opponent did very well against her. That race should be rerun. But they declared her the winner because they heard I found out about it. But take a look at what's happened in New Jersey and in Virginia and different places. It's a disgrace. That'll be a beauty. Yeah, please. Thank you, Mr. President. If proven true, are you okay with Postmaster General DeJoy and the fact that he asked former employees at his private company to make donations to the GOP and then reimburse them? Are you okay yeah, with that? I don't know too much about it. I read something this morning, but I don't — other than that, I'd have to see it. Uh, he's a very respected man. He was approved uh, very much uh, by 
both parties, I guess. It was sort of a, an approval that took place by both parties. I don't know exactly what the story is. I'll certainly know within a short period of time. I just read it for the first time. I read it this morning, just like you did. Do you support an investigation, sir? Sure, sure. And, and I think let the investigations go, but, but uh, he's a very respected man. Again, it was a uh, bipartisan commission. Postmaster General is appointed by a bipartisan commission. And we'll see how that goes. But no, I, I think he's a very honest guy, but we'll see. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President. Go ahead, follow please. Up, please, if you don't mind. If it's proven to be a campaign finance scheme, do you think he should lose his job? Yeah, if something can be proven that he did something wrong, always. You know? Thank you. Always. They've been looking at me for four years. We found nothing. Four years. Think of it. For four years, from the day I came down the escalator, I've been under investigation by sleaze, and they found nothing. They found nothing. A friend of mine said, you have to be the most innocent, honorable man ever to hold the office of president. Think of it. They spent just Mueller alone. He spent, I guess the real number turned out to be $48 million, but whatever it was, many, many millions of dollars. They had 18 angry Democrats looking. They had FBI agents all over the place. They had every — and they have no collusion. Friends of mine have said, sophisticated friends have said, you've got to be the most innocent guy ever to hold this office. And there's a lot of truth to that. Yeah, please. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, after Navalny poisoning, Chancellor Angela Merkel of Germany is under pressure to cancel Nord Stream 2 pipeline from Russia to Germany. Would you support such a move? Do you sure. think that the project should be canceled? Sure. Well, I've been, I've been supportive of that. I was the first one that brought it up. You never heard of Nord Stream 2 until Trump came along. When I came along, I said, wait a minute. We're protecting Germany from Russia, right? NATO. We're protecting Germany from Russia. Germany's paying Russia billions and billions of dollars to get their energy. And the real number is probably 60 to 70 percent, ultimately, of their energy is going to come from Russia. And I said this for years, that nobody talks about it. One of the many things between sanctions and all of the — what we've done for Ukraine relative to what the past — they used to send pillows, and we sent tank busters. But I brought that up a long time ago. Russia's unhappy that I brought it up. But you never heard of Nord Stream 2. Nobody did until I got elected. And I said, why is Germany making a deal to give billions of dollars to Russia, and then we're protecting Germany from Russia? How does that work? And then on top of it, Germany is delinquent because they're only paying a little more than 1 percent, and they're supposed to be paying 2 percent, and even the 2 percent is low. But just remember, Trump, me, I got the countries of NATO to spend 1.130 billion, going to $400 billion a year. Think of it, $400 billion a year, more for NATO. And the purpose of NATO primarily is Europe protection against Russia. Now they can use it for other, I guess, and they have a little bit in the Middle East, et cetera, et cetera. But I'm the one that did that. So — but nobody talks about that. Nobody talks about Nord Stream 2. The answer is, absolutely, if they feel that something happens. But I don't know that Germany's in a position right now, because Germany's in a very weakened position energy-wise. They're closing all their plants. They're closing their nuclear. They're closing their coal. They're closing a lot of plants. And they are — they have put themselves in a very bad position, frankly. Very, very bad position. Yeah, please. No, I have nothing against John. I have not, nothing against anybody. No, I was very heartened to see that a friend of his, because I know Zach is a friend of his and worked for him. I was very heartened to see that Zach Fuentes came out with the statement that he did, I guess, late last night, that uh, it was not true. Can I ask another question, Mr. President? Mr. President, what exactly is un-American about federal government training programs that are aimed at improving inclusivity? Well, we're going to do a report. Yeah, I, I fired those people. They're all gone. And uh, it was a disgrace, frankly. And we're going to give you a big report that's going to make you very happy. All right. Yeah, please. Thank you. Darlene Tramiel, AP. You said a moment ago, they will say anything. You were talking about Joe Biden and Kamala Harris and their comments about the vaccine. Do you have a No, they say worse. They say negative. They say negative. They're going to make the vaccine into a negative so that 
when we have it. And I spoke to the head of Pfizer. I spoke to the head of Johnson & Johnson. I spoke to the head of the greatest uh, medical companies in the world. We're doing great. We're going to have it soon. Wait a minute. So now what they're saying is, oh, wow, this is bad news. President Trump is getting this vaccine in record time. By the way, if this were the Obama administration, you wouldn't have that vaccine for three years, and you probably wouldn't have it at all. So we're going to have a, a vaccine very soon, maybe even before a very special date. You know what date I'm talking about. But let me just tell you, wait. And what they're doing, because they think it is going fast, and if you talk to a lot of your sources, if you have sources, if you talk to your sources in the FDA, you'll see it's going very, very well. The, the numbers are looking unbelievably strong, unbelievably good. So now they're saying, wow, Trump's pulled this off. Okay, let's disparage the vaccine. That's so bad for this country. That's so bad for the world to even say that. And that's what they're saying it. But I watched Kamala's poll numbers drop from 15 to almost zero and then drop out even before she ran in Iowa because people didn't like her, and I understand why. She will never be president, although I have to be careful, because Obama used to say that about me, so I have to be a little bit careful. Right. But you have to look at her a little bit more closely, because obviously Joe's not doing too well, so you're going to have to look at her a little bit too closely. But she's talking about disparaging a vaccine so that people don't think the achievement was a great achievement. I don't want the achievement for myself. I want something that's going to make people better, that people aren't going to get sick with. That includes therapeutics, where we're doing equally as well. Okay. Therapeutics. Yeah, Go ahead. Your, your point is that what they're saying is that they're saying it for political purposes. Yes. You have asserted repeatedly that a vaccine will be on the market by before the election. No, I didn't, say, the I didn't say they will. I said by the end of the year. The same thing that no, you but you're not quoting me accurately. I said that vaccines will be on the market before the end of the year. But they may even be on the market. They may even be developed and fully developed, tested, everything else. You know, we have 30,000 people in just one vaccine right now under test in very, very highly infected areas. So we're going to be able to get a good result one way or the other very soon. So I didn't say what you said. What I said is by the end of the year. But I think it could even be sooner than that. It could be during the month of October, actually. Could be before November. But aren't you also saying that for political reasons? No, I'm saying that because we want to save a lot of lives. The fast with me, it's the faster the better. With somebody else, maybe they would say it politically, but I'm saying it in, in terms of this is what we need. We have to have if we get the vaccine early, that's a great thing. Whether it's politics or not. Now, do benefits inure if you're able to get something years ahead of schedule? I, I guess maybe they do. But the most important thing to me is saving lives. It's the most important thing. Yeah, go ahead in the back. Hi. Um, just based on some of your recent tweets, sir, do you... Um, do you sound opinion? so clear, <laughs> as opposed to everybody else, where they refuse. Your tweets about the 1619 projects. Yeah. Uh, why do you object to that being taught in schools? And, and do you object to slavery itself being taught sir, in schools? Yeah, so no, I want everybody to know everything they can about our history. I'm not a believer in cancel culture, the good or the bad. If you don't study the bad, you could happen again. So I do want that subject studied very, very carefully and very accurately. Uh, but uh, we grew up with a certain history, and now they're trying to change our history, revisionist history. That's why they want to take down our monuments. That's why they want to take down our statues. I saw something the other day which was absolutely horrendous, a Washington Monument. They want to rename it the D.C. committee, but the D.C. committee is all Democrats. Abraham Lincoln, Thomas Jefferson. I mean, we're talking about this is the big stuff now. This is the big stuff. And they want to rename it. They want to redesignate it. They want to take some down. No, we don't do that. Never going to happen with me, I guarantee you that. Well, I want to thank you all, and I just want to wish you a very happy Labor Day. And we're having tremendous success, whether it's on the vaccines, whether it's on the pandemic, the the plague that came in from China that China should have never let happen, because I will never feel the same about China. And I just want to, again, wish you a happy Labor Day. Thank you very much. 
All right, everybody, that was President Donald Trump earlier today holding a Labor Day news conference. If any news breaks across the country, we'll have you covered right here on News Now from Fox. My name is Pilar Arias. Again, happy Labor Day, everybody. Thank you so much for spending your holiday with us and your Monday. Coming up next here, I'm going to show you a video courtesy of the United Nations. It is, you remember WHO, the World Health Organization? Yeah, well, they had a news conference today in regards to COVID-19, kind of the global outlook of the pandemic and the situation. So I want to listen in right here on News Now from Fox. I am Fadila Shaib, Communication Officer at WHO Headquarters in Geneva, moderating this press event. We have with us, as always, Dr. Uh, Tedros, the WHO Director General, along with Dr. Mike Ryan, WHO Executive Director of the Emergencies Program, and Dr. Maria von Kerkov, our technical lead for COVID-19. Um, they are in the room. In the room also we have Dr. Maria Angela Simao. She is our Assistant Director General Access to Medicines and Health Products and Dr. Bruce Aylward, Senior Advisor to the Director General who leads on the ACT Accelerator. Uh, we will also be joined by Dr. Sumia Swaminathan, our Chief Scientist. As usual, we are translating this press conference in the six official UN languages plus Portuguese and Hindi. We will be posting the Director General remarks and an audio file of this press conference on the web as soon as possible. The full transcript of this press conference will be ab available later on on the web. But now, without further delay, I would hand over to Dr. Tedros for his opening remark. Dr. Tedros, you have the floor. Thank you. Shukran, shukran Fadila. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. COVID-19 is teaching all of us many lessons. One of them is that health is not a luxury item for those who can afford it. It's a necessity and a human right. Public health. All right, everybody, I believe we have a live event going on with Kamala Harris right now. I'm going to take you to, we'll listen in on this uh, World Health Organization COVID-19 update a little bit later. Well, I want to thank all these leaders, and I'll start with the Lieutenant Governor for your leadership and for the work that you've been doing um, during these most difficult times around the country, including here in Wisconsin. Um, so thank you for your leadership and bringing this group of business leaders together um, this afternoon. And we've had a very important discussion. And it's actually a discussion that continues on a discussion that I've, I've been having throughout my visit today in Milwaukee. It's about talking about the um, dignity of work and the dignity of human beings and, and, and the importance of leadership to then tap into that dignity in a way that we grow capacity. And that's about capacity in individuals, that's about capacity in communities, and ultimately that means about growing the capacity of our country to be strong and to be healthy. Um, we have had an extensive conversation about the fact that if we are going to have safe communities, then we must invest in healthy communities because healthy communities are safe communities. And one of the attributes of healthy communities is that there is access to capital for the small businesses that, um, that are the heartbeat of those communities, that are part of the fabric of those communities. Um, what we know about small businesses and small business leaders is they are not only leaders in business, they are civic leaders. They hire locally. They understand the, 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 the jewels that exist within their community and the need to then encourage all of the good things that can happen in those communities. So we have talked about that. We've, um, there have been a number of, of issues that have been raised, including pointing out that during this, um, epide this pandemic, COVID, um, it has been an accelerator in many ways. And one way that we talked about in particular is um, highlighting the disparities in, in technology based on race. Those who have access to technology, thinking about things like the fact that families now are sending their children back to school virtually and whether that family has access to broadband, 
whether that family has access to the knowledge about how technology works can have everything to do with the capacity of the children of that family to actually survive through this moment, much less thrive. Um, we have talked about the importance of building an entrepreneurial class, meaning having our government and as our priorities, and it is part of Joe Biden and, and my priority, investing in entrepreneurship and investing not only through the work that we will do that is about access to capital through the Small Business Administration, access to capital about putting money into opportunity zones is one part of it, but also um, $150 billion in new capital and opportunities around investing in private venture capital as well as what the government can do. But that this is about an investment in not only those specific communities, but in our country. Understanding that some of the greatest sources of, of wealth and intergenerational wealth come about through that kind of focus. We have talked about the importance of community banks. During the course of this crisis, up to 90% of minority and women-owned small businesses did not get the benefit of the PPP, in large part because, you know, unlike how Donald Trump has, has been concerned about the wealthy, um, the people who are working every day and trying to, to raise their families don't have the access to those kinds of relationships and have not received the benefit of something like the PPP. We've talked about the need to make tax credits permanent um, and doing that and through doing that, increasing funding to um, as much as $5 billion annually to provide credit for equity investment in small businesses that benefit low and moderate income areas. So these are some of the conversations that we've had this afternoon. Um, and it is also in the context of a pledge that Joe Biden and myself are making to small businesses throughout our country, including here in Milwaukee, that we see you, we understand the significance of what you are in terms of the health and well-being of communities, and we see the benefit to the entire country to invest in our small businesses and our small business leaders. And so um, that is why we are here today, and I couldn't be more thankful for the business leaders who have taken time out of your days. Um, today, of course, is Labor Day, and so part of the work that we've been doing today is to honor the men and women of labor, including, um, we talked about this, the pride that Milwaukee and so many of us have in organized labor. Um, the lieutenant governor talked about that and, um, and what we must do to always support um, the working man and woman to be able to collective, to engage in collective bargaining and to have all of the wages and benefits that come with a hard day's work and the acknowledgement of the dignity of work. So um, with that, uh, Lieutenant Governor, I'm going to pass the mic for you to make some statements. All right. well, thank you so much. Um, I just want to thank you for being here. I want to remind people that this is uh, the Senator's very first trip, so we are excited uh, to be able to participate in that. I think I speak for everybody uh, in this room as we know how crucial the state of Wisconsin, especially the city of Milwaukee, uh, will be in the upcoming election. It's an important uh, thing for us to have leaders who care, leaders who are going to show up and listen to the concerns, especially uh, with so many uh, black business owners here at the table right now. And you juxtapose that with the White House's recent decision to uh, cancel all trainings related to race. Uh, and it's unfortunate that at a time where we have so many disparities here in Milwaukee and the state of Wisconsin all across the country, uh, that Donald Trump won't respond to that crisis within a crisis. So we are very honored, uh, proud, and lucky to have uh, Senator and soon-to-be Vice President Harris with us today. And I will pass it back over to you because I know you want to take some questions before you get out of here. Oh, all right.
All right, everybody, I'll keep a close eye on that live picture. And if it comes back uh, stable or anything different, I'll bring it back to you right here on News Now from Fox. That was about seven minutes of Senator Kamala Harris at a round table there in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I'm going to take you back out to the uh, World Health Organization update that we were listening to just moments ago. says that outbreaks and pandemics are a fact of life. But when the next pandemic comes, the world must be ready, more ready than it was this time. In recent years, many countries have made enormous advances in medicine, but too many have neglected their basic public health systems, which are the foundation for responding to infectious disease outbreaks. Part of every country's commitment to build back better must therefore be to invest in public health as an investment in a healthier and safer future. In fact, there are many examples of countries that have done exactly that. Thailand is reaping the benefits of 40 years of health system strengthening, a robust and well-resourced medical and public health system allied with strong leadership informed by the best available scientific advice, a trained and committed community workforce with one million village health volunteers, and consistent and accurate communication have built trust and increased public confidence and compliance. As you know, Italy was one of the first countries to experience a large outbreak outside China and in many ways was a pioneer for other countries. Italy took hard decisions based on the evidence and persisted with them, which reduced transmission and saved many lives. National unity and solidarity combined with the dedication and sacrifice of health workers and the engagement of the Italian people brought the outbreak under control. Mongolia acted very early activating its state emergency committee in January. As a result, despite neighboring China, Mongolia's first case was not reported until March, and it still has no reported deaths. Mauritius has high population density, with high rates of non-communicable diseases, and many international travelers, which meant it was at high risk. But quick, comprehensive action initiated in January by Mauritius and previous experiences with contact tracing paid off. Although the Americas has been the most affected region, Uruguay has reported the lowest number of cases and deaths in Latin America, both in total and on a per capita basis. This is not an accident. Uruguay has one of the most robust and resilient systems in Latin America with sustainable investment based on political consensus on the importance of investing in public health. Pakistan deployed the infrastructure built up over many years for polio to combat COVID-19. Community health workers who have been trained to go door to door vaccinating children for polio have been utilized for surveillance, contact tracing, and care. There are many other examples we could give including Cambodia, Japan, New Zealand, the Republic of Korea, Rwanda, Senegal, Spain, Vietnam, and more. Many of these countries have done well because they learned lessons from previous outbreaks of SARS, MERS, measles, polio, Ebola, flu, and other diseases. That's why it's vital that we all learn the lessons this pandemic is teaching us. Although Germany's response was strong, it is also learning lessons. I welcome the announcement by Chancellor Angela Merkel over the weekend that her government will invest 4 billion euros by 2026 to strengthen Germany's public health system. I call on all countries to invest in public health and especially in primary health care and follow Germany's example.
Tomorrow, the review committee of the international health regulations will begin its work. The international health regulations is the most important legal instrument in global health security. As a reminder, the review committee will evaluate the functioning of the IHR during the pandemic so far and recommend any changes it believes are necessary. It will review the convening of the emergency committee, the declaration of a public health emergency of international concern, the role and functioning of national IHR focal points, and will examine progress made in implementing the recommendations of previous International Health Regulation Review Committees. The names of the members of the committee were published on WHO's website yesterday. Depending on progress made, the committee may present an interim progress report to the resumed World Health Assembly in November and a final report to the Assembly in May next year. The committee will also communicate as needed with other review bodies, including the Independent Panel for Pandemic Preparedness and Response, IPPR, and the Independent Oversight Advisory Committee, IOAC, for the WHO Health Emergencies Program. Finally, today is the first international day of clean air for blue skies. The pandemic and the measures taken in many countries to contain it have taken a heavy toll on lives, livelihoods, and economies. But there have also been some unexpected benefits. In many places, we have seen a significant drop in air pollution. We have been reminded of how starved our lungs have been of clean, unpolluted air. We have had a glimpse of our world as it could be, and that is the world we must strive for. Ultimately, we're not just fighting a virus. We're fighting for a healthier, safer, cleaner, and more sustainable future. I thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Tedros. Uh, I will now open the floor to a question from the press. I would like to remind um, the, the journalists that you need to raise your hand. Just use the raise your hand icon in order to get in the queue to ask a question. Also, uh, remember, we have a large number of you in the queue, so please limit your questions to uh, one. We will start uh, with a journalist from Africa, um, South Africa Broadcasting Company. Sophie, can you hear me? Sophie? Yes, I can hear you. Uh, my question is directed to uh, Dr. Ryan and uh, uh, Dr. Tedros. Uh, some few weeks ago, you took a decision to send uh, WHO officials or scientists to come and help South Africa when numbers were really uh, rising. We are told now it looks like uh, the numbers have stabilized. What's your assessment? And are they still in South Africa? What has been their role? And uh, what have you learned from uh, their reports? Uh, I think, uh, I'm sure they did send some reports in terms of what's happening in the country. Dr. Ryan? Yes. <clears throat> well, first of all, uh, our gratitude to the government of South Africa and, and the health system in South Africa for uh, accepting uh, the WHO's role in, in, in supporting and advising uh, South Africa on its response. And it's all right, everybody, it appears we're getting an update on the California wildfires impacting so many people. So let's listen in live. hang tight for that. If you've got questions, just find me. All right, again, uh, my name is Catherine Cooley, Public Information Officer for the Bobcat Fire. Uh, first off, we're going to have uh, Chief Robert Garcia, who's the Fire Management Officer here on the Angeles National Forest. Uh, Chief?
Yeah, good afternoon. I'll start out by giving a quick overview of uh, this incident, where we are, and, and kind of how we got here. So yesterday afternoon, just after 12.30, we responded to a reported smoke in the area of Cogswell Dam. That's in the uh, west fork of the San Gabriel River, uh, just north of, uh, or just west of Highway 39, Zusa Canyon. A, a fire quickly uh, uh, erupted into uh, several hundred acres in the area around the dam, threatening structures uh, in the vicinity of San Gabriel, or Cogswell Dam and uh, a couple of other uh, cabins in the area. The fire is in a, in a fairly remote area, a uh, difficult area to get into. And so yesterday we made uh, an attack uh, with mutual aid from Los Angeles County Fire Department with aircraft and ground crews, as well as from the Angeles National Forest and from uh, numerous uh, uh, cooperating agencies that I'll mention here shortly as the afternoon wore on yesterday. It became apparent yesterday based on the activity going on, not only throughout Southern California, but throughout uh, California at large with a number of incidents that we were gonna be challenged with resources to make an aggressive attack, not only through the afternoon, but last night. So uh, yesterday's uh, ground and air attack uh, started out with a first alarm assignment. We also requested a first alarm assignment from Los Angeles County Fire Department and a number of aircraft. Shortly after about uh, 1,400 hours, uh, it became apparent that this was going to be an extended attack fire, meaning extended periods, multiple days in very remote areas, requiring a lot of uh, uh, supply, logistical, and planning support. So the Angeles National Forest ordered up an incident management team to come in and assist us, and that incident management team took command of the fire uh, just this morning at 0700. As of late, the, the fire is just under 5,000 acres with uh, very limited containment due to the fire's continued growth. And, and poor access for ground crews, as well as a limited number of resources available to us. We immediately engaged our uh, agency partners that have jurisdiction in and around this, this fire area, including the City of Monrovia Fire Department, City of Sierra Madre Fire Department, City of Arcadia Fire Department, and as I mentioned, the Los Angeles County Department that has, uh, Fire Department that has protection in the Duarte and Bradbury area. As you can see, in the overnight hours, this fire continued to grow and move down Canyon uh, looking, looking down the canyons of what we call the front country that, that uh, neighbors those uh, foothill communities that I mentioned. We're going to another period of hot and dry and extreme fire weather over the next few days as indicated by the red flag warning posted. And as such, the Angeles National Forest is going into a full closure of the National Forest. So all picnic areas, campgrounds, and developed recreation sites will be closed until further notice on the Angeles National Forest in our, in our effort to conserve resources and, pre, and prevent any further um, wildfires. So at, at this time, I'll, I'll turn it over to a number of the other speakers that can share some of the specifics on the incident about what the actions are taking uh, as we speak, resources, and kind of what our planning objectives are. Okay, our next speaker, I've asked uh, Scott Lynn, he's our fire behavior analyst, uh, to talk a little bit about the weather and how that's going to impact our operations going forward. Scott? Good afternoon, Scott Lynn, fire behavior analyst for the Eastern Area Incident Management Team. So as you've heard, the weather is supposed to get hotter and drier the next uh, September. So, sorry, the weather is supposed to be hotter and drier the next several days, uh, continuing with the forecast of what we've had. And the RRH uh, red safe humidities are going to continue to be very low. Forecasted winds are supposed to increase out of the east-northeast uh, throughout the evening, and then uh, as well tomorrow afternoon and tomorrow night. There will be a slight marine influence at the lower elevations, which should keep a south-southwest flow on the fire. The uh, fire activity will respond where we'll be continuing to have a very active fire behavior. As you've heard, it's in a very remote and uh, challenging terrain for the firefighters to be access in. And so that will continue uh, a pretty active fire behavior with the weather that we have. And we'll be continuing to uh, um, be seeing th that type of activity that we've observed in the past, uh, continuing to see that as we move through in the future, in the next few days. Uh, after, after Wednesday, the forecast is supposed to cool down a little bit, still be above average, uh, but we still will be under that uh, hot and dry influence throughout the time. So we still have a, a few more days to get through these critical periods the next couple of days, and then uh, the fire weather should um, moderate a little bit, enabling a little bit more of an upper hand for the uh, firefighters to take any uh, opportunities then. That's all I have. Thank you.
Thank you, Scott. Our next speaker is going to be um, Keith Murphy. He's our fire operations chief um, for the Eastern Area Incident Management Team. I believe his counterpart, Oscar, um, hopefully is getting some sleep um, today. Um, he's been up all night. So, uh, Keith, let us know what's going on, um, what happened today on the mountain, as well as what's going on tomorrow. Afternoon again, Keith Murphy, Operations Section Chief on the Bobcat Fire. Uh, currently, uh, we have personnel working in and around uh, Cogswell Dam area, uh, securing some structures up there. And uh, our main concern for right now at this point is southwest of the main fire and the southern boundary along the forest boundary edge. So uh, we have crews out there scouting uh, potential line locations for uh, trying to stop this fire. Um, and like you heard uh, Chief Bob say that uh, the terrain is, is pretty tricky, uh, pretty, pretty tough, steep canyons. Um, we can't commit people in there um, at this point in time until we get good eyes overhead, uh, you know, from aircraft looking at um, where we could possibly place uh, some con control lines in there. So. Um, there are some bulldozers working today. Uh, three different bulldozers kind of in that southwest of uh, the Cogswell Dam area, uh, working on previously uh, established lines um, that the forest has identified in there. So that's uh, the main operations going on at this point. Um, we are uh, scouting out ahead of this fire to the north, every direction to the south. We're concerned about the wilderness. Um, but our main priority right now is uh, the forest boundary along all the municipalities. So it's the, the southern edge of that fire coming down towards the municipalities. So that's what we're concerned about now. Um, we're in close coordination with all the municipality fire chiefs. Uh, we had uh, three meetings this morning on uh, planning accordingly uh, if this fire gets active. Um, Resources are trickling in, so I, I hope, uh, anticipate, we'll be able to get started on a little more activity on the fire, a little more suppression activity to uh, help this thing out and uh, try and get some containment on it. So with that, that's uh, the updates for today. Thank you. Thank you, Keith. And if you guys have any specific questions about some of those operations, um, Keith is going to stick around and you guys can follow up with him later. Our next speaker is going to be uh, Commander Marks. Um, evacuations. Evacuations, you know, you guys have had a long uh, fire season. Um, we understand, you know, sometimes there's a lot of fatigue in some of our messaging. Evacuations are cr critically important. And we, we need the public and we need you guys to really help us get that message about, out about uh, making sure the public is prepared uh, for any potential evacuations. So with that, I'm going to have Commander Marks talk a little bit about how that planning effort's going. Good afternoon, Commander Chris Marks, Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department. I'm here representing the Sheriff's Incident uh, Management Team. We're uh, Right now, we don't have any field assets deployed. We are in preparation and planning mode, we, along with our partners at Sierra Madre Police and Mon Monrovia Police Department. We're making all kinds of uh, contingency plans for the different scenarios the fire will present to us and we'll uh, have plans in effect and pre-positioned assets in the event we do need to evacuate and maintain security after the evacuations. We do ask the public, if you don't live in the area, please stay out of the area as the fire, if it does get closer, it's gonna become ever more important for emergency vehicles to get in and out of the area and residents have clear paths to evacuate. If you live along the foothills in the potentially affected areas, you have time now, please make preparations for what you want to take with you if you do need to evacuate, and especially if you have pets or in large animals, you have to make preparations. Please make those preparations now so that we are not all trying to leave and evacuate at one time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Commander. So next on the agenda, we had uh, uh, Chief Robert Garcia, he touched a little bit about the uh, the forest closures on that. If you have additional questions, feel free to follow up with him afterwards. Next up is our uh, incident commander, um, Steve Goldman, um, for the Bobcat Fire with some leaders in tent.
Good afternoon, my name is Steve Goldman. I'm the incident commander for the Eastern Area Incident Management Team for the Bobcat Fire. Um, I just want to emphasize our number one priority for this fire is the protection of life and property. The situation that we have right now um, is a life-threatening situation with the weather forecast that we have for the next three days. So we have a red flag warning today and we have Santa Ana winds predicted for the next two days. So what that means for the public is we really need you to pay attention to any instructions on evacuation as the fire is likely to move south towards six communities. There's a lot of people, a lot of property to the south of this fire right now and so we're working very hard with all the fire departments and law enforcement to make sure that we're prepared as that fire moves south. There's very heavy fuel, it's very dry, we're in drought, the slopes are extremely steep, so that makes the job that we're doing especially difficult and the firefighters can do their best work when the public listens to those evacuation instructions and allows those firefighters to do what they know how to do best, which is fight fire in these conditions. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. And lastly, I'm going to call up uh, Deputy Chief David Richardson with the LA County. Um, LA County. <laughs> who are you with? Fire department. Fire department. Excuse me. <laughs> Good afternoon. David Richardson, Chief Deputy Emergency Operations for Los Angeles County Fire Department. Uh, thank you all for being here. And uh, thank you for your uh, viewers that are uh, listening in at this point in time. Uh, LA County Fire Department at this point in time is an assisting agency for the fire, uh, the Bobcat fire. Uh, I can't tell you, we've been working closely with the Angeles National Forest and our partner uh, fire departments throughout the foothills. Uh, last night, Los Angeles County Fire Department uh, flew a, uh, a copter at night, dropped water dropping copter all night long, and has uh, inserted crews to try to get ahead of this thing. Um, Again, today, crews, LA County Fire is assisting with uh, aircraft as well as uh, crews on the ground uh, with our focus on pre-planning. You've kind of heard that from the sheriff and you've heard that from others up here uh, this afternoon. Uh, really, the focus is if and when the fire comes down the hill, we are prepared to uh, deal with that. Uh, throughout the day, last night and again today, uh, we have uh, dedicated individuals working together uh, Los Angeles County Fire Department along with uh, Monrovia, Sierra Madre, um, and Arcadia Fire Departments as well as Pasadena all on the same page communicating and uh, coming up with a plan to identify the number of resources needed if and when the fire does come down canyon. Um, it's an important point in time to reiterate, because I know there's a number of warnings that have gone out to the communities in the foothills, is the Ready, Set, Go program. Uh, all of us in Southern California are well aware, uh, and across the state, quite frankly, of the Ready, Set, Go program for folks to now is the ready part. Get your uh, family set, include your pets, uh, medications, important records and documents if in fact you've been identified in one of those foothill communities and in fact you will need to evacuate once that evacuation order is given. Don't wait to get things ready. Uh, it's too late if that evacuation order comes and you need to leave. So prepare now. You have time to prepare now again if and when that fire does move off the top of the mountain. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. And I'm glad he uh, he mentioned all the, the partners involved. So we have a lot of, a lot of partners, a lot of folks uh, with us today, uh, a lot of different uniforms, a lot of different badges. So if you have specific questions about a particular municipality, organization, uh, feel free to reach out and we'll get you a contact with them as well. Um, I guess right now we'll just take a few general questions. If you have some, that would be great for the, yeah. the good of the order. Sir.
Duarte and Monrovia are the two that are closest. So, but if you get a Santa Ana condition, really all six of those communities, Bradbury, Azusa, um, oh gosh, I'm, Bradbury. yeah, Bradbury, Azusa, mm -hmm. uh, Arcadia, Madre. and Sierra Madre, all of those six, because of the rate of spread of a fire like that, they're all either going to be in a warning or an evacuation mode if you get a, a strong Santa Ana push of that fire. But the two communities that would be impacted first would be Monrovia and Duarte. Hopefully the fire doesn't come down that fast and we can manage it much better. Tactically, is there anything there in the way of previous burning that has burned out some of the fuel in those foothill communities that could give you guys some breathing room or ability to get in there and stop it? To the east, there was a fire three weeks ago. So to the east, yes. However, directly coming down into Monrovia and Duarte, no, the, that area has not burned in 50 to 100 years in some places. So the fuel loading is high and there is not a, a natural break from the fuels from previous fires. Chief Richardson, for a minute, if you could step forward along with the Thank Sheriff's you. Department, I'd like to get you guys up here. I got you. How critical is it for people, literally, I mean, you said ready, set, go, that's fine, but this is PYSD, get your stuff together. Are you telling people in the next 12 hours, if you're within range of those foothills, you should right now be ready to get in your car and leave? Absolutely, so I know uh, a number of the foothill communities they have, again, keeping in mind, Los Angeles County has a responsibility of Bradbury, cities of Bradbury and Duarte, okay? Monrovia and all the communities out through to Pasadena, they have the, their individual fire agencies as well as their law enforcement uh, agencies in those jurisdictions. LA County Fire, along with the Sheriff's Department, are working closely, as you can see behind me, all the police agencies and fire agencies to ensure that messaging is getting out to the public. The time is to prepare now and not wait until that evacuation order is given. Commander Marks, if you would, step forward. Why is it critical to get people out and clear those roads? Well, obviously, if everybody tries to leave at once and then you've got fire assets trying to get into the fire, you're going to have roadblocks. I've personally worked other fires where I've seen strike teams of fire departments stuck in traffic with horse trailers trying to come out of horse property. So we need everybody that lives in this area along the foothills especially if you have large animals, start making plans now so that when you get to that ready, set, go part, that go means go now, and you're not having to wait an hour or two, and then we're competing and we're having traffic going both ways. So if you can, pack your car up now. If you live in one of those areas that could be threatened by this, pack your car up with the belongings you think you want to take now and just be ready. And if you don't, and if you don't have to evacuate, that's great, you were prepared. Right. So that's why, and that's why we're here now, the law enforcement presence is here now. Even though there's not evacuations, we're here now making preparations, coming up with missions and deciding how many personnel we're going to need to evacuate, maintain traffic control, and then maintain security of any area that's evacuated. So we'll have all those plans in place, we'll have the amount of people we'll need, and we'll, we'll put it in place. And so those homes will be protected. General That's right. Once it's evacuated and we've locked that area down, nobody comes back in and we'll have patrols within the area looking for anybody that's out in that area. So I think Thank the key you. message right now, Peter, is that you need to get the message out for us. Do your job and make sure you get those people informed that they need to be ready. Yeah. And we need your help. Uh, quick one for Scott Flynn if uh, you step Absolutely. up. Scott. Just in terms of probabilities and know that as the winds come from the north or from the east northeast that it's going to funnel down some of these canyons uh, some of the canyons leading into places like Sierra Madre on up uh, even towards Duarte you've got Santa Anita Canyon for example that hasn't burned for a long time and perhaps could be a really tough issue when you look at some of these canyons which ones really kind of stick out for you as problematic as aligning terrain with Right now, it's it's any of those canyons have the possi uh, possibility of aligning properly. It's all really going to comes down to the the initial or the actual wind event and how those winds come across that area. Uh, the uh, the traditional Santa Anas that we usually are seeing during the late winter. This is not one of those typical or late fall um, scenarios. 
so don't don't think that what we are seeing with the Santa Ana is going to be exactly like what we would see during the late fall time frame in those really um, but yes there's definitely some concerns any of those winds or any of those canyons that are aligned uh, in those areas mentioned those are definitely probabilities that we can be seeing that activity so how is it how's it atypical I mean people who live up in the foothills we know what it typically is like how is this going to be different this one's a little bit different just because the there's not quite as much cold air aloft uh, that is uh, that would drive these uh, the really really strong winds uh, quite down as deep in the uh, uh, or down to the surface as much as, they, as we would see during that typical uh, late fall time frame. So less windy than what we would see? There's that possibility, yes. Okay. And then uh, just real quickly, in terms of uh, what could potentially burn from a you know, vegetation standpoint towards the observatory and towards Angeles Crescent Highway, what, what does that look like? Right now with the predominant winds uh, for the area, we have more of a uh, west southwest push or southwest wind which typically would um, push that fire away from that more in towards that San Gabriel uh, wilderness area and so the fire behavior moving up towards the western uh, side of this fire would be um, more of a uh, flanking fire not quite as extreme as you would see uh, heading off to, in those other directions towards the uh, north and east Some of, the, some of the questions are kind of related to what the fuel looks like, and, and we have questions about recent fires in the area. So if you remember the 2009 station fire, it burned into the San Gabriel Wilderness area. So where the, where the leading edge on the north side of this fire is burning into, it's burning into that uh, 2009 station fire. So one thing that, that, that helps with is it's a lot lighter fuel load compared to where it is on the south side. We talked about fire history. The canyons that this fire is lined up with, Monrovia Canyon, San Anita Canyon, Little San Anita Canyon, those canyons have not burned since 1957 on the Monrovia Peak Fire. So that can give you some kind of idea of how many years and decades of fuel loading and uh, fire intensity could be burning in that area. And so when you're looking at not only the wind and the weather forecasts, how that lines up with topography, these canyons are lined up in alignment with the north wind. They, they run north and south. So that's going to present us some challenges. But really, the, the area burning to the north in the wilderness area is a lot lighter fuel load and it's going to give us an opportunity to catch that in that lighter fuels where we're going to be really challenged is on the, in the south side. Thank you. And there are questions for the good of the order. Okay, thank you very much. We'll mingle. Yes, sir. Spanish? Uh, somebody? We'll, we'll talk. All right, thank you very much for coming. I appreciate it. We will keep you updated. Uh, the, the most current information is going to be posted on InstaWeb. Search Bobcat. Uh, and be advised that there's also a bobcat fire in Montana. So make sure you look at the one in California. Thank you. All right, everybody. So that's the latest out of Azusa, California, not too far from Los Angeles on the bobcat fire. I'm going to take you back out to the World Health uh, COVID-19 update, organization's update from earlier today. You're watching News Now from Fox. Thank you for being here. The number of cases has stabilized and is now dropping in South Africa, but uh, let me be clear that that is not down to WHO, that is down to the hard work of frontline workers in South Africa, the cooperation and commitment of communities and the leadership uh, of the government. Uh, in terms of the, the team on the ground, and many of the team who are on the ground have come from other African countries, uh, and really has been about sharing experiences about getting communities on board, about improving surveillance, distributing surveillance deeper uh, into community levels, uh, in increasing uh, protection and training of health workers uh, and ensuring that hospitals and health facilities don't become epicenters of disease. So the, the lessons learned and the, the knowledge exchange has been, has been, has been excellent. Uh, and in many ways, South Africa reached out to WHO, not through weakness, but through strength in recognizing that it had a complex outbreak on its hands, uh, and not that it needed the help of WHO, but what it wanted to do was be able to work with WHO to identify areas in which uh, things could be done better. Uh, South Africa has a strong health system, very strong laboratory system, very uh, proud history in diagnostics uh, and uh, proud history in vaccination. So uh, I think also a lot of the, some of the work has been looking at preparation for down the line uh, and how 
a country like South Africa, again, can prepare itself for potentially delivering a safe and effective vaccine when, uh, when that comes uh, through the pipeline in the coming uh, months. So uh, I think that's uh, the more general overview. We'd be very happy to do a specific debriefing uh, with journalists on the South African mission and the findings of that, uh, and particularly with our colleagues in uh, the African Regional Office and Dr. Chidi Mueti, the Regional Director. So we'll be very pleased if, if particularly journalists based in Africa would like to have a special session on that. We'd be very pleased to, to organize that with our colleagues in Brazzaville. Thank you, Dr. Ryan. Dr. Tedros? Yeah, thank you. Th thank you, Sophie. Thank you. Very nice to hear your voice. Uh, I, I fully agree with what uh, my general Mike said. Um, actually, South Africa's request uh, to work with WHO was from, a stra from a, um, an angle or side or size or side of strengths. Um, we really appreciate uh, humility in, in leadership. Um, while doing their best, and even without WHO, they can uh, do well. Uh, asking to work together and asking for support shows uh, the humility of the leadership, which is very, very uh, important. And we were very humbled, actually, when we were asked. Actually, the decline started even before we were asked to uh, support. And not just stabilizing, actually, from the figures we have, if you take the number of cases, as you know, July, the week of July 20 was when it, it had the highest peak, around 83,000, more than 83,000 cases uh, per week. And now in August 24, the week of August 24, that's the last week, it's now uh, 15,000 cases per week. This is a significant reduction. Uh, but n not just the number of cases, uh, the, the most important uh, indicator is actually deaths. And the number of deaths, if we take when it reached its climax, the August 3, uh, more than 2,000 a week. Now, in August 24, it's actually 994, August 24. So uh, South Africa is doing its, its best. Uh, we know it's very, very complicated, uh, but it's doing its, its best, and we're very glad to partner and send our colleagues uh, there to, to work with. And it's an honor for us to support any, any country. And with the current trend, uh, we hope to uh, further uh, push it to a decline and further uh, control uh, the pandemic. But I would like uh, to use this opportunity to thank the leadership of the uh, uh, president, uh, President Ramaphosa, uh, not only in South Africa, but in the whole continent by helping uh, to develop the continental strategy, uh, one continental strategy, and helping the, ca the continent to move, uh, to move as one. And, and, and of course, uh, the other things he's, he's doing to help not only South Africa, but the whole continent. Thank you so much. Thank you, DG. Thank you, Sophie. Now we move to Mexico, to Cancun. Uh, we have with us Paulina. Alcazar from Incadena News. Polina, can you hear me? Hola, si me escuchan? Yes, please go ahead. Hola, gracias por recibir mi pregunta. Les envío un saludo desde Cancún. Eh, personas que ya pasaron la enfermedad y esperaron el tiempo indicado para regresar a sus trabajos. Pero el ramo hotelero, los trabajadores que atienden al turismo, regresan con el miedo a ser infectados por segunda vez. La doctora Clarisa Etienne de Pajo advirtió sobre la transmisión del virus cuando viajan al extranjero. ¿Saben cómo se ha comportado la enfermedad en estas tres o cuatro personas que se contagiaron ya por segunda vez? Gracias. Thank you, Paulina. Um, Dr. María will, uh, will take this question. Thank you. Sorry, Fidela, I was, I was listening for the translation. Thank you for our translators. Um, so thank you very much for the question, Paulina. Um, the question is about uh, what we understand about reinfection. 
Um, so let me first start with what we know about what happens when somebody is infected with the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Um, when somebody is exposed and somebody is infected with this virus, their body develops an immune response, an antibody response, which develops a week or two, sometimes a little bit longer after that infection. And that antibody response um, provides some protection to that individual, and it protects them against reinfection. What we're learning about right now, and there are many studies that are underway, really excellent studies that are following individuals over time, looking at how long that antibody response lasts. First of all, how strong that antibody response is, depending on the type of disease you experience, whether you have uh, asymptomatic infection, whether you have mild disease, or all the way through severe disease. And we are seeing that people, even with asymptomatic infection, still develop an immune response. What we need to better understand how, is how strong that is and for how long it lasts. Um, there are a number of studies that are underway that are following individuals, the same individual over time. Um, and there are some very promising results from these studies that are showing that the antibody response lasts, it stays strong for a certain number of months. We're only eight months into this pandemic, and so we haven't followed uh, individuals for many, many, many months. Um, so we don't know how long that, that uh, robust immune response lasts. We do have some case reports of individuals um, who have appeared to be infected a second time. Um, there are a couple of case reports that we are aware of, uh, ones that are, have been confirmed by full genome sequencing, which essentially they had a sequence at the first time the person was infected, and then they did a sequence again at the second infection, or presumed second infection. They've compared those two sequences, and they see enough of a difference to say this is a new infection. Um, there's an example from Hong Kong. Um, and there's an example I've seen in a preprint from the U.S., and there are a few other examples, a handful of other examples, a small number from a couple of additional countries. Um, in those individuals, what we are looking for is what type of an immune response did they have on their first infection, if that was even measured, and then at the time of the second infection, did they have measurable antibodies? And I think that's really important for us to really understand, to see if that immune response lasts. Because in some individuals, an immune response may decline. But again, we do need to put this into context. You know, out of, out of more than 26 million cases, having some case reports of reinfection tells us that this is possible, but it doesn't tell us what's happening at a population level. We have examples of it, and so we're following this over time, and we're working with labs um, to determine looking at that full genome sequence to see if there's a second infection. Um, so we do know that it's impossible, but there are only a few case reports that have been reported to date. Thank you, uh, Maria. Uh, we will now move to, I believe, a new journalist joining us today, uh, Leroy de Souza from Mint, India. Uh, de Souza, can you hear me? Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yes, very well. Go ahead, Hi. please. Uh, it's Leroy, but anyway. Uh, so the thing is, uh, I wanted to understand about the COVAX facility. Um, wh who is paying uh, for the COVAX facility? Is it only the developed countries or is it also the developing countries? And I'm asking this specifically with regards to India. Okay, uh, I, uh, can you please tell me if uh, India has come forward to join the COVAX facility and contribute funds towards it as part of the agreements? And do you want India to play a more proactive role in participating in COVAX? Sonia. Dr. Bruce Elward will take this question. Thank you, Leroy. Thank you very much for the question, Leroy. Um, in fact, uh, 170 countries have now come forward in a fantastic demonstration of international solidarity and cooperation to try and end the, uh, end the acute phase of the pandemic through the working together in the COVAX facility. This includes 78 what we call self-financing countries, but as well as 92 countries that would be eligible for assistance through the COVAX facility. Facility. Um, India is certainly eligible, like all countries uh, in, in, in the world, to be part of the COVAX facility, and discussions are ongoing in that regard. Um, we, from our side, of course, would welcome very much the participation of India as a full member in the COVAX facility, um, both in terms of uh, its extensive experience in, in, in vaccines, extensive experience in working together on the global scene in terms of childhood vaccination 
vaccination, other vaccines, India is an incredibly important player, um, and we're very much welcome to be part of the uh, COVAX facility. At this point, as you will be aware, the COVAX facility is still evolving, and then the final dates actually for confirmation, final binding confirmation in terms of participation of the facility is on the 18th of September. So discussions and negotiations are still ongoing with a broad number of countries in that regard. Uh, Dr. Swaminathan would like to add something. Just to add to what Bruce said, I think India is in a, in a unique uh, uh, situation because obviously of the um, very strong manufacturing capacity uh, in addition to the large population that would need to be covered by vaccination program. So, um, so India is in discussions with the COVAX facilities very much you know, going to be part of the facility, both as a supplier of vaccine doses to the facility, but also as a recipient of uh, vaccines. And as you know, the advantage of being part of the COVAX facility is that you have access to a very broad uh, array of vaccine candidates because the facility is investing in a large number of candidates trying to accelerate both the development as well as the manufacturing so that you have at least a few winners in that pool, which uh, would then obviously need to be scaled up and distributed equitably uh, to countries across the world, whether they are self-financing and paying for their doses or whether they're receiving it through the global uh, AMC facility. Um, the other challenge that countries need to start thinking about now is how the delivery of these vaccines is going to happen. This is not a childhood vaccination campaign or immunization campaign. This is going to be very different. Uh, it's going to be vaccinating adults, certain high-risk groups and vulnerable groups. And this is going to be um, different from what's been done in the past. It's going to be a challenge for countries, particularly those with large populations. And so a lot of thinking is happening both at the global level as well as at the national level with the national a vaccine task force that's been set up in many countries, including in India, to really think through these issues and start building and investing in the systems that are going to be needed, whether it's human resources, you know, whether it's supply chain and cold chain, uh, logistics, uh, syringes and needles, the training, uh, as well as the databases that would need to be put in place. So, so yes, I think we, we all have to learn from each other and, and, and help, uh, help each other uh, to, to develop those, those systems. So on the one hand, we have, of course, the vaccine doses that would need to be procured and distributed, but then how are they going to get to the right people within the country in a fair and equitable and ethical manner? Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Swaminathan. Now we will move to uh, Michael from CNN Opinion. I don't want to misread your name, but let me try it. Busio Kiv. Is it right, Michael? <laughs> uh, very good, Fadila. I'm glad you haven't forgotten. <laughs> uh, <laughs> greetings uh, from British Columbia, Canada. And um, look, I, I hope I speak on behalf of all of us when I salute you all for the extraordinary media outreach you've been doing. Uh, it's extraordinary, and it's been a very long emergency, so I salute you. My question is about uh, faith in public health agencies. Um, a former CDC had said recently that the COVID-19 virus response to science and not to spin. But my question is, when the public becomes confused by public health messaging or stops trusting its advice, or when the public health agency, such as the CDC, is seen to be politicized, where does that leave us? Or how much more difficult will it be to fight the virus to the ground? Now, I don't want to put you in the position of criticizing a member state, but as you know, the CDC has been the gold standard in so many <laughs> fights of epidemics. So I just wanted to put that to you because the importance of uh, public health messaging, uh, or rather the trust is so important to everyone. Thank you. Mike. Uh, uh, thank you. Yeah, I, I think, well, first of all, uh, you, did, you did mention the CDC there and uh, again uh, greetings to our colleagues there and, uh, and it is true that uh, uh, all uh, all great nations invest 
in their institutions that guide and frame policy for, for citizens. It doesn't matter if you're in, in, in India or, or in Brazil or in, in uh, the European Union or anywhere. You'll see many countries are measured by how they invest in their institutional policy platforms that allow good decisions to be made. And that doesn't matter if it's economic decisions, health decisions, ec uh, education decisions. Uh, good decisions are based on having the best information processing that information in a way that leads to policies that drive the best outcomes for citizens. It's not just true of science. Governments listen to evidence. Governments listen to science. Uh, but governments also have to implement policy. Uh, and there is a gap between sometimes the pure science and the actual policies that work. And that's where a government has to operate and be accountable for that translation of science into effective, affordable policy that allows a society to move forward with trust that the government is doing its best in the interest of people. No one expects governments to be perfect. Now, certainly no one expects politicians to be perfect. Uh, but uh, the reality is everyone is expected to make the best effort based on the best interests of citizens, based on the best evidence. And that, in that sense, institutions that govern science and that translate science into policy and that ensure that the best possible uh, drugs, the best possible vaccines, the best possible strategies are put in place to contain disease are extremely important. Their independence is very important because citizens must be convinced that they're giving their evidence based on the benefit uh, uh, and the, um, uh, the advantage of, of, of ordinary citizens. So yes, it's really important that such institutions are independent all over the world. It's really important that governments listen to that advice, uh, but it's also important that governments have the space to implement policy uh, that is based on that advice, but not exclusively based on that advice at all times. Uh, uh, and therefore, I think, uh, yes, more and more governments, and there are many, uh, you've mentioned the US, there are many fine institutions in the United States and in other countries that have for decades and decades been world leaders in generating evidence that has benefited not only American citizens, but citizens all over the world. And we trust that those institutions will continue uh, to perform in the way they have on behalf of US citizens and the rest of us around the world in the coming months and years. I think Maria would like to add something. Yeah, very briefly, um, just, just to come to the, the part of your question around the challenges of science and SPIN and, and in this situation that we're in. I think, as Mike has said, many public health agencies are being challenged. WHO was challenged. Um, but I think what we try to do, and we are an evidence-based organization, as you know, we are rooted in the science. Our role is to consolidate, to review, to reach out, to gather information from our international networks, which exist, existed before COVID-19, but are now focused on COVID-19, um, looking at surveillance, looking at epidemiology, seroepidemiology, mathematical modeling, vaccine, infection prevention and control, et cetera, et cetera. What we do is we reach out to experts that are all over the world that have frontline experience dealing with this pathogen um, so that that knowledge can be shared you know, faster than any peer-reviewed publication that can come out, any report that can be generated, so that we are learning, constantly learning about this brand new virus that didn't exist eight months ago. Um, and so one of the things that we do, and you've heard us speak a lot about how we develop guidance, how guidance is developed based on evidence, based on practical experience by frontline workers, by people dealing directly with this virus um, through observational studies or labs or whatever that may be and consolidating that into practical evidence-based guidance. And I think that's our role. And that's the role of USCDC and the role of many public health agencies is to consolidate it and put that out. Now, we try to be very clear in our guidance, which is focused on reaching decision makers and reaching uh, ministries of health and people that are taking the decisions to implement. We try very hard to make that clear and concise and, and uh, readable and actionable. We sit here and we do these press conferences. We do lots of different information products and we're surrounded in a room with many different uh, communications colleagues and risk communications colleagues to get the information out to different audiences because we know when we speak in scientific jargon that doesn't always translate to the individual um, and to say, what does this mean for me? 
We don't always get it right, and we know that. Um, we also rely on journalists, we rely on you to report the information in a balanced way and not to sensationalize it to get the headline, to not confuse the general public, and you're doing that. And we need journalists as partners to help us get that information out as well. Because as you say, there's a huge amount of information that's out there, it's too much, it's this infodemic. It's too much information and our brains are really not meant to absorb all of that. So how can we get it out clearly? to get the right information to people to know what do you need to do? What do I need to do to protect myself, protect my family? And I think all of us have this role to play in this, whether it's the scientists or the international agencies or the national agencies, it's the journalists helping us get it out in the general public, it's all of the different information products. And, and we're learning, you know, we're, we're doing this as best as we can. We don't, as I said, we don't always get it right, but we are all trying to save lives. And I think with that in mind, um, and with the science on our side, um, we can continue to do that. Um, and as science evolves, as science grows, this is a positive thing, we will continue to get that message out. And we know that you will hold us accountable to making sure that it's clear. Thank you, uh, Maria. We will move now to Gunilla von Ho, Swedish journalist uh, based here in Geneva. Gunilla, can you hear me? Gunilla? Okay, we will come back to Gunilla later on. Now we can move to uh, a journalist from BBC Africa, Roda Odiombo. Roda, can you hear me? Hi, can you hear me? Yes, perfectly. Go ahead, please, Roda. Uh, so my question can be answered by either Dr. Ryan or Van Kerkhove. Um, is a, I'm just wondering with the, so many unknowns about COVID-19, is a corpse of a patient who has died from the disease still infectious? I'm asking this because Kenya's health ministry is in the process of changing uh, its burial gu guidelines on grounds that the body is not infectious. Thank you. Maria? So I, I can begin. So. Um, in fact, we've just uh, updated our guidance on the management of, pe of dead bodies uh, from, from COVID-19 um, and issued guidance on the safe uh, preparation of the body, um, not only for infectious diseases, but also to be culturally sensitive, religiously sensitive, and, and just sensitive to the fact that an individual has died. Um, and, and the safe management of that in terms of the appropriate types of uh, personal protective equipment that an individual needs to wear when they prepare the body. It depends on the type of preparation that is being made for the body. Um, this, is a, this is a virus um, that spreads through, through these droplets or through these infectious uh, small particles, um, mainly through the respiratory route, um, but there are other ways that you can come in contact with the virus through touching of, of contaminated uh, materials and, and contaminating yourself. Um, but there's safe ways to be able to do that. So we've just recently reissued uh, updated guidance on that, and we can make sure that we send that to you um, so that you have access to specifics within that guidance document itself. Thank you, Maria. Uh, we will move now to Di Young from Xinhua. Can you hear me? Di Young from Xinhua, can you hear me? Uh, yes, yes. Can you hear me? Yes, perfectly. Go ahead, please. Okay. Thank you for taking my question. China has had no local infections for the past 20 days, as all cases were imported and have been quarantined right away. The government is staging an award ceremony tomorrow for some individuals and organizations for their outstanding performance in fighting COVID-19. Would you mind sharing some of your thoughts on this? Thank you. Thank you. A question for Dr. Ryan? Yeah, um, well, uh, first of all, I'm not aware of the ceremony, but uh, uh, our uh, deepest uh, congratulations go to the frontline health workers in China who've, uh, and the population who've worked together uh, tirelessly to, to, to bring the disease to this uh, very low level. It's taken a long time uh, after a horrific start in, in Wuhan and uh, a terrible toll. And almost, I think, all provinces in China have experienced disease. Uh, Bruce and Maria were there. They can maybe speak to that experience. But, there's, but a huge uh, partnership between communities 
scientific institutions, public health institutions and the government, uh, uh, and a lot of cooperation, um, a very sustained commitment to getting the job done. So uh, we, we, we congratulate the front frontline workers and the communities in China for having uh, reached uh, such a, a successful outcome. But as we've learned in other countries, as all of us have learned, uh, it's not over anywhere until it's over everywhere. And as you said yourself in your question, uh, China continues to import cases from outside. So there is no room for complacency. Uh, 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 and as normal life returns in many countries, and especially in, in China, there's always the risk that uh, disease can flare up again and sporadic cases can turn into clusters. Clusters can turn into community transmission. And community transmission can lead to overwhelmed health systems. We saw that happen in the earlier part of the year. We continue to see that happen in some countries. We need to avoid that happening again. Uh, and we would also encourage, obviously, countries that have been through the worst and come out of it to continue to offer support to other countries, to offer advice and lessons learned, to offer their partnership, to offer their technology, and to offer their solidarity to the rest of the world. Bruce, Maria, you were there. I was just going to add to that. I think we do need to celebrate the successes where we can. Um, you know, as as this pandemic continues, you know, as Mike has said, as we, you've heard us say many times, we're not out of the woods. We do have a long way to go. The virus has plenty of room to move, but we have tools in place that, that really work. You know, we have tools in place that can um, show that you can safely, you know, break chains of transmission to reduce transmission. Um, in, in places which saves lives. And I think it's important that we do celebrate the successes safely, please. You know, make sure that any type of uh, gatherings that happen are done in a very safe way, um, you know, where you still have your physical distancing and you have all the measures in place. Um, but I do think we need to highlight and support each other in um, sharing the stories of what has worked. I think many people are really in difficult positions right now. Um, I think many people, individuals, governments, you know, everyone is, is tired. Um, and seeing resurgence in many places can be um, very difficult to handle mentally, physically. Um, but we will get through this. And I think showing how you can get through this, showing what works in all of the steps. I think as, as Dr. Tedros has said, you know, the foundation of what we have. And, what I was so impressed with when, when we were in, when Bruce and I and, and the international team were in um, China in February, was looking at the foundations of, of pub, this public health infrastructure, the systems in place that are set up to deal with infectious diseases, a system in place for surveillance, a workforce that was ready and trained to do active case finding. And we're seeing this in many, many countries now. It's not just China now. To see this strong workforce for lab, for testing, for getting samples back, uh, getting test results back very quickly, um, to have infrastructure and a workforce in place, to have isolation uh, take place in not only medical facilities for severe patients or pe people who are at risk of developing severe disease, but to have mild patients cared for in community centers, um, to see uh, community workers who are out there helping to do contact tracing, helping to do um, information and bringing packages to individuals who are in quarantine. You know, there's an entire system that's in place that was activated in China and is being activated in many, many countries now. Um, and I do think, again, to say, let's celebrate the successes where we can, not become complacent because it's not over, but be at the ready. Um, and I think uh, that is a positive thing. So we look forward to more celebrations of success uh, in the sharing of knowledge across the world. Bruce, would like to add something? Yeah, thank you, Fidela. Um, and thanks, Mike, for the opportunity just to reflect on a little bit of what today may mean in terms of what we've seen uh, in China passing this milestone. It's an important one, but as Mike said, uh, um, 20 days without that internal transmission doesn't mean we don't have virus, right, and, and, and staying alert. But it provides an opportunity to reflect a little bit on what we saw when we were in China. And I think three things were particularly striking that are helpful at this point um, in, 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 in this, uh, in this, in this uh, pandemic. 
Um, the first was just the investment. Maria referred to this in the public health infrastructure at the national level, at the state level that we went to, um, uh, province level, pardon me, and then as we got into the municipalities and right down to the community level, there was a public health infrastructure right through all levels of the country that could talk to it, uh, uh, the different pieces and could move information, move learnings, and some things were particularly striking. Uh, they could update their national guidance in a country of over a billion people every week and get that right out through their system so people could stay current. It, it, it was very, very striking um, when you get out to those peripheral levels and saw just how up to date they were and they had the latest information on how to track and, 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 and deal with this disease. But I think probably more striking were two other things that we saw. Um, the first was uh, of, of those, or the second thing overall, was just the sense of individual responsibility that we saw in the Chinese people. Um, when you travel around the country for three weeks and uh, you're staying in hotels, you're traveling in trains, you're in restaurants or various places, socially distanced, <laughs> very distant often, but you do meet um, a lot of people, a lot of, uh, uh, of uh, Chinese individuals, and their sense of responsibility for keeping the world safe, keeping their community safe, for doing the right thing was, was, was probably the most striking thing we saw, that sense of collective responsibility. Um, and when you would talk about the sacrifices that were being made, it was their duty, um, both for their own country and, and, and globally, which, which was, was, was so impressive. And then the third thing we saw, I think uh, Maria might remember, that was uh, so striking was in, in many of the municipalities and provinces that we were in, um, cases were at that point starting to come down, and some provinces down to quite low levels. And we would ask, well, what's happening and what, what next to the mayors or the governors of these big provinces and cities? And they would say, well, and, and we heard it every single place we went. They said, well, we're buying ventilators and we're building more beds and we're doing this, we're doing that. There was, and, and we were just struck by the incredible effort to build additional capacity and preparedness uh, to be able to deal with what they uh, realized would be an ongoing threat for some time. And I think all of those things are part of the reason that we're seeing today the very low levels of transmission that, that hopefully uh, can, can, can be maintained. But it certainly won't be possible without that continuing dedication to all three pieces of uh, what, what was, was rather striking in terms of the response that we saw there. Thank you, Dr. Aylward. Uh, now we will go to Jeremy Lange from Radio France International. Jeremy, can you hear me? Jeremy, I think we lost you. Second attempt? No. No, here you can hear me, I think. <laughs> Jeremy, please go ahead, and I, I guess you are asking not. in French. Uh, I can ask it in English. Uh, answer in French is always welcome, but uh, the English is fine. Um, a question about the, the French government is uh, considering uh, reducing the quarantine period from 14 days to uh, probably seven days. Uh, one of the reasons is that it could help uh, people who are contaminated and their contacts uh, to respect more the quarantine. Uh, what is your opinion about that? Does it make any sense on an epidemiological point of view? Maria will respond to this question. Yes, thank you. Thank you, thank you for the question. Yes, um, I've heard this as well. Um, but just to say that uh, the quarantine period is the period in which time people, contacts of confirmed patients need to be separated from others. Um, the 14 days is based on what we know as the incubation period, which is a time of exposure to the time it takes to develop symptoms. And for most people, the average time is between five and six days. But the upper bound of that is around 14 days, is 14 days. Um, and so that's why we make the, the quarantine period 14 days. We also have been asked by our member states and by everyone to, to, to have a non-test-based quarantine period because it is very difficult globally um, to have a large number of tests be done, and I, we know everyone knows that testing capacity is increasing. Um, we have a 14-day quarantine period, which is this, this, this set um, based on all of the data that we have seen. Um, we initially had suggested and required a test to be done at the end of that quarantine, quarantine day period, but we recently removed that as a requirement. It still can be done. We are also asked by a number of countries if that quarantine period can be reduced. Can it be reduced to 10 days? Can it be reduced to seven days? Can it be reduced to five days? And many countries are considering that 
And I, my understanding of the countries that are doing that are looking at reducing the quarantine period, but then also adding in testing again. And so the point is, is that when you have a quarantine period, your, con case, your contacts of confirmed cases are isolated, are taken out, are, are put in a separate facility so that they don't have the opportunity to pass the virus onto somebody else. Um, and based on the information that we have, the median incubation period is five to six days, but it can go up to 14 days. And so to make sure that we break chains of transmission, our upper bound of that 14 days still holds based on the data that we have seen. Thank you, Maria. We will move now to Lara uh, from Sao Paulo. Folha de Sao Paulo. Lara, can you hear me? Um, yes, hello. Hello. Can you hear me? Yeah, um, very well. Go ahead, please. I'm actually from, from Globo in Brazil, but uh, never mind. Yeah. So my question is, um, you mentioned the, the communications and the, the scientific evidence and the importance of the of agencies such as the CDC. But my question is, what happens when governments um, send controversial messages to the population? I mean, um, here in Brazil, we, we've had um, sort of shutdowns and lockdowns for the population. Um, our schools are still closed mostly, but our president has repeatedly been seen outside without wearing a mask, or he's advocated for, for example, chloroquine, which um, does not have a scientific basis for treatment of COVID-19. So what happens? I mean, where does the population stand in the middle of that? Thank you, Lara. Um, Dr. Ryan will take this question. Thank you, Mike. Yeah, I think we've had uh, many questions over the weeks uh, about uh, Brazil and, and, and government policies and others in Brazil. I think the the Brazil is a very large country. Uh, the state governors have, and the state-based uh, public health uh, authorities have been very involved in, in offering advice and support to communities. Then you have the, the national government, the Pan American Health Organization, PAHO, or our American Regional Office, and ourselves. So uh, c citizens uh, in Brazil and many countries are able to look and seek information from, from, multiple, from multiple sources. Um, and uh, uh, certainly I think it is important more than uh, it is good to be in a position where you can have absolute trust in, in any given government, but it's also important that people seek multiple sources of information. Uh, Maria, as Maria said, maybe there are too many sources of information at times, and that makes it very difficult for people to decide what is credible. But it is very important that governments, and again, it's going back to my previous answer, uh, sometimes uh, messages are sent to communities that, that may have uh, political overtones. But building trust, uh, I remember a, a communications expert once saying to me, it takes years to build trust and seconds to lose it. Um, and I think that's the issue. Uh, good governments build trust with communities by only providing them with verified evidence-based information. Because if things go wrong, communities will understand. But if communities perceive that they're getting information that is being politically manipulated or that is being managed in a way that is, that is distorting evidence, then uh, unfortunately that comes back to roost. Uh, that comes back at a government politically at a later stage. I think that has been the case uh, around the world and, and for many different disasters over time. Transparency, honesty, uh, admitting error, admitting uncertainty, in fact, highlighting uncertainties and then highlighting where certainties do exist. People can take it. People can absorb that. Uh, people are smart and people are realistic and people aren't looking for magical answers and they're not looking for unicorns. They, they understand we all live in the real world and in trying to present uh, oversimplified uh, simplistic solutions for people is not a long-term strategy that wins with populations. So we would call for transparency, consistency, honesty, and admission of uncertainty, admission of error, uh, and I believe that builds trust with communities. And it doesn't matter whether you're a local official, a state official, a national official, or a global official. Those same principles, uh, I think, pertain. And we would call on all governments uh, to look at that and ensure that their strategy for communicating with citizens is sustainable, is honest. Uh, and is committed to the best interest of their citizens. 
Thank you, Dr. Ryan. The next question goes to Stephanie Nibehe from Reuters. Stephanie, can you hear me? Stephanie? Yeah. Yes, thanks. Sorry. Thank you, Fadela. Um, a question, please, um, on, uh, on vaccines. Um, in China, um, the um, vaccinations there are being expanded um, to, you know, med beyond medical staff, diplomats, et cetera, under this emergency program that began in July. Um, our understanding is phase three data is not available, and I wondered how concerned WHO might be about that vaccination proceeding on a wider basis without the data being avail available, and whether WHO is in touch with Chinese authorities to obtain that phase three data, please. Thank you. Dr. Swaminathan will uh, respond. Thank you. Thank you for that question. I could uh, start, and Mary Angela might want to add a little bit on the regulatory aspects. Um, as we have been um, saying in the past, there are clear criteria for how drugs and vaccines are evaluated, new drugs and vaccines are evaluated before they are introduced into the population. And when we're talking about vaccines against COVID, we have to be mindful of several things. One, that they're being developed at the fastest speed that we've ever known before, so unprecedented speed. Second, that we're using a number of new platforms, a number of platforms that have not been used in humans before. We're talking here about the RNA and DNA vaccines and also some of the uh, viral vectors that have not been deployed at scale. And, and then, of course, we're talking about using it not on millions of people, but potentially on billions of people. So we have to put into perspective um, the, the introduction of a vaccine, given these, these new circumstances that have not been um, in, the, in the past, and then evaluating the risks and benefits of, of introducing a vaccine before we have adequate data on both efficacy and safety. So efficacy, one would be able to assess based on, on vaccinating a significant number of people, half given the vaccine, the other half not given the vaccine or given a placebo, and then looking at the number of infections in these two groups, and you expect a, a, a reduction of at least 50% uh, in the vaccinated group. Safety is a little more complex because safety involves both immediate side effects, which are quite common with many vaccines. So you may have fever, you may have pain at the local site or swelling, which usually subsides in a couple of days. But then you need longer follow-up for side effects, particularly unexpected side effects, which you, you may see only over weeks and months. And so we would expect to see a follow-up uh, again for a significant period of time to look both for long-lasting protection and, long, and, and safety signals that may pick up later. So that is why WHO uh, has these criteria, and we'd like to see data on both safety and efficacy in significant numbers of people. So the phase one and two studies are usually done in a few dozen individuals. And while these give you some idea about safety and also an idea about the immunogenicity of the vaccine, what we are really looking for is signals for efficacy and safety in, in during longer follow-up. Now, having said that, national regulatory authorities do have the, the mandate and the power to to allow uh, use of medical products within their own jurisdictions uh, under certain conditions. And an emergency, a pandemic, is, is one of those conditions where um, national regulatory authorities may consider uh, this type of use. Um, hopefully, this is done under monitored conditions. It's done under what we call the emergency use of products uh, under research settings where where people who are given the vaccine are followed regularly, are assessed at periodic intervals, where data is collected and can be used. But this is only a temporary solution. And the solution, the longer term solution, is really completing those phase three trials, which will provide the confidence for those vaccine candidates to be actually used in the, in the millions of doses. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Swaminathan. Um, Dr. Simao, I think, has something to add. 
Just a quick uh, additional information that WHO's office in China and WHO headquarters has been working with the uh, regulatory authorities in China. It's, we're in direct contact and, and sharing information and the requirements for international approval of, of vaccines. So we're working together with the Chinese authorities on this. Thank you, uh, Dr. Simao. I think we are coming up to the hour, uh, so I think we will take uh, one more question, and I will come back to Gunilla. Gunilla, can you hear me? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, please, go ahead, Gunilla. Okay. Thanks, Farilla. Thank you for taking my question. Uh, my question concerns schools, uh, mainly in Europe. They have all restarted now. But there is a certain confusion um, among teachers uh, how to deal with the situation, because you will have children who have coughing or stomach ache, and, and at what point should they actually send them home? At what point, where is the limit for when you should close a class or even a whole school? It should be useful with some more guidance on this. Uh, do you have some? Thanks. Maria, please. Thanks, and thank you for the question. So it's it's really important that um, when schools are, are considering opening up and, and we have the safe resumption of schools is that there are plans in place specifically to address an example of what you just asked in your question. What are the plans in place if you have children that are ill, if you have children um, who have respiratory illness or have fever or are suspected to have COVID-19 or something else? Is there a plan in place within the school itself to say this is a, a case that we're concerned about or a potential case that we're concerned about and to have how the child should be cared for? Um, and then if that individual is a case, what is the plan around contact tracing and what do you do in terms of um, if a classroom should be closed or if there should be a partial closure or not. Um, WHO, with our partners, with UNICEF and, and with others, we have a technical advisory group that is, is helping to advise us on educational institutions, specifically around these considerations. Um, what needs to be taken into account when schools open or how schools open and how they can open safely. Um, and I think one of the big things is, is this plan in place to be able to quickly detect a case and then what do you do if this individual is an actual case? Um, and those plans should be outlined very clearly. What are the actual steps that need to be done in terms of alerting the school nurse um, or the parents, tests that need to be done, the follow-up of contact tracing, informing of the, the class itself and the parents themselves. Um, we are seeing schools that are uh, uh, putting into place um, different measures within the class itself, keeping classes in, in these bubbles, um, so to speak, so that this, the class itself stays together and they don't mix with other classrooms. Um, we are seeing differences in the way that they are approaching this by age, with the youngest children um, having a certain type of um, activities that they have to do per day, making sure that they do their hand hygiene, uh, making sure that they're well informed, older children making sure that they have their physical distancing and hand hygiene, and et cetera, et cetera. Um, but it is very critical that these plans are clear and that it's communicated not only to the staff of the schools, but the children themselves and also the parents. Um, because as the situation evolves, it's really important to know what to do and when to do it. But, uh, maybe I could yeah, just add, because I think for, for a lot of parents, uh, it really comes down to understanding from the school authorities and from the health authorities what's going to happen if my kid gets sick. What's going to happen if there's a suspected case in the school, uh, which is very different to a confirmed case. And it's, it's really important that authorities communicate that clearly and that it's, it, it's clearly laid out to parents. Uh, and you said it in, in your question, if my child has the sniffles or has a mild fever, does that mean they shouldn't go to school and they should wait home and be tested? What are the arrangements? And I think sometimes uh, lives are very busy for people nowadays and, and parents do want to understand the rules of the game, how this is going to work out. Um, and yes, the, the schools have many things in place in terms of pods and cohorting, and it's very important that parents understand that. More importantly, the children understand why the system works that way. But for the decision to send my child to school or not, what's going to happen? Will I be contacted by the authorities? There's an element of stigma. People feel fearful if my kid gets sick and then the whole class is sent home. Does that mean that we're going to be pariahs in the neighborhood? So people have a lot of concerns that bubble underneath the, the processes. And the more that schools communicate with um, parents 
and the more that parents understand what's going to happen if, and the more the public health authorities come in and intervene when there is a confirmed case. And it's very clear that the school doesn't have to go through this process alone. It's not just down to the schools. The schools have prepared a lot. They've brought kids back. But it's also important that public health authorities are there to work with schools so it's clear immediately when there is an incident, an event or a case or a cluster, that the public health authorities come and explain to everyone what's going to happen next. And it's extremely important that we don't see stigma arising from the fact that a child is diagnosed or confirmed with uh, coronavirus. Anybody can get this disease and anybody can carry this disease symptomatically or asymptomatically and it is not the fault of a child that they have this disease. And it's, I think particularly we've seen this in other elements of community practice and we've seen health workers been stigmatised because of COVID. It's really important now we don't stigmatise our children over this or the families of people who have a, a COVID positive case. I think Maria has something to add. Yeah, it's not about the schools. I want to clarify something. So where there was a question that was asked by Jeremy about the French government and, and the question about quarantine. Uh, I answered the question as the quarantine, it relates to the quarantining of contacts of confirmed cases. There are other ways in which the word quarantine is used, so I just want to make sure that my answer is specific to that. What WHO recommends is a quarantine period, so these are contacts of confirmed cases of 14 days. Mm -hmm. And I was referring to the incubation period of when somebody goes from exposure to when they develop symptoms. On average, is between five and six days, but it can go up to 14 days, which is why we make that 14-day period. We are always looking at the evidence of the incubation period coming from all different countries um, and looking at if that can be modified, and, and if so, can be modified with the addition of testing or whatnot. So we are looking at that, but right now, and it continues to remain a quarantine day period of 14 days. I did see a recent review that has looked at the incubation period, um, saying that the mean incubation period, depending on the country, ranges from somewhere between two days and 10 days. The mean incubation period of two days to 10 days. So the 14 day upper bound is really um, a robust number to really prevent the potential for onward transmission. So I just wanted to clarify that because uh, we were having a little debate among here about the actual question itself. So I want to be very clear. Mm -hmm. I and could I also just, just for the on this say, uh, uh, we also advise that people who travel and who travel internationally are travelers. They're not contacts. They may be coming from a country that has a higher incidence. So people who are known contacts of confirmed cases should not travel. Uh, so people who are traveling by definition are not contacts. So they're not the same category as Maria spoke about. Now governments and people have to manage a very complex issue here. Uh, managing two weeks self-isolation or restricted movement when people arrive in a country is for a business person, for someone going home to see family. That, that's quite an imposition. Uh, but those individuals are coming from an area of perceived risk in another country. They're not contacts of COVID. Uh, and therefore, governments are within their rights, if they want to, to reduce the time of observation that those individuals are in specific self-quarantine or self-restricted movement. That doesn't mean that the person loses responsibility to report symptoms if they get them. So I think that's a flexible number, and it's about the, the level of imposition of of, of it, uh, it, it's difficult for people to implement and it's difficult for governments to monitor. So in a situation like a, a, this, I don't know for sure, I haven't seen the issue or the data from the, the French side of the proposal, but uh, especially if you're focusing in on containing your own major community transmission and you're focusing on ensuring that your contacts of cases are self-isolating and you want to track them most aggressively for the 14 days, if people are coming in to your country, in order to reduce the pressure on your follow-up systems, yes, countries could be, um, uh, it would be a defensible thing to say we'll reduce the period of, of observation on travellers coming into our country. And again, each government has to set that period. Some governments are moving towards testing regimes, some governments are, are doing different things. So I, I do think that's, uh, I won't say a flexible issue, but it's an issue in which governments have choices that they can make. But I would be, um, uh, I think Maria is correct, contacts of confirmed cases need to be uh, in quarantine for 14 days. And that's not something that we think would be advisable to reduce or adjust in any way. 
Thank you, Maria. Thank you, Mike, for this clarification. And uh, to our friends, journalists, if you have still any uh, remaining question, please do reach us, uh, reach to the media team. We will make sure you have the answer. I do apologize for those who could not get their questions answered. Uh, we, um, it's already one hour um, press conference, so I will give the final uh, floor to Dr. Tedros, please. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Fadila. So our message uh, today is um, for countries to continue to invest in public health and primary health care while fighting COVID. And many countries who have invested in public health and primary health care uh, are responding to the uh, COVID pandemic uh, in a better way. So investment in public health and primary health care is essential. So with that, uh, thank you so much again for joining us and look forward to uh, seeing you in our uh, next uh, presser. Thank you. Thank you all. Au revoir. All right, everybody. So again, that was the latest from the World Health Organization video courtesy of the United Nations. We're taking a live look at Times Square in New York City where it's 723 in the evening. And everyone, this is probably the most life I've seen there in the heart of New York for quite some time. Uh, there's people out there for sure, likely tourists, locals alike. They are finally feeling like they can get out and about. They can see the sights, hear all the sounds of the city, maybe do some shopping, do some eating. Definitely some sightseeing going on there, though. The weather is pretty much nice. You see a lot of people there in shorts. I'm not seeing very many jackets. I am seeing some masks. I'm seeing some outdoor dining going on. You've got the flag there at half staff. Uh, New York, extremely hard hit, not just the city, but the state in terms of the coronavirus. They had many COVID-19 related deaths out there. And so, um, I mean, they're, they're definitely, they're reeling. There are, uh, there's a lot of people that lost loved ones out there for sure. So gonna continue to show you the live pictures that we have for you across the country. Next, I'm gonna take you out to Azusa, California. This is that Bobcat fire that we just had an update from right here. So I'm gonna go to our sister station, Fox 11, Los Angeles. I'm gonna see what they're reporting in terms of the latest there, even though we just heard from officials. And matter of fact, while we're having all these wildfires going on as well, I'm hearing that tens of thousands are without power in Los Angeles County amid a heat wave. And I was hearing from over the weekend, their temperatures were around 108, 109. Now that's nothing for us here in Phoenix, Arizona. We're used to those types of temperatures. Anytime we're 110, we're kind of like, eh, it's, it's hot, it's warm, but we're kind of used to it, right? But in Southern California, they are not used to those types of temperatures, regardless of what type of uh, what time of year it is essentially and now we're hearing about all these poor air quality warnings as well going on as a result of all this so california is definitely dealing with a lot right now we're going to continue to follow the latest that we can here i'm looking for bobcat fire just to try to give you a little bit of update in terms of the latest here for this fire any wildfire is not a good uh, fire right so I'm looking here. You can probably hear me thinking and typing at the same time and looking for all the latest here on our sister station. Yeah, you just heard the U.S. Forest Service shut down the Angeles National Forest due to fire danger across the state. There's a Sepulveda Basin Brush fire. That happened. El Dorado fire. Lots going on out there in California. So a fast moving wildfire continuing to burn with 0% zero zero containment, excuse me, in the Angeles National Forest north of Azusa as officials are ordering evacuations and are preparing to close the forest entirely this evening. Angeles National Forest taking a Twitter to say notice forest closure. The Angeles National Forest will be closed to all activities starting at five today. So that's in barely over 30 minutes. This includes all USFS roads, trails, campgrounds and day use sites. This is a temporary one week closure for public safety until Monday, September 14th. Thank you, 
and be safe. The Bobcat Fire burning near Cogswell Dam in the Angeles National Forest, growing to 4,871 acres overnight. It remains 0% contained. Lots going on again in California. I know I'm going to mispronounce some of these names. So if you're from California, please correct me, especially if you're watching on the platform that offers a chat feature. Stanislaus National Forest, Sierra National Forest, Sequoia National Forest, Inyo National Forest, Los Padres National Forest, Angeles National Forest, San Bernardino National Forest, and Cleveland National Forest were all closed today, the United States Forest Service announced. Could you imagine? It's a holiday weekend. It's Labor Day. People love to camp. They love to fish. They love to kayak. They love to boat. They love to paddleboard. They just love to get to the great outdoors. And with all these wildfires across the state of California, these heat waves, it pretty much is making it impossible for a lot of people. But guess what? Human lives, safety, health, and well-being is what's most important. And you got to think about all the firefighters as well out there battling all these flames, trying to stay safe as well while putting out the fires. As you know, the Bobcat fire that we're watching here, courtesy of our sister station, Fox 11 Los Angeles' Sky Fox, it's one of several fires that sparked across the region as parts of Cali saw record-breaking temperatures over this Labor Day weekend. Fire crews were sent to an area near the dam and West Fork Day Use area at 1222 in the afternoon yesterday. That's according to the LA County Fire Department dispatcher. It appears the fire has generated a pyrocumulus cloud that can be seen for miles. Firefighters reporting they're experiencing erratic fire behavior. It's not good. That's not what we like to hear. Structures are threatened. That's according to the Angeles National Forest officials who said five engines, three hand crews, four helicopters, five fixed wing aircraft and two water tenders have been deployed. A temporary flight restriction was in place over the fire area and a large plume of smoke can be seen throughout many parts of Los Angeles County. State Route 39 closed in both directions at El Encanto Park. People in the area urged to stay away. The highway being used for emergency vehicle access. Again, we're talking about temperatures in the forest were well above 100 degrees as a heat wave struck Southern California. So that's the latest from our sister station, Fox 11 Los Angeles. We will continue to keep a very close eye on that. In just a few moments here, everyone, I'm going to show you some uh, updates from our sister stations across the country. They provide us all this uh, this awesome content that we can play for you here on News Now from Fox. So I've got several different updates to show you right here. Uh, first, let's hear from Dr. Mike Slarigliano. He does those COVID-19 updates for us almost daily. Dr. Mike Slarigliano with Penn Medicine joining us out of Philadelphia. Good to see you, Dr. Mike. Happy Labor Day, Thomas. Same to you. And on this holiday, I want to start different here. I want to start with the daily reminder on staying safe. Well, even though it's a holiday day, we need to make sure, Thomas, that we socially distance, we wear masks, and we do the right thing. Remember, the goal here is to be around for next Labor Day. And so if you remember that, let's invest now in what I call our health 401k. Let's do it right. Let's be safe this holiday because next Labor Day, I'm hoping, Thomas, this virus will be gone and we will be partying like it's 1999, my friend. And we're all hoping for that. And it really is a daily reminder that it's not just about catching the virus and getting over it. I mean, there are new clinical trials out there, Dr. Mike, that found that half of the patients who had this just can't shake the symptoms, ranging from fatigue to respiratory to neurological problems. Well, we're learning more and more, Thomas, about the long-term effects of COVID-19. And it is clear that for many people, this just doesn't go away. It will have long lasting effects. There's no question that this event, this pandemic will go down uh, in history as much as the 1918 pandemic did. And there will be long lasting effects. Remember, there wasn't much in terms of uh, follow up back in 1918. And so we don't really know the long term ramifications that occurred from that pandemic. But I can assure you, we will be watching and we will be vigilant because there will be long-term effects. But 
like anything that happens that is challenging and perhaps bad in one's life, uh, you can look at it as several ways, Thomas. And one of them is it can make you stronger. And even though you may have had this virus, you may have some long lasting effects. The bottom line is you're still alive and you are stronger for it. So if we look at it that way, uh, we can rest assured that science and uh, study will guide us through how to improve any symptoms and any complications that occur down the road. And as we see, not just a respiratory illness here, you know, we often hear it's where the virus binds, Dr. Mike, that makes a difference. What does that mean in relation to the severity of the illness? Well, what we, what we know is that the virus binds to an ACE2, that's angiotensin converting enzyme to receptor. And so uh, that is how the virus gets into the body. We know for a fact, Thomas, that this virus can affect just about every organ in the body. I mean, over the last several months, you and I have personally talked about just about every organ and every symptom, whether it be the heart, the lungs, uh, whether it be depression, anxiety, stroke, all of this can be affected by COVID-19. And where do we stand with plasma therapy at this moment, Dr. Mike? Well, the, the basically, uh, most experts are saying, look, wait a minute. I know that it is uh, 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 gotten emergency authorization, but it really should not be considered standard of care until more study comes out. Remember hydroxychloroquine. In our attempts to wish and hope that something works, we have to base it on hard factual data, and that's science. And so we need more data to look at plasma therapy. That doesn't mean that doctors cannot use plasma therapy, but with the new information coming out with steroids, whether it be hydroxy, uh, uh, whether it be hydrocortisone or dexamethasone, we have some really interesting data showing dramatic uh, uh, improvements in quality of life in a uh, uh, reduction in death mortality, as well as the risk of going on ventilators. And one other thing, Thomas, uh, there's uh, an intriguing uh, small study looking at a monoclonal antibody. That's an antibody that's made in the lab, and it showed an 80% reduction in risk of going on a ventilator and mortality. Now, very small study, and like everything else, we need more data to show sure. whether that is going to be the right way to go. But there are some very exciting science-based treatments right about ready to go. They're right ready to go. It's, it's encouraging, it's encouraging, but still looking at the numbers here, uh, when we talk about children returning to the classroom, I know there's a, a rise in the number of children 17, 17 and under, Dr. Mike, who had tested positive, that's only a fraction of schools in session. I know that, but do these numbers tell you where we are and, and should we be concerned? Well, I think it bespeaks of the fact, Thomas, that children, adolescents can get the virus. It's clear they can spread the virus. They're not immune. They are not immune to getting sick and even dying. Luckily, the virus seems to affect them less with less serious complications than we see with adults, but they can spread it and they can spread it to those people who are at high risk, those elderly people, people with high blood pressure, diabetes, obesity, all of that. Those are the ones that we worry about the most. And that's what we talk about possibly being these silent spreaders. So here we are in a new month, Dr. Mike, September. We see the signs up, get your flu shot. Is now the recommended time to get it? I've been telling my patients, Thomas, start about middle September, because what we want to do is have that protection last into March and April of 2021. Remember that, that it's going to be a momentous task to get the vaccine when it's available to the entire population. That's going to be a big challenge. But until that happens, what we're trying to do is to get people to get their flu shots. You must get the flu shot. If you get the flu shot, you will make not only your uh, self protected and your family protected, but you will make my life a little better because you won't come in with the flu. And then I have to worry whether you have COVID, the flu, or anything else. 
So that's where we are at. Yeah, you could at least rule one out. You did say you can get influenza and COVID-19 at the same time, correct? No question about it. They're two different animals. So you can get influenza and COVID, God forbid. Boy, that would be a party mm -hmm. from hell. So you really want to protect yourself. And I hear this all the time. People say, I don't think it works. The vaccine we've heard doesn't work all that well. Well, even if it's more than zero, even if it's 17%, it's better than nothing. And studies show that people who get the flu shot on a yearly basis tend to do better. Uh, and, and so you need to get that flu shot to protect yourself. I'm hopeful that with social distancing and wearing masks and this whole pandemic, that many people will not spread the flu vac a a virus like they have in the past because they take very good care to protect themselves uh, because of COVID-19. Influenza, a seasonal vaccine, do you think the same could be true for COVID-19, a vaccine? Well, from what I'm hearing, Thomas, uh, we're, many people are thinking there's going to be at least two shots for the COVID-19 vaccine. It may require more than that. It may be a yearly thing. Uh, time will tell. But look, if we have an effective vaccine and it makes COVID-19 go away, please bring yeah. it on. And we've seen evidence that the virus may be mutating, but it's not all bad. Well, sometimes viruses mutate to their detriment. And so they become less uh, lethal, less uh, 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 likely to cause death and people get, getting on ventilators. And so that's been shown to happen in the past. So, uh, and the, the, uh, the other good news in the confirmed cases of reinfection, it seems that the uh, viral mutations, when they get it again, their body's immune system is prepared and ready to go, and they have very mild cases. So that's another good sign. So once again, we'll end on some positive news here, Dr. Mike. It appears there are multiple clinical trials in its final phase, and there are some proven therapeutics out there that's being used right now. I, I think we should be very optimistic, Thomas, even though there's a lot of negativity out there. We now are close to having vaccines that are safe and effective. We are close to having significant treatments that we didn't have in March and April for this terrible virus, including steroids, monoclonal antibodies, even plasma therapy if it works out. Bottom line is, is that we are in a good place. There is room to be optimistic. And if everyone just stays the course and behaves themselves, we will get through this and we will be okay. On this Labor Day, we'll end it there. Dr. Mike Sirigliano with Penn Medicine out of Philadelphia. Have a great day, Dr. Mike. You have a wonderful day, Thomas. I enjoy hanging out with you. Thanks. Aw, I enjoy, I enjoy hanging out with you all as well. <laughs> hey, you're watching News Now from Fox. My name is Pilar Arias. Thank you so much for being here. And huge thanks to our sister stations across the country for all of the special content that they put together for us to show you here. I know you all just see me and Mike Pace all the time as your News Now from Fox host, but this is definitely a huge team effort. Again, all of our Fox owned and operated stations across the country. So speaking of, I want to go to some more uh, updates that we have for you. I'm going to take you out to uh, our sister station, KTVU Fox 2, and they uh, put together a segment talking about the work from home burnout. So essentially, like, how do you avoid it? And I want to take a listen to that segment. KTVU also putting together other segments as well in terms of work from home and distance learning, uh, part one and a part two, as well as a, uh, a benefits of pumpkin. Yeah, everything's pumpkin season already, right? I know I had a pumpkin flavored coffee myself today. I love the pumpkin flavor. It was delicious, just like I love pumpkin pie and other things with pumpkin. So um, yeah, definitely. But it turns out there might be benefits to it. So again, we're heading out our sister station, KTVU, put together this segment for us about a work from home burnout, essentially how to avoid it. Hi everyone, I'm Frank Malicote. I'm a reporter anchor for KTVU Fox 2 here in the San Francisco Bay Area. My guest is the Chief Transparency Officer of Transparent Business. He is a remote work expert and he's here to talk about the impact of remote working and how all of us are maybe getting just a little tired of it. Mo Vela is his name. Good morning, good afternoon, sir. 
How are you, Frank? It's good to be with you. Okay. Well, I know you're in Vermont right now, so you're probably right. not all that burnt out, but I, I've <laughs> kind of got a hybrid. I work three days at home, and then I anchor two days on the weekend. Yeah. And I'm kind of getting sick of it, I must admit. I mean, there's some yeah. good stuff about it, but I think some folks are uh, probably ready to go back to work. Well, you know, look, I think that this is our new normal. I think you and I talked about that the last time we were together. And as every corporate uh, entity in the world is starting to show, this will be the, the way it's going to be probably for the rest of our lives. Uh, it's our new normal and it, it works, but we have to work at it too. We've got to do our part, in my opinion, to make it work, make it work effectively, and make it work for both us and our employer, Frank. And so I've got a few tips when you're ready on how to avoid that burnout. There's that isolationism that can happen. There's a sense of anxiety, actually, that some people are developing as well, a little claustrophobia. We have some tips that we can discuss to avoid all of those. Things. Well, it's Friday. Let's dive right in. Tip number okay. one, I guess, take care of yourself, right? Absolutely, but there, that comes in a lot of different forms, right? So self-care, as I call it, love yourself, right? So if that means yoga to you or it just means a walk around the block, it may mean just crafting, it may mean uh, knitting, whatever it is to you that brings you that kind of tranquility and that serenity, do it. For me, it's moving to Vermont for three months <laughs> and just driving to the 7-Eleven and just feeling the, the calmity of the river that I'm riding along with, exactly. <laughs> yeah, now, uh, getting to the countryside, I think in just hearing birds. Absolutely, uh, absolutely. Or, or, or we're not too far from the ocean to go down yep. to Ocean Beach and just kind of go. Wave, oh the God. sound of nature. There's something about it. Again, for me, the, 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 cool, the cool air here in Vermont that comes from the mountains, right? That the babbling brook, uh, as, as crazy as it sounds, it absolutely is part of my self-care. So whatever it is for you, engage in it, right? Get her done. Uh, how about creating a workspace that yeah. might feel kind of like work, but it's your own little space in the house? Absolutely. And look, this is one of the advantages that we get to create our workspace at home. So make it count. Make it work for you. Um, so, you know, that means, like, look, surround yourself with the pictures that you love. Sit in your comfy chair. Pick the chair that you love the most, right? Um, and, and look, in my case, I'm renting this house in Vermont, so it comes with the birch, kitschy, country, chic, you yeah. know, uh, furniture. That. But that brings me solace, too. So I love the comfort that it brings me, this beautiful piece of furniture. I and it. so it's about making sure you're surrounded with what brings you comfort, that brings you some serenity and that calmity. One thing I've noticed, uh, you know, I'm working from home. <coughs> I have a picture here that I arbitrarily left on my desk. It's my dad <laughs> in his 64 Olds Cutlass Convertible. There and you go. Got, and I'm guilty of it too. I'll watch other anchors and reporters from home going, oh, they went to the University of Colorado. <laughs> exactly. People have texted or emailed me saying, what kind of car is that, you know? Oh, uh, yeah, see? And that means something to you. And that makes, you know, look, it's a, it's a beautiful memory for you of your father. And, uh, and of course, it's, it uh, demonstrates, and so does the flower behind you, the orchid. Oh, yeah. Again, these are just, you're making it comfortable for you. And that's what this is about. Important tip to avoid that feeling of isolationism. Surround yourself with what brings you kind of that comfort to you. Tip number uh, three. Lose the phone, maybe get off the screen a little yes. bit, a little yeah. downtime from that. You know, Frank, a lot of people don't realize it. The experts always advise us no more than two hours of screen time at a time. By the way, that, that means our phone that you just pointed out, not just our laptop or our desktop, but our phone screen as well. Step away from all of it. Disconnect just a little bit every few hours so that you remember what really matters in life, right? Your family, your children the people you love and who love you. And I'm guilty of this. You know, when you're at home, you kind of lose track of time. You do. You can kind of multitask and nine o'clock turns into three o'clock. And when you're normally driving back home, yeah. you're like, oh, I got one more call to do and do this. That's I right. I need lunch. So you got to take a break occasionally. Not take necessarily go out to the river for an hour, but maybe just get away from this and go, hey, Mo, catch you in a minute. Absolutely. No doubt about it. And look, the next tip, of course, is communicate, communicate, communicate to avoid that isolationism, that sense of loneliness that we are all kind of starting to feel. 
even some of the anxiety. And that means not just with your boss, right? Because that can actually enhance the anxiety, but with your loved ones, with your, uh, my mom's 87, I check on her every day. That brings me some joy, right? That brings me happiness. Friends, just check in with them, but communicate with people throughout the day, whether it's text, phone, or video chat. Uh, video is my favorite because we can see each other, we can hear one another. There's some semblance of connection. And that is the greatest powerful tool to overcome isolationism and that loneliness. And don't be afraid to put, a, put apart a little bit of time. Uh, I know five o'clock is happy hour. Uh, we didn't always do it, but as soon as it hits five, my other half and I say, like, hey, it's five o'clock. Yeah. Let's chill. Time to take a break. But, it, but uh, Mike, you know, what I say on that is don't burn the candles at both ends. It's really hard. You, you mentioned it a minute ago. You lose track of time, Frank, right? right? Because we're in this kind of comfort zone. Uh, but it's very important to say, okay, you know what? It's 5 or 5.30, even 6, whatever. This will be here when I get back tomorrow morning, right? And so take, don't burn the candle at both ends. Fight that urge to keep going and to keep going. Stop. It'll be okay. Go enjoy your life a little bit. What are your, you, you talked about making your personal space, your workspace, yep. but uh, um, I guess another one is just personalize a little bit. Don't be afraid to. Absolutely. I think it's very vital. This is what all the research shows. And certainly in my six months of, you know, talking about this now and the, talking to companies all over the world about this, about remote workforce. Um, look, what one of the things I've learned is it's very, very powerful to designate workspace versus personal space. Now, a lot of people write me and they go, well, I only have a one bedroom apartment or a studio. And I'm like, okay, that's fine. Since you don't have an extra room to make your office, right? And say that's office time. But when I'm not in there, it's personal time. You can't, if you don't have the luxury of doing that because you live in a studio like many of us do, that's okay. Make sure you take your computer off your dining room table that you're using as your desk. And when it's time to eat dinner, set the table for dinner. And when you're done with dinner, remove that. In other words, it's okay. You only have that table that you're using for both things. Just distinguish between the two so yeah. that in your mind, you're getting a mental break. You got to get away from work. No doubt you about You do. That. You do. You really do. Yeah. And if you have the luxury to rotate that designated space within your house, personally, I do this all the time. I, I try every 20, 30 days so far to change where I do these interviews, where I sit and I plug away at my consulting yeah. business. Yeah, you noticed the last time that wasn't behind me. No. So I try to change the environment a little bit. It keeps me fresh yeah. in my mind. I know as a kid, when you would kind of, I'm gonna move my bed over here, my desk yes. over here. Yes. You walked in, you just felt different and probably better. It felt new. It really did feel new. And again, the word I use for me personally is, it makes me feel like I'm in a fresh environment. It gives me a fresh uh, mindset. And so just kind of like a rejuvenation. These are all important factors, Frank, to avoid that anxiety, that little claustrophobia we're all starting to feel, that isolationism, and that loneliness. It gets a little lonely at times. Uh, but again, communication, in my opinion, above all things, is the key to fighting off all of those uh, those tendencies. Yeah, I try to reach out to an old friend. I was doing it every day, but if you do two or three that you don't talk to a lot during the week, yes. text or whatever, yeah. you know, it can open up uh, you know, a line of communication that may not have been there for a long time. Absolutely, what a great time to reconnect. That's what I say. Let's right. reconnect with old friends, family members we haven't seen in a while, that we don't get to talk to you that often. And, and you know what? All of a sudden, you'll forget that you ever felt a little lonely or a little isolated. And what's that address in Vermont? I'm going to come and knock it. That looks pretty nice. Up West there. Dover at the base of Mount Snow Ski Resort. <laughs> I'll tell you something. I, I was the best decision ever. Least infected state in the country. So I actually go to the grocery store with uh, the odds on my side. They're in my favor not to get this horrible virus. Well, I spent uh, almost three decades in neighboring state of New Hampshire, which is a lot like Vermont. So Just uh, as beautiful and about to be a slice of paradise in the next 30 days right with on. Paul Folios. He is the chief. Oh, by the way, Mo, if people want to get in touch with you for information yeah. about all this, what do they do? Yeah. 
Uh, very easily, it's mo at movella.com, M-O-E at M-O-E-V-E-L-A.com, or go to uh, www.transparentbusiness.com. That's another way. And on Twitter, at Movella, M-O-E-V-E-L-A. And I would love to talk to anybody who wants to discuss remote workforce. Sounds great. He is the Chief Transparent Officer of Transparent Business. He's Movella. I think we've chatted a couple of times. I'm sure I will see you again, sir. All the best. I hope so, Frank. All the best to you. Stay well and healthy. All right, everybody. This is kind of the best live look that we have at the time. It is Times Square in New York City, and it's uh, coming up at 5 o'clock here in Phoenix, Arizona. It's almost 8 o'clock there, and I feel like the crowds are growing. It might be uh, some great weather out there. It might be a good time to uh, check out a lot of things that haven't been checked out in quite some time. This is seriously the largest crowd I have seen in Times Square in New York City in months since probably uh, late February, early March. So it looks like people are getting comfortable being outside again, mingling. Um, unfortunately, I don't know if that's a dance party circle group there in the middle, but I'm not seeing a whole lot of social distancing there. And it is a concern, a legitimate concern about people worried about another COVID-19 outbreak due to the large crowds gathering, vacationing this Labor Day weekend. Uh, so we shall see in about a week or two if any numbers spike across the country. We're continuing to show you our sister station special coverage right here on News Now from Fox. I'm going to take you back out to our sister station KTVU. They're talking about balancing work from home and distance learning as well. A lot of people have those kiddos at home. Hi everyone, I'm Frank Malicote. I work at KTVU Fox 2 here in the San Francisco Bay Area as an anchor and a reporter. My guest is a Bay Area working mother. She's got two children in school that are distance learning. Her husband also works from home as well. They have what you might call a full house, juggling both their careers, their kids, their education, and all the technology. So we're gonna find out how it's going now that school is back in session this fall. Let's say hi to Jamie Soper and her son, Austin, from uh, the uh, Alameda County. Alameda, how are you guys? Hi, how are you, Hello, Frank? How are you? Good to have you with us. Well, let's start with mom, Jamie. How's it going? It's good, how are you doing? No, I mean, how's it going? Well, how's it going? Um, <laughs> it's a little crazy around our house these days. It is um, our new normal, for sure, but in every day is different. What, what has been the biggest task? for you, uh, I know you work from home, your husband mm -hmm. works from the home, Austin's right. a seventh grader and you got a daughter in fourth grade. Uh, what has been the biggest bugaboo? Um, I think juggling uh, both our work schedules and the demands that, um, that our careers bring, but also wanting to be there for the kids as they um, work through this new normal of remote learning. It's challenging for all of us. Um, they're not in school all day. They're, um, they're on and off Zoom um, throughout the day, uh, going to uh, doing their synchronous learning and asynchronous learning. Um, and I think just being there for them to answer questions, you know, when they need, because if they were in a classroom, they would be walking up to the teacher's desk, asking questions, getting clarification. And I think, when you're juggling those needs of kids who, who are trying to do their work without other classmates there, um, you wanna be there for them. And then you're also trying to be there for your team, um, your, your coworkers, your, your own career. And it's a lot of um, back and forth. It's a, it's a big juggling act. I bet. Austin, what is the toughest part about distance learning from home for you? Um, probably, uh, not getting to see any of my friends would be the hardest part and probably it's harder to ask the teacher a question when I have a when it's distance learning so that's that's, the, that's probably the hardest part and do you feel like you're engaged are you are you learning or I mean are you distracted how, how does that all work for you well, it's um, definitely difficult, but yes, I do feel like I am learning because the teachers give us tools that really make a big, significant impact. 
Yeah. I, you know, I hear from a lot of kids and I think that's the biggest thing. It's that social interaction, not only with the teacher, but with the kids at recess, at lunch, uh, during class. Uh, Austin, is that what you miss the most really is just seeing your friends and being yeah. able to be a kid? Being able to see my friends and play with my friends at lunch and being able to, there's a lot of stuff that you cannot do from home that you can do when you are on school campus. Yeah. And Jamie, you got a 12 year old there. He's probably got a lot of energy that needs to get burned off. And that's gotta be tough for him as well, right? Absolutely. In fact, um, PE class was just a couple of minutes ago. And um, he's doing a lot of jumping jacks and push-ups and burpees in his room right now. That's it, right? <laughs> Trying to get it, trying to get that energy out. Um, but you know, we also try to involve the kids in our own home workouts. Um, he works out with my husband uh, a couple of times a week in some in some some online workouts that we do here. Um, trying to get the kids outside on bike rides and runs around the block as much as we can. You know, but yeah, there's a lot of pent up energy that they they get out even being in the classroom that they're not able to get out right now. Do you feel like your school, even the county, were prepared to do this. I think they were all hoping we'll get through, uh, you know, June and April and May, and let's mm -hmm. hopefully get back to normal. But here we are. Um. So, yes and no. Um. I think that I think I don't think any public school district is prepared for this, no matter how many months they have to prepare. Um, you have a lot of teachers who really are the tried and true teachers who thrive on standing up in front of their, their kids and, and teaching. And that's, that's what they're trained to do, you know? And, and as much as our world is going towards a, a remote and technically, um, you know, forward world, teachers are still trained to be in the classroom. And, um, and they also thrive on that dynamic, right? So I think what's happened is as much as our districts have really tried to put technologies in place like Zoom and Google Classrooms, um, there's just dynamics that are missing. I do feel like our district did as much as they could in the time that they had to prepare the teachers. We did start back two weeks later than we normally would have in order to give our um, our teachers extra time to learn the technology, but it's still challenging for everyone. I will say that I feel like there's been a huge difference from last spring until um, to this week. I think that the teachers have really tried hard to understand how to teach classes remotely. I think that they're doing a good job. I do. But you got to feel for them too, because I feel for there's them. There's no so roadmap for this. It's like corralling cats, you know? There's no roadmap. And we also have to remember that our teachers who are teaching our children, most of them have their own kids at home. Right, yeah. My niece is a kindergarten teacher and she's got a second grader and, uh, and a fifth grader at home. Yeah. So she's going yeah. nuts. Yeah. I'll be right over. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, and that's how we all feel. We'll be right there, you know? We'll be right there and we will be there. It's just, Many of us can't stand up from our computers immediately when our kids need us. And, you know, we have to finish what we're doing or we have to finish, you know, the meeting that we're in. And, um, you know, we can't all be there immediately like we normally are. Yeah. Austin, what do you guys do on Wednesdays? So we normally have, my school has splits it up in trimesters. So you get three classes a trimester. And on Wednesdays, you just get one class in the morning, which is homeroom, and you do not have another class the rest of the day. So and how do you feel you about that? Wednesdays. How do you feel about that? Um, it's definitely very good because let's say on Tuesday you had some uh, missing work. You can get that done on Wednesday because you have all that free time for the rest of the day. And are you doing the work on Wednesdays? Yes, I am. That a boy. That a boy. Well, Mom, I know you uh, put something on Facebook that said, "Oh my God, my kid is done with school. It's eleven o'clock." <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's got to be tough. You've got a twelve-year-old yeah. boy that probably has all this energy cooped up, and uh, what are we doing next, Mom? Yeah. 
Um, I mean, to combat some of this downtime, you know, we're still bowling with some friends down here. So it's a lot of afternoon play dates. It's a lot of heading to the library or buying books off of Amazon and trying to keep them reading and engaged in some additional work um, when they are done at 11.08. Um, it's, it's, um, it's trying to figure out how we can bring some school that isn't there back to the house. So for instance, we're going to figure out days we, we cook with the kids, you know, make cookies or um, try a new recipe. I'm attempting a garden in the backyard. So it's, can I, can I take the kids out for an hour during lunch and, and try to garden with them? You know, it's, it's, could we set up a, a small art corner and can we do a little bit of art? It's just trying to bring in some things that they're missing um, into those down times that we're finding a lot of in the afternoons. But you're also juggling your workload too. Oh, we're sure. juggling workloads. So we have to make it, um, we have to make it accessible to the kids so they feel like they can do it on their own without asking us or needing help. Yeah. What, yeah. Is, there, is there anything, Austin, that you really like about the distance learning? I mean, you probably can sleep in a little bit more. Um, um, what do you well, like? I like? I like the classes that we have. Definitely the part that I like the most is having three classes a trimester because I think that trying to fit six classes, like let's say you try to fit six classes in one day. First of all, it's like, it's just a lot of homework and stuff. And second of all, I think it helps everybody better because you can just focus better when you have less classes. I get it. And you feel like you're learning too, right? Yes, I do. Yeah. And you're doing your homework uh, on your own when, when, they're done with you at noontime. You'll sit down and get it all done. Yes, mm -hmm. we have asynchronous time and um, some independent time. We have we have times where we can where we go and do our work on our own, and times when we stay in our via Zoom, and the teachers will give us instruction. Do you ever get any Zoom time just yourself, or maybe with another student with your teacher? Oh, um, well, when we are in via Zoom, they will put us in breakout rooms so that you can go and work separately. And also you can, um, there's something called small group check-in where you can go and it's not like you have to go in there, but it's like a help section. Like if you got a question or if you need a, a help with the problem, they, you can go in there and you can um you can be like hey i need some help can you help me help here. that's like the that's like the independent teacher time right um mom are you prepared to do this for the whole year we are well, my husband and i had a really long conversation um two nights ago and we just had a kind of a a come to Jesus moment of this could be all year. And we're going to have to be very planned and, and, and try to also be as sensitive as we can throughout the year and just do, do what we can to not only make the environment, um, you know, positive for the kids, but positive for us and positive for us as a family. But yes, we're, I'm absolutely prepared for this to go on um, through the first of the year and, and maybe throughout the rest of the year. And uh, Austin, how do you feel about that? Not being able to see your buds and working from home. I, I know you have a, a, some bubble neighbors and some friends, but not quite the same. Well, it is very disappointing because it's just being able to see friends is very great, but not being able to do that. And then the distance learning part is also hard so i would not i would like to go back to school and not be have to spend all year on on distance learning but i'm ready for that if that's the case what would that first day back at school regular school be like um everybody would probably be very happy 
I would be very excited to see all my friends. And I think the, and I think we would just be able to learn a lot better and, and then, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mom, you'd like that too, right? Yeah. We, we would because they need to see their friends. Just like Austin has said multiple times, they, they really miss the social interaction of being, you know, around their buddies and, and having, you know, lunch with their friends who they don't get to see who are in other classes and, you know, playing a quick game of basketball, you know, after school. It's, it's just little things that a lot of people took for granted before this. Yeah. Who's learning more about uh, high tech stuff? Is Austin <laughs> teaching you or are you teaching him? I'm probably teaching my mom. I don't, I don't know. I think my mom is teaching me some stuff that I didn't know before. Sure. Yeah. And I understand you're using. Each other, I think. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's the, that's the way it should be. And you, you're able to use some of your video games, I guess, Austin, to communicate with some of your friends too. Oh yeah, um, I can I can text message my friends and I can do all of that, but it still does not have like I'll I'll play Xbox with my friends, but it just still doesn't have that social aspect that yeah. that I like and seeing my friends and stuff like that. It's gonna get better, I promise you. It is. Yeah, someday. I don't know when. I wish I did, but. Uh, well, Jamie uh, Soper in Austin, want to thank you guys for joining us. We wish you, Mom, all the best with a full house. And uh, Austin, it sounds like you're doing really well at school. So keep up the good work. Thank you. Thank you. I think we all wonder when life is going to get back to the way that we knew it and if it uh, ever will, for sure. Here's another live look at Times Square in New York City. Everybody, it's definitely the live picture I have that has the most amount of people in it right now. I'm taking a live look myself right here at the I-17. Traffic coming back down to the valley. A lot of people got to work tomorrow, whether they are working from home or they are uh, working in person at the office. A lot of people headed up north to try to escape our record-breaking heat over the weekend. It was a hot one for sure, but uh, can you imagine dealing with the temperatures while sitting in traffic? That can make things a little bit more difficult, right? And the last time I went up to the uh, Payson area, there was some severe traffic on the way home. All right, well, we're going to stay with KTVU. Again, there's special coverage of lots of things for us. Uh, they kind of did a distance learning 2.0 or a part two, and then we're going to get to the benefits of pumpkin and then we've got uh, some other updates from across the country from earlier today. Again, you are watching News Now from Fox. My name is Pilar Arias. Thanks for being here, everyone. All right, millions of students are back at it once again for the fall semester. Probably some actually going back maybe after Labor Day. But uh, the majority, you could say, are distance learning to talk about uh, how it's been for parents, what we can learn as a family, as educators. Uh, the Dean of the College of Education at the University of Phoenix, Pam Rogeman, joins us once again. Pam, thanks for being back with us. Oh, happy to be here. Thank you. Okay, so uh, let's start with parents first. Uh, this time around, what we've learned, what we're doing differently, and I think, and I'll use myself as an example, and, and my wife, who is very involved with the kids as she also works downstairs, um, is technology. Okay, so one of the first questions we ask, and I don't know if you recommend this, but is to go to the principal, go to the teacher and say, what do I need to make this happen and be smooth? Yeah, not only that, but I think it's the best advice you can get is uh, give is to go to the teacher, uh, especially for the younger kids, those grades K through three, especially, you know, how much maneuvering of the Zoom platform or, you know, whatever online platform they're going to use, are those younger kids going to be able to do? You know, I've heard a lot of families be super creative. Um, I know one family that, that has uh, the grandma come in for the morning learning to be the guide on the side for those younger kids. Um, I know a lot of families are have asking the older kids to kind of uh, be the guide on the side for the younger kids because, uh, you know, they're just much more independent. And I think, uh, you know, one of, the, one of the struggles that I've heard is just uh, space in the house. 
because when you've yeah. got the Zoom meetings going on, you know, the younger kids with the headphones sometimes um, that helps them keep them focused. And sometimes it's, you know, just kind of a distraction. So you kind of have to know what's working best for your child. Um, but, uh, you know, just the, the, the ability to be able to focus on an online meeting is something that I've heard parents are really struggling with, the younger kids especially. So moving forward, when you talk about focus, do you think it's more important when, uh, to focus on long-term goals here with the distance learning or focus more on like short-term goals? You know, I really think that where you have the most success is when you're monitoring and adjusting your plan in kind of the short-term bursts. You know, um, so maybe you're sitting down, you know, over the weekend and just saying, okay, what worked, what didn't work? Do we need some space? Yeah. Um, you know, between our kids, are, are, are the devices working? And then, um, you know, modify and adjust that plan for, for what's not working. And also, I think that, you know, schools, um, teachers are getting better at knowing just kind of how to keep the kids engaged. For example, um, my daughter's in high school and they're doing block schedules, so two hour blocks. And what the teachers have learned is it's, it's just unrealistic to expect the kids to stay staring at that screen for two hours. Yeah. And so what they do is, you know, they meet synchronously at the beginning, they talk about what they're gonna learn, the kids go off and do some work, they know everybody's coming back on at a certain time or they put them in small groups. And, you know, that's not even a high tech um, kind of uh, skill base for the teachers. That's just good classroom management you know, um, like in the actual classroom, teachers will chunk their lessons in appropriate time frames according to the age of the children. So for the younger kids, especially, what I've seen, you know, just in the videos and everything that I've watched for the schools that have started is teachers will ask the littles to stand up and, you know, just like they would in the classroom, stand up and do a stretch or, right. you know, yeah. yeah, just wiggle, have a little wiggle break. That's it. Hey, one more for the parents too, because and I, you know, I go back and forth with some of my own friends uh, who have children in my children's classes, and it, you know, I know my, there's a few of them that just can't stand this whole thing about distance learning. They don't like it at all. Um, is it important for parents to at least understand that there is some benefit to online learning? I mean, because this may be something that could live with us forever, you know, in some aspect. Yeah, absolutely. And I think what what parents need to understand is the constant virtual learning with no choice is a it's only going to happen for a limited time kids are going to go back to school everybody wants that but i do think that what parents need to be able to embrace about this is you know if your family takes a vacation if your child gets um sick you know even beyond covid um if they have a sports trip or whatever what the virtual learning does allow is some flexibility and um it doesn't interrupt your child's learning you know summer school more time spent on standards extra help it just extends the school year and the school day i think that positive point is here to stay when it comes to your uh blueprint for learning and i want to focus in more on the educators for this one but uh i gave an example well not yet but um one of my one of my the teachers for one of my kids you know it's just one zoom link now for all their different subjects it's i mean my point is simplicity um is that something that you recommend to teachers out there just try to keep it as simple as possible Absolutely. And not only that, but not only for, you know, just the access for the kids and how they're going to maneuver it, but also I, I think advice for teachers is to not think that you have to master all of these technological skills that are out there. It's great to go on Pinterest at night and see what everybody else is doing. Yeah. But um, for myself, when it comes to technology, I learn one thing at a time. I learn it well. I learn how to manipulate that one thing and be creative with that one thing. And then I move on and I add another tool to my toolkit. But um, yeah, just, you know, you know, you're teaching, you know, when you're being effective and you know when you need to change. You know, in a classroom setting, teachers get frustrated. They can pull the child up to the desk, have a private conversation. Hey, I need more of you to focus here and that. When you're on the Zooms, you know, it's, it, maybe it's harder to do that. You can pull them in a waiting room, I guess. But uh, what do you tell teachers who, who maybe get frustrated saying, what, I don't know if I should call this student out you know, in front of everyone, like I used to in the classroom, or do I not? Right, and, and uh, 
I think the first thing that you do is you follow what your school's protocol is. A lot of schools are, are um, counting attendance with that synchronous online appearance and holding kids accountable that way. And I've heard other schools that due to accessibility for their student population, they can't hold them accountable. And so um, I think both parents and teachers need to connect in a way that they never have before. And I do think, uh, you know, one of the things that, that we never really utilized as teachers before was just that face-to-face -face kind of meeting with parents. And now because we have all of these tools with Zoom and, you know, uh, whatever platform that you're using, I think it's okay to just sit and, and talk to the parent and just say, let's work together. What can we do? Uh, for example, I heard of one student that, you know, has ADD. And so in the classroom, the parent was, or the teacher was pretty good about being able to accommodate that student. So one of the things that they're trying is they're having the student put the computer on the kitchen counter and standing. And just that little bit of interaction and, you know, kind of focus with their, that physical self, um, that's helping. And that's how they've solved that. And so that was kind of a solution that the parent and the teacher worked out together. So I think those kinds of possibilities, really having the parent and the teacher be better, closer partners than they ever have before, hopefully some of those skills uh, will just um, uh, kind of transform throughout COVID and beyond COVID. Yeah, teammates all in it together. Hey, would you tell teachers to prior prioritize, um, I guess you could say longer student driven assignments rather than shorter ones or no? You know, I really think it depends on the age group. Okay. And, you know, that's always kind of been um, what teachers have done. And, you know, the long-term projects, uh, you know, I think teachers are still going to address those long-term projects the way that they did before in the classroom. Um, I think what, what they uh, will be able to lean on is just offering more resources, you know, send the kids here, there, or wherever um, online, and that's really going to help um, to be able to enrich students' learning in a way that, you know, not every kid had a device in the classroom where they were able to do that, but teachers, you know, can send links and, you know, take kids um, on virtual, you know, scavenger hunts and whatnot, where they didn't really have the technology to be able to do that, um, sitting in front of every kid. So I, I, I do think that, you know, to get through anything that's hard, you really have to try to focus on, well, you know, what does this bring to us, as opposed to what is this doing for us? And Pam, you don't think that this is going to go on? You kind of touched on it a little bit. I mean, you said yeah. we're going to go to the classroom, but this is something, is it, is any aspect of this going to be uh, in our futures forever for these, for these students? Um, I think that uh, what teachers are going to learn is that kids can do more on their own. I think that's what we're learning is that kids can be um, independent, self-starting, self-initiating learners. And so um, I think that the expectations by teachers are going to be elevated when kids go back because they do know that they, they don't need mm -hmm. teachers to to hold their hands possibly as much as maybe we did before. Um, you know, we can lean on our students to be better partners in the whole education process. And I think that is gonna be a long lasting kind of a goal for teachers is just to say, okay, you know, we can, we can expect our kids to be that self-initiating, um, self-reliant learner that maybe in a, in a different way than we did before. Yeah, just responsibility. I mean, I've noticed it in my second grader, just, t you know, taking the responsibility on herself that you have to be in this class at this time. And oh, be in the seat at this time. And this yeah. is the way that I behave online. And, you know, that's a good skill that kids will take with them into the workplace as well. Yeah, for sure. All right. The Dean of the College of Education at the University of Phoenix, Pam Rogaman. I appreciate the conversation, Pam. Oh, great to talk to you again. Thank okay. you. All right, everybody, I am super excited for this next story. I'm going to show you again from our sister station, KTVU Fox 2. They provide a lot of this special coverage that we were able to show you here on News Now from Fox. Of course, take another live look at Times Square in New York City. This one's about the benefits of pumpkin, pumpkin everything, right? We've got pumpkin ice cream. We've got pumpkin pie. We've got pumpkin spice lattes. Let's hear the breakdown. Hi everyone, I'm Frank Malicote. I'm an anchor reporter for KTVU Fox 2 here in the San Francisco Bay Area. My guest is a registered dietitian who is here to talk about the benefits of pumpkins. After all, fall is right around the corner and they are in season. So let's say hi to Olivia Wagner. How are you? I'm great. Thank you so much for having me here today. 
Good to have you. I know I'm a big fan of pumpkin spice lattes, but I guess uh, those orange gourds go a long way, not only in your coffee, but in your food during the day. I had no idea of the benefits of pumpkin. Absolutely. I mean, there are tremendous nutritional, you know, components to pumpkin and the seeds. And I think that's something that we forget is that we pick up like canned pumpkin or box pumpkin at the store, but really that's coming from the flesh of the puree, you know, the inside flesh of the pumpkin, nice puree. Yeah, well, how many times uh, around Halloween you carve up a pumpkin, you throw out all the stuff, but that's where all the nutrients are and uh, you figure it out, you can cook them up and throw them in some great stuff. Uh, talk about the yeah. immune system because I guess pumpkin antioxidants, uh, really high in vitamin A, it's got vitamin C and all kinds of goodies in it, right? Yes, so I was mentioning that pumpkin flesh, and that flesh is what's really rich in that vitamin A. Actually, one cup of pumpkin has about 200% of your daily recommended intake of vitamin A. And vitamin A is really important for not only your immune system, but it's also important for healthy skin and hair too. All right, well, would you do the canned version or is the fresh stuff, which is a kind of slimy, what, what do you do? Well, what do you, first of all, which one is better for you? Yeah. And if you're doing the, the fresh, fleshy stuff that you're pulling out of the gourd, how do you prepare that so it looks like what you're pouring out of the can? Awesome questions. I mean, what I always say is good, better, best. And so if you wanted to take some time to carve a pumpkin and then roast it after you're done carving it, that's something that you could then either roast or steam and puree and make your own pumpkin mash that, that you could freeze off and use throughout the year and take advantage of when those pumpkins are in season. But getting you know, canned pumpkin or boxed pumpkin from the store is a really, really great option and a convenient option too. And it's still providing a lot of that same vitamin and mineral density. There now are BPA-free cans and also BPA-free cardboard boxes, which are two kind of popular forms that you can get um, canned pumpkin in conveniently at the store. And pumpkins are really just a giant squash, are they not? So there's a wide, they, they are in the, the they are in the different, <laughs> there's squashes and there's pumpkins, but okay. uh, they have similar, they are all gourds. And so they have seeds in them that you can also utilize too. And the pumpkin seeds are tremendously dense in nutrition as well. Yeah. A quarter cup actually has about 10 to 12 grams of protein and is rich in not only zinc, but also um, plant sterols that are really good for cardiovascular health and supporting healthy cholesterol balance too. And those are really easy. You got to kind of pluck them out. But if you put them on like a cookie sheet with a little salt and and bake them, um, you know, for 10 minutes or so, uh, you got yourself a pretty They're healthy. They're so diet. delicious. Exactly. Season them up with a little spices or just some sea salt. A perfect afternoon snack. So when you're carving a pumpkin, it's not just all the all the guts that are inside it that you're pulling out, but the wall of the pumpkin itself is what gets pureed, right? That's the flesh, exactly. Okay, got to get yeah. that right. All right, well, you're going to create for us a little bit, Olivia. What are you going to do? Yeah, so I have here today a pumpkin product. I think that typically we are bombarded with, you know, pumpkin candies and pumpkin spice lattes, and they actually have a lot of sugar in them. So today I'm going to share a pumpkin recipe for pancakes that's low in sugar, has some good fiber and healthy fat in it, and is an awesome option for a breakfast or a snack. So I'll walk you through how to make that. What we're going to start with is actually four eggs. Put that into the bowl here. You can add three tablespoons of your oil of choice. And here I just did a coconut oil because I thought that would go really nice with the pumpkin flavor. But you could also do a more neutral oil like grapeseed or even avocado oil or butter. I have a tablespoon of vanilla that I'm going to put in. That always helps. I put that on all my pancakes and my fruit. Oh, I know. Elevates flavor. Yeah, it gives it a little oomph. And then I've got a cup of water, but you could also use milk, buttermilk, or a non-dairy milk. And we're going to whisk this up. So it's nice and combined. And then I'm going to add in Simple Mills pumpkin and waffle, pumpkin, pancake, and waffle mix. And the cool thing about this mix is I mentioned the first ingredient is almond flour, but it actually has nine simple ingredients in it. And one of them is dehydrated pumpkin. And so a lot of times when we stumble across pumpkin spice flavored options for the fall, it's not real pumpkin and it's, you know, added with artificial flavors and a lot of sugar. 
And here you're getting the real deal pumpkin in a packaged product. So you're gonna add that in. And I'm gonna mix that up to combine. Comes together super, super easy. And you've got your uh, concoction to make pancakes there. Yes. I like what you threw on them too, here to your right. Those look pretty good. So I did make some in advance and I wanted to share a few different toppings that you could add on them to sure. make them feel a little bit more satiating as a morning meal or even as a snack. So one of the options that I did was almond butter, some omega-3 rich walnuts and some berries on top. And the fun thing of adding almond butter, like a triply, drizzly almond butter to a pancake is it helps to extend the, the coverage of the pancake with using a little less maple syrup. And I do have a little organic maple syrup here. And because you already have some of that almond butter on it, you don't have to add as much of it to still get that same mouthfeel you're looking for. Now, it looks like you've got a glaze of maple on there too. Is that right? On these pancakes or these no. pancakes? Uh, well, both really. I don't, I don't know. So the pumpkin pancakes have a little bit of a kind of a more goldeny color because of the spices in them. Sure. So there's some cinnamon and nutmeg, nice warming fall spices that partner well with the pumpkin. So it kind of gives it that nice tone. But on here, it's just the almond butter and the maple syrup with the walnuts and the berries. Oh, wow. And then I also on this side decided to make a little cream cheese glaze yeah. for the um, pancakes, which I think is so fun and festive. We a lot of times think of cream cheese frosting with um, any sort of like pumpkin cake or muffin. And so this cream cheese glaze is actually just a combination of a cultured cream cheese. So a cream cheese that has some probiotics in it, a little bit of a milk of choice. It could be a non-dairy milk or a regular milk. And then adding in a little bit of maple syrup to taste, sea salt and vanilla. And so then I just drizzled that right over the top here. And that's something that I put with a little bit of pumpkin seeds and a little bit of extra cinnamon. What great comfort food too. I know we're all kind of stuck in this pandemic. We're all kind of going nuts. And there's nothing like a kitchen that smells like breakfast. And oh, making these pan pancakes, it just filled my home with this beautiful aroma. And I think it's comforting, but it's also nutrient dense and nutritious. Each serving of pancakes, which is like this small stack here, has less than six grams of sugar, um, not including the syrup. So it's keeping it lower sugar. It's still giving you those fun fall flavors. And it's something that can yeah, add a little bit of spice and fun to maybe a little bit more of a challenging time. Well, if you weren't in Chicago, I'd be knocking on your door. Those look great. <laughs> I would love to share these with you. <laughs> oh, I bet. I, mean, you've, I hope you get some company there because you've got a, you got a lot to eat. You know, um, I, I did a little research. Pumpkin spice lattes grossed over $200 million uh, in the last year or two for um, Starbucks. So there, there must be something to pumpkin that people just love. Yeah. I think it's nostalgic. I think it's seasonal. Like this box mix here is a limited edition seasonal mix. And so it is something that with the change of the season, leaving summer gives people something to look forward to and be excited about. But also those spices are just so comforting. And cinnamon is actually really good for keeping your blood sugar nice and stable. So preventing kind of the spikes and falls that can come in your day um, from you know, maybe you waited too long to eat or you ate a meal that was too high in carbohydrates. So there's a lot of healthy benefits to spices too, but they really are very comforting and warming. I know in New England, I lived a lot of years there. Uh, pumpkin spice is kind of a big deal there. And there was a tire store in Southern New Hampshire, I actually did a story on it. And they put up a sign outside, all our tires are pumpkin spice approved. And people, I mean, it, he put it up there as a joke and every TV station came and did a story on it. He got all this publicity just for throwing. Oh my gosh! So it's kind Pumpkin of saves the day. <laughs> exactly. Hey, um, Olivia, if people want to get in touch with you or want more information. What do they got to do? They can go to livenourishnutrition.com. I or they can follow me on Live Nourish Nutrition um, on Instagram. All right. Uh, hey, thank you very much for sharing. We really appreciate it, Olivia. Thank you for having me today and. Enjoy your pumpkin this fall. Try to incorporate some whole food pumpkin if that's not something you're used to doing, whether it be like in a soup, a smoothie, um, or even, you know, in an oatmeal. And, you know, enjoy the beautiful flavors of it. There you go. Olivia Wagner. She is a uh, 
a dietitian out of the Chicago area, and she makes a mean set of pumpkin pancakes. Olivia, thanks a lot. As our commander in chief, I would hope that you would rescind those. Well, I will. Look, uh, first of all, thank you all for your service. I don't mean just uh, your service for labor, but your service to the country. How, what made you uh, decide you wanted to join the service? Um, it's pretty much I, I, growing up. I, you know, I was born and raised in New York. It was very hard to find jobs, and that was I, that was like one of my reasons too. But at the same time, I saw myself being a soldier at the same time. So I had I already had the plan to do that. I wanted to serve, so I wanted to do three years. I liked the military service, and I wanted to keep continuing my service. That's one of the reasons why I also stayed in. <laughs> but you were in Afghanistan as well as Iraq, yes, correct? I went to Iraq and Afghanistan. How long were you in Afghanistan? You were in Afghanistan for a whole year, 365 days. Iraq also. What do what, what do your fellow soldiers talk about out there? Um, talk about back at home. Talk about families. Uh, you know, one of the things that they they talk about is how are they going to get out and start a fresh career, you know, doing something else. They run their own business, um, go to school, have a degree plan. And sometimes when they do that, when they go to college, some of those jobs are outdated. They can't get those jobs. And now they're sitting on a fence somewhere trying to find a different job or go back to school and have to depend on government loans to cover those costs. <laughs> You uh, do you think most of those guys are, and women are suckers? <laughs> no, I mean, it's a. Uh, is there any reaction to that? Have you, among because you're in the National Guard now, right? Yes. Okay. Well, look. Let me ask you a couple practical questions. Okay. How did you find the pipe fitter apprenticeship program? Um, I was getting out. They, they had a uh, transition programs for. Vets. It was a new program that started in Fort Hood, Texas, and I, that was the trade I wanted to uh, go into as a welder. And how do civilian employees, uh, what don't they get about uh, the enormous talent veterans offer? I mean, is there, a, is there a concern that vet getting out doesn't know what he's doing or she's doing, or is there a, an appreciation of it? Um, it's a little bit of both, because you got to, once you start a new career, you have to reset your mind and, and learn new ways because military and the civilian sector doesn't really always work, but some jobs they do always work, but construction is a whole different ball game. You have to, you know, take what you're learning from the guys that are experienced in those, in those construction jobs, uh, go through the whole training process, start a new beginning. And, uh, tell me, the the AFG, do you think you should be able to unionize, right? Absolutely, sir. Well, so do I. Uh, you know, uh, how'd you find a way to uh, uh, get into the AFG? I mean, after you get out of the military. Well, I was union all my life as well. My father was a lifetime member of a National Steel Workers 1940 in Lewistown, Pennsylvania at a steel plant. Um, and... So it was a natural evolution for me. As soon as I got into a civilian job where I was eligible to be in a union, I sought that out and joined the union, and that was 35 years ago. And what has been the impact of his executive orders? Well, um, it, there are a lot of impacts to it. Uh, we have to pay for any uh, office space that we use on a military installation to have a union office where bargaining unit members can come to. We have to get prior approval to use official time to meet with someone who has a problem that they need to discuss. And that official time has been truncated to the point that it's almost impractical to try to use it. And we're forbidden from using our official time to try to prepare someone for certain grievances and certain processes, we would have to use our personal time, off, off the clock time. And 
some locals, our local is fortunate and that we still have an office on the installation. Some locals, for instance, the one in, in uh, at the Army Depot over in New Cumberland, um, they were forced to leave the installation altogether and rent some way, someplace to have a union office. And so it varies by command how the how it has personally affected the locals, but overall it has gutted our ability to properly represent our bargaining unit employees. You've been doing this a while. Long time, sir. 74 years old. Well, I tell you what, you know, uh, you iron workers are all nuts anyway. Anybody who climbs up 13 stories and walks a 12-inch beam, you know, and, and then sits on the beam and has lunch, you know, you got to be crazy. But then again, you, it, helps. You, it helps. It helps. All kidding aside, don't, tell me what you hear from your old colleagues that's most bothering them right now. Well, you know, I, I don't get to talk to too many of them anymore. But just getting out there and doing a day's work for a day's pay. This is drummed into us a long time ago, and today it's still like that. They're out there. They want to do a good day's work for a good day's pay. And uh, I, I just want to let you know, I am a coal cracker from Shemokin, PA. Shemokin, all right. <laughs> almost heaven, almost Scranton. Yeah, almost. <laughs> yes, sir, almost. Yeah, well. Um, Mr. Vice President? Yeah. Um, I, I also wanted to uh, earlier thank you for your help with helmets to hard hats with the national building trades uh, which helps transitioning um, military into our apprenticeship programs and as journeymen uh, I, uh, I know you worked on that with us through the years and to, to be blunt I would say we have over 50,000 to 100,000 uh, ex-military in the building trades nationally and uh, you know when someone's coming out out of uh, the military, they may have never applied for a job before. So, uh, you know, they don't know where to go or where to look. And programs like Veterans in the Pipe Trades or Helmets to Hard, hard Hats helps them transition. And uh, your help through the years of uh, your career has benefited uh, thousands of military uh, getting those good paying jobs where they get health care, they get a pension, and they retire with dignity. Uh, don't ask for anything extra. We just, you know, we pay for our own health care. We pay for our own um, pensions. And, you know, I'm concerned now with the pensions, uh, with the economy the way it is. And, and the number, of, we had 8,500 people laid off at the cracker plant in Beaver County uh, in one day. 8,500 people uh, because there was no uh, preparation for the pandemic. Uh, we're gearing back up a little bit at a time uh, with, with different kinds of standards and, and protocols than we had before. But just think, that was just one job in Pennsylvania where all those people had to go home in one day. 85. Be the first president in American history to uh, uh, end up, when he leaves office, having fewer jobs than when he took office. Not history, in the, in the last 90 years. Uh, and... Uh, you know, you got, uh, um, you know, six, more than six million people uh, infected with COVID. You're heading toward uh, the 200,000, above 200,000 range of people have died from COVID. And uh, he still has no plan. I mean, there's virtually no plan as to how to deal with it. And uh, you see what's happening uh, across the country. We're, uh, you know, we have more we're averaging about a thousand deaths a day. If you take the seven largest European countries and combine them, they have a population bigger than ours. And as of a week ago, they were averaging total 57 deaths a day versus a thousand and with a population larger than ours. And so uh, he has just sort of waved the white flag on, on dealing with COVID. And he, all he wants to do is just, just reopen, but the way he's reopening is causing us to, uh, you know, shut down. Look what's happening with schools right now. If you have kids trying to get them back in school right now, it's pretty tough. The, um, you know, uh, I, uh, it seems to me that there is uh, things 
can and should change because for the first time, unions are respected more for the first time than they have been any time in the last 50 years. Over 65% of the American people support union movement, support union growth. And so, you know, the only thing standing in the way of us getting for people to be in a position where they actually have the ability to make a decent wage is a uh, prevailing wage is, is, uh, is to make sure that we uh, remove the guy who's there right now. The fact is that, uh, you know, we're in a position where we can fundamentally grow this country just by no other reason, just investing in infrastructure, roads, bridges, canals, all the things we have to do, airports, that in fact could create thousands and thousands of good paying jobs at prevailing wage. And uh, he keeps saying he wants a, a uh, you know, an infrastructure plan. He said he wanted one in, you know, in 2016, 17, 18, 19, now he hadn't introduced a thing. What are we waiting for? Well, I I, I don't think that you know, he I don't think he has any interest in it whatsoever at this point. That at least he hasn't shown any. One of the things that uh, um, uh, Frank is that uh, have uh, how 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 have unions help people get through this pandemic? Um, you know, you, you know what would be a big investment in infrastructure? Uh, that I mean, how, how much would it mean to your members? if we were able to create what's estimated to be tens of thousands, or actually several million jobs uh, that are needed now. I mean, we need to improve our bridges, our roads. We rank so, we're so low in, our, in the safety. We're in a position where, you know, there's no reason why, as President of the United States, you have control of a significant budget of taxpayers' money, taxpayers' dollars, where you're spending federal money hiring contractors to do things. Under my administration, it will be all made in America. Not a joke. If it's going to be used, taxpayers' dollars are going to be used to hire corporations to do things from, you know, building roads to building bridges to whatever it is, it's going to have to have been made in America. Any product, steel, aluminum, anything used has to be made in America. And also the supply chain. You know, we we now have under this president the, uh, you know, the the largest trade deficit we've had uh, uh, in a long time. The trade deficit with Mexico is higher than it's ever been in in history, and the uh, product trade deficit with the rest of the world is the highest it's ever been in American history. And that's because he's provided all these loopholes in the law to allow companies to get a tax break going abroad and hiring people doing things abroad. Uh, that'll end, and it will not be a violation of international trade agreements. That'll end in my administration. I mean, for real, it all will have to be made in America if it's a taxpayer dollar is being spent. But uh, tell me about the, uh, uh, the attempt on the part of corporations to prov provide their, quote, own apprentice programs. There was an effort to shut down you all and uh, they're deciding they can provide the apprentice programs. Well, as it stands right now, there's, there's guidelines to make sure the people that enter an apprenticeship program actually get the training and end up graduating to a decent paying job uh, at the completion of their apprenticeship program. And the plan was to eliminate that, take, take all the rules, and let the corporation decide all the all the angles on how they were going to run their apprenticeship program. As it is now, there are requirements under federal law and state laws to make sure that people do actually get the training. And it's not just a venue for low wages. Uh, we see a lot in corporate America where they want to have an apprenticeship program, and, and especially in the construction industry, to have people at 50% of the, the wage rate so they can have an advantage on bid day or cut their cost uh, uh, in production. And this is problematic. And one, one of the big ones is uh, warehousing. Uh, you know, it's only a $15, $15 an hour job to start with. And then they want to have an apprenticeship program where they bring people in for seven fifty an hour. And then they just churn those people. They keep them until they get to be too expensive and then they get rid of them. And, you know, it, it ends up that we have people just going through a cycle 
and uh, the unemployment system gets drained as it is now, which has never been drained as far as it has in Pennsylvania due to uh, the lack of response of the president on the COVID issue. Uh, we have more more debt than we're ever going to have uh, in my lifetime. And uh, that, that apprenticeship scheme that was being portrayed by the uh, Department of Labor out of D.C. was terrible. I think we had the most calls uh, and comments to uh, L and I on the regulations on that that have in the history of <laughs> calls on regulations. So you're absolutely right. Well, the on that. reason why you guys get hired, you have the best training programs in the world. You're the best at what you do. I mean, in fact, you're the best at what you do, and uh, everything they've done uh, has been designed. Uh, you know, uh, the fact is that. Uh, um, you know, Wall Street investors didn't build this country. Ordinary folks, middle class, built it, and, the, and unions built the middle class. That's how we got to where we are and continue to try to hollow out the union movement, hollow out the middle class is, uh, is, is, is what's going on, been going on for uh, some time now. And uh, I promise you, if I'm elected, it stops. It stops. You're going to have the best friend Labor's ever had in the White House because... And my dad used to have an expression, and uh, when he had to leave Scranton because there was no work and moved away to Delaware to find work, was that uh, he'd say, Joey, a job's about a lot more than a paycheck. It's about your dignity. It's about respect. It's about your place in the community. It's about being able to look your kid in the eye and say, honey, it's going to be okay. Well, the fact is that uh, there's an awful lot of people who don't think their kids are ever going to be able to reach the standard of living they had because of what's going on. And the House has passed legislation that the so-called HEROES Act that provides for significant help to allow people, first responders, whether they are docs or whether they're firefighters, police officers, whether they are whoever they are, the, the folks keeping the sewers functioning, uh, the, the, the people who make the system work and, uh, and provided the money to, for states to be able to pay them. You all know that states have to have a balanced budget. There's a reason why the federal government was designed not to have to have one, to be able to be a ballast for when things got really bad. We inherited one of the worst economies that existed when uh, the so-called financial collapse it was, the worst uh, recession short of a depression in American history when Brock and I got elected. And he put me in charge of a program called the Recovery Act, and it provided for over eight hundred billion dollars in stimulus but what it did i was able to spend 144 billion dollars making up for states deficits so teachers didn't get fired so that firefighters didn't get fired so police officers didn't get fired so essential workers didn't get fired all those folks out there that are busting their neck keeping the groceries stacked on a shelf so everybody else can be okay all those nurses and doctors taking their shots and and, uh, I mean, risking their lives to keep us going. Those firefighters that show up and don't ask, by the way, do you have COVID? They just take care of the problem. And, uh, and so, and he has uh, been spending too much time in his golf courses and his sand traps instead of uh, going out. I mean, for real, think about this. I've been around a while. I can't think of any president in the middle of a crisis like this, and there's been other crises, both foreign and domestic, that has not called in the leadership of the Republican and Democratic parties to the White House, to the White House, to the Oval Office, to sit and work out an agreement. But there's no desire to work out an agreement here. It's just the ability to make sure that you, he's able to do the minimum things that are necessary to make it look like he's trying. But he's not even had a meeting with them. And so a lot of people are hurting. A whole lot of people are hurting right now because and things we could be avoiding right now. And, uh, and I, I just, uh, I was going to say I don't get it, but I'm beginning to get it because I don't think he, it's not what he's about. He talks about this K-shaped recovery, meaning the, on the letter K, one part goes up, okay? You know, when you're doing the K, you know, boom, okay, the K is up. That's the stock market. As long as the stock market's doing great, Everything's okay as far as him, but everybody else is getting clobbered. Everybody else is hurting. And, uh, and so I, I just think that uh, 
you know, and the other expression my dad used to talk about, he said, you know, the only way to deal with power, the abuse of power, is with power. And the only power out there to counter the abuse or the extreme abuse of corporate power is unions, labor, the only ones who have the wherewithal to take it on. And that's why I think everyone, including public employees, should have the right to organize and make their case for what they are entitled to have, and what they're able to work, what they should be being paid, how they should be treated. And it's all about just, you know, basic fundamental decency. But I think we've got an enormous opportunity because the public has changed. You know, I'll say one last thing here, and, I'm, and you don't ask me any questions. You know, uh, um, all of a sudden, the last, uh, not all of a sudden, the last eight, ten years, things have changed in the following way. People, hourly workers who thought unions were the problem. Remember how unions were the issue? That's why we weren't. Well, you know, all of a sudden they found out you had, you had thousands of employees making an hourly wage having to sign non-compete agreements. So if you worked at Burger King, you have to sign a non-compete agreement. You would not go across town to McDonald's to try to get five more cents in your hourly wage. All designed to do nothing, just to keep wages down. You could not go. It's not like you had a secret uh, that was uh, consequential and you couldn't give away that secret because it's a high-tech industry to another industry you go to work for. These are people making an hourly wage, just doing just their, just their job. And they were told they couldn't even bargain for themselves, let alone have a union do it. And uh, I remember going up to when, uh, well, I won't go into it, but the point is all of a sudden they figured it out. And then all of a sudden they figured out, too, the reason they got overtime pay is because of unions. Because look at all the overtime was being cut from people who weren't union members. They reclassify you as management that if you worked in a grocery store and you control the man or woman who brought out the cart that had all the all, all the spaghetti sauce on it, you were management. You you control that cart. I mean, literally. And that's what people realize that this abuse has caught up with them. And, uh, and this economic crisis caused by his failure to deal rationally with COVID, not even acknowledging it. I mean, look, it's going to, you know, warm weather is going to make it go away. It's going to be like a miracle. It's going to be passed. I'm going to have a vaccine for you quickly that everyone's going to be fine. You know, it's just, uh, it, it's, it's all about refusing to deal with the problems that affect ordinary, hardworking people. And uh, I think one of the ways back is to considerably strengthen the union movement. But you guys have any questions for me about anything at all? I would just like to thank you. I'd like to thank you for all you've done for unions in general through your career and Pennsylvania. Um, I mean, if you, and you know Pennsylvania, if you go to Erie now, there's no new jobs in Erie. There's no new jobs in Scranton. There's no new jobs anywhere except for maybe some warehousing jobs or a few uh, delivery jobs now because people can't go to restaurants. But if you take all the people that are on unemployment and then out all the people that ran out of unemployment and then take all the people that can't get either or just you know going day to day that number is a lot greater than what they're showing on on tv especially those who've had to move to part-time and have their wages cut they're not considered unemployed they're just considered they're employed but guess what when you get your wage cut in half it's awful hard to pay for the new tires when you have four ball tires on your wife's car or your husband's car when you, in fact, uh, have your wage cut in half, it's always awful hard to figure out how you put all the meals on the table. It's going to be all right. Or, I mean, how many people have discussions in suburban neighborhoods where they're sitting down saying, who's going to tell her she can't go back to the junior college? We can't afford it. Who's going to tell him that he can't do the following? We can't do such and such. I mean, these are those discussions that took place in my living room, my kitchen growing up. And now they have to be there. And there's an answer to it. The money's been appropriated. The money's been appropriated. But the, but the Senate, you know, uh, Mitch McConnell, that Republican leader, said, let the states go bankrupt. Well, that's really cool, right? Let the states go bankrupt. But the point is, I think that the American public is beyond it. I think the American public knows the dereliction has taken place and knows that, uh, you know, we... Uh, um, 
we have a president who doesn't seem to understand the notion of service. You know, I, I just, uh, I, I just, I don't know, the idea that you guys have served, and my son, who spent a year in Iraq, and before that, six months in Kosovo, and Our great friend, Senator Ron Johnson. All right, everybody. Again, that was presidential candidate for the Democratic ticket, Joe Biden, in Pennsylvania earlier today. Now we're taking a listen to vice, uh, current Vice President Mike Pence in the state of Wisconsin, a battleground state for this year's election. I do want to give you a heads up. I've heard that there's a shooting involving a child and possibly several other adults from Chicago, Illinois. I'm waiting for a live news conference there when and if I get it. I'll bring it to you right here on News Now from Fox. Lights on here in Wisconsin. So to all the hardworking men and women of Dairyland Power and to every American worker across Wisconsin, happy Labor Day. And you can grab a seat if you've got one. You know, before I go any further, Allow me to bring greetings from another friend of mine who loves the Badger State, who I think is the best friend American workers have ever had sitting in the Oval Office at the White House. When I told him this morning that I was headed to La Crosse, I, I think he sounded just a little bit jealous. <laughs> so allow me to bring greetings from a friend of this state and a friend of American workers. I bring greetings from the 45th president of the United States of America, President Donald Trump. You know, I'm here because I stand with President Donald Trump. When this president stands up for faith and family and the American flag, I stand with President Donald Trump. When this president stands up to the radical left and their socialist agenda, I stand with President Donald Trump. And when this president stands up every day and fights for American workers and jobs, 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 we stand with President Donald Trump. You know, four years ago, a movement was born, a movement of everyday Americans from every walk of life. And look how far we've come. Four years ago, we inherited a military hollowed out by devastating budget cuts, an economy struggling to break out of the slowest recovery since the Great Depression. Terrorism was on the rise around the world, and we witnessed a steady assault on our most cherished values, the freedom of religion and the right to life. But in our first three years, what a difference the decision that Wisconsin made made. We rebuilt our military. We restored the arsenal of democracy. And we are once again giving our soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines, and Coast Guard, and our veterans the resources and the support that they deserve every single day. We revived our economy by cutting taxes across the board, rolling back federal red tape, unleashing American energy, and fighting for free and fair trade. We appointed judges to uphold all of our God-given liberties, including the Second Amendment right to keep and bear arms. I couldn't be more proud to be vice president to a president who has stood without apology for the sanctity of human life and for the freedom of religion of every American of every faith. And beyond all of that, throughout all of the last three and a half years, this president and this administration have stood with the men and women of law enforcement, and we will stand with them every day. You know, President Trump and I know that the men and women who serve in law enforcement are the best of us. 
They put their lives on the line every single day. They literally count our lives as more important than their own. And they deserve the respect of every American. Now to be clear, any incident involving the police use of force will always be thoroughly investigated. But there is no excuse for the rioting and looting that we have seen in Kenosha and in cities across the country. And this violence against civilians, against property, and against law enforcement must stop, and it must stop now. Now, President Trump and I will always support the right of Americans to peaceful protest. But rioting and looting is not peaceful protest. Burning businesses is not free speech. And those who do so will be prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law. That's why President Trump took action just a few days ago. We sent 200 federal law enforcement officers into Kenosha. Working with the National Guard and local law enforcement, we quelled the violence. Under this president, I promise you, we will have law and order in every city in this country for every American of every race and creed and color. So help us God. Now for months, all Joe Biden talked about was peaceful protesters as the American people watch businesses and communities in our major cities burn. Last week, Joe Biden, after three months of silence, spoke out against violence in every form it takes. But right after he said that, he criticized law enforcement. And Joe Biden never condemned Antifa. He never called out his campaign staff or his running mate for raising money to bail out violent criminals. And he never called on Democrat mayors to get their cities under control. And I think the people here in Wisconsin know Joe Biden would double down on the policies that have literally led to violence in our major American cities. I mean, Joe Biden says America is systemically racist and that law enforcement has an implicit bias against minorities. When asked whether he'd support cutting funding to law enforcement, Joe Biden replied, yes, absolutely. But under President Donald Trump, I promise you, we will always stand with those who serve on the thin blue line of law enforcement. We're not going to defund the police, not now, not ever. Now, President Trump and I know what you all in Wisconsin know. We don't have to choose between supporting law enforcement and standing with our African-American neighbors and families to improve the quality of their lives, to improve public safety, create more jobs and better schools. I mean, for the first day of this administration, we've done both. And I promise you, we're going to keep supporting law enforcement and keep supporting our African-American neighbors and all of the minorities in every community in this city every day from here to come. So in three short years, with the support of the people of Wisconsin, we rebuilt our military, we revived our economy, we stood for our liberties and for law and order. And the result? I can tell you, having traveled to more than 30 countries as your Vice President, America is respected in the world again. At home, our God-given liberties are more secure today. And in our first three years, there's only three ways you can describe those years. It was jobs, 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 right here in Wisconsin and all across America. It's true. I mean, with less taxes, less regulation, more American energy and better trade deals, businesses large and small across this country created more than 7 million good-paying jobs in just three years. And on this Labor Day, it's, it's great to remember that that wages were rising in those first three years. Wages were rising at their fastest pace in the last decade. And we couldn't be more proud. 
that in those first three years, wages rose most rapidly for hard-working, blue-collar Americans. The forgotten men and women of America are forgotten no more. And under this president's policies, manufacturing has come roaring back. You know, when Joe Biden was vice president, America lost 200,000 manufacturing jobs. And the last president actually said that those jobs were never coming back. You remember? It was the summer, four years ago, 2016. The president back then wondered aloud how you could ever bring manufacturing back to the heartland. He said, quote, what magic wand do you have? Well, we didn't need a magic wand. We just needed President Donald Trump in the White House. 500,000 manufacturing jobs in just three years. Beyond that, the lowest unemployment rate ever recorded for African Americans and Hispanic Americans. At the end of our first three years, more Americans were working than ever before. And let me just say, with with him present here today. None of that would have been possible without the strong and principled support of Senator Ron Johnson. Wisconsin, would you join me? Get on your feet and show how much you appreciate a man that's been fighting for Wisconsin values and fighting for Wisconsin jobs. Thank you, Senator Johnson. our strong allies in the Congress like your Senate, we created the greatest economy in the world in three short years. We made America great again. And then the coronavirus struck from China. The people of Wisconsin deserve to know that before the first case of coronavirus spread from person to person, within the United States. President Trump took the unprecedented step of suspending all travel from China before the month of January was out. And I can tell you, having led the White House Coronavirus Task Force, that action alone saved untold American lives. And it bought us invaluable time to stand up the greatest national mobilization since World War II. In the President's direction, we marshaled the full resources of the federal government and the American economy. We partnered with private industry to reinvent testing. When I took over the task force in late February, we'd done no more than 8,000 tests total nationwide for the coronavirus. Today, with American ingenuity and high relief, we perform more than 800,000 coronavirus tests a day. We work with private industry to arrange for the production and the delivery of billions of supplies of personal protective equipment to our great doctors and nurses and hospitals all across America. We saw the delivery of those supplies at the point of the need in one city after another where the impact was the greatest, where the challenge was the greatest. And I will tell you here in Wisconsin all across America, Every American should be grateful for our doctors, our nurses, and our health care workers and our first responders who have risen to the challenge in this hour of our time. Now, our hearts go out to all the families who've lost loved ones during the course of this pandemic, including more than a 1,000 families here in Wisconsin. I want to say to each and every one of them, you've always been in our hearts. And you'll remain in our prayers. But we're going to continue to move forward. Continue to develop medicines each and every day that are saving lives across the country. More therapeutics are becoming available each and every day. And I promise you, we're not going to rest. We're not going to rest until we have a safe and effective coronavirus vaccine for the American people and we put this virus in the past. To 
amazing to think with Operation Warp Speed, the president initiated a project where, believe it or not, we have several vaccines that are already in the final stages of clinical trials. But we're not waiting until they're approved to produce the vaccines. At the president's direction, we're actually manufacturing vaccines even as we speak, so that the moment that the FDA says that we have a safe and effective coronavirus vaccine, we'll have tens of millions of doses available for the American people. I have to tell you, Joe Biden said not long ago that no miracle is coming. But here in America, we're in the miracle business. And we're going to have a safe and effective vaccine for the coronavirus before the end of this year. So we're slowing the spread. We're protecting the vulnerable. And we're saving lives. Each of us has a role to play. But in the midst of this pandemic, our president also worked with leaders in both parties in Congress and with Senator Johnson in particular to secure support for American families and for American businesses. It's amazing to think we were able to secure nearly four trillion dollars in support to American families and enterprises. And the Paycheck Protection Program alone is estimated to have saved some 50 million American jobs. But I promise you, Wisconsin, we're going to continue to put the health of America first. So because of the strong foundation that President Trump poured in those first three years, and because of the unprecedented aid that we secured for families and businesses, after losing 22 million jobs at the height of this pandemic, we've already seen more than 10.6 Americans go back to work already. The American comeback has begun. In the last four months alone, we've literally, literally seen half of the Americans that lost their jobs go back to work. And that, that includes 200,000 Americans right here in the state of Wisconsin. So we're opening up America again. And we're opening up America's schools. Just last week, we spoke to educators around the country, leaders of uh, colleges and universities around America, to make sure they had the support and the guidance to be able to safely reopen their schools. People all across the country are working to safely reopen our K-12 schools. I'm proud to report to you that school teacher I've been married to for 35 years is already back in the classroom teaching art at her elementary school. And I want to say thank you. I want to say thank you particularly to the Dairyland employees who leaned into this effort to get our schools back open. On the plane on the way here, I learned that a lot of you volunteered at, at an area school to build plexiglass barriers. You removed furniture to make our classrooms safe for our kids. Thank you for being there for our kids and our teachers and our schools. Great job. Great job. Dairyland. So we've gone through a time of testing, but we're coming through it together. Hard-working people of Wisconsin deserve to know. As we go through this time of testing, we're soon coming to a time for choosing. And the choice has never been more clear. And it's amazing to think that in the middle of a global pandemic, Joe Biden wants to raise taxes by $4 trillion. And President Trump, for our part, not only cut taxes for working families and businesses large and small, but as we speak, we're letting the American people keep more of what they earn. And I promise you, we're going to keep fighting for tax relief for working Americans every day. Where President Trump signed more laws cutting federal red tape than any president in American history, Joe Biden wants to bury the American economy under an avalanche of red tape, like his own version of the Green New Deal. And here at Dairyland Power, you deserve to know that Joe Biden and the radical left want to crush American energy and American energy jobs. They want to pass uh, their climate change agenda and cap and trade that would cost 
that would raise the cost of electricity for nearly every household and business in Wisconsin. President Trump, for his part, unleashed American energy and all of the above energy strategy. As we stand here today, the United States is now a net exporter of energy for the first time in 70 years. We're energy independent. And when it comes to free and fair trade here in the heartland, we all remember NAFTA. Over in the Hoosier State, after NAFTA was signed into law back in 1995, we saw entire communities shuttered. And literally in the years since, 60,000 factories closed across the United States. And many of those jobs moved south of the border and overseas. But I saw this president work to keep the promises he'd made to the people of Wisconsin. He said we could do better than that. We could fight for the kind of free and fair trade that put American jobs and American workers first. He drove a hard bargain. And I'm here to tell you, the USMCA is a win for Wisconsin workers and a win for Wisconsin farmers. <laughs> Under the U.S.-Mexico-Canada agreement, now Canada is also ending its unfair treatment of our dairy farmers. So important here in Wisconsin. The USMCA is actually expected to increase our dairy exports by more than $300 million in the next year. That's a win for Wisconsin. <laughs> the experts also tell us the USMCA overall will create about 600,000 new jobs just right out of the gate, including 50,000 manufacturing jobs. You know, I heard that Joe Biden's running mate is in Milwaukee today. The dairy farmers in Wisconsin deserve to know that Senator Kamala Harris is one of only 10 senators to vote against the USMCA. She said it didn't go far enough on climate change. And here at Dairyland Power, you deserve to know. Senator Harris put their radical environmental agenda ahead of Wisconsin dairy and ahead of Wisconsin power. But under President Donald Trump, we will always put Wisconsin farmers, Wisconsin businesses, and Wisconsin families first. <laughs> Thanks to President Trump's leadership, NAFTA is yesterday and the USMCA is here to stay. Beyond trade with our neighbors, this president also stood strong stood strong with regard to China from day one. President Trump made it clear that the era of economic surrender is over. When we took office, literally half of our international trade deficit was with China. And President Trump acted. We imposed strong tariffs on China. We took action to end steel dumping. It was hollowing out our steel industry and manufacturing in this country. And every single day, we continue to stand firm demanding that China, demanding that China open up their markets, respect American private property, and play by the international rules. Joe Biden, he's been a cheerleader for communist China. He actually wants to repeal all the tariffs that are leveling the playing field for American workers. And recently, he actually criticized President Trump for suspending all travel to China at the outset of the pandemic. So I'll make you a promise. Whatever the other side wants to say or do, President Donald Trump and I are going to keep standing strong for American workers and American jobs until China comes to the table, lowers trade barriers, respects American properties, and levels the playing field. Because when the playing field is level, American workers can compete and win against any workers anywhere in the world. <laughs> and finally, on this Labor Day, as we think about labor, think about the cost of labor. It's one of the reasons why President Trump has made record investments in border security. As we stand here today, this president's already overseeing the construction of more than 3 
hundred miles of a border wall on our southern border, and we've been enforcing our immigration laws all across America. I mean, the truth is that illegal immigration drives wages down. People know that. One of the reasons people of Wisconsin ought to be concerned, Joe Biden is for open borders, sanctuary cities, free health care for illegal immigrants that will continue to bring low-cost labor into our cities and our towns, undermining the wages of American workers. And in addition to enforcing our immigration laws and standing firm for the conviction that a nation without borders is not a nation, President Trump has also launched what we call the Pledge to America's Workers. We're encouraging businesses in every field to expand training opportunities for American workers, and it's already led to 16 million training and apprentice opportunities for American workers all across the country. That's why we call that future ready. So we stood strong. We stood strong for a safer, more prosperous America. We stood firm to make sure that those that are meeting the needs, the families that are challenged in the midst of this pandemic have the support and the resources have the care that every one of us would want their family member to have. We stood up for our values. We stood up for American families. And on this Labor Day, American workers can be confident. You have a champion in President Donald Trump. President Donald Trump, I can tell you firsthand, having served with him every day over the last three and a half years, he's the real deal. The man who says what he means, means what he says. Never backs down. And I can tell you, he's never stopped fighting for the working people of Wisconsin. But for all that we accomplished in those first three years, for all we've done to see our nation through this time as America's begun to stand up again, go back to work and back to school, that's just what President Trump calls a good start. And I promise you, I promise you that we're never going to stop fighting for working people all across Wisconsin and all across America until we bring this state and this nation back bigger and better than ever before. So thank you for the warm reception today. And I'm very thankful it's not that warm today. It's a beautiful day in Wisconsin. Good to be with all of you. More importantly, thank you for thank you for what all of the hardworking families gathered here and those that might be looking on do for this country every day. And President Trump and I believe that all honest work is honorable. That it's really been the people who make things, who grow things, who work with their hands, with the sweat of their brow, in the factory, in the field that have made this country what it is today. I mean, it's been the hard work and the strength of working Americans, men and women like all of you here, people who believe in faith, in family, in patriotism, and hard work, people who believe in the American dream that have always and will always be the backbone of this country. So on this Labor Day 2020, I encourage you to keep pressing on. Keep showing the strength and the faith and the resilience that working people have always shown in the life of this nation. So keep standing with us. And I promise you, we'll keep standing with you. And finally, and finally, have faith. Have faith in the strength and resilience of the American people. The ability of hardworking Americans to see our nation through this challenging time and come all the way back and then some. And have faith that even in these challenging times, those ancient words that Americans have clung to throughout the generations are still true today. They're above the mantle in our home. And there they've been for more than 20 years. From the book of Jeremiah. Chapter 29, verse 11. Have faith, as he said, 
I know the plans I have for you. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. The future belongs to America and to hard-working Americans. And our hope is in Him, in this one nation, under God, with liberty and justice for all. Faith in all of you and faith in him. I leave here today with renewed confidence. We're going to make Wisconsin and America stronger and more prosperous than ever before. With President Donald Trump in the White House, with great leaders like Senator Ron Johnson serving Wisconsin, and maybe future leaders like Derek Van Orden finding his way into public life. With your continued support and with God's help, on this Labor Day, I just know we're going to make America great again. Again. Thank you all very much. God bless you. God bless Wisconsin. And God bless America. All right, everybody, not the greatest audio today for Vice President Mike Pence. We're taking a live look at the White House in our nation's capital, Washington, D.C. I do have some information from our sister station, Fox 32 Chicago, but I do not have a live picture or the news conference that we are expecting. I'll keep a very close eye when and if it does pop up. I will let you know here on News Now from Fox. But meanwhile, while we're taking a live look at the White House, I can let you know the latest from our sister station, what they are reporting on their website. Let's take a look here. It says an eight-year-old girl was killed. Two other people were shot while they were traveling in a car today in Canaryville on the south side of the city. The shooting happened about 5.55 in the evening at West 47th Street and South Union Avenue. That's according to Chicago Police Chief of Operations Brian McDermott. The child was taken to Comer Children's Hospital, where she was pronounced dead at about 628 this evening. The two other gunshot victims were taken to the University of Chicago Medical Center in critical condition. That's according to Chicago fire officials. One of the wounded shooting victims was a man, the other a woman, according to police. The girl's mother was injured after the car the group was in crashed. The Cook County Medical Examiner's Office hasn't released details about the girl's death. Following the shooting, a black Dodge Charger took off southbound on Union. That's according to police and community activist Andrew Holmes. A suspect described as wearing a black hoodie and black pants. No further details are available. When and if I get any information, I'll bring it to you right here on News Now from Fox. Meanwhile, I'm going to take you back out to Rochester, New York. A lot of eyes have been on the community lately for their recent update about the unrest that has been happening. All the protests and demonstrations we're going to hear from the mayor and police chief. Good afternoon. Over the last few nights, we have seen righteous anger and heartfelt protest from many residents of our community. I know the vast majority of the people that have taken to our streets do so with pure hearts, good intentions to ensure Tragedy, tragedies like the death of Mr. Prude never happen again. Their message that we must do better and that we have to address how we police our city has been heard. These calls are not new and the chief and I have worked diligently to do the necessary work. It is my solemn duty as the mayor of the city to honor Mr. Prude, to not let his death be in vain and to do everything possible to transform how we police our city, to truly protect and serve our residents. That is why today, as a child who was raised on Jefferson Avenue and educated at Wilson Magnet High School, and as a mother who raises my daughter in our city, I am recommitting myself to doing that work. And we have already begun. We are doubling the availability of mental health professionals at the suggestion of Council Vice President Lightfoot we will take our Family Crisis Intervention Team, or FACET, out of the police department and move it and its funding to the Department of Youth and Recreation Services, where our Pathways to Peace program already resides, to better and more humanely serve our residents. 
we will fully engage with the Race Commission and our real rapid response team to further improve our response to mental health crises and re-envision our police department. However, this work won't be done in a week or in a weekend. Today, and to do this right, we will need to continue to deliver consistent progress over the coming weeks, months, and years. But I am committed to addressing these challenges and ensuring that change truly comes. But we need to also address the immediate issues in front of us. I am glad that the Attorney General informed us yesterday that she will impanel a grand jury to complete the investigation of Mr. Prude's death. And I have to also address the response to the protests by our police department. I have spoken with Chief Singletary and we have discussed at length how our police department has responded to the protesters. The deployment of pepper balls, tear gas, the fireworks, and agitators have escalated these situations. That is the reason why I'm asking you, the citizens of Rochester, to help us. In the city of Rochester, we take care of our own. I am proud to stand here with Reverend Myra Brown, pastor of Spiritus Christi Church. Today, she and I met and have worked together to come up with a plan that will allow our protesters to exercise their First Amendment right to assemble free from distress while our officers protect the public safety building. Pastor Brown and I are calling on the elders of this city in our community to meet at her church located at 121 North Fixshoe Street at 6.30 p.m. today. RTS has agreed to bus in our elders. They will stand as the buffer between our protesters and our police department. I appreciate her and others for their willingness to step up and help us through these trying times. No one of us can do anything alone. It takes people reaching across, working together to ensure that we have a brighter future. You will hear from Reverend Brown in a moment, but I also need this community to understand the importance of the public safety building. Not only does our police department reside within the PSB, but our fire department's leadership and the nucleus of our city's operations reside in that building. Our ability to serve the residents of our city on a daily basis depends on the services that are held within that building. We have to protect it. There is credible information that outside agitators want to destroy the PSB. That said, what truly matters is creating a city that is dedicated to serving, protecting, and lifting up the least among us. What will always pay me about the death of Mr. Daniel Prude is our failure to do that. We had a human being in need of help, in need of compassion. In that moment, we had an opportunity to protect him, to keep him warm, to bring him to safety, to begin the process of healing him and lifting him up. We have to own the fact that in that moment, we did not do that. Unfortunately, we will not have the opportunity to save Mr. Prue. I can't bring him back. None of us can. But what I do have the opportunity to ensure is that his memory creates everlasting change. To ensure that he did not die in vain, that the next man or woman that needs our help gets the very best that this community has to offer. So let me say this to this community. I wholeheartedly believe that Chief Laurent Singletary 
is the right person to lead us through these difficult times. He was born and raised in this city, educated in this city, worked his way up to lead the department he loves. I do not believe there's another person more dedicated to changing the culture of policing than Laron. I know that he and I are committed to being better, working harder to restore the trust and faith of our community. Please welcome our police chief. First and foremost, uh, I extend my condolences to the Prue family, and we want to make sure that uh, Mr. Prue's death changes how we do policing in this city. Moving forward, we are dedicated to taking the necessary actions to prevent this from ever happening again. And I understand that there are certain calls that law enforcement shouldn't handle alone, and we are looking at ways to reimagine policing surrounding uh, mental health and have been for the last several months. And as the mayor stated, we have already started working with city council to uh, remove the family crisis intervention team, is known as FACET, from the RPD, and all of its resources to drive, and we are prepared to do more. Our PD is working with our county's forensic intervention team and clinicians out of the Office of Mental Health to effectively assist residents with mental health needs who have repeated contact with law enforcement with the goal to connect said individuals to outpatient services and to decrease the use of emergency and crisis responses. And police reform is actively moving forward with the race commission charged with developing policies and procedures and legislation that will address uh, racial inequities, as well as the things that we've already instituted, such as body-worn cameras and the implementation of the Community Affairs Bureau that I did in 2018. And as I share the mayor's sentiment, there is more work to be done, and I'm dedicated to doing what I was charged to do, which is to serve our citizens so that together we can collectively cr create change uh, in our community. And tonight, I'm Dedicated to work with uh, community leaders such as Reverend Myra Brown, someone who I've been uh, accustomed to know uh, throughout in this community and our city elders to ensure that tonight we protect the people's First Amendment rights to protest peacefully. Thank you. Now that I welcome Reverend Myra Brown. Hi, I'm Reverend Myra Brown and I'm the pastor of Spiritus Christi Church uh, in Rochester. On last night, protesters were trapped in front of my church, and we took them in. The church was um, smattered with um, pepper bullets and whatever was used on those protesters. And I've been marching with protesters in these last few days because um, it's important for us to get our systems right. And so as a pastor, it is my job to make sure that people are safe. Mr. Prude's death re-triggered pain, trauma in this community. And so it's important when a community is grieving that they be given the space to grieve. They be given the space to be angry, to be given the space to make the demands that we need to make in order to change these systems. We know that our policing systems in this country were created around the 17th century and many of them were created to answer a question after emancipation, which was, what do we do with the blacks? And so these, the systems across America were created from a slave patrol blueprint. Uh, we need to change that blueprint. We need to make these changes. We need to do the structural racism work on all of our systems, but in particular, our policing systems. And I'm, I'm, I'm happy to hear that that work is going to begin in Rochester, and I'm looking forward to and expecting us to finish that work. I don't want my children 57 years later uh, having to march and having to call for equity and equality. So the mayor and I have agreed to make sure that those who are protesting in the city are safe, that they get to have the space to grieve, that they will not be converged upon, um, and that we can have protests and be able to give people the space to make the demands and to do their civic duty of calling on our systems to do better, to do more, to transform itself. And so that is my position, and I'm looking forward 
to that work. I'm looking forward to the transformation of policing systems in Rochester and across the country as I um, send my deepest, deepest condolences to the Prude family. May we not have to stand here or any other city again talking about a black or brown body dying at the hands of police. Thank you, Reverend Brown, and I appreciate you for stepping up and helping us today. We will take some questions. Yes, sir. Uh, we do have intelligence that uh, we've been receiving that there has been outside agitators that have uh, come to Rochester. As you know, we do monitor social uh, media and, and things of that nature. Um, so we do have credible information that uh, one of the areas that they want to target uh, is symbolic features. Chief, so has anyone been arrested outside the city? I mean, what yes. Proof? Yes. Chief, we, 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 we have arrested. Uh, people have provided addresses from Alaska, Massachusetts, and other parts of the country. Did you say it's true that, that you misled the mayor between March and August? As uh, w what I did was I provided you know factual information based on the uh, incidents uh, that I had at the time. Mayor, could we follow up on that um, regarding the transparency? Because that is an issue for these protesters. They don't feel like they need was not aware of what was happening regarding Mr. Proof. There was an autopsy in April showing that Mr. Proof died by homicide. Were you aware of that autopsy in April? No, I was not aware of that autopsy in April. What I was aware of, um, as I said, the chief called me at 7 o'clock in the morning, um, I believe on April 20, uh, March 23rd, and he told me what he knew at the time. Um, and then he did whatever he needed to do from that point forward. And I think that he has the document to show that he exercised and, and did what he needed to do as chief from that point forward. Um, remember, we were in the middle of COVID. We had a lot going on in this city and across this, this country at that time in dealing with the pandemic that was before us. It wasn't until um, August 4th that I was uh, made aware of the video and saw the video, and that was by Corporation Counsel. So, so you I think that the chief did do all those things. So he he handled it the way that he needed to handle it internally. So when he made the call to me. It was the information that he had at that time. And then he did what he needed to do on the back end. And then on August 4th, when the Corporation Council made me aware of just the video and, and the extent of what the video was, that was the conversation that we had, an extensive conversation with the Corporation Council, the chief, as well as the deputy mayor at that time. So the law department, and, and again, city council is going to be reviewing this. And so you will see as they go through their review that all the steps that were taken were in proper order. So the chief notified me that they, we had an incident. He reviewed that incident, made a call, um, and then started his internal process. And those things happened. Again, we were in the middle of a pandemic. We were dealing with those issues in-house where we're trying to make sure that the city is still operating and functioning. It wasn't until April, uh, until August 4th, that I was able to see the video and notify by our corporation council about that. But there will be an extensive review for this, and you will get all that information during that investigation and during that review. And you will all see that this was done by the book and the chief did everything possible on his end to ensure that the Prude family got the justice that they needed, and the law department acted in accordance with what they believed the law to be. Chief, at, at any point in the last couple of days, Chief, uh, have you offered to resign? Did you resign? 
No, I know there was rumor that I offered to resign. I, I did not. I'm still the chief today. Have you been asked to resign, Chief? At any, at any point, were you asked to step down? No. no. Chief, knowing that the relationship. Uh, you say you hope Daniel Cruz's death was due to change the way you do policing. Do you believe the officers involved in his death acted improperly? That would be uh, inappropriate for me to comment at this time. There's still an ongoing criminal investigation, there's an internal investigation. So that would be highly inappropriate for me to comment with respect to. Uh, the outcome of that investigation prior to its conclusion. Can you specify how you want your policing to change? Well, I think, I think we're at a time and climate that we're looking at the, the uh, temperature around the country. We're looking at what the narrative is. And I think people do want change. People do want reforms. And I think, you know, even prior to uh, whether it was Mr. Cruz's death or Mr. Floyd's death, there have been calls for change. And I think that's what we have been continuously doing. That's what we will always do. What about your office? I think what we do is we look at how we respond, we plan, you know, we, we, we take a measured approach. Um, and I think we have been consistent in that. Uh, what, let me be clear. What has occurred is that there are people who come to these protests who want to protest peacefully, who want to express their First Amendment right. Um, as police chief, that is my charge to do that. That's what I have done as police chief, okay? The, um, there are agitators within the crowd, whether they're from here or elsewhere, who do want to uh, provoke um, and, and want some kind of confrontation. There have been frozen water bottles that have been thrown at police officers. There have been other type of debris, glass bottles, rocks that have been thrown at police officers. Now, our stance has been measured. Uh, we have shown restraint. I know that there's people who may have a differ of opinion. Um, but, you know, as of yesterday, I had a conversation with uh, some other police departments across the country with regard to how they respond to protests, you know, just for information sharing purposes to see, you know, if there's anything that we are missing here in Rochester. Uh, we were right on par. Chief and Mayor, this is a question for you both. The, first, the last time we saw the two of you together, the officers in question were still on duty. 24 hours later, the mayor alone comes out and announces their suspension. What changed in those 24 hours that caused you to suspend those officers when, in fact, you knew in August that this video existed and this was on tape? So I think that we have reviewed this extensively, right? So our understanding from our law department was that the attorney general's office was in the middle of their investigation, and therefore we could not get in the middle of that investigation. We since learned on that day that we could proceed. The attorney general came out and said that we could proceed. And so it was my belief that we needed to suspend the officers and that we needed the attorney general's office to finish their independent review. And I am thankful that the AG has come forward and said that she is impaneling a grand jury and that process will be moved forward. So we have the situation with Mr. Prue's death and now we also have a situation where we have to make sure that our citizens, our police department, our community is able to do the work and move forward together. And moving forward together looks like working together to ensure and reimagine what policing looks like. It also looks like uh, readjusting how we manage and budget our, our police department. It looks like making sure that we are understanding what our officers are responding to and being held responsible for and looking to mental health and mental health professionals to help us with that. I know that that is something that our city council has definitely been pushing us towards and we're committed to making sure that we do everything possible here in the city of Rochester to build up our community and not tear it down. What is your response to protesters who have called for your resignation and the chiefs? For everything that we have seen this year, it is clear to me that there is more work to be done. And I am committed to doing what's necessary. And I know that the chief is committed to doing what's necessary to better, the, better serve our citizens and our community. That was the job that I was elected to do. That was the job that he took an oath to serve. And understand something, the chief and I, we love our city. We were born and raised here. We were educated here. We are committed to making the necessary changes to ensure 
that this community moves forward. We recognize the hurt. We understand that there will be a process, an extensive process and a look at, but when you go through and you look at step by step by step, you will understand that throughout this whole thing, we have been responsive to those people that were investigating this and listening to our legal department as we went forward. For everything that we have seen this year, it is clear to me that there is more work that needs to be done, and I am committed to doing that work. When you go through and look at, when I go through and I look at extensively what the chief did, right? So notifying me on a day that the incident happened, what he knew. He, he, he knew that this, uh, that Mr. Prude had, uh, was on drugs or had, a, had an overdose and, and that was what he believed. He then went to review the video. After he reviewed the video, he immediately started an internal criminal and internal investigation. When he learned of Mr. Prude's death, he immediately referred that over to the DA's office. He immediately, after being contacted by the AG's office, gave them the information that they needed and went through that process. Again, we were in the middle of a pandemic. And so when he's going through and doing his job as chief, and you look at the documentation of everything that he did on that back on the back end, and then when the law department is working through the process, and they're working with the AG's office as well as the family's attorney, and then our corporation counsel is able to see the video and then notify me before releasing it and, and making sure that I saw it. I think that is very, very important to understand the timeline. The documentation will support that, and we welcome the city council going through and looking at each of those steps. I, I, I clearly, expressly at that, that press conference stated that I believe that Chief Leron Singletary was the person to lead this department. If that was what you interpreted, then I am sorry. I clearly, unequivocally said, I believe that Chief Leron Singletary is the person to lead this department. And when you look through the timeline, you can go through and step by step by step. He gave me the information that he knew when he had it. No, we so Chief, did you, were you told the same exact information of her originally, that it was just an OD? Or were you told the whole thing? I, I provided the, mate, the mayor factual information uh, the morning of the 23rd, and uh, March 30th was the follow-up when Mr. Fruit passed away. But if you, you, you told her that a, a person OD while being arrested, did you know that he was being held down and all the other stuff? Yes. Would it be protocol to tell the mayor when someone's um, death is ruled a homicide in police custody? I'm sorry? Would it be protocol to tell the mayor when someone died in police custody? As, as yes, and I did. I did. In April, as, the mayor knew? As, I mean, after the autopsy came out, did the mayor on the, know? On the morning of the 23rd, I made factual information to provide right to the mayor. And on the morning of March 30th, when Mr. Proof passed away, as well. Well, what about the autopsy? Was she informed of the autopsy report that showed it was a homicide? The mayor, the mayor just said she was not. Would that be protocol? Well, this is a criminal investigation, and as part of the criminal investigation, the officers do have a right to an attorney. So um, I have no control as police chief, no control of as to whether they go provide a statement to the attorney general's office. You mentioned last week there are two. Correct. So the, uh, both are active. The internal investigation, as I ordered them the next day, um, the same day, I should say morning, uh, March 23rd, the internal investigation and the criminal investigation. So the Attorney General's office, as you know, took over the investigation on April 16th. And the, um, the internal investigation 
is, is being done by the uh, by the professional standards section, and that investigation is still ongoing. Do you have any sense of when that might come out? Um, I'm, I'm not sure. It's Regarding that timeline, yeah, I just have a question back to your point about the AG. Um, they're doubling down, saying that they did not prevent uh, your office from making the information public. Do you have a response to that? So I can only tell you what our law department's understanding was. I was not on that call. And I believe that our corporation counsel and the attorney that spoke with the assistant AG was on that call. I believe that it was sometime either in April or June. But I can tell you that when I saw the video on August 4th from our corporation counsel, um, the, the understanding that he gave to me was that there was an investigation going on, a criminal investigation going on by the assistant attorney general's office and that we could not impede that investigation and we needed to wait until they were done with that criminal investigation before coming forward. But I can assure this community that once I saw that video on August, uh, August 4th, I informed the chief that whenever there is a death in our community or a use of force, force that I needed to be informed within 24 hours. And he has been, and he understands that. And we have changed our policy around that. And so when we, as we move forward, it's about how do we ensure that the things that happened here never happen again. Mayor, and so- So today, again, Mayor uh, Reverend Brown is working with us, right? So we have the elders in our community that's coming together with our protesters and our police department to help us ensure that everyone is able to exercise their First Amendment rights, they're able to walk, and they're able to protest and do it peacefully. But we also recognize and as the chief has already indicated, there are some agitators that are from outside of this community that we also have to be aware of. Reverend Brown is aware of that, and she is committed to helping us work with the protesters to ensure that everyone is able to exercise their First Amendment right peacefully and without loss to property or harm to anyone. Do you feel like we can guarantee the safety of these elders? So if I could just um, respond to that and then he can say what he wants. Um, having the elders uh, be the buffer between police and protesters was my proposal because it's important for this community to be able to protest safely. I don't know how long we'll be protesting on the streets together, um, but we're, we're asking for justice and until justice is served, you need to make sure that our young people are safe right, that our college students are safe, that children who are marching are safe. And so we elders have volunteered to put our bodies on the line to make sure that that happens because this community needs to unrestrictedly be able to walk these streets, be able to make the demands that they want to make, and to be able to go home without pepper spray and pepper balls in their eyes and feel safe in this community. And I feel as an elder and as a pastor that that is one of my responsibilities to do everything that I can to make sure that that happens. And so I am actually, um, I'm glad that the mayor has accepted this proposal and is working with us to make sure that our elders can step up and partner to make sure that this community is safe when they come out and hit those streets to protest a system uh, that needs to be transformed. Question for Chief Singletary about last night. Uh, you've seen that lots of back and forth about who got physical first, throwing something, firing a pepper bullet. But the very first thing that happened was the police announcement that it was an unlawful gathering. Can you explain how that decision was arrived at and what the protocols are? Why was it unlawful? take us through that process, starting not when the, when the objects were being thrown, but back when the decision was made that the gathering was unlawful. 
Yeah, so it, it, the, if individuals just standing there peacefully protesting, um, it is not unlawful at that particular point in time. It is not. Um, so whenever we do any type of you know situation, we always go back to the table and do uh, see what we can do better. Um, and that was one of the things that did come up. But how, how, what, what criteria makes the gathering of people anywhere yep. unlawful? So when people start to throw debris and things um, at the police or start destroying property or throwing incendiary devices, um, frozen water bottles at police, that's when it becomes an unlawful assembly. Um, you know, what we want people to do is show up at um, these situations and protest peacefully. You know, we don't want people to throw frozen water bottles or debris or glass um, at police officers, right? Because we don't want no one to get hurt, to include police officers, peaceful protesters, anybody. We don't well, want no one to get hurt. literally all the way across the broad street from the protesters and vice versa, and the announcement was already being made that the gathering was unlawful. How did that determination Great. Again, those are things that we review um, throughout the process. Chief, so how can you guarantee the safety of elders when lawmakers, last night that were walking the streets peacefully were hit by pepper balls and complained of injury. So as Member Brown stated, you know, this is a plan that, you know, she brought to us. This is a plan that whatever we do have a plan, we make our concern is known. Do you have concerns about this, Chief? Has anybody died in police custody? No. Do you have concerns about tonight's idea? We, whenever there's a plan, I always express concerns, and we try to, you know, overcome those concerns as best as possible. I'll meet the, the elders at the church uh, tonight at, at 6.30. I believe that um, Reverend Brown has a special relationship with the people in our community. And um, the fact that she has come forward and she has said, Mayor, let me try this. We can't continue to go down the same road that we've been down. We can't continue to have the, these protests end this way, you know, it breaks my heart. Remember, this is our community. This is a city that we love, that we care about. And we know that the protesters care about this city as well. And we want to work collectively together as partners to ensure that everyone is able to exercise their rights and do so safely and do so peacefully without harm, without danger. And so what Reverend Brown saw last night, what I saw, the cause that I got, the things that I was seeing over the last two days, and I know that this hurts the chief as well as the officers and everyone in our community alike. We want to try something different we want to be able to work together. We want to be able to, to move forward in a way to make sure that Mr. Prue's death wasn't in vain and make the changes that are necessary in order to do so. And those are changes that the Prue family has brought forward, especially